The digital space is a world of connection and opportunity. But take this moment for example. The web has made it possible for you to enrol in this program where you'll learn from the personal stories of developers at Meta. By the time you have completed this professional certificate, you can become a creator of digital experiences. Connection is evolving, and so are you. You might not have a background in tech at all, and that's okay. Even if you have no experience, this program can get you job ready within a single year. So how can this professional certificate prepare you for a job at an organization like Meta? The Database Engineer Professional Certificate will help you build job ready skills for a database engineering role while earning a credential from Meta. From Meta Engineers, you will learn about how they collaborate to create and test high performance databases. You'll also discuss interesting topics with other aspiring database engineers. And complete a range of coding exercises to improve your skills. It's important to complete all the courses in this certificate in order, as each course will build on your skills. Although we have a recommended schedule for each course, the program is entirely self-paced, which means your time is your own to manage. As you make your way through the courses in the certificate, you'll learn how to model and structure a database according to best practice and create, manage and manipulate data using SQL, one of the most widely used languages for working with databases. You'll also learn how to use the Django Web Framework to connect the front end of a web application to your database. For your final project, you will create a functional relational database designed and developed with best practice architecture to showcase as part of your portfolio during your job search. You'll also be ready to collaborate with other developers as you will have learned to use Git and GitHub for version control. In the final course, you will prepare for the coding interview. You'll practice your interview skills, refine your resume, and tackle some common coding challenges that typically form part of technical job interviews. Once you complete the program, you'll get access to the Meta Career Programs Job Board. A job search platform that connects you with over 200 employers who've committed to sourcing talent through Meta's certificate programs. Who knows where you will end up? Whatever the future of connection looks like, you'll be part of its creation. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to this course in database engineering. Almost everyone has used the database and more likely information about us is probably present in many databases all over the world. But who understands what a database is and how important database engineering is to global industry, government and organizations? A very straightforward description of a database is that it is a form of electronic storage in which data is held. Of course, that explanation does not even come close to explaining the impact of database technology. To give an idea of databases in a real world context, let's briefly describe some typical use cases. For example, your bank uses a database to store data for customers, bank accounts and transactions. A hospital stores patient data, staff data, laboratory data and more. And an online store retains your profile information along with your shopping history and accounting transactions. Many of these services have access to a diverse range of data. They collect and store other items such as your location, how long you spend on their platform and friends you connected with alongside many more facts. Such online services and social media platforms generate enormous amounts of data due to their large user base and constant user activity. And with the Internet of Things or IoT, many extra devices are now connected to the Internet. These continual streams of data have led to a revolution in database technology to accommodate the volume, variety and complexity of what has become known as big data. Whatever the source of the data, a database will typically carry out the following actions, all of which a database engineer must be familiar with. Store the data, form connections or relationships between segmented areas of the data, filter the data to show relevant records, search data to return matching records, and have functions to allow the data to be updated, changed, and deleted as required. Don't worry if you don't fully understand all these terms. For now, you're just receiving a brief introduction to databases and data. During the course, you'll explore these concepts in more detail, alongside the many other tasks that form the duties of a database engineer. You'll learn about the concepts of data and databases, how data is related in a database, and different database structures and their uses, how to perform, create, read, update, and delete operations, how to use SQL operators to sort and filter data, what database normalization is, and how to normalize a database. You'll get to build a fully operational database. 
And you'll also install and set up software called XAMPP on your computer to help progress your local and remote database learning. You're not expected to be a database engineer just now. There are many videos in your course that will gradually guide you toward that goal. Watch, pause, rewind, and rewatch the videos until you are confident in your skills. Then consolidate your knowledge by consulting the course readings and put your skills into practice during the course exercises. Along the way, you'll encounter several knowledge quizzes where you can self-check your progress. And you're not alone in considering a career as a database engineer, which is why you'll also work with course discussion prompts that enable you to connect with your classmates. It's a great way to share knowledge, discuss difficulties, and make new friends. To be successful in this course, it is helpful to commit to a regular and disciplined approach to learning. You need to be serious about your study, and if possible, map out a study schedule with dates and times that you can devote to attending the course. It's an online, self-paced course, but it does help to think of your study in terms of regular attendance at a learning institute. In summary, this course provides you with a complete introduction to databases, and it's part of a program of courses that lead you toward a career in database engineering. I really like this idea that in the end we're all solving human problems through technology. And we're not, as a software engineer, my role is not to simply develop technological solutions. They need to have this human outcome. I'm Daniel Bloomfield Ramagem. I'm a software engineer for Meta. I joined the company in 2017, and I work out of our Washington, DC office. I immediately think of um, my mother's recipe book, which is a spiral notebook. So she keeps her recipes in a spiral notebook. Uh, every page has a number, and she keeps kind of an index at the beginning of that notebook so she can easily find the recipe. Well, that's a database. So, you know, my mom is a database engineer, perhaps, or not engineer, but uh, certainly she relies and has created her databases. So I like that fun kind of example because it shows the range of that things that are possible once you store data in a structured way that is, can be easily retrieved. And so it's the recipe book. But it's also, you know, the picture I just shared on Facebook that now my friends get to see anywhere they are in the world so quickly. All that is powered by a lot of infrastructure, databases at the core. I think data is at the heart of every application. And so learning to create an effective data layer that can provide um, the user with you know, quick responses, accurate responses and results is really critical. And as a database engineer in particular, I think you are involved in such a critical component of building applications and you have such a large influence in everything else that follows from the data. So that includes the user interface, it includes um, the clients, the APIs, like all of that gets influenced by how the data layer gets modeled, stored, and all the characteristics of being able to retrieve that data effectively and making it um, the consumption of that information uh, easy for the rest of the tech stack. So you have a really large influence. And I, I hope you walk away knowing that you have this very large influence on the development of applications. So technical skills are used on a, on a daily basis. Um, I mean, certainly I code. And when I say code, I mean not only I, I program using kind of a standard programming language, languages for web, um, but I also uh, work in the database space by creating the pipelines that produce that extract, transform, and load a lot of the data that makes its way into um, the applications that, are, that we develop. The soft skills I use on a daily basis certainly include a lot of communication and organization. You know, it's easy to you come out of school and you're so excited about the coding, the technical skills you've learned, and those are obviously very, very important. But I thought code was king. Um, I'm here to program. And, you know, I expect people to understand the output of what I'm, what I'm making. And I learned that that is insufficient. And I, I saw great examples of uh, people who were doing great technically, but they were excelling furthermore on just being able to explain what they were doing, um, not only to the team internally, but to the people who are going to maybe use those features in the tool set. The perfect is the enemy of the good. Particularly, I think with database development, it's easy to overcomplicate solutions, and especially when you're doing data modeling and data storage. 
you want to cover every possible variation of data, every different use case, edge case for uh, using that data. And that can lead you down the path of creating very complex data schemas that become hard to maintain, can be not well performant. Um, so you need to iterate on your work. For databases, I would say, you know, try to focus on the here and now needs of data. Uh, be especially mindful of these perceived uh, needs for massive data scalability, which may, again, lead you to overcomplicate your solution when, in fact, you might need something much smaller scale, at least to kick off and get better understanding of what the feature and the data requirements truly are. So start small, iterate frequently. Write more often. And I know usually when you think of engineers or database programmers, uh, you think, uh, the output of your work is, you know, it's the program, it's the code, it's the SQL queries. And yes, it is, but that alone, I think, is insufficient. So complement that with writing. Now, what are you going to write about? Well, certainly there's documentation that goes along with your code. Um, I have a, a, a good colleague at Meta that always tells me when I said I'm done with something, he looks at me and says, are you done, done? And I said, the first time he said it, I was like, yes, I'm done. Uh, and he followed up with, did you, is your documentation ready? Is your uh, code checked in, in the right places? Is the wiki page updated? Did you write a post about this? And so he emphasized the importance of um, code is the 80%, you know, 20% is that additional communication that's needed. So I would say write more often. Don't be afraid to write imperfectly. Write something, put something out there, whether it's sharing the status of something that you're doing, whether it's just um, enhancing documentation for something that you're working on get into the habit of writing more often. Try to take what you're learning and connect it to something practical that you can see a use for. Um, whether it's learning about databases and you know thinking about a recipe book that your mother or father has in a spiral notebook or maybe baseball cards that you tracked as a child or comic books that you tracked as a child. Try to think of ways to apply what you're learning technically to these real life problems. They can be small problems, like finding the recipes at the right time, but they can be, of course, bigger, uh, more perhaps interesting problems around just te technical and digital communication between people. We all use data and databases in our daily online lives. For example, uploading photos to our social media feeds, downloading files at work, and playing games online are all examples of database usage. But what exactly is data? And how does it interact with a database? If you're struggling to answer these questions, don't worry. By the end of this video, you'll be able to describe what a database is at a conceptual level, identify real world examples of the use of databases, and demonstrate an understanding of how data is organized in a database. So let's return to the first of our questions. What is data? In basic terms, data is facts and figures about, well, anything. For example, if data were collected on a person, then that data might include their name, age, email, and date of birth. Or the data could be facts and figures related to an online purchase. This could be the order number, description, order quantity and date, and even the customer's email. Data is crucial for individuals as well as organizations. But where is all this data stored? In our digital world, data is no longer stored in manual files. Instead, Developers use something called databases. A database is a form of electronic storage in which data is organized systematically. It stores and manipulates data electronically to make it more manageable, efficient, and secure. There are many real-world examples of where databases are used. For example, a bank can use a database to store data for its customers, bank accounts, and transactions. And a hospital uses a database to store patient data, staff data, laboratory data, and much more. At this point, you might be asking yourself, but what does a database actually look like? Well, a database looks like data organized systematically, and this organization typically looks like a spreadsheet or a table. What exactly does the term systematic mean? All data contains elements or features and attributes by which they can be identified. For example, a person can be identified by attributes like their age, height, or hair color and this data is separated and stored in what's known as entities that represent those elements. 
As you just learned, an entity is like a table. It contains rows and columns that store data relating to a specific element. In other words, these are relational elements. They're related to one another. These entities could be physical representations, like an employee, a customer, or a product. Or they could be conceptual, like an order, an invoice, or quotation. Entities then store data in a table-like format against the attributes or features related to the element. For example, an online store could hold customer's data in a customer entity containing specific attributes relating to the customer. These attributes could include first name, last name, date of birth, and email. And they could also have product data stored in a product entity against attributes like product code, description, price, and availability. In the relational database world, these entities are known as relations or tables. The attributes become the columns of the table, and each table row represents an instance of that entity. As an example, let's take the entities from the online store example that you just explored. These two examples could be combined into a list of orders the store received from its customers. Within a database, this data could be rendered as an order table or entity, and the data could be organized into rows that contain a unique order number, the name of the customer who placed the order, the product that they ordered, and the price of that product. There are many ways to organize data in a database. Relational databases aren't the only kind of databases that you'll encounter. As a database engineer, you'll work with many different types of databases. Here's a few common examples of other types of databases. An object-oriented database is where data is stored in the form of objects instead of tables or relations. An example of this kind of database could be an online bookstore. The store's database could render authors, customers, books, and publishers as classes, like sets or categories. The objects, or instances of these classes, would then hold the actual data. Graph databases store data in the form of nodes. In this case, entities like customers, orders, and products are represented as nodes. The relationships between them are represented as edges. And finally, there's document databases where data is stored as JSON, or JavaScript object notation objects. The data is organized into collections like tables. Within each collection are documents written in JSON that record data. So in this example, customer documents are held in a customer collection, while order and product documents are stored in the order and product collections. But where are the databases themselves stored? A database can be hosted on a dedicated machine within the premises of an organization, or it could be hosted on the cloud. Cloud databases are currently a more popular choice. This is because they allow you to store, manage, and retrieve data through a cloud platform and access data through the internet. And they all provide a lower cost option for data management than other similar options. You should now understand the concept of a database. You should also be able to identify examples of databases and demonstrate how data is organized within a database. Great start. You'll be storing and managing data in no time. Picture yourself in the following scenario. You're managing the database of a large online store. Your database must be able to retrieve a customer's details from one table and then find the order recorded against another table. So how does the database establish a relationship between these pieces of data? Over the next few minutes, you'll explore this process. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to explain why data in a database should be related and identify an instance of related data in a database. Data stored in a database cannot exist in isolation. It must have a relationship with other data so that it can be processed into meaningful information. So how do you make sure that all the data in your database is related? Let's explore how data is related by using the online store as our example. In the database of your online store, you could have an order table and a customer table. To locate the details of a customer's order, you would check the order number against the customer ID. In other words, the database establishes a link between the data and the tables. Let's look at the customer table in more detail. In this table, the columns are customer ID, first name, last name, and email. In relational database terms, these are fields. Then there are several rows which contain data for each of these fields. In relational databases, they are known as records of the table. So, all these fields and rows work together to store information on the customer, also known as the entity. 
Every row and record in the customer table is an instance of the customer entity. For example, Sarah Hogan, who has a customer ID of C1, is one customer instance. And Katrina Langley, who has a customer ID of C4, is another customer instance. What's most important is that each of these customer instances or records must be uniquely identifiable. But what if two or more customers share similar info, like the same first name or last name? To avoid this confusion within the database, you can use a field that contains only unique values like the customer ID. This is called a primary key field. It contains unique values that cannot be replicated elsewhere in the table. So even if two customers share the same name, they'll still have separate customer IDs. This means that your database can determine which customer is the required one. Let's look at the order table next. Just like the customer table, the order table also has fields and records. And in this table, the primary key field is the order ID. But there's also a field named customer ID with the exact same data as the customer data. So what is the purpose of the customer ID in this table? The customer ID is there to help identify who it is that placed the order. So by adding the customer ID field to the order table, a relationship is established between the customer table and the order table. And because of this relationship, you can pull data in a meaningful way from both tables. The customer ID field in the order table is known as the foreign key field. A foreign key is a field in one table that connects to the primary key field in the original table, which in this case is the customer table. So the customer ID is the primary key of the customer table, but it becomes the foreign key in the order table. This way, the relationship is established and the data in these two tables are related. You should now be able to explain the relationships between data in a database and identify instances of related data. Great work. You've probably heard of terms like big data and cloud databases. Maybe you've even encountered them in this course, but do you know what they mean? In this video, you'll discover more about these terms and you'll be able to identify different types of databases and explain how databases have evolved in response to new trends like big data. Databases have been around for a long time and have been influenced by many different trends, but they've undergone a huge change in recent decades. Thanks to the growth of the internet, they now must be able to store ever-increasing amounts of unstructured data. However, this poses difficulties, as they mostly store structured data. Let's briefly look at some of the different types of databases and how they've been affected by this trend. Relational databases have limitations when it comes to storing data because they mostly store structured data. Yet databases are now required to store more and more unstructured data. So the trend in recent years has been to rely on NoSQL databases instead. NoSQL databases are a type of database that store data in a variety of different formats. Essentially, they provide databases with a flexible structure. This makes scaling easy by facilitating a change to the database structure itself without the need for complex data models. NoSQL databases are used by social media platforms, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and other applications that generate massive amounts of unstructured data. Types of NoSQL databases include document databases, key value databases, and graph databases. Now that you're familiar with different types of databases, let's take a closer look at big data and cloud databases. Essentially, these terms are used to describe a recent change in our approach to data and databases. Let's start with a look at big data. Big data is complex data that can increase in volume with time. In other words, it's data that can grow exponentially with time. But where does this kind of complex data come from? Social media platforms, online shopping sites, and other services generate massive amounts of data every second of the day as they capture the actions of billions of users around the world. And with the Internet of Things, or IoT, more and more devices are connected to the Internet, generating even more and more data. This is how complex data, or big data, is created. All this data is highly unstructured or semi-structured. Traditional database systems could deal with structured data using tables, records, and relationships. But big data is a whole new challenge. Big data is a combination of structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data collected from many different sources. And it adds more power to data because it can address complex business problems that traditionally structured data can't handle. Finally, big data helps to provide unique insights that can help to improve decision-making. 
so it's highly valued across many industries. For example, the manufacturing sector processes big data to predict equipment failure by evaluating the current state of machinery, assess production processes by monitoring the production line, respond to customer feedback proactively, and anticipate future demands by monitoring current sales. Retail processes big data to anticipate customer demand, improve customer experience, analyze customer behavior and spending patterns, and identify pricing improvement opportunities. And the telecommunications sector utilizes big data analytics and network usage analytics to plan for infrastructure investments, design new services that meet customer demands, analyze service quality data to predict customer satisfaction, and plan for customer retention mechanisms. Now that you're familiar with big data and how it helps to power businesses, let's move on to another trend in databases, the use of cloud databases. Organizations are moving to the cloud to free themselves from the difficulties of dealing with the infrastructure of physical servers, like maintenance and storage costs. Some examples of cloud storage services include Dropbox and iCloud. With these cloud storage services, it's possible to store documents and other data on the cloud, a much more affordable solution. Another trend in databases is business intelligence, or BI. Traditionally, databases were just a means of storing data, but organizations now utilize their data with business intelligence related technologies and strategies. With these technologies, organizations can analyze their data and extract valuable information to help them to make informed business decisions. New trends are constantly emerging in database technology and they'll keep advancing with time. But for now, these are a few of the leading trends that you should be aware of. At this stage in the course, you're probably familiar with the basics of databases and how they store and manage data but it's also important that you know how to interact with databases in order to work with data. As a data engineer, you can interact with databases using structured query language, or as it's more commonly known, SQL, also pronounced as SQL. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn how to explain what SQL is and outline the role of SQL in databases. So what sort of interactions do database engineers need to establish with databases? Some of the operations you could carry out in the data might require you to create, read, update, and delete data. These operations are also known as CRUD operations. You might already be familiar with some of these operations. If not, don't worry. They'll be covered in depth at later stages in this course. Let's find out more about SQL. SQL is a standard language that can be used with all databases. It's particularly useful when working with relational databases which require a language that can interact with structured data. Some examples of relational databases that SQL can interact with include MySQL, PostgreSQL, Oracle, and Microsoft SQL Server. The next question this raises is how does a database interpret or read and execute instructions given using SQL? A database interprets and makes sense of SQL instructions with the use of a database management system, or DBMS. As a web developer, you'll execute all SQL instructions on a database using a DBMS. The DBMS takes responsibility for transforming SQL instructions into a form that's understood by the underlying database. This was just a very quick introduction to SQL. At this early stage, you should be able to explain what SQL is and explain the role of SQL in databases. In the upcoming videos, you'll learn more about SQL and develop a deeper understanding of the language. Imagine that you've just been hired to create a database for a college. First, you'd need to create tables to hold data in all aspects of the college. Then you'd need to insert data into these tables and then modify this data whenever something changes. That's a lot of work, but it's all possible with the use of SQL and CRUD operations. Not familiar with these operations? No problem. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn how to explain the tasks that SQL syntax is used for when building a database and demonstrate an understanding of the SQL subsets and sublanguages. So, let's return to our college database scenario. How can you possibly make all these changes in the database? Well, with the help of what web developers call CRUD operations. Performing CRUD operations is the most common task when working with a database. CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete. Or in operational terms, Create, Add or Insert Data, Read Data, update existing data, and delete data. 
Alongside these operations, there are many other things that SQL can do. Depending on what SQL is used for, it can be divided into many subsections or sublanguages. These include DDL, or Data Definition Language, DML, also known as Data Manipulation Language, DQL, or Data Query Language, and DCL, also called Data Control Language. Let's take a closer look at these languages and their commands, starting with Data Definition Language, or DDL. DDL, as the name says, helps you define data in your database. But what does it mean to define data? Before you can store data in the database, you need to create the database and related objects like tables in which your data will be stored. For this, the DDL part of SQL has a command named create. Then you might need to modify already created database objects. For example, you might need to modify the structure of a table by adding a new column. You can perform this task with the DDL alter command. You can remove an object like a table from a database using the DDL drop command. Data manipulation language, or DML commands, are used to manipulate data in the database, like inserting, updating, or deleting data. Most CRUD operations fall under DML. To add data to a table, you can use the insert command. This command lets you specify the fields to add data to, along with the values to be inserted. If you need to edit data that's already inserted into a table, just deploy the update command and you can specify data to be removed by using the delete command. So far, you've learned how to add database objects and manage data within them. So how do you read or retrieve that data? To read data stored in a database, you can use data query language. DQL defines the select command to be able to retrieve data. Select lets you retrieve data from one or multiple tables, letting you specify the data fields that you want based on preferred filter criteria. And finally, you can also use DCL, or data control language, to control access to the database. For example, using DCL commands, you control access to data stored in the database. Grant and revoke DDL commands are used to give users access privileges to data and to revert access privileges already given to users. You should now be familiar with how SQL acts as the interface between the database and its users and you should also be able to identify SQL operations and sublanguages. Great work. By now you're most likely familiar with the basics of databases, and you might even have come across some simple SQL syntax. But why do developers use SQL to interact with databases? SQL is a popular language choice for databases because of the many advantages that it offers. Now over the next few minutes, you'll identify the advantages of SQL and demonstrate how the advantages of SQL assist with database tasks. SQL is the interface or bridge between a relational database and its users and offers web developers a wide range of advantages. Let's look at a few of them. The biggest advantage of SQL is that it requires very little coding skills to use. It's just a set of keywords. There aren't many lines of code required to perform basic CRUD operations or add, create, update and delete tasks on the database. So it's a very developer or user-friendly language. SQL's interactivity makes it even more user-friendly because it lets developers write complex queries in a short space of time. So, if you need to work with the relational databases for your next project, you just need to know what keywords to use and when. SQL is also a standard language that can be used with all relational databases, like MySQL. This also means that there's a lot of support and information available. So, SQL can run on any computer once you have database software installed. SQL is also a portable language. Once you write your code, it can then be used on any hardware and any operating system or platform, wherever you need. So if you write SQL code in a desktop and then move it to a production server environment, it will run the same in both locations. Also, SQL is a comprehensive language that covers all areas of database management and administration. For example, it allows you to create databases, insert, update, and delete data, retrieve and share data among multiple users and manage database security. This is made possible through subsets of SQL, like DDL, or Data Definition Language, DML, also known as Data Manipulation Language, DQL, or Data Query Language, and DCL, also known as Data Control Language. And the final advantage of SQL 
is that it lets database users process large amounts of data quickly and efficiently. You now know that SQL is a simple, standard, portable, comprehensive and efficient language that can be used to communicate and work with relational databases. You're well on your way to mastering SQL. Well done. As you might already know, you can interact with the database using SQL. But just like with other coding languages, you need experience with SQL syntax and its subsets before you can make use of it. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn how to create a database using the Data Definition Language, or DDL subset of SQL. Utilize the Data Manipulation Language, also known as the DML subset, to populate and modify data in a database and read and query data within databases using the Data Query Language, or DQL subset of SQL. In order to demonstrate SQL syntax and its subsets, I'm going to show you the SQL commands that can be used to develop a database for a college. However, take note that the demonstration which follows will only briefly show each step in the process. You just need to develop a working familiarity with SQL for now. You'll explore the language and its subsets in much more detail later in this program. The first task is to create the database. To do this, I write a create statement using SQL's DDL subset. So, the syntax to create a database is create database, followed by the name of the database. I then place a semicolon at the end of the statement. Let's create a college database as an example using the syntax create database college. Once you've created a database, the next step is to create the tables. You can create tables using the create table syntax followed by the table name. Just repeat these same steps for each new table you want to add to your database. I can use this syntax to create a student table in my college database. This table will hold information on each student. To create the table, I just write create table student. Now I need to populate the table with data. This is where I can use the data manipulation language or DML subset of SQL. To add table data, I use the insert into syntax. This inserts rows of data into a given table. I just type insert into followed by the table name and then a list of required columns or fields within a pair of parentheses. Then I add the values keyword and specify in order the values for each of the fields. As an example, let's add data to the student table in our college database. I'll use the student table I created earlier and add student data to it by specifying values for each of the following columns. ID, first name, last name, and date of birth. And then populate the table with the required data. But what if I need to update or modify data? For example, Let's say I've input the wrong date of birth for a student. To change this data, I can use the update syntax, which is part of the DML subset of SQL. First, I add the update keyword, followed by the student table name. Then I use the set keyword, followed by columns and values I want to update, written as key value pairings. In this instance, it's the date of birth column and a new date of birth value. Finally, I add the where clause and a condition to filter the records I need. For example, to change the data for the student with the ID of 2, I can type where ID equal to 2. It's also possible to delete data from a table. Let's delete the table record for the student with the ID of 3 using the delete syntax. First, I type delete from, then the table name. This tells MySQL where the data must be deleted from. This is followed by the where clause in a condition such as ID equal to 3, which would remove all data on row three of the table. So I could instruct MySQL to remove the data of the student on row three. Once I run the statement, the student's data is removed from my table. You're now familiar with how to add, update, or delete data in a database. But how would you read data stored in your database tables? That's where SQL's DQL, or data query language, comes in. The main syntax of DQL is select. As its name says, it's used to select data from the database. A select statement is written using the select keyword, followed by the columns that hold the data you required. You then write the from keyword, followed by the name of the table you want to select data from. As an example, you could use the select statement to query the student table to find the name of the student with an ID of 1. You would just need to add the where keyword, followed by the student's ID. This would then return the name of John Murphy. You're now familiar with the basics of SQL syntax and its subsets. Don't worry if you're still trying to figure out these subsets. 
You'll explore each of them in more depth later in this specialization, and you'll also get an opportunity to try them for yourself. At this stage of the course, you're probably familiar with the basics of how databases store and interact with data. But how do they store all this data and present it in a logical way? In the form of tables. By the end of this video, you'll be able to outline what a database table is at a conceptual level and explain how data is structured in a database table. As you probably already know, the table is made up of rows and columns which hold data, and a table is stored in a database. In a database that holds multiple tables, these tables are known as relations, as they all relate to one another. In a more conceptual or logical sense, a table is also known as an entity. And in object-oriented databases, or OODB, an entity is an object that has attributes that are like columns or fields in a table. So in essence, a table, entity, and object all refer to the same concept. Within every table are columns, also sometimes called fields or attributes. Each column or field has a unique name and data type. For example, I have a table that contains data on employees in a company. The table organizes the data into columns such as ID and role. And each column can hold different types of data, like numeric or string. A set of columns or fields form a row. In relational database terminology, a row is known as a record. So a record is a combination of columns or fields that contain data. In my employee table, for example, each row is a single employee record. Let's return to columns for a moment. As you now know, every column has a data type. The data type of a column defines what type of value a column can hold, like integer, character, date and time, and so on. It's up to the developer to decide the data type for each column. And it's also a guideline for SQL around what data type to expect in each column and how to interact with the underlying data stored physically. However, data types can vary depending on the database system. For example, you might have different types for MySQL, SQL Server, or Access. Always refer to the documentation of the relevant database system to check what data types it supports. Generally, all database systems support string data types for storing characters and strings of characters, numeric data types to store exact or whole numbers and approximate numbers, date and time data types to store information on date and time, and binary data types to store images, files, and other information. Another important concept related to tables is domains. A domain is the set of legal values that can be assigned to an attribute. Basically, this means making sure that the values a field can hold are well-defined. For example, you can only place numbers in a numerical domain, and you can only place characters or strings of characters in a string domain. And each of these domains must include length, values, and other relevant rules that define its function. Each row or record in a table is also uniquely identified by what's known as a primary key. A column in the table that has unique values will become the primary key of the table. In the employee table, for example, the ID column is the primary key as each ID is unique. This is because the other columns could contain repeating values. For example, two employees may share the same name or role. It's also possible for a primary key to be a combination of columns if a single column alone doesn't possess unique values. You should now be familiar with what a database is and be able to explain how it is structured. You should also be able to explain key concepts such as columns, rows, and keys. Great work. At this stage of the course, you're probably familiar with the relational database model. But to fully understand how a relational database model works, you first need to understand how tables within a database are related. Essentially, relationships are established between tables with the use of keys. By the end of this video, you'll be able to identify the main keys used in tables in a relational database and explain the relationship between keys in a table. The relational database model is based on two main concepts, entities, which are defined as tables, and relations that connect to related tables. To realize how this model works, you need to understand the different key attributes that exist in the relational database. To demonstrate, let's use the example of a sports competition that uses three tables to keep track of the league, the league table, the teams table, and the points table. Each table has relevant columns, where each column represents an attribute of the table entity. 
The league table keeps track of each team's position in the league, their name and the state they represent. The team's table tracks the team name, the team captain and the team coach and the points table records the team's position in the league, the team's name and how many points the team has this season. Notice that the team's table includes team name, which also belongs to the league table. These attributes could be of a simple attribute type that can hold a single value. For example, in a table of staff members in a college, each staff name attribute has a single value in each row. Or they could also have a multi-value attribute that can have multiple values, like a list of subjects taught. However, multi-value attributes should be avoided in relational database design. You'll learn more about this concept later in the course. Let's use the example of the staff table to explore some examples of attribute keys. Let's begin with the key attribute. This is a value used to uniquely identify an individual record of data in a table. For example, in the staff table, the key attribute is staff ID. This attribute has unique value in each row of the table, so it's the perfect way to uniquely identify each record of data. In a relational database, there are a range of different types of key attributes. There's also the candidate key attribute. This is any attribute that contains a unique value in each row of the table. In the case of the staff table, both the staff ID and contact numbers are examples of candidate keys. Each has a new unique value in each row. The other columns can contain repeated information, so they're designated as non-key attributes. A composite key is a key that is composed of two or more attributes to form a unique value in each new row. In the staff table, an example of a composite key is a combination of the staff name and staff title, assuming that there isn't another instance of the same combination elsewhere in the table. A composite key is usually considered when a single attribute key can't be identified. A relational database must also contain a primary key, which you should already be familiar with. In the staff table, the staff ID is the primary key. An alternate key, also known as the secondary key, is a candidate key that was not selected to be the primary key. Just like a primary key, it's a column that contains a unique value in each field. For the staff table, the contact number is the secondary key on each row. And finally, there's a the foreign key. The foreign key is an attribute in a table that references a unique key in another table. Typically, a foreign key references the primary key of another table. For example, the staff ID might also be a foreign key in one or more tables within the college database. The relationship between primary and foreign keys will be discussed in more detail at a later point in this course. You're now familiar with the different types of keys in a relational database. You've reached the end of this module and introduction to databases. In this module, you've discovered the basics of databases and data, received an intro to SQL, or structured query language, and explored the basic structure of a database. It's now time to recap the key points and concepts you learned and skills that you gained. You began the module with an introduction to databases and data. Following the completion of this first lesson, you can now provide an overview of what a database is at a conceptual level, outline real-world examples of database usage, and explain how data is organized within a database. You can now also explain the importance of related data within a database, identify an instance of related data within a database, and provide an overview of new trends in database applications. You're also able to identify different types of databases and provide a high-level overview of how databases have evolved. Following your exploration of databases and data, you are then introduced to SQL. This lesson focused on the basics of SQL, or structured query language. During this lesson, you learned how to outline the purposes of SQL and demonstrate an understanding of the role of SQL in databases. You can also identify the advantages of SQL, such as its low entry level, its wide range of applications, and its portability across operating systems. And you can also explain how these advantages will assist you when working with databases. And you're also able to provide a high level overview of how SQL, DDL, DML, and DQL syntax is used, and identify the main SQL commands used in databases. In the final lesson of this module, you explored basic database structure. Now that you've reached the end of this lesson, you can explain the concept of a database table and outline what it's used for, and identify the key components of a database table, such as columns, rows, data types, and keys. You're now familiar with the basics of databases. You can explain how they store data, 
identify methods for interacting with databases through SQL, and outline the basic structure of a database. That's a great start to your database journey. Well done. You probably know that database tables store data in the forms of columns and rows. But how do you make sure that every column accepts the correct type of data? For instance, that your cost column stores values in decimal, or your product quantity column accepts positive numbers. This is exactly what data types do. With data types, you can determine what kind of data is accepted by each field in your table. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn how to explain the numeric data type in a database and differentiate between integer and decimal data types. Before you begin exploring numeric data types, let's take a moment to explore the concept of data types. When you create a table in a database, you need to define column names and the data type of the content that will reside in those columns. Data type tells a database management system, such as MySQL, how to interpret the value of the column. Data types maintain data in the right format and make sure the value of each column is as expected. The most used data types are numeric, string, and date and time data types. Let's take the example of a table from the database of an online store. This table collects information on customers in the form of columns called customer name, order date, product quantity, and total price. Each of these columns must store data in the form of a suitable data type. The customer name column can use string data. Order date can use a date type and product quantity and total price columns are best suited to numeric data. The focus of this video is a numeric data type. Numeric data types is the generic term used for all specific data types that let a column store data as numbers in the database. The two most common numeric data types used in databases are the integer data type, used for a whole number value, and the decimal data type, used for a number with a fraction value. To return to our earlier table example, the product quantity column is defined as an integer data type. This is because it holds whole numbers only. Fractional numbers can be inserted, but they'll always be automatically rounded up or down to the nearest whole number in the database. And the total price column is a decimal type. This is because it holds fractional numbers. For example, an item that costs $80.90 is a fractional value. 80 is a whole number and 90 is a decimal. Whole numbers can also be inserted. The database will add a decimal point along with a fractional value of zero. In most database management systems, you'll find different types of integer and decimal data types. Each type is intended to store a minimum and a maximum number value. For example, in MySQL database management system TinyIntegr, or TinyInt, is used for a very small integer number value where the maximum possible value that can be inserted is 255. While integer or int can be used to store a very big number, the maximum value that it can store is over 4 billion. These data types can also accept negative and positive values. In some database management systems, you can also force columns to accept positive numbers. This increases the maximum value they can store. You should now be able to explain the numeric data type in a database, and you should also be capable of differentiating between integer and decimal data types. Great work. You probably already know that when you create a table in a database, you must define the column names and the data type of the content that will reside in those columns. You can use a string data type to define a column's data type, particularly in instances when it accepts both numeric and text characters. In this video, you'll explore the string data type, and by the end of the video, you'll be able to explain the string data type in a database and differentiate between char and varchar data types. When you create a table in a database, it is important for data integrity to ensure that only valid values are inserted in your table. For example, you should use string data type when you intend to store data that contains a mix of character types. So if you define a column as a string, then any type of text can be inserted. This includes alphabet characters, numeric characters, and special characters. Let's explore an example to find out more about how string data types work. Let's take the example of a student table from a college database. This table stores student login information for the college's online portal. It stores this information under the following four columns, student name, username, password, and email address. The student name column contains only alphabet characters. The username column contains alphanumeric characters, and the password and email column contains a mix of character types. String data type is a generic term used for different string data types in the database. 
the most used string data types are char, which stands for character. This data type is used to hold characters of a fixed length, and varchar stands for variable character. This holds characters of a variable length. Let's explore these string data types further. Char means that the given length of the characters is predetermined. It can't be changed after declaration. Column attributes are defined as char followed by a character length in parentheses. For example, char 50 means that a column only permits 50 characters of space in each field. Char is the best option if you have a predefined size of character that you want to maintain. In the student table, you can set a maximum length of 50 characters for the username column in SQL with char 50. For example, the table contains the records for a student with the username mark123, which is a total of seven characters. However, because the column is defined as char 50, this username occupies a length of 50 characters within a space. The varchar data type works in a similar way to char. However, it is a variable length. This means that the length can be changed, it's not fixed. Varchar is often used when you're not sure how many characters might be inserted in the column field. So you can type varchar 50 in SQL to allow for any input up to a maximum of 50 characters. In the student table example, the student name column would most likely contain names of varying length. So you could define the student name column as varchar 50 in SQL. This means that the name of each student only occupies as much space as there are characters in their name. For example, Mark Simpson occupies far less than 50 characters, but this field could hold a name up to the value of 50 characters if required. Finally, let's briefly explore some more commonly used examples of string data types. Tiny text is used to define columns that require less than 255 characters, like short paragraphs. Text is used to define columns of less than 65,000 characters, like an article. Medium text defines columns of 16.7 million characters, for example, the text of a book. And the long text data type stores up to four gigabytes of text data. You should now be able to explain the string data type as used in a database, and you should also be capable of differentiating between string data types, including char and varchar. Great work. To ensure the accuracy and reliability of the data in your database, you must limit the type of data that can go into your database table. In this video, you'll learn how to describe the purpose of constraints in a database and identify default constraints to set default values in a table. Database constraints are used to limit the type of data that can be stored in a table. This ensures that all data inserted into the table is accurate and reliable. If the database detects a violation between the constraint and the data operations, then it aborts these operations. An example of a violation might be an attempt to insert or upload invalid data to a table. The database realizes that the data is invalid and rejects it. Constraints can be column level, where the rule applies to a specific column. They can also be applied at table level. For example, I could use the foreign key constraint to prevent actions that would destroy links between tables. I'll demonstrate this in more detail in a later lesson. Two of the most used database constraints include not null, a method of preventing empty value fields, and default, a method of assigning default values. For now, let's begin our exploration of default values with the not null constraint. The not null SQL constraint is used to ensure the data fields are always completed and never left blank. Let's explore this concept using the example of a table from an online store that records the IDs and names of customers. The table records this data in its customer ID and customer name columns. These columns must always contain data. If there's no data or values inserted into either of these columns, then the creation of a new customer record is aborted. The not null default value is implemented using a SQL statement. A typical not null SQL statement begins with the creation of a basic table in the database. I can write a create table clause, followed by customer to define the table name, followed by a pair of parentheses. Within the parentheses, I add two columns, customer ID, and customer name. I also define each column with relevant data types, int for customer ID as it stores numeric values, and varchar for customer name as it stores string values. Finally, I also declare a not null constraint for each column. This makes sure that neither column will accept null values. Now any operation that attempts to place a null value in these columns will fail, like inserting or updating data. 
Next, let's look at how the default constraint works in a table. The default constraint sets a default value for a column if no value is specified. This means that if no data is entered for a specific field within a column, then the table will automatically insert a default value instead. To gain a better understanding of default values, let's look at a table that holds player records for a football club's database. The table is called player table and contains two columns. The first is player name and lists the names of each player in the team. And the second column is city and lists which city each player is from. Most of the players in this club are from Barcelona. So I can specify a default value of the city column as Barcelona. This means that I don't have to enter Barcelona repeatedly into the city field for each new player. If no value is entered in the table, then each field is automatically filled with the default value of Barcelona. Let's find out how the default command is incorporated into a SQL statement. First, I use the create table commands to create a table and then call it player. Then within a pair of parentheses, I input the column names, assign a string data type for each and assign a default value of not null for the name column. Finally, I add the default keyword statement followed by the default value Barcelona for the city column. Now when I add data into the table for a new player, I don't need to type in Barcelona for players who are from the city. Instead, it will be inserted automatically. You should now be familiar with the importance of using database constraints. You should also be able to explain database constraints as a method of enforcing rules on a column or table level. Good work. You've just been hired by an online bookstore to build and maintain databases that can store information on millions of books and customers. But how do you even begin to create and alter databases that store constantly expanding information or process millions of orders from all over the world? The answer to these questions lies in SQL create and read commands. In this video, you'll learn how to create a database using SQL syntax. And you'll also discover how to drop or delete a database. However, before you create a database, you first need a clear idea of its purpose. For example, if you're building a database for an online bookshop, then your database needs to record data like book titles, authors, customers, and sales. The data on these topics must be stored and organized in relevant tables in a database. Users can then access, retrieve, and update the data as needed. So how can you create a database using SQL syntax? To create a database, just type the create and database keywords. These keywords are then followed by the name of your database. But what about removing or dropping a database? To drop a database, just type the keywords drop and database. Then follow these keywords with the name of the database you want to remove. Let's look at these keywords in action. To create a database, I need to use SQL syntax. To demonstrate, let's create a second bookstore database using SQL syntax. First, I type the keywords create and database, followed by the name of my new database. In this case, the database is called bookstore2 underscore db. I always use a meaningful and relevant name when creating a new database. This helps to make it easier to document my work. Database names must also be unique and can only have a maximum of 63 characters. If my database name doesn't meet these requirements, then an error message will appear. Finally, I add a semicolon to the end of the statement. Then I run the statement. And the new database bookstore underscore db2 appears on the left-hand sidebar. So, I've created a second database. I can also remove databases using SQL statements. First, I select a SQL tab. Then I input my query in the code box that appears. I type the keywords drop and database followed by the name of the database I want to delete. In this case, it's bookstore underscore db. Now I run the query. Then SQL deletes the database. In this video, you learned how to create and delete databases using SQL syntax. Great work. Building a database involves working with substantial amounts of data. But how do you organize your data so that you can find exactly what you need and make sense of it? With SQL, you can create a table within your database to hold and organize your data. In this video, you'll learn how to create tables in a database management system using SQL syntax. Let's begin with a look at the SQL create table statement syntax. I begin the statement with the keywords create table, 
to let SQL know that I want to create a new table. I then add the name of the table I want to create. Finally, I add a pair of parentheses. Within these parentheses, I type the name of each column that must be included within the table, followed by its respective data type. Now that you're familiar with the syntax, let's look at it in action. Be aware that before you can create tables, you must already have a database on the server. In other words, you can't build tables if there's no database to create them in. So let's assume that I already have a database ready to work with. In this example, I'll create a customer table in the bookstore database to store customer data, like names and phone numbers. First, I write a SQL statement that contains the create table commands followed by the name of the table, in this case, customers. Then I add an open parenthesis. It's within this parenthesis that I need to create my own columns. So, I write the name of my first column, which is customer name. This is followed by the data type varchar. This data type means that the column can hold data of any type. I then add a numeric value within a pair of parentheses. Then I add a comma and write the name of the second column, which is phone number. I add int as the data type so that only whole numbers can be stored. Then I add a closing parenthesis and a semicolon. Finally, I execute the statement. The customers table is now stored in the database. In this video, you learned how to create tables in a database using SQL syntax. Well done. At this stage, you're probably familiar with creating tables in databases, but no table is ever static. Database developers are always restructuring tables. Sometimes they need to add new columns, delete old ones, or edit the data they contain. You can complete many of these basic restructuring actions using SQL syntax. In this video, you'll learn how to alter a database table by adding and removing columns, and modify the attributes of a database table. Let's start by exploring the SQL alter statement syntax. The first part of an alter statement is the alter and table keywords. These keywords inform the database that there is a table whose contents must be altered. This is followed by the name of the table to be altered. I then include the add keyword. This keyword tells SQL that there's one or more items to be added to the table. There are other keywords I could include here instead, but for the purposes of this example, I'll work with add. Finally, I insert a pair of parentheses. Within these parentheses, I declare the name of a new column to be added to the table, along with this data type. Now that you're familiar with the alter table statement, let's explore an example of this statement in action. However, before you can begin altering tables, you must already have a database on the server. So as always, make sure that you know how to create databases before proceeding, and ensure that you already have a table in your database with data that you can alter. In my example, I have a student's table located within the database called college. My student's table holds information on their IDs, names, and emails of each student in the college. I can demonstrate the alter statement by adding, deleting, and modifying columns in this table. My first task is to add three new columns to the table, age, nationality, and country. To add these columns using SQL syntax, I first type the alter table command, followed by the name of the table, students. Next, I use the add command to let the database know that I want to add new columns to the table. Then I input a pair of parentheses that contain the columns I want to add, along with the type of data they'll hold. These columns are an age column, which holds data in integer format, a country column with varchar as the data type, and nationality and country columns that hold varchar or string data. I also add a character limit of 50 to the country columns fields and a limit of 255 to the nationality columns fields. Then I execute this statement. I now have two new columns in students table in the college database. Country and nationality are very similar columns and in most cases will probably hold the same type of information. So I can write a SQL statement to remove the nationality column. Just like the last example, I start my statement with alter table students table. Next, I type the drop column command followed by nationality. This command instructs SQL to delete or drop this column from the table. Then I run the statement. A notification message appears requesting confirmation of deletion. I press OK to confirm. The nationality column has now been dropped. Now it's time to alter the structure of the table. The country column has a limit of 50 characters just as I said it originally. And now I'm going to change it so that it holds 100 characters instead, 
using the alter table command. I start with the syntax alter table followed by students table. Then I type the modify command, the country column name and the varchar data type. And finally, I add a pair of parentheses containing my new value of 100. I then execute the query. My country columns limit has now been updated to 100 characters. In this video, you learn how to alter and modify tables in a database using SQL syntax. Well done. When working with databases, you'll often have to add new rows and columns to existing tables or even create new tables from scratch. For example, if you run a college database, you'll have to add new rows for every new student. With SQL, you can perform these tasks quickly using the insert statement. By the end of this video, you'll be able to identify and understand insert SQL syntax and insert data into tables with the use of the insert into clause. Let's begin with an exploration of the insert into syntax. To write an insert statement, first write an insert into clause, then specify the table name followed by a list of columns contained within a pair of parentheses and separated by commas. Then use the values keyword and write a list of values within a pair of parentheses. It's important to remember that each value corresponds to a specific column and so should reflect the same data type and order. You can also add multiple rows into a table at the same time. First, write the insert into clause in table, just like before. Then use the values keyword and add multiple rows of values. Just make sure that each new row is separated from a previous one by a comma. Now let's explore some examples of an insert statement. In this example, I'll use a table called players from a sports club database. And I want to insert new player data into this table. First, I write the insert into command, followed by the name of the table. In this case, it's players. Then I add the column names within a pair of parentheses. These columns must contain the basic information that the club requires about each player. So I'll name the columns ID, name, age, and start date. Next, I insert the values keyword and then add the values I want to assign to each column within a pair of parentheses. I start adding the data for a new player named Yuval, age 25, with an ID of 1 and a start date of 2020 10 15. It's important to use the correct format of year, month, and day when entering dates in a table. Otherwise, an error message will appear. I can also use the current date function followed by a pair of empty parentheses next to my values just like I've done for the new player Yuval. Now that I've scripted all values for Yuval, note that each value relates to a specific column. Number one corresponds to the player ID column, Yuval to player name, 25 to player age, and the date to start date. This means that the order in which I type my values within the parentheses is very important. Otherwise, I might accidentally store these values in the wrong columns. It's also important to note that all non-numeric values are placed within quotation marks just like Yuval and the date value in the statement. Finally, I execute the statement. The output now shows one row of data for Yuval, just as my code instructed. But what if I wanted to insert multiple records of data into the table? Let's say that two new players have joined the team. The first player is Mark, age 27, with an ID of two and a start date of 2020, 10, 12. And the second player is Carl, age 26, with an ID of three, and a start date of 2020, 10, 7. Both Mark and Carl must be inserted into the database. As you learned earlier, this is a very straightforward task. First, I write the insert into command. Then I write the table name, players. Next, I type the ID, name, age, and start date columns within a pair of parentheses. Then I write the values keyword and insert two records of data. These data records are contained within two pairs of parentheses separated by a comma one for Mark and another for Carl. Finally, I run or execute the statement. I then check my output, which shows that all three players are now in the table. So far, I've explored how to add data to the table, but it's also possible to show existing data in the player table by executing the following SQL query. First, I type the select clause, followed by an asterisk. This asterisk tells SQL to return all columns within the table. Then I type the from keyword, and the name of the table. I execute the statement and the output shows all data available from the player table. You can now identify and make sense of the insert syntax as well as insert new data into tables with the insert into clause. 
Good work. There will often be times that you'll need to query data from a table in your database. For example, you might need to retrieve a list of names from a table or return a set of results from a math calculation. You can perform these actions using the select statement. And that's what I'll demonstrate now. So over the next few minutes, you'll learn how to utilize the SQL select statement to query data from a table in a database and perform other SQL select tasks, such as math calculations, date and time queries, and concatenation functions. To get started, let's explore the syntax of a SQL statement. A basic SQL select statement is written as the select keyword, the name of the column that contains the data you need to query, then the from keyword, and finally, the name of the table you want to query. For example, if I want to query data about the names of players from a soccer club database, I could use the following syntax, the select keyword, the player name column, and the from keyword, and finally, the name of the table, which is player table. And although it's not mandatory, a semicolon is often added to mark the end of a SQL statement. Let's take a closer look at how the statement works. As an example, I'll extract information from a table called players held in a soccer club database. This table records details about players in a soccer club, like ID, name, age, and skill level. I can use the SQL select statement on this table to obtain information on the club's players. The expected outcome of this select query is that it will return a result set that displays all player names held in the table. I can write the statement as select name from players. The select command is used to retrieve data. Name is the column that stores the player's name in the database. From is a keyword that identifies the source table, and players is the table name. I then run the statement. The query returns a table column that lists the player's names from the player's table, with each name on its own row. So in the example you just explored, I retrieve data from one column in a table. But what if I wanted to retrieve data from multiple columns? Maybe I need to retrieve the name and skill level of each player. I can obtain this information using a SQL select statement written as select name level from players. I add a comma between name and level so that SQL understands they are two separate columns. I run the query and it returns the data from the name and level columns in the players table. I could also use a select statement to retrieve all data from all columns in the players table. There are two methods I could use to achieve this. The first method is to list all column names in a standard select statement as follows. Select ID, name, age, level, from, players. Once again, each column is separated by a comma. I then run the query and get all the requested information in table format. The second method is to use an asterisk as shorthand. So instead of typing out all column names, I just type select asterisk from players. Then I run the query. It returns all the information available in all table columns, just like in the first method. You're now familiar with how to use the select statement in MySQL. So, next time you need to query data in your database, you've now got different methods to choose from. When working with tables, there might be instances where you need to retrieve information from one or more tables in order to populate columns in another table. You can complete these actions using the insert into select statement. Over the next few minutes, you'll explore the SQL syntax for these actions, and by the end of this video, you'll know how to identify and understand insert into syntax and insert data from a source table into a target table using the insert into clause. First, let's find out more about the insert into select statement. Essentially, the insert into select statement is used to query data from a column within a source table and place the results of that query in the column within a target table. For example, you could use an insert into select statement to query data in column C in the source table and place the results of that query in column B of the target table. So what does the insert into select statement syntax look like? Here's an example. First type an insert into clause, followed by the name of the target table and the name of the column you want to insert data into. Then type the select keyword with the name of the column you want to extract data from. And finally, type a from keyword and the name of the source table that holds that column or source data. To find out more about how this syntax works, let's explore an example of insert into select. To demonstrate the statement, 
I use tables from a soccer club database that contain important data about the club. However, before I begin querying this data, let's quickly review these tables. In this database, I have a table called players that holds the records of four different players in the team. I also have a table called country that holds information about the countries that these players are from. But right now, the country table is missing the names of the countries. In other words, it has no data. I can perform a SQL query using the insert into select statement to populate this missing data. Do you remember the example of the source and target tables from earlier in this video? In this instance, the player table is the source table that I need to query, and the country table is the target table in which SQL places the results from my query. So to query data from my source table and populate my target table with it, I write an insert into select statement. Note that for the purposes of this demonstration, I have organized the player data in the player table in the same order in which it must appear within the country table. So to perform this task, I first click on the SQL tab to open the code editor. Then I write an insert into command, followed by the name of my target table, which is country table. I then state the name of the column that the data from my query must be inserted into within a pair of parentheses. In this instance, the column is called country name. Next, I type the select keyword and state what column I want to query within the source table, which is country. Finally, I type the from keyword and state the name of the source table I want to query the data from, which is player table. I add a semicolon to the end of my query, then run it. Now I select country table, my target table from the database, and check that the country name column has been populated with the correct data. You now know how to query tables using the insert select statement. Well done. I recently created a database table for a college called student table. It contains the following pieces of data on each student in the college. ID, first name, last name, home address, college address, contact number, and department. Let's use the update syntax to update the home address and contact number of the student assigned the ID of three in the table. So I click the SQL tab in PHP my admin. Now I use the update clause followed by the name of the table that I want to update, which is student table. Then I add the set clause followed by the names of the columns to be updated, which are home address and contact number. Next to the name of each column, I add an equal to symbol and place the new values to be inserted into the table in single quotation marks. I also make sure to separate these column value pairings with a comma. Finally, I add the where clause to identify the exact record I want to update. This record has a student ID column field that was assigned the value of three. So I write where ID equals three. Now that I've completed the syntax, I can select go. I then receive a message confirming that the change has been made. And when I check the table, it displays the updated values for the assigned columns alongside student three. So that's how you update the information for one student. However, the update syntax can also be used to update the information for multiple students at once. Let's suppose that the college's engineering department has moved their classes to a new location on campus called the Harper Building. And I need to update the department's address on the table for all engineering students. I can perform this task using the update SQL syntax. The syntax is very similar to the previous example. First, I use the update clause followed by the name of the table. Then I add the set clause and state that I want to update the values within the college address column to Harper Building. So I type this as set college address equals Harper Building. Next, I type the where clause and state that I want this update to occur within the college address column for all students assigned the value of engineering in the department column. I then click go to run the statement. Now I just check that the table has updated the college address of the engineering department 
to Harper Building. I could also use the update statement to update multiple field values in multiple records. For example, I can return to the original SQL statement and add a new column value pairing to the set clause. If I want to update the home address column, I add a comma and write home address equals the new address information within quotes. Make sure to separate out the column value pairings with a comma. In this example, I'm updating two columns with one update statement. In this example, I'll demonstrate how to delete a single record from a table in a database. I'm using the student table from a college database and deleting the record of a student with the last name of Miller. I go to the SQL tab in phpMyAdmin, and I write a delete statement beginning with the keywords delete from. Then I specify the table name as student table. I add a where clause and the condition to delete the data I want. I need the database to scan the list of students and identify the last name or value of Miller and then delete that record from the table. So I type where followed by last name equal to Miller. I then run this statement by pressing the go button. I get a confirmation that the record Miller has been deleted from the database. I can then access the student table on the left panel to ensure that the record or instance of Miller has been removed. Let's explore another example, this time by deleting multiple records from the student table. Now I want to delete the records for the two students within the engineering department. The beginning of the statement is the same as the previous example. I begin with the delete and from keywords followed by the name of the table I'm working with, which is student table. The where clause is the key difference in this example. I type where followed by department equal to engineering. This instructs SQL to identify all records that have a value of engineering within the department column and remove those rows from the table. But I need to be careful. If I don't correctly specify the WHERE clause, then all the records in the table will be deleted. So now that I've completed my statement, I select GO to run it. I then check the table by clicking it on the left panel and confirm that the records for the two engineering students have been deleted from the table. Finally, let's quickly explore how to delete all records from a table. In this task, the syntax remains largely the same as in the previous examples. The key difference is that I remove the WHERE clause so that now my syntax just states delete from student table. I remove the WHERE clause so that now my syntax just states delete from student table. In other words, I'm instructing the database to remove all records from the student table. Then I click go and confirm the deletion. Once the deletion has been confirmed, I check the student table, which is now empty. I now know that all records have been deleted. You've reached the end of this module in CRUD operations. In this module, you've discovered how to create, read, update, and delete data within a database. You've also examined different SQL data types like numeric, string, and default values. It's now time to recap the key topics you learned and skills that you gained. You began the module with an introduction to SQL data types. Following the completion of this first lesson, you can now identify and understand the numeric data type so that you can store data as numbers in a database. Utilize numerical data types in a database and differentiate between integer and decimal data types so that you can store numerical values of different sizes, including positive and negative ones. Following your exploration of numerical data types, you then moved on to investigate string data types. During your investigation, you learned how to identify and understand string data types in a database demonstrate how to use string data types, and outline the key differences between char 
and varchar data types. The final concept that you learned about in this lesson was default values. Now that you've completed the lesson on default values, you're able to demonstrate an understanding of the concept of constraints in a database with SQL syntax and identify the default constraint to set default values in a table. As part of this lesson, you also undertook a series of exercises focused on SQL data types. Having successfully completed these exercises, you can now demonstrate your ability to work with numeric data types, string data types, and default values, and outline how to select the correct data type for your data. Once you completed your study of SQL data types, you then moved on to explore the topic of creating and reading data in a database. Now that you've completed this lesson, you're able to create a database and create tables, alter database tables, and drop a database. You can also demonstrate how to create a table in a database with SQL syntax, alter table structure using the SQL alter table statement, and insert or add data into a table with SQL insert statement. In addition to these new skills, you also learned how to retrieve data from tables with the SQL select statement and insert query data from one or more tables into another target table using the insert into select statement. You also had an opportunity to demonstrate these new skills through a series of exercises. In these exercises, you proved your ability to create a database and a table and then populate the table with data and manage data within your tables using the select and insert into select statements. You then moved on to the final lesson in which you explored how to update and delete data. Having completed this lesson, you can now demonstrate knowledge of the SQL update statement and utilize the update statement to update both single and multiple field values of a record. Finally, you also proved your abilities with these new skills by completing an exercise in which you deleted records from a table. You're now familiar with the create, read, update and delete operations. You're also skilled in the use of SQL data types. Great work. You're making good progress on your journey towards becoming a database engineer. Imagine a corporate database with information about hundreds of employees. How can you calculate important things such as salary increases or calculate changes to allowances for all the employees accurately and efficiently? With SQL, you can use arithmetic operators to make these adjustments. By the end of this video, you'll understand and be able to describe SQL arithmetic operators and know how to use these arithmetic operators to perform functions in SQL. But first, what exactly are operators in SQL? Operators are specific words or characters that help you to perform different activities in a database. They're like conjunctions or connection words you would use to compose a sentence or the operation keys used to perform a sum in a calculator. So, why do you need to know about operators? Well, when handling data in a database, at some point you'll need to query and manipulate data for different purposes. SQL operators allow you to manipulate data as necessary to perform these different activities in the database. For example, you can use an arithmetic operation to calculate how many leave days an employee has left, or you can compare whether employees are meeting company targets. There are various types of operators in SQL, each with different functions. Let's explore a few examples of arithmetic operators. Arithmetic operators are commonly used in computer languages to perform a calculation and return a result. Much like common arithmetic operators in mathematics, you can use arithmetic operators in SQL to carry out mathematical operations in a database. The SQL arithmetic operators and their symbols are plus for addition, minus for subtraction, an asterisk for multiplication, forward slash for division, and percentage for modulus, which provides the remainder value of a division calculation. So how do SQL arithmetic operations work? When performing a calculation, an operator takes two operands and returns a result. For example, an addition operator can take five as both of its operands and return 10 as its result. In SQL, you can apply the same concept by using the select command for the various operations. Let's illustrate this concept using the addition operator. You can use the select command followed by one operand, the addition operator, and the second operand, and just like the previous example, SQL calculates the two operands and produces the result. You can repeat the SQL syntax with the other arithmetic operators. With a subtraction operator, the output result is zero. A multiplication operator returns a result of 25. The division operator calculates the result as one. And with a modulus operator, the result is zero, as five divided by five equals one with no remainder. Now, let's take a closer look 
and how to use these arithmetic operators in SQL. I'll demonstrate how to use arithmetic operators in SQL to perform basic mathematical operations. Let's try an addition operation to add two numbers. First, I use the SELECT command and then type the numbers 10 and 15 separated by a plus operator followed by a semicolon. Although the semicolon is optional in this case, I prefer to still use it as it represents the end of a SQL statement. The SELECT command retrieves the value which is a sum of 10 plus 15 and displays it on screen. Let's run this query. The query produces the result of the example addition operation, which is 25. Just as I performed this addition operation, I can do the same with subtraction, multiplication, division, and modulus operators. I can use the minus sign for subtraction, an asterisk star for multiplication, forward slash for division, and a percentage sign for modulus. For example, I can type select 100 modulus 10. This divides 100 by 10 and gives me the remainder of the division operation. In this case, the remainder is zero, as 100 divided by 10 equals 10 with no remainder. So, I run the query and the remainder of zero is displayed. And that's how you can use the operator symbols for different basic operations in SQL. You've learned about SQL arithmetic operators and how to perform basic operations with them in SQL. You're now ready to learn how to apply these arithmetic operators in more practical ways. Awesome work. So far, you have learned how to use SQL arithmetic operators to perform basic functions. In this video, you'll take one step further by learning how to use these arithmetic operators in practice when working with a database. Let's explore the use of arithmetic operators using the example of a corporate table of employee data. It's populated with the following information about each employee, ID, name, and salary. I'm going to demonstrate how to use each of the arithmetic operators in SQL to perform various functions with this practical data and retrieve the desired results. In this first example, let's say that an employer wants to give each employee on their team a $500 bonus. But first, they'd like to see what each employee's salary looks like after adding the $500. I can type select salary plus 500 from employee to add the $500 bonus to each employee's salary. This select command works by retrieving the salary of each employee from the employee table and then adding $500 to each value. Let's execute the query by clicking the go button. The result is that each employee's salary has increased by 500. You can create other statements that use the SELECT command in a similar way. For example, let's say the employer wants to deduct $500 from the salary of each employee. To do this, I type the SQL query statement, SELECT SALARY MINUS 500 from employee. Again, I'm using the SELECT command to retrieve the salary value of each employee record stored in the employee table. This time, I use the subtraction sign, minus, to subtract $500 from the salary of each employee. Now I click the Go button, and the database returns a table that shows the output result of salaries after the deductions. In the next example, Let's imagine a scenario where the employer would like to increase the employee's salaries by doubling their current annual salary. To do this, I use the SELECT command to perform the same function as discussed previously. I then use the multiplication sign, an asterisk symbol, to multiply the salary value of each employee by 2. So the SQL statement now reads, select salary asterisk 2 from employee. I can now click the Go button to generate an output of the results of salaries from multiplying the values by 2. Now let's suppose the employer needs to determine the monthly salary of each employee. I can perform this task using an SQL query statement as I have done in the previous scenarios. However, this time I'll divide the annual salary by 12 months. To determine the monthly salary, my statement reads as follow. Select salary 
forward slash 12 from employee. The select command retrieves the salary value for each employee stored in the employee table. Then division sign, or the forward slash, divides the annual salary value by 12. So I click the Go button to generate the output result. The employer can now use this output result to determine what each employee's monthly salary is. In our final example, the employer would like to know if the ID of each employee is an even or odd number. I can use the modulus operator to complete this task. I just need to type the following statement. Select ID modulus 2 from employee. I then click Go to execute the statement. This divides each employee ID by 2 and returns the remainder of the division operation. In this case, a remainder of 0 denotes an even ID, as all even numbers are divisible by 2, meaning there will be no remainder. The result shows that there are 3 odd IDs and 2 even IDs. You should now know how to make use of the SQL arithmetic operators in a database. You're making great progress. Keep it up. Imagine you're running a database for a soccer club. As a database engineer, there's a lot of work required to manage this database. For example, you might need to categorize players into groups according to their ages. How can you complete this kind of task? You can use SQL comparison operators. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn how to explain the concept of SQL comparison operators and utilize SQL comparison operators in a database. So, what are SQL comparison operators? Comparison operators are used to compare two values or expressions where the outcome result can be either true or false. They can be used to filter data and to include and exclude data. So how are these operators used in SQL? SQL uses common mathematical comparison operators by means of the symbols equal to, less than, and greater than. It also uses less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, and not equal to. Now let's explore how to use these comparison operators and relevant symbols in a practical way using a database. To demonstrate the use of SQL comparison operators, I'll use the example of an employee table from a company database. This table includes information on each employee's ID, name, and salary. Now, let's assume the employer wants to extract relevant data from the employee table about the employee's salaries for different purposes. Each instance of data extraction will require a different comparison operator. So, in the first example, the employer wants to identify all employees receiving a salary equal to $18,000 per year. I can identify these employees using the equal to operator. First, I click the SQL tab in the main menu. Then I write select, asterisk, from, employee, where, salary equal to symbol, 18,000. Let's break the SQL statement down. The select command is used to retrieve data. The asterisk star denotes that I am selecting data from all columns. The from keyword and the table name specify where the data will come from, and then I define the condition using the where clause. In this case, the condition uses the equal to symbol to check if the salary value in each record of the table is equal to $18,000. If the result is true, then the data is retrieved. So, I run the query and generate an output. The output result of this query is that the employees Carl and John earn $18,000 per year. You can apply the other comparison operators in a similar way to perform different functions. Let's take another example to find out more. In this next example, the employer needs to know which employees are receiving a salary that is less than $24,000 per year. This task requires a different operator. To find this information, I can write select asterisk from employee where, salary, less than symbol, 24,000. This SQL statement utilizes the less than symbol to check whether the value stored in each field of the salary column is less than $24,000. Once again, I select the Go button to execute the query and generate an output. 
The output of this query is that the employees Carl and John earn less than $24,000. Let's take another example where the employer needs to determine which employees receive a salary that is less than or equal to $24,000 per year. In this case, I need to write the following query. Select asterisk from employee where salary less than or equal to symbol 24,000. The only thing in this statement that has changed from the previous example is the operator symbol. This less than or equal to symbol tells the SQL statement to check whether the value stored in each field of the salary column is less than or equal to $24,000. I click the go button to execute the query. The output results show that there are four employees who earn less than or equal to $24,000 per year. What if the employer wants to know which employees receive a salary that is greater than or equal to $24,000 per year? To generate these results, I can use the greater than or equal to operator in my SQL statement. So I write the following SQL query. Select asterisk from employee where salary greater than or equal to symbol 24,000. This time, the greater than or equal to symbol is used to check whether the value stored in each field of the salary column is greater than or equal to $24,000. I click go to execute the query and the output shows that there are three employees who earn $24,000 or more per year. The final comparison operator available in SQL is the not equal to operator. In this final example, the employer wants to know which employees receive a salary that is not equal to $24,000 per year. I can determine this using the following SQL code. Select asterisk from employee where salary. Then I type less than and the greater than symbols to denote the not equal to operation. And then I type 24,000. As with the previous operators, the SQL statement utilizes the operator to check the values stored in each field of the salary column. In this case, it checks for values that do not equate to $24,000. The output results of this query show that there are three employees whose salaries are not equal to $24,000 per year. You should now be able to describe comparison operators and use them in a database in SQL. Congratulations on building another important database skill. There are several clauses available in SQL for sorting and filtering data in a table. One of the most useful of these is the order by clause. With this clause, you can reorder the data in a table by one or more columns. For example, in a table that holds data on students in a college, you could sort the data by date of birth. The table would then present all students in the order of oldest to youngest. By the end of this video, you'll be able to demonstrate the purpose of the order by clause for sorting data, explain the different forms in which the order by clause can be used to sort data, and describe how the ascending and descending keywords behave when used on sort columns. Let's begin with an exploration of the purpose of the order clause. The order by clause is an optional clause that can be added to a select statement. Its purpose is to help sort data in either ascending or descending order. For example, you can sort a list of student names in an alphabetical order from A to Z or vice versa. To get a better understanding of how the order by clause works, let's explore the syntax. In its most basic form, the syntax of the order by clause is as follows. It begins with a select statement, then a list of the columns to be sorted with each one separated by a comma. Next is a from keyword, followed by the name of the table to be sorted. Finally, the order by clause is added, followed by the name of the column to be sorted. At the end of the column name, state how you want the data to be sorted. You can do this by specifying ASC for ascending order, or DESC for descending. But the order by clause doesn't limit you to just the one column. You can also use this syntax to order the data from multiple columns. The syntax for sorting multiple columns is very similar to that used for a single column. The key difference for multiple columns is that you must type the name of each column after the order by clause. Just make sure that you separate each column with a comma and specify whether you want to sort the columns in ascending or descending order. It's also possible to specify all columns after the select keyword by using an asterisk. This is a much easier method than listing all columns one by one. Finally, it's also important to note that the type of data in your table affects how it is sorted. 
If the column has a numeric data type, the records will be sorted in the ascending or descending numerical order. And if a column has a text-based or string data type, then it will be sorted in ascending or descending alphabetical order. Next, let's explore some examples of the order by clause in a SQL statement. Let's begin with an example of ordering data by a single column. For this example, I'll use a table that lists details of students in a college. I need to sort or order this data in ascending order of each student's country of nationality. So in this instance, the order by column must be the nationality of each student. Each student's nationality is listed in the table's fifth column. I begin by writing the select statement, followed by the names of the columns that I want in the result. ID, first name, last name, and nationality. Then I write the from keyword, followed by the name of the table, which is student table. Next, I type the order by clause. Then I specify the name of the column by which I want my data to be sorted, which is nationality. Finally, I type ASC so that the data is sorted in ascending order. I then execute the statement. All students in a table have now been sorted according to nationality in ascending order. Note that even if I was to omit ASC from the end of my code, I'd still get the same result. This is because the order by clause sorts all data in ascending order by default. Let's run the same statement, but this time using DESC or descending instead of ASC. All students in the table have now been sorted by nationality for a second time, but in this instance, they've been sorted by descending or reverse alphabetical order. Finally, let's explore an example of sorting data by multiple columns. In this example, I'll sort each student by nationality and date of birth. First, I write the select statement. Then I write the names of the columns I want in my result. ID, first name, last name, date of birth, and nationality. I then write the from keyword and student table, the name of the table. Next, I type the order by clause and specify the names of the columns by which I want my data to be sorted, which are nationality and date of birth. I then add ASC after nationality, so that the data is sorted in ascending order of nationality. And I add DESC after date of birth, so that the data from this column will be sorted in descending order. Then I run the statement. This returns my table with the data for the specified columns organized as instructed, which is alphabetically for nationality, and youngest to oldest. This was a short introduction to the SQL order by clause. You can now demonstrate the purpose of the order by clause for sorting data, and you can also explain the different forms in which the order by clause can be used to sort data. Great work! An admin department at a university wants to create different reports for students in the engineering faculty. The department needs to filter out students from the engineering faculty to retrieve their details from the student database. So how can this be done with SQL? Well, the WHERE clause is useful in scenarios like this. In this video, you'll learn how to explain the purpose of the WHERE clause, demonstrate how to filter data using the WHERE clause, and make use of different operators in the WHERE clause condition. So what is the WHERE clause? The WHERE clause is used to filter data. More specifically, it is used to filter and extract records that satisfy a specified condition. To better understand how the WHERE clause is used, it may help to break down its syntax in a SQL SELECT statement. The syntax begins with a standard SQL SELECT statement, followed by the columns you want to query. Next is the FROM clause, followed by the table name. Then you can bring in the WHERE clause. After the WHERE clause, you can specify a condition. You may be wondering what the purpose of the condition is. Well, the condition makes it possible to filter out and fetch the required records from the table. You can think of the conditions as filter criteria. Only the records that meet the condition will be retrieved. For example, you can use the condition or filter criteria to check if the desired column name is equal to a certain value or operand. In between the column and value, you can place an operator. As you've just discovered, the operand follows the operator. Let's take a quick look at it in more detail. The operand can be either a text value or a numeric value. It all depends on the data type of the table column or field. To demonstrate, let's take an example, where student ID equals 01. In this case, the condition is instructed to filter a numeric value, 
so it functions as a filter criteria. Once you run the SQL select statement, it retrieves the records as instructed. Let's take another example, where first name equals John, a text value. All text values must be enclosed in a pair of single quotes. Once again, you just run the SQL select statement and it filters the required records. To specify your filter condition, you can make use of a wide range of operators. You've just reviewed an example of the equals operator and others you may have encountered in a previous lesson. Let's quickly review these other operators. SQL comparison operators include equal to, less than, and greater than. There's also less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, and not equal to. In addition to these symbols, the WHERE clause can also use the BETWEEN, LIKE, and IN operators. With the BETWEEN operator, you can filter records within a specific numeric or time and date range. The LIKE operator is used to specify a pattern in the WHERE clause filter criteria. And the IN operator is used to specify multiple possible values for a column. Now, Let's explore some examples of the WHERE clause in select statements. Recall the scenario of the admin department that wants to create reports for its engineering and science students. I can use the WHERE clause to filter out the details of students who are in the engineering faculty. In this case, I need to retrieve all details, or all columns, from the student table. So I write SELECT, asterisk, FROM, STUDENT TABLE. Next I type WHERE followed by the filter criteria. The criteria is written as faculty, then an equal operator. Finally, I write engineering enclosed in single quotes, which are required for text values or operands. So I'm instructing my SQL to fetch only the details of the students who are attached to the engineering faculty. Then I run the query. As per the filter condition, it has retrieved the student records of the three students in the student table listed in the engineering faculty. Note that I could have used other operators such as greater than, less than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, and not equal, in the same way as the equal to operator in this WHERE clause condition. You can use any of these operators with numeric values or operands. Now let's review some examples that use between, like, and in operators in the WHERE clause condition. The college has a financial aid program available to students of a certain age. The funding department would like to notify eligible students only. I can use the between operator in the WHERE clause condition to filter the records in the student table. As before, I type SELECT, asterisk, FROM, STUDENT TABLE, followed by WHERE. After the WHERE keyword, I specify the filter column as DOB or date of birth. Then I insert the between operator. Lastly, I give the date range as 1st of January 2010 and 30th of June 2010. Running this query retrieves the records of four students whose date of birth falls in the specified date range. Note that I could use any numeric range here, not just dates. For the next example, let's assume the admin department requires the details of the students who are in the science faculty. I can do this with the like operator, which can be used when you want to specify a pattern in the where clause filter criteria. Within the SELECT statement, and after the WHERE keyword, I type FACULTY for faculty column, then the LIKE operator, followed by SC percentage sign within single quotes. The percentage character in the pattern is a wildcard character that represents zero, one, or multiple characters. The underscore sign can also be used to represent one single character. In this case, my WHERE clause asks MySQL to search for and filter out values within the faculty column that start with SC, followed by any number of characters. So I run the statement and it filters out the five student records whose faculty column has a value of science. That is, starting with the pattern SC. In the final example, the admin department needs to know the details of the students who are studying in specific locations. You can use the IN operator in the WHERE condition to retrieve the relevant student records. Remember, the in operator is used to specify multiple possible values for a column. Within the select statement and following the where keyword, I type the column name, which is country, the in operator, then an open pair of parentheses. 
Within these, I place the values USA and UK each in single quotes. My select query will filter out all student records that have a value of USA or UK in the country column. Running this query returns four records, two students from the USA and two students from the UK. So the in operator searches for multiple possible values in the country column and filters out based on them. Note that although the examples in this video looked at the WHERE clause in the SELECT statement, it can also be used in other statements, such as UPDATE and DELETE. You've now learned what the WHERE clause is, and you should now know how to use it to filter data as well as how to use different operators. Great work! Suppose you have a database that contains the records of college students from all over the world. As part of an annual report, a list of all the different countries these students belong to is required. It's very likely many students will come from the same country, so how can you retrieve the results you're looking for without any duplicates? Look no further than a select distinct clause. In the next few minutes, you'll learn how to describe the select distinct statement and explain what it's used for, demonstrate how to use it in a SQL query, and explain how it interacts with a single column, multiple columns, and null values in a few practical examples. Let's start by exploring what the select distinct statement is. In its most basic form, distinct, as its name states, returns only distinct or different values. In other words, it returns the results without any duplicates. Let's take a closer look at duplicate values. As you can imagine, columns in a table can often contain duplicate values. In a college's student records, for example, the country column will likely contain duplicate values as there can be many students who are from the same country. Let's assume you want to find out which countries the students in the college are from so that you can get an understanding of which nationalities are represented in the college. You can begin by using a SQL SELECT statement. You can write the SELECT keyword, then country, followed by the FROM keyword, and the student table name. Running this SELECT query gives you seven records as the result, with multiple duplicate records. In this case, there are duplicate records for Australia and the USA. So how can you eliminate these duplicates and retrieve a unique set of results? You can use the SELECT DISTINCT statement. You can write a SELECT statement just like before, but this time add DISTINCT after the word SELECT. The word DISTINCT will return all unique values in the table with no duplicates. You can then write the FROM keyword followed by the student table name. Once you run this statement, the countries now only appear once in the resulting records. All the duplicates have been removed. This is how the SELECT DISTINCT statement can be used to return distinct values from one column. In this case, you've returned distinct values from the country column. Now, let's take a few moments to explore the select distinct statement in action. The examples that follow focus on the select distinct statement with the use of multiple columns or when applied to a column that has a null value. With the student table in this example, I want to write a query to determine which countries are represented by students in different faculties. I can use a select distinct statement as before, but this time, I'll add the word faculty before country. Running this statement produces six records. The science faculty has students from three different countries, as does the engineering faculty. So, with this statement, which uses multiple columns, I've generated each unique faculty and country combination. Now, let's return to the table once more and examine how select distinct deals with null values in columns. In this example, I have a new student named Julia Smith from the USA. She's not yet been assigned a faculty or school address. As a result, both fields within these columns assigned to Julia Smith contain a value of null. So let's see what happens when I run the same select distinct statement as the previous example. How does it handle the null values? In other words, what results does it return for Julia? I select go and receive the same result as the last time. But now there's also a record for Julia with a null faculty value and USA as the country. This is because the distinct clause considers null to be a unique value. So it outputs null and USA as a unique faculty and country combination. In this video, you learned how to use the select distinct statement to eliminate duplicate values in a select query result. You also observed how it behaves in response to values in a single column and multiple columns and to null values in columns. Great work. You're at the end of SQL operators in sorting and filtering data. Well done. Having a lot of data stored in a database is great. Making sense of all that data is even better. 
That's why using SQL to manipulate the data becomes a much sought after skill. You might remember that SQL operators can accomplish tasks such as arithmetic and comparisons. Data can be filtered using the WHERE clause and sorted using the ORDER BY clause. Just to finish up, let's recap the key points of this module. Here at the end of this module, you should now be able to demonstrate the SQL arithmetic operators and tables, demonstrate the SQL comparison operators in a database, describe the purpose of an ORDER BY clause, and demonstrate ascending and descending sorts by single and multiple columns. In the videos on filtering, the WHERE clause was used with the SQL SELECT statement to filter records. For the WHERE clause, you should now be able to explain the purpose of the WHERE clause, describe how it is used to filter data, and demonstrate using the SQL WHERE clause with comparison operators. Finally, you also explored the SELECT DISTINCT clause. Following this, you should now be able to explain the purpose of SELECT DISTINCT, describe how it is used to eliminate duplicate values, and demonstrate using SELECT DISTINCT with a single column, multiple columns, and null values. After this module, you should now be able to do some SQL operations on the data within your database. That's one of the first steps to giving real value to that data. With your SQL skills, the database is now no longer just a store. It's also something you can investigate and draw conclusions from. Before developing a database or a software application, you first need to plan how you'll organize your data. This plan is referred to as a schema. It's essentially a blueprint of what your data looks like. In this video, you'll learn how to explain the concept of a database schema, identify the different meanings of the term schema across different database systems, and outline the advantages of a database schema. Let's begin focusing on what developers mean when they use the term schema. The general meaning of a schema is that it's an organization or grouping of information and the relationships among them. In the context of a MySQL database, a schema means a collection of data structures or an abstract design of how data is stored in a database. Essentially, schema and database are interchangeable terms within MySQL. A schema is how data is organized in the database and how it's related to other data, but schema is defined in different ways across different database systems. In a SQL Server, a database schema is a collection of different components like tables, fields, data types, and keys. In PostgreSQL, a database schema is a namespace with named database objects like views, indexes, and functions. An Oracle schema system assigns a single schema to each user. Oracle even names each schema after its respective user. But no matter which type of database you encounter, the two most important concepts you need to understand when working with schemas remain the same. Organization of data in the form of tables and the relationships between the tables. Let's now cover the components of a database. A SQL Server schema is comprised of what are known as schema objects. Many of these objects will probably already be familiar to you from your study of databases. They include tables, columns, relationships, data types and keys. An example of a SQL database schema is a music database with data on artists, albums, and genres, all stored in separate tables. However, these tables can still be related to one another through various keys. In other words, the data within this database is organized in separate tables or entities. Yet the tables are also related to one another. Essentially, a database schema is comprised of all of the important data and their relationships the unique keys for all entries in databases, and a name and data type for each column in a table. So, now that you're familiar with what a database is, let's move on and explore the advantages of a database schema. Schemas provide logical groupings for database objects. They also make it easier to access and manipulate these database objects than other available methods. Schemas also provide greater database security. You can grant permission to separate and protect database objects based on user access rights. And finally, it's possible to transfer ownership of schemas and their objects between users and other schemas. In this video, you've learned that a database schema is a structure that represents the storage of data in a database. You also now understand how the meaning of schema changes across different database systems. Lastly, you explore the advantages of a database schema. By the end of this video, you'll know how to create a simple database schema using SQL. You'll do this by building the schema for a shopping cart database consisting of three tables. 
Let's start by creating a new database called Shopping Cart DB. First, I type the Create Database keyword followed by the name Shopping Cart DB. Then I run the statement. The Shopping Cart DB database appears in the left hand explorer. Now I can create the tables inside this database. First, I need to create the customer table, which stores the following information on each customer. Customer ID, name, address, email, and phone number. To create this table, I use the create table keyword, and then I type customer, followed by parentheses. In the parentheses, I specify the fields and their data types as follows. The customer ID data type is integer, while the others are varchar. I give the name and email fields a character limit of 100. I assign a character limit of 255 for address. And I assign a limit of 10 characters for phone. Also note that I've used the primary key keyword on the customer ID column. This designates that field as the primary key of the table, a role you'll learn more about soon. Next is the product table, which stores the product ID, name, price, and description. I can specify this table as follows. The product ID has the integer data type. The name is a varchar with a 100 character limit. The price has a numeric type with parameters of 8 and 2. The description is varchar with a 255 character limit. And the product ID is set as the primary key within this table. And finally, there's the cart order table, which holds the order ID, customer ID, product ID, quantity, order date, and status. This table is set up as follows. The order ID, customer ID, product ID, and quantity are all integer types. Order date is date, and status is varchar with a 100 character limit. Order ID is the primary key here. However, this table also introduces something new in the form of two foreign keys. Before moving forward, let's quickly discuss what primary and foreign keys are. You may have noticed that the cart order table contains the customer ID and product ID fields. These same fields are also found in the other two tables. This is because these fields in the cart order table are directly linked to the same fields in the corresponding tables. To establish this relationship, each table must contain a primary key. The referencing table then uses foreign keys that point it to the external source table or the referenced table. You'll learn more about primary and foreign keys in greater detail in a later lesson. But for now, let's return to the shopping cart database example. All primary keys have been set up. So the foreign keys for the cart order table come next. I create the first one by using the foreign key keyword along with the customer ID column name. To link it to the customer ID field in the customer table, I then use the references keyword followed by the source table name customer and then customer ID in parentheses. Creating a foreign key for product ID is similar, but with product and product ID as references. So I use the foreign key keyword and name it product ID. I then reference it in the product source table product and then product ID. Then I execute these statements and the tables appear nested beneath Shopping Cart DB in the left hand explorer. In this video, you learn the steps for creating a simple database schema using SQL. The same process applies for both small and large scale databases. When creating your databases, you need to be able to distinguish between different kinds of database schemas. In other words, you need to answer the question of what kind of database best suits my project. Over the next few minutes, you'll explore some different types of database schemas, and by the end of this video, you'll be able to explain the concept of a logical database schema 
and outline the concept of a physical database schema. Let's begin by exploring a logical database schema. A logical database schema is how the data is organized in terms of tables. In other words, it shows what tables should be in a database and explains how the attributes of different tables are linked together. Creating a logical database schema means illustrating relationships between components of your data. This is also called entity relationship or EOR modeling. It specifies what the relationships between entity types are. Let's take the example of a simple EOR model that shows the logical schema of an ordering application. It demonstrates the relationship between an order, the shipment in which it will be shipped, and the courier assigned to it. The ID attribute in each table is the primary key of the respective entities. It provides a unique identifier for each entry, row, or record in the entities. In the order entity, the shipment ID and courier ID are called foreign keys, but in fact, they're also the primary keys of the shipment and courier entities, respectively. This creates a relation between these entities and the order table, which in turn has its own ID as its primary key. The other type of schema is physical schema. Physical schema is how data is stored on disk. In other words, this involves creating the actual structure of your database using code. In MySQL and other relational databases, developers use SQL to create the database, tables, and the other database objects. For example, you can create a physical schema for an online store database by writing SQL statements to create tables for customers, products, and transactions. However, physical schema creation could differ slightly between different database systems. Database schemas are vital when it comes to the creation of databases, and they form the basis of your application. You should also be able to describe how a logical database schema refers to the organization of data in tables, and that you use an EOR model to specify relationships between entities. And you should also now know that you can control how data is physically stored on disk by creating a physical schema with SQL statements. At this stage of the course, you spend some time exploring the relational model for databases. However, it's crucial that you have a proper understanding of how the relational model influences the design and structure of a database, and how it helps to build relationships between tables. Once you understand how your database is structured, then you can determine how best to extract information from it. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn how to outline the basics of the relational model, identify the different relationships between tables, and explain the basics of an EOR diagram. To understand how the relational model influences our databases, let's take the examples of two tables from a college database. The first table shows a list of students, along with their assigned student and course identification numbers. And the second table lists courses that students can study, along with the ID for each course and its department. So the big question in this example is which student is studying what course? And is each student studying one or multiple courses? These are basic examples of why it's important to structure and connect tables correctly. There are three types of relationships between any two tables in a relational database. One to many, one to one, and many to many. Let's begin with an exploration of the one to many relationship. In a one to many relationship, a record of data in a row of one table is linked to multiple records in different rows of another. In the student table, a student with the ID of one is enrolled in two courses on the course table. So a one-to-many relationship can be drawn between these tables. This relationship can also be illustrated in a basic entity relationship diagram, or ERD, as student is enrolled in many courses using shapes and symbols. The diagram depicts the two entities student and course in rectangle shapes with enrolled to describe the relationship in a diamond shape. And many, is depicted using the crow's foot notation symbol. The relationship can also be illustrated using a more complex EOR diagram that depicts keys. Course ID in the student table is a foreign key, or FK, and this references the primary key, or PK, course ID column that exists in the course table. Next, let's take a look at one-to-one -one relationships. In one-to-one -one relationships, one single record of one table is associated with one single record of another table. To demonstrate this relationship, I'll use two new tables, 
one that outlines key information about the staff in each college department. The other is the department location table that records key data about the location of each department on campus. In this instance, each department head is in one department building on the college campus. So each staff member from the department staff table is associated with one record from the department table. These relationships can also be depicted in an EOR diagram as one department head leads one department. And finally, there's also many to many relationships. This type of relationship associates one record of one table with multiple records of another table. And the same relationship also works in the other direction. In this example, the student Morris Doyle is undertaking two research projects and each project is supervised by a different staff member. And likewise, one staff member can supervise or collaborate with multiple students on their research projects. These relationships can also be depicted in an EOR diagram as many students are supervised by many staff. You should now be able to outline the different relationships that exist between tables in a relational database model. Good work. By now you're probably familiar with querying values or records within database tables. But how do you query specific records and values if they're duplicated across a table? When you come across obstacles like these, you can use keys as your solution. In this video, you'll learn how to explain the purpose of primary key in a database table and select a simple and composite primary key. You may have encountered several examples of primary keys during this course. And in these examples, you saw that they're used in tables as a unique method to identify a record and prevent duplicates. Let's take an example of a student table with five attributes, ID, name, date of birth, email, and grade. How could we identify a specific student to enter their grade? Like the student Mary on row two. All you need to do is find the unique ID of Mary to identify a record of her data. However, in this example, you can't use the student name column because there are two students in the table called Mary, and you can't use the date of birth either because another student in a table called Dan has the same birthday. Neither of these records are unique to Mary, so what's the best approach? The solution is to locate a candidate key. This is an attribute that's unique to each row of the table, and it cannot have a null value. In other words, it cannot be empty. In this example, there are two possible candidate keys, the student ID, and the student email. Both rows contain a unique value for each student, so either one can be used as a primary key. Let's assign the student ID as the primary key. Whichever column we reject as the primary key becomes the alternate or secondary key. In this instance, the email column is the secondary key. But what happens if you can't locate a unique value within a table? Maybe all rows of duplicated values. In this instance, you can create a composite primary key. This type of key is a combination of two or more attributes. Let's take the example of the delivery department of an online store. They have a delivery table that tracks the deliveries placed by their customers. However, there's no single column with unique values in each row. So, no column can be considered as the primary key. In this case, the best approach is to combine the customer ID and product code columns to create a unique value for each specific record of data. With these columns, you can determine which customer ordered what product. So together, these columns become the composite primary key. And this key can be used to track the delivery status for each customer. You're now familiar with one single column primary and composite primary key. You should now also be able to identify the most appropriate situation in which to use each one. Great work. Imagine a scenario where a bookstore has a database that contains two tables, a customer table to track customer information and an order table to track customers' orders. But how can they determine which customer made which order? The solution is to add a customer ID column into the order table column as a foreign key. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn how to describe the purpose of a foreign key and demonstrate how to use it to connect different tables in a relational database. So what exactly is a foreign key? A foreign key is one or more columns used to connect two tables in order to create cross-referencing between them. By foreign, developers mean external. So the foreign key in one table will refer to an external or foreign column in another table. Let's find out more about how a foreign key works 
by exploring the tables from the database of an online store. The store's customer table contains information about the customer's name and address, while their order table contains information about each customer's order date and status. The issue is how to connect these tables to make sure that each order is associated with the right customer. Establishing this connection is important so that you can process and deliver orders to the right customers, update order details, or cancel orders if required. A foreign key is a great method of establishing a relationship between these tables so that these other tasks can be carried out. But before you learn about how to use a foreign key, let's take a few moments to explore the concept in a bit more detail. To find out more about how foreign keys work, let's take the example of the relationship between two generic entity tables. These tables are called table 1 or T1 and table 2 or T2. The purpose of connecting these tables is to relate records of data that exist in both tables with each other. The foreign key in T1 should point to a related column in T2. In this case, the foreign key column values in T1 must correspond to existing values in the reference column in T2. And the reference column in T2 must contain unique values in each row of data. This will most likely be the primary column in T2. In addition, the reference table T2 is known as the parent table, while the referencing table T1 is the child table. Don't worry if all this seems a bit complicated. Let's simplify things by exploring an entity relationship diagram using the customer and order tables from earlier. In this diagram, the order table relates to the customer table by including the customer ID attribute and defining it as foreign key inside the order table. The relationship between these two tables is one to many. You might have encountered this type of relationship in an earlier video. One to many means that each customer may have many orders, but each order must refer to one single customer only. This means there must be a customer record available in the customer table before any order can be made. But it is not necessary to have an order once a new customer is created. Therefore, the customer table represents a parent table and the order table represents a child table. This means that the parent can exist and the child may not exist, but the opposite scenario cannot occur. In this example, the customer ID value existing in the order table can be used to fetch the records of a specific customer to determine who placed the order. For example, to generate an invoice or to deliver an order to the customer address. It is also possible for a table to have more than one foreign key. Each will be used to connect the referencing or child table with other referenced or parent tables. In this case, you'll have multiple parents to the same child. Let's add a new table, product table, into the previous diagram to explain this in more detail. The order table now has two foreign keys. One foreign key links it with the customer table via the customer ID, and the other links it with the product table via the product ID. The relationship between these tables is one-to-one. -one. Each order must be related to a specific product record, and each product might be related to an order record but doesn't have to be. For example, you can receive a new product in your inventory, but no customer has placed an order on it yet. If an order has not been placed in this product, then it's not related to any order yet. So this then raises the question, who is the parent and who is the child? The customer, the order, or the product? The answer is that there are now two parents, the customer and the product tables, and there's one child, which is the order table. You should now understand the purpose of a foreign key, and you should also be able to demonstrate how it can be used to connect tables in a relational database. Well done. When building a database, there's often a lot of different tables that you'd need to consider including. But how do you determine what to include and what to exclude? The answer is to identify the entities you're interested in maintaining data on. In this video, you'll learn how to explain the meaning of entities in a relational database, differentiate between attribute types and be able to identify entities and their attributes. So let's begin by exploring what an entity is. An entity can be described as an object that has properties which define its characteristics. An entity can be anything that represents a single object in a database, such as a place or a person. In a relational database system, each interesting object in a project could be considered an entity. For example, a customer or individual and an entity in a table is comprised of rows and columns created in database management systems such as MySQL. Let's explore this concept in more depth 
using the example of a table that holds delivery records for the database of an e-commerce store. The table name represents the entity name, Deliveries, and each column represents the entity-related attributes. And the system holds customer or entity-relevant attributes such as ID, name, and delivery status details. These attributes hold relevant data about the table entity. So, each instance of the customer entity in this e-commerce system contains a record of data about each customer. But there are also different types of attributes in a relational database system. These include simple attributes, composite attributes, and single-valued attributes. And there are also multi-valued attributes, derived attributes, and key attributes. Let's explore these attributes in more detail using the example of a student table in a relational database system. A simple attribute is an attribute that cannot be classified further. In the example of the student records, the grade values cannot be classified further. A composite attribute is an attribute that can be split into different components. For example, the name value of each student could be split into sub-attributes such as first and last name. A single value attribute can only store one value. In the student table example, the date of birth column can only contain one value per student. So these values could be defined as a single valued attribute. With a multi valued attribute, the attribute can store multiple values in a field. For example, the student email column could hold more than one email per student, a college email address, and a personal email address. However, this practice should be avoided in a relational database. A derived attribute is where the value of one attribute is derived from another. In the student table, the age of each student can be derived from their respective date of births. And finally, there's the key attribute. This is a field that holds a unique value used to identify a unique entity record. A good example are the values contained in the student ID column. Each ID is a unique value which can be used to obtain data about a specific student. Remember that there's no point in considering entities or attributes that will not be used in your project. You only need to capture data in your database system that helps the users of your system complete certain tasks and activities. You should now understand the concept entities in a relational database and be able to differentiate between attribute types. Good work. At this stage, you might be familiar with the process for creating tables within a database. But there are several issues that you're likely to encounter when working with tables, such as unnecessary data duplication, issues with updating data, and the effort required to query data. Fortunately, these issues can be resolved with the use of database normalization. By the end of this video, you'll be able to explain what database normalization is, and you'll also be able to demonstrate an understanding of insert, update, and deletion anomalies, and be able to list some of the issues associated with them. Normalization is an important process used in database systems. It structures tables in a way that minimizes challenges by reducing data duplication, avoiding data modification implications, and helping to simplify data queries from the database. To gain a better understanding of normalization and the challenges it addresses, let's explore an example of a table that hasn't been normalized. In this example, I'll use a college enrollment table. The table serves multiple purposes by providing a list of the college students, courses, and departments, an outline of relationships or associations between students, courses, and departments, and name and contact details for the head of each department. Creating tables that serve multiple purposes causes serious challenges and problems for database systems. The most common of these challenges include insert anomaly, update anomaly, and deletion anomaly. Let's begin with an overview of insert anomaly. Insert anomaly occurs when new data is inserted into a table, which then requires the insertion of additional data. I'll use the college enrollment table to demonstrate an example. In the college enrollment table, the student ID column serves as the primary key. Each field in a primary key column must contain data before new records can be added to any other column in the table. For example, I can enter a new course name in the table, but I can't add any new records until I enroll new students. And I can't enroll new students without assigning each student an ID. The ID column can't contain empty fields. So I can't insert a new course unless I insert new student data. I've encountered the insert anomaly problem. An update anomaly occurs when you attempt to update a record in a table column only to discover that this results in further updates across the table. Let's return to the college enrollment table once again to understand how an update anomaly occurs. 
In the enrollment table, the course and department information is repeated or duplicated for each student on that course. This duplication increases database storage and makes it more difficult to maintain data changes. I'll demonstrate this with a scenario in which Dr. Jones, the director of the computing department, leaves his post and is replaced with another director. I now need to update all instances of Dr. Jones in the table with the new director's name. And I also need to update the records of every student enrolled in the department. This poses a major challenge because if I miss any students, then the table will contain inaccurate or inconsistent information. This is a prime example of the update anomaly problem. Updating data in one column requires updates in multiple others. Next, let's review the final challenge, deletion anomaly. A deletion anomaly is when the deletion of a record of data causes the deletion of more than one set of data required in the database. For example, Rose, the student assigned the ID of four, has decided to leave her course, so I need to delete her data. But deleting Rose's data results in the loss of the records for the design department as they're dependent on Rose and her ID. This is an example of the deletion anomaly problem. Removing one instance of a record of data causes the deletion of other records. So how can you solve these problems? As you learned earlier, the answer lies in database normalization. Normalization optimizes the database design by creating a single purpose for each table. To normalize the college enrollment table, I need to redesign it. As you discovered earlier, the table's current design serves three different purposes. So the solution is to split the table in three, essentially creating a single table for each purpose. This means that I now have a student table with information on each student, a course table that contains the records for each course, and a department table with information for each department. This separation of information helps to fix the anomaly challenges. It also makes it easier to write SQL queries in order to search for, sort, and analyze data. You should now be able to explain what database normalization is and you should also be able to demonstrate an understanding of anomalies and challenges. Well done. As a database engineer, you'll very often come across columns in a table that are filled with duplicates of data and multiple values. This can make it quite challenging to view, search, and sort your data. But with the correct implementation of normalization, this challenge can be dealt with. By the end of this video, you'll be able to demonstrate how to design a database in first normal form, identify the atomicity rule and how to enforce it, and analyze effective ways to eliminate the repeating group of data problems in data sets. As you might already know from previous videos in this lesson, the normalization process makes it easier and more efficient for engineers to perform basic database tasks. It's an especially useful process for helping to fix the well-known insert, delete, and update anomalies. However, in order to achieve database normalization, you first need to perform the three fundamental normalization forms. The database normalization forms include first normal form, or 1NF, second normal form, or 2NF, and third normal form, or 3NF. This video focuses on designing a database to meet the first normal form, or 1NF, rules. These rules enforce data atomicity and eliminate unnecessary repeating groups of data in database tables. Data atomicity means that there must only be one single instance value of the column attribute in any field of the table. In other words, your table should only have one value per field. By eliminating repeating groups of data, you can avoid repeating data unnecessarily in the database. Instances of repeated data can cause data redundancy and inconsistency. To understand this better, let's explore an example. To demonstrate data atomicity, I've built an unnormalized table called course table within a college database. It includes information about the college's computing courses, along with the names and contact details of the course tutors. And the course ID column serves as the table's primary key. However, there are multiple values in each row of the contact number column. Each row contains two contact details for each tutor, a cell phone number and a landline number. This table isn't in 1NF. It violates the atomicity rule by including multiple values in a single field. I can try and fix this by creating a new row for each number. This solves my data atomicity problem. The table now has just one value in each field, but this solution has also created another problem. The primary key is no longer unique because multiple rows now have the same course ID. Another way that I could solve the problem of atomicity while retaining the primary key is by creating two columns for contact numbers. 
one column for cell phones and a second column for landline numbers. But I still have the issue of unnecessary repeated groups of data. Mary Evans is the assigned tutor for two of the courses, so her name appears twice in the table, as do her contact details. These instances of data will continue to reappear if she's assigned more courses to teach, and it's likely that her details will appear in other tables within a database system. This means I could have even more groups of repeated data. This creates another problem. If this tutor changes any of their details, then I'll have to update their details in this table and all others in which it appears. And if I miss any of these tables, then I'll have inconsistency and invalid data within my database system. To solve this issue, I can redesign my table to adhere to 1NF or first normal form. First, I identify the repeating groups of data. In this case, it's the tutor's name and contact numbers. Next, I identify the entities I'm dealing with, which are course and tutor. Then I split the course table so that I now have one table for each entity. A course table that contains information about the courses and a tutor table that maintains the name and contact numbers of each tutor. Now I need to assign a primary key to the tutor table. So I select the tutor ID column. I've solved the problem of data atomicity, but I also need to provide a link between the two tables. I can connect the two tables by using a foreign key. I just add the tutor ID column to the course table. Now both tables are linked. I've now achieved data atomicity and eliminated unnecessary repeating groups of data. You should now be familiar with 1NF and the rules that you should apply to avoid it. Good work. As a database engineer, you'll very often come across columns in a table that are filled with duplicates of data and multiple values. This can make it quite challenging to view, search, and sort your data. But with the correct implementation of normalization, this challenge can be dealt with. By the end of this video, you'll be able to explain how to design a database in a second normal form, outline the functional dependency concept, and define the partial dependency concept. Before you begin, make sure that you've watched the video on first normal form, or 1NF. Database normalization is a progressive process, so you must be familiar with 1NF before you can implement 2NF. So why do database developers require database normalization? If you're going to store content, you should aim to have the best possible database. Best means that it is a proper structure that reduces duplication and ultimately allows for accurate data analysis and data retrieval. To get the best results, engineers build tables in a way that optimizes the database structure. This video focuses on how to design tables in a relational database to meet the second normal form criteria. But before you can learn how to do this, you need to understand what is meant by the terms functional and partial dependency. Functional dependency refers to the relationship between two attributes in a table. The unique value of a column in a relation determines the value of another column. To demonstrate this concept, let's take the example of a table known as R. This table contains two columns called X and Y respectively. X is a column with a set of unique values, which are not replicated elsewhere in the table, a primary key, for example. Y is a column without a set of unique values, like a non-primary key. R is the table or relation in which the columns X and Y exist. Y, as a non-primary key with duplicated values, is dependent on X. This is because X is the table's primary key, as it only contains unique values. Don't worry if you don't quite understand this concept yet. I'm going to demonstrate functional dependency in more detail. Let's take the example of a table called student that holds key information on students in a college. The table contains three columns, a student ID column, a name column, and a date of birth column. I need to use this table to find the date of birth for a specific student. I can't use the name column because it has duplicated values. There are two students named Tony. If I query this column, I'll just receive both instances of Tony, and I can't use the date of birth column either because there are two students who share the same date of birth. But I can complete this task by using the student ID column. All values in this column are unique, so it's designated as the table's primary key. And the values of this primary key column determine the information of the other columns. This means that each column in the table is functionally dependent on the student ID column is the only column that can be used to return specific data. Now that you've explored the concept of functional dependency, let's look at partial dependency. Partial dependency refers to tables with a composite primary key. 
This is a key that consists of a combination of two or more columns. To demonstrate, let's take the example of a table that shows the vaccination status of patients in a hospital database. The table shows the vaccination status of two patients, David and Kate. It also displays the patient ID, vaccine ID, and vaccine name. There's no one single column with unique values in each row, so there's no single column that can be used as a primary key. So it's best to combine both the patient ID and vaccine ID columns as a composite primary key to create a unique value in each record. The vaccination table must meet the second normal form, or 2NF. So all non-key attributes, the vaccine name, patient name and status, must depend on the entire primary key value, which are patient ID and vaccine ID. It can't depend on just part of the value, otherwise this creates partial dependency. Let's apply this rule to find out if it's true for every non-key column. So, how do I check that the patient with the ID of 50 has taken vaccine 1? I check the value of both the patient ID and vaccine ID keys. The combined value is the only way to return the vaccination status value of a specific patient. This means that there's a functional dependency between the status value and the primary key value. But if I just want to find out the vaccine name, then I don't need both combined values. The only information I need to return the vaccine name is the vaccine ID. As you learned earlier, this is called partial dependency. This should be avoided in most instances as it violates a 2NF rule. Similarly, if I want to identify the patient's name, I don't need both combined values. I can just use the patient ID to return the patient's name. Next, let's look at how to upgrade this table to 2NF. First, I need to make all non-key columns dependent on all components of the primary key. So, I identify the entities included in the vaccination table. In this instance, there are three entities, vaccination status, as represented by the status column, vaccine, which is the vaccine ID and vaccine name columns, and patient, represented by the patient name and patient ID columns. I then break up the table into three separate tables as follows, patient table, vaccine table, and vaccination status. Now in each of these new tables, all non-primary key attributes depend only on the primary key value. I've eliminated all unnecessary replication of the vaccine and patient names within the vaccination table. The three tables are now in the second normal form, or 2NF. You should now be familiar with the 2NF rule and how to upgrade a table to 2NF. Good work. When working with tables in a database, you may often encounter tables that contain repetitive data. Perhaps two columns contain values that are very similar, so you might split the table in two to simplify the data. When building relational databases, you can solve similar issues of repetitive data using what's known as third normal form, or 3NF. By the end of this video, you'll be able to understand how to design a database in third normal form and explain the concept of transitive dependency. Before you begin, Make sure that you've watched the videos in first and second normal form. A database must be in first and second normal form before it can be in third normal form. In addition to these rules, databases can't contain any instances of transitive dependency. In the context of third normal form, transitive dependency means that a non-key attribute cannot be functionally dependent on another non-key attribute. In other words, non-key attributes cannot depend upon one another. A key attribute in a database is an attribute that helps to uniquely identify a row of data in a table. To demonstrate this concept, let's take the example of a basic table with three columns, A, B, and C. The concept of transitive dependency means that the value of A determines the value of B. Likewise, the value of B determines the value of C. The relation between these table columns is represented by A, B, and C. This means that A determines C through B. This is the type of relation that database engineers call transitive dependency. Let's see how this works using a more complex example. I have a table of best-selling books within Europe from the database of an online bookstore. The table organizes the books according to five attributes, book ID and title, author name, author language, and country. In this table, ID is the only key or primary key that exists in the table. All other attributes are non-key attributes. But to determine what these non-key attributes are, I must use the ID of the top-selling books. This means if I want to find any specific information about any attribute, 
I need to use the ID attribute value to find the targeted attribute value. For example, if I use the ID of three, then I can locate the author Cormac O'Dwyer, the language Irish, the country Ireland, and so on. However, it's also possible to determine the country based on the language, or to determine the language based on the country. And both country and language are non-key attributes. For example, in the context of Europe, it's always possible to determine the country is France if the language is French and vice versa. This means that I have a transitive dependency in this relation. A non-key attribute depends on another non-key attribute. This dependency relation can be presented as follows. Language determines country and country determines language. The rest of the attributes are fine as they only depend on the ID primary key. So you can't say, for instance, that author name determines book title or that author name determines language. For example, the author Michel Laury has written two books in two different languages, French and Spanish. As I've just pointed out, the only transitive dependency that exists in this example is between language and country. So how do I solve this transitive dependency within my table and remove any repetition of data? I can split the table into two tables while joining them to conform with three NF rules. So I keep the top books table while splitting off the country and language columns into a new table called country. But I also leave the country column inside the top books table as a foreign key that connects the two tables. The country table now holds just four records with no repetition of data. And there's no need for a language column within the top books table. Stating the country is enough to determine the language. And most importantly, all non-key attributes are determined only by the primary key in each table. This means that my table now meets the requirements of 3NF. You should now know how to design a database in third normal form, and you should also be able to explain the concept of transitive dependency. Well done. Well done. You've reached the end of this module on database design. It's now time to recap the key points and skills. You began this module with a lesson on designing a database schema and learned that a correctly designed database is the basis for all subsequent data storage and analysis. It's crucial to know the principles of good database design because a poorly designed database makes it hard, if not impossible, to produce accurate information. Having completed this module, you should now be able to define the term database schema, describe the schema of different database systems, create a basic database schema using SQL, and list the two main types of database schema. You then moved on to explore relational database design. In this lesson, you learned how to design a relational database. Having completed this lesson, you should now be able to describe the relational model, list different types of relations, evaluate an entity relationship diagram, or ERD, and explain the purpose of primary key in a database table. And you should now also be able to demonstrate how to select a single primary key and a composite primary key, describe the purpose of a foreign key, connect tables using a foreign key, and summarize the meaning of entities in a relational database. Furthermore, you should now be able to list different types of attributes, identify entities and their attributes, and create links between entities. The last lesson covered database normalization. Normalization is the process of converting a large table into multiple tables to reduce data redundancy. You should now be able to explain database normalization, recognize insert, update, and deletion anomalies, and explain the atomicity concept and describe the repeating groups of data problem. And you should now know how to design a database in first, second, and third normal form, and explain the concepts of functional, partial, and transitive dependency. You should now be familiar with the essential skills and concepts of database design. And you should also be able to create the structure of a normalized relational database. Well done. That's great progress towards your learning goals. In this course, you covered an introduction to database engineering. Let's take a few moments to briefly recap what you learned. In the opening module, you had an introduction to the course and explored possible career roles that you might want to follow as a database engineer. You also reviewed some tips around how to take this course successfully and discussed what it is that you hope to learn. You then covered an introduction to SQL, or Standard Query Language, the coding syntax used to interact with databases. And finally, you explored the basic structure of databases and learned about the different types of keys they use. You began Module 2 with an exploration of SQL data types and learned how to differentiate between numeric data, string data, 
and default values. You also completed several exercises in which you learned how to utilize these different data types in your database projects. You then moved on to explore CRUD, or create, read, update, and delete operations. You learned how to create databases and tables and populate them with data. You explored how to update and delete data, and you demonstrated your ability with CRUD operations by completing exercises in creating and managing data. In the third module, you reviewed SQL operators and learned how to sort and filter data. You began the module with a lesson on SQL operators in which you explored the syntax and process steps to deploy SQL arithmetic and comparison operators within a database. Next, you covered how to sort and filter data using clauses. The clauses that you learned about include the order by clause, the where clause, and the select distinct clause. You also covered an overview of how each clause is used to sort and filter data in a database. And you went through demonstrations of these clauses and had an opportunity to try them for yourself. In module four, you learned about database design. In the first lesson, you had an overview of how to design a database schema. You explored basic database design concepts like schema and learned about different types of schemas. The next lesson focused on relational database design. In this lesson, you investigated how to establish relationships between tables in a database using keys. You also learned about the different types of keys that are used in relational database design, such as primary, secondary, candidate, and foreign keys. Finally, you covered a lesson on database normalization. In this lesson, you investigated the key concepts around database normalization. You then learned about the concept of normal form and about the first, second, and third normal forms. Well done in completing this recap. Now it's time to try out what you've learned in the graded assessment. Good luck. Congratulations on reaching the end of this Introduction to Databases course in the program Meta Database Engineer. You've worked hard to get here and developed a lot of new skills during the course. You're off to a great start with your database learning and you should now have a thorough understanding of databases and data. You were able to demonstrate some of this learning along with your practical database skill set by creating and querying a database in the project lab. Following your completion of this first course in Meta Database Engineer, you should now be able to demonstrate knowledge of different database schema, explain relational database design and table normalization, perform database operations such as create, read, update and delete, and demonstrate SQL commands by sorting and filtering data. The key skills measured in the graded assessment revealed your ability to demonstrate knowledge of different database schema, explain relational database design and table normalization, perform database operations such as create, read, update, delete, and demonstrate SQL commands by sorting and filtering data. So, what are the next steps? Well, this is the first course in the Meta Database Engineer specialization, and it has given you an initial introduction to several key areas. You probably realize that there's still more for you to learn. So, if you found this course helpful and want to discover more, then why not register for the second course? You'll continue to develop your skill set during each of the Meta Database Engineer courses. In the final lab, you'll apply everything you've learned to create your own fully functional database system. Whether you're just starting out as a technical professional, a student, or a business user, the course end projects prove your knowledge of the value and capabilities of database systems. The lab consolidates your abilities with the practical application of your skills, but the lab also has another important benefit. It means that you'll have a fully operational database that you can reference within your portfolio. This serves to demonstrate your skills to potential employers. And not only does it show employers that you are self-driven and innovative, but it also speaks volumes about you as an individual, as well as your newly obtained knowledge. And once you've completed all the courses in this specialization, you'll receive certification in Meta Database Engineering. The certification can also be used as a progression to other Meta role-based certifications. Depending on your goals, you may choose to go deep with advanced role-based certifications or take other fundamental courses once you earn this certification. Meta certifications provide globally recognized and industry endorsed evidence of your technical skills. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to embark on this journey of discovery with you. Best of luck in the future. Have you ever accidentally deleted something on your device and wished you could undo your mistake?
Wouldn't it be great if you had a time machine to go back and undo your mistake? While humans can't yet travel back in time, programmers working on projects can do something quite like it. They do this using a system called version control. As a programmer, you'll be working with many files in your project, and it's important to keep track of the changes being made. Version control is a system that records all changes and modifications to files for tracking purposes and is essential to your day-to-day -day development activities. In this course, you will become familiar with version control and how it relates to development. By the end of your studies, you'll understand what version control is, how it works, and how it is used. There are both centralized and distributed control systems available, and you'll examine the different types of workflows available. Conflict resolution is an important aspect of version control, as it helps users manage file and version conflict issues. You'll get to explore popular methods of version tracking using version control technologies like Git and GitHub, and you will learn how to create and clone a repository in GitHub. In addition, you will become familiar with Git concepts such as add, commit, push and pull, branching and forking, diff and blame. As well as focusing on version control, the course also explores the use of command line syntax with an emphasis on Unix commands. There are many videos in your course that will gradually guide you toward that goal. Watch, pause, rewind, and rewatch the videos until you are confident in your skills. Then you'll be able to consolidate your knowledge by consulting the course readings and put your skills into practice during the course exercises. Along the way, you'll encounter several knowledge quizzes where you can self-check your progress. You're not alone in considering a career as a web developer, and the course discussion prompts enable you to connect with your classmates. It's a great way to share knowledge, discuss difficulties, and make new friends. To help you be successful in the course, it's a great idea to commit to a regular and disciplined approach to your learning regime. You need to be as serious as you can about your study, and if possible, map out a study schedule with dates and times that you can devote to attending the course. Of course, this is an online self-paced program and you can study at dates, times, and places that suit your lifestyle. However, it may help to think of your study in terms of regular attendance, just as you might have to do at a physical learning institute. You may have encountered new technical words and terminology in this video. Don't worry if you don't fully understand all these terms right now. Everything you need will be covered during your learning. In summary, this course provides you with a complete introduction to version control, and it is part of a program of courses that lead you toward a career in software development. Communication is the most important skill for collaborating with other developers to ensure that you're on the same page when you're building products, and also so that people are keeping track of each other's timelines and the understanding of what the product requirements are are consistent. Hi, I'm Leila Rizvi. I am a backend software engineer at Instagram, working on Instagram Calling in San Francisco. Effective collaboration is important so that we can move cohesively together on large projects with people that have a wide range of skills. As engineers actually have to collaborate with one another a lot. When we build features together, we have to work in parallel with one another to design the best features for our users. We also have to collaborate with a lot of non-engineers a lot. For example, when we built Instagram Live, we had to work with our product managers to figure out what we should build. We had to work with our user researchers to figure out what areas we should focus on to build the best products for our users. We had to work with our designers to figure out the right look and feel for our product. And we had to work as engineers to figure out what we can actually build in the timeline that we had. Communication is one of the most important skills for working with other developers. Learning how to give developers the right amount of context for what they're working on. Learning how to ruthlessly prioritize your work is also very important as a software engineer. There's always going to be an endless amount of things that you can do to improve your product. Learning which things are most important to unblock other developers or unblock yourself is the most important skill. The last thing that's really important to learn as a software developer is to accurately estimate your products. When you first start out, it'll be a little bit tricky, but over time, learning how to say how long a project's gonna take and being able to explain the trade-offs is gonna be very critical. The skills you need as a software developer changes from company to company a little bit. 
When you're at a big company like Meta, engineers are much more specialized, whereas if you're in a startup, you wear many different hats. As an engineer at Meta, we have to learn to be able to give just the right amount of context to people for what we need to get done because we're working with people with little context on the work we're doing. There's so many engineers there, but if you're in a startup, people generally have a little more context on what you're working on, but they might not be as specialized in that area. So you have to do a little bit more learning potentially, and you have to maybe give less context to them. Some challenges I've encountered while learning to collaborate is that I have to learn how to adjust how I work with different people depending on their work preferences. Some people I work with are visual learners, so I learn to whiteboard when I'm talking to them. Some people I work with like to think before they speak, so I learn to be a little more patient when I'm talking to them, to listen to them. A skill that I'm working on learning to develop my own career is I'm learning how to work on mobile. I'm a backend engineer and I work with mobile engineers every single day to better like build products for them. It's nicer for me to understand how they operate, how their code base works so that we can build better things together. To learn mobile, I took an Android bootcamp class at Meta that Meta provided for backend engineers interested in learning mobile. And after I finished the course, the Android engineers on my team have been giving me small tasks and small projects for me to drive so that I can learn a little bit more about how they work. Practicing effective version control leads to better collaboration because it helps you understand why certain changes were made if you look at a commit. It also helps you context switch between different features or projects that you're working on. Effective collaboration led to a better outcome on a recent project of mine. I'm a backend engineer and I was driving the backend parts of a key project for my team. I had to unexpectedly take time off, but I had a lot of clear commits for my code changes in Git, and I had a lot of documentation for my team, so they were able to easily pick up where I left off, and the project ended up staying on track. You should keep learning to collaborate with other people because the more people you work with, the better products you build because you'll get different perspectives on what you're building. It's rewarding because your product that you're working on ends up being better. The more people you work with, the more people you can learn from. And ultimately it's rewarding because the product that you build is gonna be better because it's gonna have a lot more different input and a lot more different perspectives for how it should be built. Have you ever worked on a document, made changes to it, and wished you could have gone back to your first version a few days later? Can you remember that feeling of wishing you could travel back in time? For developers, this time machine exists and it's called version control. In this video, you'll learn about version control's primary features and benefits. Version control is a system that records all changes and modifications to files for tracking purposes. Developers also use the terms source control or source code management. The primary goal of any version control system is to keep track of changes. It achieves this by allowing developers access to the entire change history with the ability to revert or roll back to a previous state or point in time. There are different types of changes, such as adding new files, modifying or updating files, and deleting files. The version control system is the source of truth across all code, assets, and the team itself. Let me give you an example that we're all familiar with. In word processing applications, version control functionality is available to provide users with a safety net of auto-saving the document. The application creates a restoration point on each autosave to which the user can revert if required. Version control systems for coding projects tend to be a bit more complex, but their underlying functionality follows the same process. Working as a developer, you'll need to become familiar with many different tools, and version control is one of them. For developers, especially those working in a team, there are many benefits associated with version control. These include revision history, identity, collaboration, automation, and efficiency. Let's explore these in some more detail. Revision history provides a record of all changes in a project. It provides developers with the ability to revert to a stable point in time in cases where code edits cause issues or bugs. The ability to roll back to a particular version or time allows teams to work faster and deliver code with more confidence. Keeping a record of changes is great, but it doesn't have as much value if you don't know who is responsible for adding or changing a record. All changes made are always recorded with the identity of the user that made them. 
Combining this feature with the revision history allows teams to see not only when the changes occurred, but also who made the changes. Teams can also analyze the editing, creation, and the deletion of files on the control system. As a software developer, you will often work with a team to achieve a common goal. This can be adding new features to an existing project or creating a brand new service. In all cases, a version control system allows the team to submit their code and keep track of any changes that need to be made. Another important aspect of a version control system is something called a peer review. Developers working on a task create a peer review once the code is ready for inspection. The peer review aims to get other developers on your team to review the code and provide feedback where necessary. The ability to create and deliver code on a wide scale is complex and time consuming. Version control helps keep track of all changes. It plays an integral role in the explosion of development operations or DevOps as it's commonly called. DevOps is a set of practices, philosophies, and tools that increase an organization's ability to deliver applications or services to a high quality and velocity. Version control is a key tool in this process, and it is used not only to track all changes, but also to aid in software quality, release, and deployments. You, as a developer, will usually work on a project alongside many developers and team members with other skill sets. You and your team need to be efficient to make your project a success. You and your team may work using processes from the Agile methodology. In an Agile process, a team normally plan and execute two weeks of work to complete, which is called an iteration. Each iteration has a list of tasks to complete before the two weeks ends. These tasks, while complex in some cases, are aided by having version control in place. If you would like to learn more about the Agile methodology, there is a link to an additional reading at the end of this lesson. Testing and having some level of automation on every task introduced allows the team to be more efficient. It also ensures more confidence that any new feature being introduced will not break any existing flows. You now know what version control is all about. Great work! Now that you have a better understanding of the goals and benefits of version control, you are ready to learn how to start using it. An interesting fact about collaborating on projects at Meta is that engineers drive every project at Meta. They're in charge of coordinating with product, data scientists, researchers on what we're building and the timelines for that. Whereas in other companies, product managers or leadership is often in charge of each project. I'm Leila Rizvi. I'm a backend software engineer on Instagram Calling in San Francisco. In this video, I hope you learn that effective collaboration is important for engineers' success at Meta and learning how to use version control at Meta is also very important. As a backend engineer on Instagram Calling, for my role, I collaborate with other mobile engineers in my department on a daily basis so that we build the best products together. I also collaborate with Instagram messaging a lot because calling and messaging are closely tied. I also work with non-engineers like product and data scientists regularly as well. To collaborate effectively with my coworkers, we message each other on chat uh, to unblock one another, but when something warrants a meeting, we'll schedule a meeting. When something warrants a document, we collaborate together on a document with comments and leave notes for one another. Version control for Instagram is interesting because we have one giant monolithic repository for all of our code for backend. That means that whenever I'm making a change, uh, the code that I'm writing in is shared with every other Instagram team. It is risky in some ways, but it's also nice in others so I can reuse their code. The other thing that's interesting about version control at Meta is that any engineer can approve any change. At Meta, they're big on this saying that nothing at Meta is someone else's problem. So that means that any engineer can actually work on any change that they want to work on. Version control at Meta is a little different than version control at a lot of other places. While Meta has a giant monolithic repository for our code where we continuously release our code, many other companies have smaller repositories called microservices for each team. So each team has their own code base and only they work in it. They use branches so that they can 
take their code and merge it back with like the master brand for their team or product. This is great for smaller teams in some ways, but it has its cons in that you might run into a lot of merge conflicts at Meta because we have so many engineers. There would be too many merge conflicts if we had branches for each team in the company. Some collaboration challenges for version control on my team is that because we use a monolithic repository, merge conflicts happen a lot. So we try to write smaller changes uh, so that we can easily revert them. We also try to add a lot of gatekeepers so that if we ship something to production on Instagram, we can easily turn it off without waiting for any rollback. We also share our code with messenger calling. So we also have to add a lot of tests so messenger doesn't break us. Git blame is a way for us to look at the revision history for files. It helps us so that if I'm looking at a line of code and I don't understand it, I can figure out who wrote that code and reach out to them. I can also figure out what they were trying to do in that code. They write a message saying what the change was for. Um, it's also great so that I can figure out what change to revert if I'm trying to revert a change. I use it every single day. Uh, when I need to understand what some code is doing, I'll reach out to the point of contact that wrote that code, uh, which is especially helpful at Meta where there's so many engineers. I often don't know the person I need to get a hold of, so seeing their code helps. In this video, I hope you learn that learning how to work together effectively and collaborating well, as well as learning how to use version control effectively is critical for success at Meta. Getting a diverse set of perspectives on what features you should build, who you should build for, what a feature might need or how it can improve is really helpful. And the rewarding part is that your end result, your project ends up being better. As a developer working in a team, you are continually writing, changing, or updating existing source code. It may happen that while you are working on a new feature, another developer in the team is busy fixing an unrelated bug. With multiple developers all working in the same code base, keeping track of all of those additional updates can be problematic. Luckily, version control addresses these kinds of problems. In this video, you will discover the different types of version control systems, learn how they operate, and learn about their similarities and differences. There are many different version control systems available. For example, Subversion, Perforce, AWS Code Commit, Mercurial, and Git, to name a few. Version control systems can be split into two types or categories, centralized version control systems and distributed version control systems. Both types are quite similar, but they also have some key differences which set them apart from each other. Let's start with centralized version control systems. Centralized version control systems, or CVCS for short, contain a server and a client. The server contains the main repository that houses the full history of versions of the code base. Developers working on projects using a centralized system need to pull down the code from the server to their local machine. This gives the user their own working copy of the code base. The server holds the full history of changes. The client has the latest code, but every operation needs to have a connection to the server itself. In a centralized version control system, the server is the central copy of the project. After making changes to the code, the developer needs to push the changes to the central server so that other developers can see them. This essentially means that viewing the history of changes requires that you are connected to the server in order to retrieve and view them. Now let's discover how distributed version control systems work. Distributed version control systems, or DVCS for short, are similar to the centralized model. You still need to pull code down from the server to view the latest changes. The key difference is that every user is essentially a server and not a client. This means that every time you pull down code from the distributed model, you have the entire history of changes on your local system. Now that you know a little about CVCS and DVCS, let's explore some of the advantages and disadvantages of each. The advantage of CVCS is that they're considered easier to learn than their distributed counterparts. They also give more access controls to users. The disadvantage is that they can be slower given that you need to establish a connection to the server to perform any actions. With DVCS, you don't need to be connected to the server to add your changes or view a file's history. It works as if you are actually connected to the server directly, but on your own local machine. 
you only ever need to connect to the server to pull down the latest changes or to push your own changes. It essentially allows users to work in an offline state. Speed and performance are also better than its CVCS counterpart. DVCS is a key factor in improving developer operations and the software development lifecycle. You will learn more about DVCS later in this course. And there you have it. You can now differentiate between a centralized and a distributed version control system. You also learned how they operate and what their benefits are. As an aspiring developer, I'm sure you can appreciate the importance of version control systems. Well done. I'd like you to think back to a time when you thought you'd lost work because it had been overwritten or deleted. As you have previously learned, version control and version control systems help developers keep track of their code and up to date with any changes. In this video, you'll get a feel for how developers use version control to keep track of changes and resolve coding conflicts. When working with a team of developers, it's essential for the code base to have a source of truth that has all historical changes. Version control systems play an integral part in aiding this process by providing a full history of changes of every single file added to its repository. It makes collaboration across a team easier and also aids in working toward a common goal. Whether it is adding new features and following the flow of how they were implemented, or discovering where a potential issue may have been introduced, being able to accurately pinpoint the who, the when, and the what of those changes is paramount. The revision history will record the essential data points so any developer or team member can walk through the entire project from start to its current state. Every change that has occurred on the project should be easily accessible either by a simple command or integration into the developer's IDE. It's important for organizations to define standards for how developers communicate changes they make. Developers need to know prior to looking at the code what the lead developer's aims are. The more information, the better, and this creates a stronger team environment that is more transparent and open. Now I will guide you through an example of a typical development team working on an e-commerce application. Suppose you're working on a team with three other developers to release a new feature. You've been tasked with creating a new feature to enable experiments on the website. This will allow the marketing department to test user behavior. A daily report is generated that ranks the effectiveness of each experiment. The reports will give insights into how each experiment is doing. They will then provide the results of which experiment is the most successful and overall winner. After all the code changes, the developer will push their changes to the repository and create something called a pull request. Developers will then peer review the pull request to approve, request changes, or decline. When working on a single project, there's usually some level of crossover between the developers. When this does occur, the history of revisions can help aid the developers in seeing the full life cycle of changes that have occurred. It is also essential for merging conflicts where multiple developers have made changes that may need to be resolved prior to the code being approved. The history will show who made the change, for what reason, the code itself and its changes, and the date and time of when they occurred. Typically, on a new project, you will encounter changes in one task that may cause potential issues or conflicts with another. The history of revisions will give the team the ability to manage and merge these changes and deliver the business objectives in a timely manner. Well done. You've now learned about the history of revisions. Remember, it's vital to have a system in place to keep a record of all changes to the code base. This is critical when working with a team of other developers. You should now be able to describe how developers use version control to fix any conflicts that may occur during production. Well done. You've reached the end of this introductory module on software collaboration. It's now time to review what you've learned during these lessons. This module started with a case study about how software engineers collaborate across the globe without wrecking one another's code. You then began to explore the answer to the question, what is version control? You learned to describe how modern software teams collaborate and work on the same code base, list different version control systems, explained different version control methodologies, and explored software development workflows. 
you learned about the history of version control and that it has been in use before the internet was widely adopted. You explored conflict resolution and discovered the important role of version control in the software development process. You learned about some of the common tools and strategies developers use to implement version control, such as workflow, continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment. The differences between staging and production were explored, and you learned that the staging environment should mimic your production environment. You also learned the many areas that benefit from creating a staging environment, including new features, testing, migrations, and configuration changes. You learned that any issues should be caught and fixed in the staging environment before going live in production. You have also explored downtime, vulnerabilities, and reputation regarding production. You should now be familiar with version control. Well done. You're making good progress on your learning journey. One of the first things you learn to do when you use a computer for the first time is to operate the mouse and type on the keyboard. At first, it goes slow, but as you become more competent, you interact with your computer and it responds as you want it to. But what does it really mean to interact with your computer? In the context of using a computer, the term interact simply means to exchange information or even simpler, send and receive information. So essentially, a computer is sending data to you and you receive it. In turn, you also send some data to your computer and the computer receives it. I've talked about the mouse and the keyboard, but can you think of other ways in which you and your computer interact? Computers have various input and output devices. The input devices include a keyboard, mouse, microphone, camera, touch sensitive devices, and so on. The output devices are things like speakers, monitors, headsets, and haptic devices, to name just a few. You use all these devices to send data to a computer and receive data from it. But there's something else that supports communication with your devices. These are graphical user interfaces, or GUIs, which facilitate your interactions. GUIs are popular because they require very little training to use. GUIs offer an easy way to interact with devices, but they also somewhat limit the scope of human-computer interaction. As an alternative to GUIs and input devices, such as microphones, you will learn to interact with your computer through the command line. The command line is a very powerful alternative because it allows developers to perform tasks quicker and with enough experience, less potential for errors. To use this powerful tool effectively, you need to have a certain level of knowledge. You might feel that the learning curve for the command line is a bit steep, but take it from me, the payoff is definitely worth it. By learning just a few commands, you can perform various tasks, such as creating new directories, creating new files, combining directories, copying and moving files around different directories, and searching through files using various criteria and keywords. As you become more advanced in using the command line, you will be able to perform tasks such as track software, access and control remote servers, search for files using specific criteria, unzip archives, access software manuals, and display them in the command line install, upgrade, and uninstall software, and mount and unmount computer drives or check disk space, and so on. Pretty advanced stuff, don't you think? But the list goes on. You can write scripts to automate various tasks, control user access to files and programs, stop, start, and restart programs, create aliases of only a few characters long to initiate very long commands, download files from the internet, run various software, and finally, run and control self-contained virtual software, which is also known as containerization. There are many, many ways to use the command line. But for now, I will guide you through some basic commands to get you started. First, the CD command, which stands for change directory. This is used to point our command line to a specific directory, for instance, a certain folder. For example, on Linux, if I type cd tilde forward slash and desktop, I will point the command line to the desktop of my computer. When you type cd dot dot, you will move out of the current directory and back into the parent directory. Next is the touch command, which makes a new file of whatever type you specify. For example, 
to build a brand new file, you can run touch followed by the new file's name, for instance, example.txt. Note that the newly created file will be empty. You can also make new folders using the mkdir command. For example, mkdir followed by the title you want to give the new folder. To view a history of the most recently typed commands, you can use the history command. There are many other commands that you can use, but with the ones I just introduced, you can already do quite a lot. I'll take you through a quick scenario as an example. Let's say you want to point the command line to the desktop directory, and then add a new folder there titled MyJS Project. Next, you want to point the command line to the MyJS Project directory and make a new file, which you will call example.js. And finally, you want to open the example.js file in VS Code. To do all of this, you will need to run the following commands. The first action you'll do is to use the change directory or cd command. Then you want to use the mkdir command to make the new folder. To move into the new folder directory, you use the cd command again. And then you use the touch command to create the file. The final command is the code command, which will open the file in VS Code. If you've run all these commands correctly, you'll end up with a myjs project directory on the desktop with the example.js file inside of it, and additionally, that example.js file open inside VS Code, ready to be edited. In this video, you discovered that you can interact with computers on a more advanced level through the command line. You now have a better idea of what kind of advanced tasks the command line allows you to do. And you are also ready to try out a few basic commands. I encourage you to start practicing some of these commands. Just like you got better and better at typing and moving the cursor with your mouse, I assure you that with practice, you will soon use command line like a pro. I'm pretty sure you use your phone to perform a number of activities, such as sending messages, shopping online, and watching videos. You simply tap your screen, scroll, and swipe. But have you ever thought of how your phone responds to your tapping, scrolling, and swiping? You interact with your phone and computer through a graphic user interface, or GUI, which is just a layer above underlying commands that tells the device what to do. Developers, however, need to know how to use specific commands to perform various types of tasks. For example, to create a new folder on the desktop, you right-click and choose New Folder. In the command line, you use the specific command mkdir to achieve the same result. Having a grip on Unix commands specifically is a great skill to have in today's software development world. In this video, you will get started with a few basic Unix commands. Did you know that the majority of companies run their platforms on the cloud and 90% of these systems run on a platform called Linux? You might be wondering why I am discussing Linux while the topic of this video is Unix commands. To answer this, let's explore some history. Unix preceded Linux and was developed by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ricci and team at AT&T Labs in 1969. Linux came much later on and was originally developed as a hobby by Linus Torvalds, hence the name Linux. The commands that you will explore in this video originated from the Unix platform, but you can use them in most modern environments that run some flavor of Linux. Using the command line could seem a little intimidating at first, but you will quickly learn that Unix commands are simply a layer below the normal actions, such as opening file directories or renaming files. Windows, for example, became the dominant desktop operating system, mainly due to its easy-to-use GUI. Windows allowed non-technical users to perform tasks without having to learn a list of commands. But you, as an aspiring developer, will learn to perform tasks using Unix commands. Before I delve into some of the most common commands, it's important to note that each command has a set of helper instructions. These helpers give detailed information about how the commands can be run and how something we call flags can be passed. One of these helpers is the man command. Man is short for manual, and when called against a command, it will display a detailed manual of instructions for that given command. For example, the command man space ls will show you the detailed manual of instructions for the list command ls. 
You can also use something called flags in conjunction with Unix commands. Flags are used to modify the behavior of a command. Think of them as options that can either change or extend the functionality of the given command. Next, you will learn about some of the most commonly used Unix commands, and in the next video, you will see some of them in action. The CD, or Change Directory command, is used to move from different directories of the file system. You can learn more about working with relative and absolute paths from the additional reading at the end of this lesson. LS is used to show the contents of the current working directory. The LS command can accept many different types of flags that will change what is returned in the response. For example, LS-L lists the file out in list order and shows the read or write permissions, owners, and groups it belongs to. LS-A, on the other hand, will list all files and directories, including hidden ones. The PWD, or Print Working Directory command, shows the full path of the current working directory. The Copy, or CP command, copies files or folders from one destination to another. And the MV, Move command, moves files from one directory to another. In this video, you learned about some of the most commonly used Unix commands. Next time you use your device, think about what commands run underneath the GUI to complete the tasks you are performing. Okay, so I've opened up my terminal window. Let's navigate to my home directory. I type the cd command and then a tilde, followed by the enter key. Then I use the ls-la command to return all of the files in a list, including all hidden files. Notice two files, a bash rc file and a bash profile file. For now, I want you to focus on the bash rc file first. I can use the command less dot bash rc to check this file. The bash rc file is mainly for configurations. It is essentially a script file that's executed when you first open the terminal window. What's in there will be configurations for the shell itself. For example, the types of colors that I'm using. I can also add in things around my shell history, like how much history of previous commands I want to store and so on. So any configuration options that I put in here will be executed when the terminal session begins. I press the Q key to exit the less environment. The other file is the bash profile file. So I can run the less command again, this time with dot profile. This tends to be used more for environment variables. For example, I can use it for setting environment variables for my Java home directory or my Python home directory or whatever is needed during development. Again, I press the Q key to exit. Now I will create a simple shell script. For this example, I will use Vim, which is an editor that I can use which accepts input. So type vim, and then I create a new file by typing the test shell.sh and press the enter key. And then at the top of the file, I put in what type of file I want it to be. In this case, it's going to be a bash file. If I press the I key on my keyboard, it'll set insert mode. Then I put in a hash symbol, followed by an exclamation mark, a forward slash, the word bin, another forward slash, and then the word bash. This lets the operating system know that this is a bash script. The script is very simple. I want to print out some type of text onto the screen. So I use the echo command and type in what I want to print out. In this case, hello world. Press escape to get out of insert mode. Then I type colon wq exclamation mark to save the file. Press enter. And if I look in the directories now, notice there is now a file named testshell.sh. The other thing to notice is that this file can't be run at the moment. In other words, it's not executable. It's just a read-write file, but I want it to be executable, which requires that I have an X being set on it. In order to do that, I have to use another command, which is called chmod. After using this command, I type in the type of permissions that I want. So I type in 755. And then I want to set the file that I want to add the permissions to, which is testshell.sh. And if I use the ls-la command again, I notice that the file has now been turned into an executable file. This means that I can now run the file from the command line.
To run the file, I press dot forward slash test shell dot sh followed by the enter key. And now you notice the words hello world are printed out on the screen. This is how you can create simple scripts and make them executable within the bash shell. I've opened up the command line and first I want to check what directory I'm currently in. To do that, I run the pwd command. pwd is short for print working directory. I type pwd and press the enter key. The command returns a forward slash, which indicates that I'm currently in the root directory. This is the top level directory within the operating system. If I want to check the contents of the root directory, I run another command called ls, which is short for list. I type ls and press the enter key. And now notice I get a list of different names of directories within the root level. In order to get more detail of what each of the different directories represents, I can use something called a flag. Flags are used to set options to the commands you run. Use the list command with a flag called L, which means the format should be printed out in a list format. I type ls space dash L, press enter, and this returns the results in a list structure. Let's focus on some items in this list. First, you need to know what's the difference between the link file, a directory, and a standard file. The link file is always represented by the L, and it's always going to be at the very start of the output. The temp directory has an arrow beside it, which points to TMP. This means temp is the same link to the actual directory TMP. The next item is the bin directory, and it's represented as a D. That means that's just the standard directory and that you can use the change directory command to actually open the directory and check its contents. Now let's focus on the etc directory. To change directory, use the cd command. I type cd etc to change to the etc directory and press enter. Now I type ls to check the contents. Notice that the contents are completely different from the root. The command returns what's inside the etc directory. To verify that you're in the etc directory, run the pwd command and it confirms that you are in etc. Again, if I want to change the output, type ls-l and it returns a printed list format in list structure. Let's cover a standard file, like a text file or a configuration file. The association or the symbol for it is the hyphen. In this case, it represents the file resolve.conf. Understanding the different symbols and different name conventions is important when you're trying to find specific files. Notice that there is a root and that these just represent the owner and the group that it's associated to. So if I want to move back from the etc directory, there are two ways to do it. One is by typing in cd dot dot, which means that I go back up to the parent directory, press enter, and then I type pwd. Notice I am now back in the root directory. To step back into etc, type cd etc. To confirm that I'm back there, type pwd and enter. If I want to use the other alternative, you can do an absolute path. Type in cd forward slash and press enter. Then I type pwd and press enter. You can verify that I am back at the root again. To step through multiple directories, use the same process. Type cd etc and press enter. Check the contents of the files by typing ls and pressing enter. Let's try another directory. For example, the ssh directory, type cd ssh and press enter. Then type ls and press enter. Again, you'll notice the different output from each one. To move back up to the previous directory, I can use the cd dot dot and I should now be in the etc directory. And then again, back to the root using cd dot dot, which will take you back to the root itself. Finally, I can confirm that I am in the root by typing the pwd command and pressing enter. You have now learned how to navigate and change directories. So first, I want to check what current directory I'm in by using the pwd command and pressing the enter key. 
you can see that I'm in the root directory, which displays as forward slash root. If I type in the ls-l command, notice that I have one directory in here called projects. Now, I will create a new directory called submissions. I do this by typing mkdir, which stands for make directory, and then the word submissions. This is the name of the directory I want to create, and then I hit the enter key. I then type in ls-l for list so that I can see the list structure. And now notice that a new directory called submissions has been created. I can then go into this directory using the change directory command. I do this by typing cd submissions and then press the enter key. I type the ls command and notice that there is nothing in there. If I want to add some text files or some content, I can use another command called touch. I type touch test one dot txt followed by the enter key. To add another text file, I type in touch test two dot txt followed by the enter key again. Now I run the ls l command and notice that the two text files are listed inside the submissions folder. After this, I want to go back to the root level directory and I do this by typing in cd dot dot followed by the enter key. And then I run the ls l command again and notice two directories are now listed, projects and submissions. Now I want to create another directory called archive. To do this, type mkdir followed by the word archive and then hit the enter key. To see all of the directories, enter the ls l command followed by the enter key again. Once again, notice that three directories are now listed, archive, projects, and submissions. To get back to the top view of my terminal, I can clear my screen by typing clear followed by the enter key. After this, I type in the ls-l command, and now I can see all three directories. Okay, so let's say I want to move the submissions folder into the archive folder. This requires a different command called move, written as mv. In this example, I need to specify the directory I want to move and then where to move it to. So I type in mv submissions followed by the word archive and then I hit the enter key. Then I can check to see if the move happened by using the ls-l command and now notice that the submissions directory is gone. So now I want to go to the archive directory by typing cd archive. Again, I use the ls-l command and now notice that the submissions directory is listed inside of the archive directory. Recall that I created two text files inside the submissions directory? Well, you'll notice that they were also moved to the archive directory. So I go to the submissions directory by typing cd submissions, which changes the directory. I use the ls-l command followed by the enter key. And now you can see the two text files are present and they were moved too. You have now learned how to make directories and files and move directories and files. Okay, so I have launched my terminal and I'm running the ls command. It informs me that I have two folders, archive and projects. Next, I can change directory into archive using the cd command and search inside using ls. This reveals a submissions folder. I can then type the cd submissions command to enter into the submissions folder and check what's inside. The ls command reveals two files file1.txt and file2.txt. Each of these files have some content in them. I can check the content of a file by running another command called cat. I run the command cat file1.txt. This returns the contents of the file, which is some simple text. Another command is the word count command, which is abbreviated as wc. To use this command, I can just call it against the file by typing wc file1.txt w. The w flag tells the wc command to return the word count. The output informs me that there are 181 words in the file. Let's run another example with pipes. 
Pipes allow you to pass the output from one command as the input to another. I can perform an ls command on the current directory. Note that this outputs two file names. Let's type the ls command again. Then I pass in my pipe using the vertical line character. Then I use the wc command with the dash w flag. Notice that it returns a result of two because there's two files in the system. So, what if I want to find the word count of a file using pipes? I just change the ls command to catfile1.txt pipe wc dash w. This returns a word count of 181 for file1.txt. Did you know that you can also combine this command against the directory or multiple files? For example, I can use the command to get a combined word count for file 1 and file 2. To get this data, I just input the command cat file 1.txt and then also pass in file 2.txt. Then I use a pipe followed by a wc-w. This returns a total word count of 362 for the two files. In this video, you will learn about redirection and the different types of redirection you can use. The basic workflow of any Linux command is that it takes an input and gives an output. The standard input device is the keyboard. The standard output device is the screen. With redirection, you can change the standard input and or output. There are three types of I.O. or input-output redirections. Standard input, standard output, and standard error. The shell keeps a reference of standard input, output, and error by a numbering system. The zero is for standard input, one is for standard output, and two is for standard error. Now you will learn about each of these redirection types. Let's start with standard input. Taking input normally refers to a user typing information from the keyboard. We use the less than sign for user input. The cat command can be used to record user input and save it to a file. How do we take input and store it in a file such as a .txt file? Let me explain how you can do this by using an example to store user input to a text file. So I have just launched my terminal. But how do we take input and store it in a file such as a .txt file? One of the commands you learn to use frequently in this course is the cat command. This command is actually set up to take in input. On my terminal, I type the cat command followed by a greater than sign and then follow it by the name of the input file. In this scenario, input.txt. Press enter. Now I can add text to the text file created. At the end of the text, press enter. Next, press control D to tell the cat command that's the end of the file. To output the contents of the file, enter cat followed by a less than sign, followed by input.txt. Press enter. Notice that the text that I added from the keyboard displays. Let's discuss standard output now. A lot of the commands we have already used, for example, ls, send their output to a special file called the standard output. Output direction is handled with a greater than sign. I.O. allows us to use redirection to control where the output goes. Now I will demonstrate how you can send output to a text file. Everything in Unix Linux is a file. This means every time you run a command like ls and press enter, it sends the output of the file to an std out file. In Linux, if you want to control where the output goes, you can use a redirection. How do we do that? Enter the ls command enter dash L to print it as a list. Instead of pressing enter, add a greater than sign redirection. Now we have to tell it where we want the data to go. In this scenario, I choose an output.txt file. The output.txt file has not been created yet, but it will be created based on the command I've set here with a redirection flag. Press enter, type ls, then press enter again to display the directory. The output file displays. 
To view the content of that file, use the last command followed by output.txt and press Enter. The content that displays using the ls-l directory includes the different files available. Errors occur when things go wrong. When using redirection, you also have to specify that the error should be written to a file. You can do that by explicitly setting the number 2 before the output arrow. And you can also combine it with the standard output of 2 greater than ampersand 1 to print both the standard output and error if any occurs. You have already learned that input is represented by 0 according to the shell. Output is represented by 1. The input stream uses the less than sign. The output stream uses the greater than sign. And the error stream uses 2 followed by the greater than sign. It may happen that an error occurs when you are outputting data to a text file. Remember that the error will not correspond with the output stream. It will change to use the error stream which is represented by 2. Let me now demonstrate how this works. So I have the terminal open and I'm running a similar example to the standard output. Type the ls command. Follow this by dash l to try and print it as a list. Instead of using a directory that we know exists, I'm going to use one that doesn't exist. Enter forward slash bin forward slash usr. Now type a greater than sign followed by the name of the output file. In this scenario, type error.txt. Press enter. Notice that the message cannot access. It states that there is no such file or directory. Normally, you think that it would still print the contents of the file, but because an error occurred, it prints it to the console. There are two ways to send the contents to the error.txt file. I type ls-l forward slash bin forward slash usr, then add the number 2, which represents the error output, followed by the greater than sign. Now enter the name of the output file, error.txt. Press Enter. To see what we have inside the error file, type less followed by the file name. In this case, error.txt. Press Enter. The error message ls cannot access forward slash bin forward slash no such file or directory displays. If you want to handle both cases where it may find data or may not find data, you can pass in a different redirection. So it handles each one both for output and for error. To do this, again, enter ls-l forward slash bin forward slash usr. Next, add the greater than sign for output, followed by the file name error underscore output dot txt. This time, we're going to use another redirection to signify that we also want to get errors. To do this, I enter a 2 followed by a greater than sign. This is followed by an ampersand sign and the number 1 to get the output that is available. Press Enter. To have a look inside the error file, type less error underscore output dot txt and press Enter. Notice that the error is contained inside the error.output file displays. And that brings us to the end of this video. Now you know what redirection is and how to use the three types of input-output redirections. Well done. GREP stands for Global Regular Expression Print, and it's used for searching across files and folders as well as the contents of files. On my local machine, I enter the command ls-l and see that there's a file called names.txt. If I access that file using the less command, it displays a list of first names in non-sequential order, as in not arranged alphabetically. So what I'll do first is use grep to find some patterns of names that start with similar matches. Then, I'll also show how grep can be passed with different flags to get different results. First, I'll perform a standard search using grep. So, what I'm going to do is look for names that begin with Sam by entering the command grep sam names .txt. This then returns a list of names that begin with Sam. Keep in mind that grep is case sensitive, which means if I run the same query with a lowercase s, it returns a completely different set of results. 
Because this query doesn't match the capital S, it returns partial matches in which Sam appears in the middle or end of a name rather than the beginning. Fortunately, I can pass in a flag to ignore case sensitivity. I can do this with the command grep minus I, followed by the keyword Sam, and then the file name names.txt again. This time, I get back both users that begin with Sam and also with Sam as a partial match in the middle or the end of the name. So the result set changes based on the type of query that I pass through with different flags. We can also do an exact match by passing in a different flag, and that's the dash W, which means it'll match exactly what I'm looking for. So I'll input grep dash W and then pass in the keyword Sam with a capital S, and finally, our file name, names.txt. In this case, we only get back a single result with the name Sam, as any partial matches are ignored. Lastly, I can use a pipe command to combine different searches for grep itself. For example, let's say I want to search across a list of directories for certain executable files. I can combine that with different commands and search across the file structure to find exactly what I'm looking for. If I check all the executable files inside the bin directory by running ls forward slash bin, it returns a long list of results. In order to filter that down, I can run the same query of ls forward slash bin, but this time I'm going to pipe it. Pass in a grep and then enter the keyword zip. You'll find that in this case, I get a much smaller subset back in the results. And if I need to refine it further, then I can also apply the different flags to look for an exact match, a partial match, or ignore case sensitivity. Great work. You've reached the end of this module on the command line. It's now time to review what you've learned during these lessons. In this module, you learned how to use the command line to execute commands in Linux. You were introduced to some of the most commonly used commands that traverse, create, rename, and delete files on your hard drive. You learned how to use piping and redirection to create powerful workflows that automate your work. Having completed this module, you should be able to describe what the command line is and how it is used, explore your hard drive using the command line, create, rename, and delete files and folders on your hard drive using Unix commands, and use pipes and redirection. This module began with a video exploring the answer to the question, what are Unix commands? You learned how to determine the current working directory using the pwd command. You also explored how to create and change directories and files using the command line. You can now create a working directory, create two different directories, dir1 and dir2 create files and directories inside dir1 and dir2. You can now also use grep to search for files, folders, and contents of files. You're now familiar with the command line. Well done. You're making good progress on your learning journey. Are you familiar with version control or version control systems? Here's a quick example of where they're useful. Have you ever opened an app on your phone and received a prompt to update to a new version? These prompts most likely direct you towards an app store where you then download the latest version. As you download the new version, you might notice a new layout, button, or piece of functionality. In software and web development, developers use version control to track the differences between versions. And a popular method of tracking versions is the use of version control technologies like Git and GitHub. In this video, you'll discover the answer to the question, what is Git and GitHub? You will learn about the differences between Git and GitHub and how web developers make use of them, and explore the benefits and advantages of both services. Let's start off with Git. Git is a version control system designed to help users keep track of changes to files within their projects. Git was designed to address the challenges that its creator, Linus Torvalds, was having managing the development of the Linux kernel, the operating system for Linux. Linux has thousands of contributors who commit changes and updates daily. Git was designed to help with the challenge of tracking all these changes and updates. 
As well as helping to keep track of changes, Git was also designed to tackle some of the shortcomings of other version control systems. The benefits that Git offers over similar systems include better speed and performance, reliability, free and open source access, and an accessible syntax. It's also important to note that Git is used predominantly via the command line. Developers tend to find Git syntax and commands easy to learn. The other service commonly used by developers is GitHub. GitHub is a cloud-based hosting service that lets you manage Git repositories from a user interface. A Git repository is used to track all changes to files in a specific folder and keep a history of all those changes. It incorporates Git version control features and extends these by providing its own features on top. Some of the most common of these features include access control, pull requests, and automation. You will learn more about these later in this course. The features are split out into different pricing models to suit different size teams and organizations. It's also important to point out that GitHub is very popular among web developers. It's like a social network. For example, projects can be private or public. Users on GitHub have their own profile, which other users can follow. Public projects can accept code contributions from anyone across the globe. And it also includes multiple features outside of its core development tools, like documentation, ticketing, and project features. You're now familiar with Git and GitHub version control systems, along with the benefits and advantages that they offer. This is just the beginning of your version control journey with Git and GitHub. Great work. OK, so I have just logged in to the GitHub website. Once there, I click on the green button with the text Create Repository. When I click on the button, I am redirected to the Create a New Repository screen, where I'll be prompted for who the owner is. I choose my account as the owner option for this example. Next, I need to input a repository name. So I type a name called my-first-repo. Notice that the input field has a green tick icon beside it. This is just GitHub letting me know that this name is available to create the repository. If it's not, I will see an X icon and be prompted to rename it. OK, so now I need to type a value for the description input. For this, I type practice account for learning Git. The next option I want you to know about is if you want the repository to be public or private. Public just means that anyone on the internet can see the repository. I still have control over who can make changes to it. It's just available on the viewable aspect of it on the internet. The next option is private, meaning it's not available for anyone to see. I can only allow access by granting people access to the repository. The next few options are about initialization. I can initialize a repository with a readme file, a git ignore file, and a license if one is required. For now, I'm just going to choose the readme file option and then click the Create Repository button. OK, so a repo has now been set up, and I can see that I have one single file in the repository called readme.md. MD is just short for Markdown, a popular method for creating documentation because it's shorthand for creating HTML pages. This allows me to do things like creating titles and texts. I can insert images and various other web page elements. Notice that the main branch has also been created, and it's important to know that every repository you create will have a single main branch at the start. This is also known as the main line. Next, I'm presented with additional button options. The first is labeled Go to File. Then there is Add File, which you can use to add a new file from the UI. And finally, a green button labeled Code. Clicking this button provides me with the GitHub UI options for cloning down the repository. First is the option for HTTPS, which contains the HTTPS URL of the repository. And I can use this to pull it down by using the git clone command. Next, there is an option for SSH. But to use that, I have to set up my SSH keys and assign them to the user accounts. And finally, I have the GitHub CLI option. Underneath, notice that there are additional options for GitHub Desktop if I would like to use that. And finally, I can also download a compressed zip file containing all the files and folder structures. For this demo, 
I will show you how to use HTTPS. To begin, select the HTTPS option and click on the copy button to copy the HTTPS URL for cloning. Now I go to my command line that I will be using to run the commands to clone the repository. I'm currently in my home directory. Okay, so what I usually like to do is create a directory for all repositories that I'm working on at the moment. First, I create a directory using the command make dir. Then I type the name of the directory I want to create, which is projects. Next, I can cd into that. And now I can run the commands to clone the project from the GitHub UI. To do this, I type the command git clone and paste the HTTPS URL I copied earlier. Finally, I press enter on my keyboard. Notice that I receive a message stating that Git is cloning into the My First Repo folder. It then displays messages about all the objects that have been received. It also displays a 100% status message and then finally a statement that simply says done. Now I can list the directory by running the ls-la command, which means list all directories. Notice that I have my repository, which I named My First Repo. This is the name of the repository that we set up on GitHub. Finally, if I enter inside that folder using the cd command, I can see a single file, the readme.md file. If I use the ls-la command, another file is listed, which is just named .git. You will learn more about this later when you explore how to use this for source control. As you now know, GitHub is a cloud-based hosting service that lets you manage Git repositories from a user interface. It's like a social network. You can follow users or accept code contributions from anywhere in the world. In a previous video, you created and cloned a repository to your local device. I am now going to explain to you how to pull the repository to your local device. I will be demonstrating commands that you can use in Git Bash Shell for Windows users and Terminal for Mac users. This refers to the application where the commands are typed in. Let's move to the directory I want by typing cd and the name of the directory, my first repo. Once inside the directory, run the list all command by typing ls space dash la. Dash la is short for list all. There are four items in this directory. I will focus on two of them, the .git item and the readme.md item. Let's start with the readme.md file. This item was added when I created the repository on GitHub. The other item is a folder called .git, which is a hidden folder used to track all the changes. In Linux, any folder starting with a dot is a hidden folder. This folder is automatically created when you create a repository, and you will learn more about it later in this course. In the command I ran, I added the switch dash la, so we would list all files and folders, including the hidden ones. The .git folder is initialized by running the git init command. As the repository was created on GitHub, it was not required for us to run it. GitHub handled all of this as part of its create new repo flow. Now let's focus on Git workflow. Git uses workflows which can be broken into three states, namely modified, staged, and committed. Now I will go over each state and then provide an example of adding a new file to my Git repository to show it in action. Let's start with the first state. Adding, removing, and updating any file inside the repository is considered a modified state. Git knows the file has changed but does not track it. This is where the staging state comes in. Let's turn to it now. In order for Git to track a file, it needs to be put in the staged area. Once added, any modifications are tracked, which offers a security blanket prior to committing the changes. Then the last state is the committed state. Committing a file in Git is like a save point in many ways. Git will save the file and have a snapshot of the current changes. Let me introduce you to an example that summarizes the workflow clearly. Suppose you have a workflow that contains the three stages just mentioned, as well as the remote repository. A file is added from the working directory to the staging area. From there, the file is committed and then pushed to the remote repository. From the remote repository, the file can now be fetched and checked out 
or merged to a working directory. You will learn more about this later. Well done. You've covered some of the Git fundamentals and now know what is inside a Git folder and understand the Git workflow. So I've opened up my terminal window. I'll have a look at what directory I'm currently located in. I can do this by running the pwd command, which is short for print working directory. Notice that I'm in the directory my first repo. Now I can check inside that directory by running the ls-la command. I can see that I have two items a readme.md file and a hidden folder called .git. Before I add any files or make any changes, it's always good practice to check if any changes or commits are currently there. I can do this by using the git status command. Git status also displays what branch I'm on. In this instance, I'm prompted that I'm on the branch called main and that my branch is up to date with the origin main. This means that all the latest files on my local machine are exactly the same as what is displayed on the GitHub UI, which represents the server that everyone commits to. Git status also tells me that I have nothing to commit and that my working tree is clean. Now, let me show you how to add a simple text file. I'll add a file called test.txt by using the command touch test.txt. Then I'll run the command git status again. Now, Git is telling me that I have an untracked file, which is the test.txt file that I just added. It's also telling me that I have nothing added to the commit, but that untracked files are present, and that I should use git add to track them. The purpose of the git add command is that I'm essentially prompting Git and letting it know that I want to track this file, and that it'll be included as part of my commit. The first phase of this process is just to run the command git add test.txt. Now I'm going to run git status again to check that file is now being tracked. Notice again that I'm notified that my branches are up to date. But it's also telling me now that there are staged changes to be committed, which is this new file called test.txt. It prompts me asking if I want to revert those changes. For this, I can use the git restore command with the flag dash dash stage and the file name test.txt. Running the command will unstage the file from the commit. I then run git status one more time to see the file is back to an untracked status. So once again, I'll add the file using git add test.txt, run git status, and now notice that the file is back in a tracked state. Okay, let me clear my screen before moving on. To do this, I use the clear command. Now, any changes that I make from here on will be tracked. And then at the end, I will use the git commit command. The staged area is really important because you're essentially preparing to get all of the files and changes that you want as part of whatever feature you're working on. Basically, you are getting all of that content ready for commit. You also have to remember that this is only on your local machine. The distributed manner of Git means it will only push to the server using the actual push command itself. But any change you make here is only specific to you and your local machine. Anyone else who pulls down the project from GitHub will only get what's available on the remote server. Okay. Now I want to explain to you how to run the git commit command. First, type in git commit. You can pass in a flag of dash m, which stands for message, allowing you to type in a message which will be attached to the commit. In this example, the message is adding a new file for testing. Next, press return on the keyboard. And now notice that the response states one file change, zero insertions, zero deletions. There is also a create mode statement with the name of the file, test.txt. Finally, if I run the git status command, the response says that there is nothing to commit and the working tree is clean. However, I want to be aware of the message at the top of my screen. This message tells me to use git push to publish my local commits. And this ties back in with what I mentioned earlier. All of these changes are on my local machine and they will only be uploaded to the remote server when I run the push command. You learn more about the push and pull commands in a future lesson. Okay, I've opened my command line.
I should check to ensure that I'm in the correct directory using the pwd command. I can see that I'm in the my first repo directory. Now it's a good practice to perform a git status command to make sure that I have no commits outstanding. If there are no commits and the shell is clear, then my branch will show as up to date with origin main outside of the main branch itself. So my next step would be to create a new branch. To create this new branch, I use the git checkout command by typing git checkout dash b. I then call this new branch feature forward slash lesson, which I'll refer to as feature lesson for the purpose of this video. But this is just one way to create a branch. I could also use git branch and pass in the name as well. These methods are the same and can both be used to create a branch. The key difference between them is that git branch just creates a branch. But git checkout dash b moves me from the main branch into the branch that I created. I can verify that I've been moved between branches by running the git branch command. This will then tell me if I have switched from the main branch to one of the feature lesson branches. Any changes that I make will now only occur in this new branch. It's important to remember that the main branch has no indication or knowledge of any of these changes, even when I push code to the main repository. This is because that branch exists in isolation. The new branch needs to be merged back into the main branch to recognize changes in the feature lesson branch. This is where it'll come in with a pull request. The purpose of a pull request is to obtain a peer review of changes made to the branch. In other words, to validate that the changes are correct. When coding, many teams will have conditions around the unit tests and the integration tests. These conditions will usually include validating that the standards have been met for merging back into the main line. A team will also check for any issues that might have been missed. The next step is to add a file to the new branch. I can create a simple text file called test2.txt using the command touch test2.txt. Then I add it using the git add command. I then commit it using the git commit command. Once I've committed the new file, I need to push my changes up to the remote repository with git push. I type git push dash u origin feature lesson. It's good practice to specify dash u. This means that I'm only going to get updates from the upstream, which in this case will be the main branch. The result of this is that the origin won't be my main branch anymore. Instead, it's feature lesson. I press the enter key and this pushes the new branch up to the remote repository. As I am using HTTPS, I will be prompted for my login information. Once this action has been completed, GitHub will recognize that a new branch has been added. It will then prompt me to create a pull request that can be compared against another branch, in this case, the main branch. So my next step is to open the GitHub UI. GitHub will show my new branch with a prompt. Click on the Compare and Pull Request button. A pull request lets the team know that I've made new changes that I want them to review, and that I also want to approve or request changes to the actual pull request itself. Another thing to note on the GitHub UI is that I'm comparing this with the main branch. I've essentially cut a branch from the main called Feature Lesson. I've then added a new file called test2.txt, and it's this file which is the main difference between the two branches. Next, I check the pull request. I can see that there's been one commit. In other words, just one file has been changed and it's been added as test2.txt. I then click Create Pull Request. The team will then review the changes and either approve or decline them. Once approved, you can then merge your changes to the main branch. This is much cleaner than everyone working off the main branch. It's particularly useful if you have features that are closely tied together. For example, you could be working with a feature that crosses over with some code or requires changes that most likely will be altered by someone else. So, the approach of keeping everything at branch level is much easier than having everyone working from the main line. In fact, everyone working off the same branch is more likely to cause issues. 
Having independent branches makes the project easier to manage. Also, there's no limit to how many branches you can have. The team decide on the naming conventions that they use. In a lot of cases, when adding a new feature, you can add the keyword feature, then followed by the branch name, like a URL path, such as feature forward slash lesson in this example. For bug fixing, fix forward slash can be used. So because we have no reviewers in my current project, I'm just going to merge the branch. Then I'll confirm the merge. Once confirmed, I'm presented with the option to delete the branch. On your own projects, it's up to you whether you want to keep the branches or delete them. For now, I'm going to keep the branch. Then I can return to my code where the test2.txt file has merged into the main branch. I can then confirm that by going back to my command line. Next, I look at git status again to check if there's something to commit. At this point, there's nothing outstanding. I'm still on the feature lesson branch. I can check out my main branch by typing git checkout main. Then I run the git pull command. I'll then receive the latest changes that were merged in from the feature branch that I just created. Notice that the test2.txt file is now available. I can also verify that by doing a simple check within the directory by using the ls command. This returns a readme file, test.txt, and the test2.txt, which is from my branch. You have now learned the branching workflow, which you'll use regularly when collaborating with other developers. In the pre-internet era, saving project files to different machines for backup and transfer was a tedious process. It required manually copying files between machines one at a time, making things slow for teams. Nowadays, the cloud has enabled a more efficient way to do this. And in this video, I'll explain the differences between remote and local on GitHub. You have previously learned about the flows modified, staged, and committed in a Git workflow. Now you will learn about pushing your changes from your local to a remote repository. Remote refers to any other remote repository to which developers can push changes. This can be a centralized repository, such as one provided by GitHub, or repositories on other developer devices. In this lesson, you will be hearing some new terms, such as clone, push, pull, and repo. Don't worry, these will all be explained soon. The remote code is accessed through a URI, which is unique and only accessible to those who have permission. Local, on the other hand, refers to your machine, which can be a laptop, desktop, or even a mobile device, and is only accessible to you. To demonstrate both of these in action, let's say we have a project called Coding Project 1, which is located on GitHub with a unique URL. In other words, this project is stored on the remote server. When a user wants to copy this project to their local device, they need to either perform a clone, if it's the first time, or pull it to get the latest changes. To clone a project, a user must first choose a folder on their local machine. Coding Project 1 is then cloned from the server and copied into the chosen folder. The user can then make changes to the project and push those changes back to the server. Other users working on the code base won't see those changes on their local machines, unless they pull the latest changes from the server. One of the advantages of Git is that you can work offline and then commit your changes when you are ready. Now, let's go through an example of how exactly you would do this in GitHub. In this video, I'm going to explain what local and remote mean in GitHub and help you to understand the differences between the two. First off, I'm going to create a new local repository using the git init command. I'll start by inputting mkdir to create a new directory, and then I'll set the name as my second repo. Next, I'll use the change directory command, which is cd, followed by the name that I just set. Finally, I'll perform the git init command to create my new repository. This will return a line telling me that an empty repository has been initialized under root, projects, my second repo. If I execute another command called git remote, it comes back as blank. The reason for that is that I've only initialized a local repository which has no connection to a central repository that sits either on GitHub or another server. Right now, it's only available locally on my machine. Now, I'll step back out from this directory and go into my first repo with a cd command again. 
This is a repository that I created earlier and does have a connection to GitHub using the remote URI. I'll then check it by using the git remote minus v command. Git tells me that it's set to git tutorials 101 my first repo dot git. Next, I'm going to set this against our second repository. I'll step into the new directory once more using the cd command. In this case, we're going to add this URL to the remote settings by using the command git remote add, specifying a name and then passing in our URI. The name that is typically used here is origin, so I'll stick with that. So again, the full command with the URL should read git remote add origin git at github.com git tutorials 101 my first repo dot git. This time when I execute the git remote minus v command, I have this set up against the git tutorials 101, which sits up on GitHub. What I'm going to do next is use the git pull command, which will connect with the GitHub server and pull down all the changes from the repository. So on my local, I now have all the changes, but when I check the directory, it's blank. The reason for this is that I haven't set up a branch that matches with what I have on the server repository. Fortunately, I can change that by performing the command git checkout main, which will set up a branch main on my local that tracks the branch main from the remote. And now when I check my folder using the ls command, it confirms that I have the readme, test, and test2 files available on my local. In this video, you learned about the differences between local and remote in GitHub. This will help set you up to exchange data more efficiently within your development team. See you next time. By now, you should know how to use git add and git commit to add new changes to your local repository, put them into the staging area, and get them ready for a commit. Now, let me guide you through the next step and upload these changes to the remote repository using git push. I'll also demonstrate how to retrieve changes from the remote servers and apply them to your local repository with git pull. Before we begin, let's go over the command line and perform the command git status. Git tells me that I'm on the branch main, but also that my branch is ahead of the origin main branch by one commit. What this means is that all the changes that I have on my local repository are currently ahead of what is stored in the remote repository on GitHub. That ties into Git's distributed workflow in which you can work in an offline state and then only ever communicate with a remote repository when you use the commands of git push or git pull. Now I'll guide you on pushing your changes to the remote repository, and then I'll demonstrate how to use the pull command to get the latest changes. It's always good practice to check which branch you're currently on, and you can use git status or git branch to do this. This is important because if you do make changes in a different branch, you need to specify where you're pushing up to. So let's push up the changes using the git push command. I'll specify the origin branch to be the main branch, as in I'm pushing my changes to the origin as the remote repository, and then I want to push it to this branch as the main. I'll be prompted for my login information as I am pushing using HTTPS. Once I enter my login information, you'll notice that the commit is pushed from the local main to the remote main on the remote repository. Let's refresh the page on the GitHub website. You can see that my test.txt file now appears there. That's taken the commit snapshot that I have in my local repository and pushed it up to the remote repository. Git has then compared those files with what's on the remote repository to find any conflicts or problems. If none are found, it'll just merge them straight through, which is classed as an auto merge. If there are any conflicts, my push will fail. Before doing a push, it's also good practice to perform a git pull in order to get the latest changes from the remote repository and reduce the odds of encountering a conflict. Because I only have a single file and this will be a new repository, I'm not going to run into any conflicts or any issues. So now let's move on and I will guide you through how you can use git pull. Normally, when you're working on a project, you could have several developers all submitting with different branches, different code, and different features. In order for you to get those changes, you need to use the git pull command. To demonstrate this, I will add a single line to the test.txt file 
using the GitHub UI and then add the commit change, updated the test.txt file. I'll then commit it directly to the main branch by clicking on Commit Changes. The changes now appear on the UI, but because I haven't used the git pull command on my local machine yet, I should have no content on the test.txt file. Let's verify by using the cat command on test.txt, and sure enough, the file is empty, which is what you'd expect. As I mentioned before, I need to run the command git pull. This will get the latest changes from the remote repository. If any new changes were added, it'll be reflected in the shell output. I run the command, and in this case, git tells me that one file has changed with one insertion. If I run the cat command on test.txt once more, it shows that the line, this is my change, is now available in my local directory. With git pull, you're taking all that data from the remote server. Git then merges the snapshot from the remote with the snapshot that's on your local. It will auto-merge them if there's no conflicts. Once that's complete, I'll have the latest changes on my local machine. You have now learned how to push to and pull from your GitHub repository. Have you ever applied for a job? You know the process. Prepare your resume, look for jobs, submit an application, prepare for interviews. That is an example of a workflow. In computer programming, workflows are really important. By the end of this video, you will be able to describe what a workflow is, and you will also be able to identify different workflows available. Now, let's start with an example to illustrate why workflows are important. As a developer working on a project, you first need to pull the project down from a remote repository to your local machine. This is commonly called checking out a project or pulling a project. Once on your local machine, you can build and run the project and make changes. When you are done, you have to push the changes you made back to the remote repository so other developers can see them. From this example, you can understand that the purpose of a workflow is to guide you and other members of your team. It should not disrupt or cause blockers for deployment or testing or for any other developer who contributes to the project itself. Choosing a workflow needs careful consideration. It can depend on the size of the team, the culture of your workplace, and also the type of product you intend to build or update. With that in mind, let me explain feature branching, a common workflow used by many developers. Feature branching means you create a new branch from the main line and work on this dedicated branch until the task is completed. Rules and conditions need to be made in order for this branch of code to be kept in a good state. Every code base has a main repository, which is essentially the source of truth for the application. All changes, such as add, edit, or delete, are submitted directly to the feature branch. The main branch stays as is. When you are ready and happy with the code you have added, you have to commit the changes and then push to the server repository. To commit, you push the changes, and as it's a feature branch, a pull request follows. The pull request is compared to the main branch, so developers who peer review the code can see exactly what was changed. Once it's reviewed and approved, it can then be merged into the main line. Now, let me guide you through how this works using Git and GitHub. Before creating a new branch, always ensure you have the latest code. You can do this by running the git pull command to pull the latest code from the remote repository. Next, you need to create your new branch. You can do this by passing the dash B flag with the checkout action. Next, let's add new content to this branch. Let's create a readme.md file. To do this, type git add dot or git add readme.md and press enter. Next, you need to commit the new file and provide a meaningful message so other developers can discover what you added. To do that, run the git commit command with a dash m option to include a message with a short description of the changes being committed. The file has now been added to the local branch. This means that the file is only visible locally to you. To allow other developers to see the changes, you need to push the file to the remote repository. You can do that by running the git push command and referencing the new file. The changes are not pushed to the remote repository on GitHub. Your next action is to get it reviewed as part of a pull request, but more about that later. 
And that brings us to the end of this video. Now you know what a workflow is and how a feature workflow works. Well done. Previously, you learned about the hidden folder called .git that is located in each project. You know that this folder is responsible for keeping track of all changes across a project. How does Git know what branch you're currently on? Let me explain. It keeps a special pointer called head, which is one of the files inside the .git folder. This file refers to the current commit you are viewing. You will now learn how to identify the current commit you are working on. First, open the .git folder on your terminal. Type cd.git and press enter. Next, type cat head and press enter. In Git, we only work on a single branch at a time. This file also exists inside the .git folder under the refs forward slash heads path. Let me show you. Type cd.git and press enter. Next, type cat forward slash refs forward slash heads forward slash main. Press enter. After you entered this command, a single hashed ID appears. The single hashed ID is a reference for the current commit. Let's switch branches to see how the head is moved to point to a new branch. Type git checkout testing and press enter. Next, type git branch and press enter again. This moves the head to point to the testing branch. Let me explain how this happens by using a diagram. We have two branches, the main and testing branch. When you run the checkout command, it moves the head to now point to the testing branch. To check the contents of the head file inside the .git folder, you have to enter the less command. Type less.git slash head and press enter. You can now verify that the head has changed from main to testing. Now I will demonstrate how git head works with a simple example. So I am here in the terminal. To see what branch I am in, I am running git branch. When pressing the enter key, I can see I'm on the main branch. To confirm that, I run the cat.git forward slash head command and press enter. That brings me back to the reference to where it actually points to, namely ref, refs forward slash heads forward slash main. In this case, you can see the reference is pointing to the head's main. If I change my branch to feature testing branches above, I use the git checkout command git checkout feature forward slash testing branches. I then go to my head file inside the git folder by typing cat.git forward slash head. The ref is now pointing to the feature testing branches, namely refs forward slash head forward slash feature, forward slash testing branches. Notice that my branch is up to date with origin, forward slash feature, forward slash testing branches. I'll go back into my main branch by typing git checkout main and then check the reference file inside the main directory using the cat command again, cat.git forward slash refs, forward slash heads, forward slash main. When I press enter, I get a hash ID. This is a reference to the latest commits of that working directory. I can show you that if you make a change to any files within this directory, that this ID will then change after a commit has happened. So let's do a simple update to the readme file. You can do this with any editor such as VS Code, or I can also do this by executing the vim command. Type vim readme.md and press enter. When inside the readme file, add some text. In this case, add minor update to your my first repo line and save it. Then check the ID again just to verify. Type cat.git forward slash refs forward slash heads forward slash main and enter. If you would like to learn more about Vim, there is a link to an additional reading at the end of this lesson. The ID should be the same because we haven't committed anything. We've just made a change to run the cat command. Therefore, the ID is exactly the same as before. If I do a git status, it is telling me that I have modified the readme file. On the screen, the words modified readme.md displays in red. I'll now add that file. The shorthand to add a single file is git add space dot. Type the command and press the enter key. I am then going to do a commit. Type git commit 
dash M for message by adding minor update to the command line and press enter. The data confirms that one file changed, there was one insertion and one deletion. I am using the cat command to verify what is in the reference file by typing cat.git forward slash refs forward slash heads forward slash main. Press the enter key to confirm that the ID is changed. Originally, the ID started with a 8B55, and now it starts with 9C90. Whenever a change occurs for a commit, this ID will then update to be the latest commit for that working directory. And that's git head. You now know what the purpose of head is. You can also change the head to point to a different branch. Great novels are rarely written in one go and usually endure several drafts before the author is satisfied with the outcome. Of course, there is always the possibility that an idea from an earlier draft will sound good again later. But without a system of organization, it can be difficult to find where this idea is located. Programming is no different, and sometimes you need to revisit old code. In this video, I'll guide you through how to use git diff to compare changes across your files, branches, and commits. You probably know that the git status command tells you which of your files have been changed. The git diff command goes a step further and tells you what exactly these changes are. When used together, you can think of them as a file system. Git status tells you the file names, but to open the file and see the contents, you'll need to use git diff. To demonstrate, let's say you have a text file named cities.txt, which contains the names of cities you visited. You've been updating the list during a tour of South America, but upon returning home, you've lost track of what you've recorded. So, what can you do? Well, this is a situation where git diff makes itself useful. Git diff will compare the previous version of the file with your current one to find any differences. It will then tell you specifically what content has been removed as well as what content has been added to the file. In your cities.txt file, git diff would tell you that you removed one city that was in version A and then added a new one that appears in version B. So, now that you've had a basic explanation, let's go into a more detailed example. In this video, I'll show you how you can use git diff. Diff is used to make comparisons against files on your local repository. It can also be used against commits and against branches. I'll start with a simple example. When I go into my local repository, I'll find a file called README that I'd like to update slightly. You can do this with any editor, such as VS Code. I can also do this by executing the vim command to enter the file for editing, remove a few words, and then save it. If you would like to learn more about vim, there is a link to an additional reading at the end of this lesson. Next, I'm going to use the git diff tool to compare the updated file against the head. Because we haven't yet completed a commit, it's not available for a comparison against another commit. So, I'll input git diff, pass in the head as the first option, and then finally the file name. This then returns an output showing the changes that occurred in each file. Here, the line starting with a minus symbol represents what it originally was, while the line with a plus symbol shows what it is now. So, my example tells me that the words minor update have been removed. In addition to individual files, you can also make comparisons against previous commits. I'll start by using the git log command to display my history of commits, and I'll also use the pretty flag here so that each one is shown in one line. The pretty flag is used by developers to make the output more readable. Each commit has its own ID code, so I'll perform a git diff command on the codes from the most recent commit and from the very first one. Git will go through all the files, note all the changes that have occurred, and return the differentiation between the two. Finally, one more way of using git diff that I'll show you is how to use it for making comparisons against branches. If I perform the command git branch, it will display all the branches that are available in the repository. I can then use the git diff command to pass in my main branch, followed by my feature branch as the second option. And once again, this will display all the changes that have occurred between the two. This shows that my feature branch has the previous update, while the main branch has the most recent one. So, these are a few examples of how you can use git diff. 
In this video, you learned how to use git diff command to keep track of changes across your files, branches, and commits. This tool can help you to stay on top of updates and avoid mistakes or overlap. See you next time. One day, you might be overseeing a big team of developers. Can you imagine how complex it gets to keep track of everyone's changes and updates to files? Fortunately, Git has a very helpful command for keeping track of who did what and when. It's called Git Blame. In this video, you will learn about Git Blame, and I will demonstrate how it is used with a few examples. One of the core functions of Git is its ability to track and record the full history of changes for every file in the repository. In order to view and verify those changes, Git provides a set of tools to allow users to step through the history and view the edits made to each file. The git blame command is used to look at changes of a specific file and show the dates, times, and users who made the changes. By now, you should know how to use commands like git log to see the changes made. I will now use the feature.js file to demonstrate how git blame works. Let's get started with the git blame command. To run the git blame command, type git blame and the name of the file. In this case, feature.js. After pressing enter, git returns a list of all changes on the file. To understand what is happening, let's break down the blame messages and go through it line by line. Firstly, let me guide you through the format of each line. Every line will start with the ID and then the author, the date, and time when the change was made, and the exact line number where the change occurred. Then the actual change or content is also returned. The ID is a reference ID of the commit. The same ID might appear in several lines. This happens when a single commit has been made by the same developer. The author is the person who created the commit. The timestamp is the date and time when the changes were committed. Line number represents the location in the file or the exact line where the changes were made. The content is the code that was added to the file. Now that you know the meaning of each line in the blame output, let's explore a real example. In this example, you will check who made changes, when the changes were made, and also what changes were added. For the purposes of demonstration, I will be using a public repository called mkdocs. MKDocs has various different contributions from many different developers, so it's a good way to see a log file from all the changes of specific files. To begin, I will check inside the directory by using the ls command and passing in dash l to get a list of all the available files, and I'll just pick one. The file I will use is called setup.py, which is a Python file. So, in order to examine the different changes to that file, I create a command called git blame and then pass in the name of the file, setup.py, and press enter. The output will list all the changes made by all the different developers. It will also indicate the timestamps and line numbers as well as the actual changes that were made. Now, I will talk you through the output. Starting from the left of the list is what's called a hash ID. It just represents the commit of when a change occurred. Then, the name of the developer who worked on the file is listed, and then you have the timestamp when the change went in. Next is the line number in sequential order. And finally, the actual change that was implemented. I can scroll through the list of changes all the way to the end of the file, depending on the size of the file or whatever number of lines it has. If I want to exit out, I click on Q. This will clear the screen to make it easier. Take note that git blame on its own and by passing the file name will list the entire file. In a lot of cases, you will work with very large files and then you'll need a way to abbreviate the output or chop it down based on, say, line numbers. Fortunately, git blame offers a flag for that. To do this, I type git blame and pass in the flag of dash L and specify the starting line number and the end line number. I will type 5, 15, then pass in the file name again, setup.py, and press enter. This time, a smaller subset is returned that only starts at line 5 and ends on line 15. The output indicates that there are four different changes made by five different developers across these lines. Let me give you a few more tips around git blame now. Firstly, you can change the format of how the list is displayed. 
This is similar to what you can do with the ls command on the Unix commands. You can also pass in a dash l flag for changing the output itself. So again, let's run git blame dash l followed by the file name and press enter. This time, there are a few changes to the output. For instance, the hash dash id is in its full length form. It's not in the shortened version. The output is now a bit more detailed. You can also control if you want to show email addresses or change the date format. These are the examples of the various things that you can do. Secondly, another aspect of using git blame is that you can see detailed changes or the actual commit changes of a specific hash dash ID. To do that, I will run a git blame command on that file again in order to copy a hash dash ID from the output. Now, I will use that with a git log dash p and pass in the hash dash id and press enter. This gives you the actual change that occurred. Just to clarify, git blame will display to you the point where it was changed. Git log will give you the detail of the change. I always use the two in conjunction to get more details about what changes occurred. You've reached the final video in this lesson on creating a repository with forking and the end of the Git module. Let's take a few moments to recap on what you've learned. You now know how to explain the principles of Git and utilize a GitHub repository, including branching and merging code, perform a local install of Git on a Windows operating system, create a new repository in GitHub and clone it to a local machine, explain the fundamentals of Git and outline the Git workflow, and identify the differences between remote and local repositories in GitHub. Explain what the git add and commit commands do and describe how they work. Push content to remote repositories with git push and retrieve content from remote servers using git pull. Keep lines in your workflow clear and stable with the use of branches. And explain how head is used in git to identify the current branch you're working on. Compare changes across files, commits, and branches using diff commands. Examine changes to files and identify their author with the use of blame commands. And create a repository with the use of forking. You're now familiar with Git, GitHub, and creating repositories with forking. Great work! In this course, you were introduced to the practice of version control. Let's do a brief recap of what you covered. In the first module, you learned about how different version control systems and effective software development workflows enable modern software developers to collaborate across the world without messing up each other's code. You gained knowledge about the history of version control and know how version control or subversion is used to bring order to the chaos of massive software projects that have the potential for mistakes and bugs. Next, you learned more about the various systems, tools, and methodologies that are leveraged by software developers to collaborate successfully as part of a global team. You explored how to resolve conflicts in Git and that version control plays a crucial part in the development of software. You then moved on to investigate the difference between staging and production and that a staging environment should mimic your production environment. In module two, you learned about how to use the command line to execute commands in Linux. You were introduced to what the command line is and learned to use commands that traverse, create, rename, and delete files on your hard drive. Then you learned how easy it is to use piping and redirection to create powerful workflows that will automate your work, saving you time and effort. Finally, you explored the command line further discovering standard input-output streams, flags that can be used to change the behavior of a command, and grep. In Module 3, you developed a strong conceptual understanding of the Git technology and how it is used in software development projects to manage team files. First, you learned how to install Git on various operating systems, and then how to connect to GitHub via HTTPS and SSH before creating a GitHub account. Next, you gained a practical understanding of how Git works, including creating and cloning a repository, add, commit, push, and pull. You also explored how to use a repository and some concepts associated with workflows, such as branches, blame, and forking. 
Finally, the ungraded lab is an opportunity to complete a practical version control exercise by forking a repository, creating a branch, and committing a change. It also includes staging your changes and opening a pull request with the source repo. Well done on completing this recap. Now it's time to put into practice all that you've learned. Are you ready to proceed? Good luck. Congratulations on completing the Introduction to Version Control course. You've worked hard to get here and developed a lot of new skills during the course. You should now have a great foundation in the different version control systems and how to create an effective software development workflow. And you've also demonstrated your skill set by managing a project on GitHub for the graded assessment. Following completion of this course, you are now able to implement version control systems, navigate and configure documents, files, and directories using the command line, create and manage a GitHub repository, and manage code revisions. The key skills measured in the labs showed your ability to determine the current working directory and make and change directories and files using the command line, create, clone, commit, and push to a repository, create a repository with forking, and manage a project on GitHub. So, what are the next steps? You've established a good foundation so far, but there's always more to learn. Whether you're just starting out as a technical professional or student, this project will enable you to prove your knowledge and ability. Your project experience shows employers that you are self-driven and innovative. It also speaks volumes about you as an individual and your drive to continue your educational progress. Once you've completed all the courses in this professional certificate, you'll receive Coursera certification. Certifications provide globally recognized and industry-endorsed evidence of mastering technical skills. Congratulations once again on reaching the end of this course. It's been a voyage of discovery. Best of luck and do continue to pursue your own learning objectives to their final goal. The digital space is a world of connection and opportunity. But take this moment for example. The web has made it possible for you to enroll in this program where you'll learn from the personal stories of developers at Meta. By the time you have completed this professional certificate, you can become a creator of digital experiences. Connection is evolving, and so are you. You might not have a background in tech at all, and that's okay. Even if you have no experience, this program can get you job ready within a single year. So how can this professional certificate prepare you for a job at an organization like Meta? The Database Engineer Professional Certificate will help you build job ready skills for a database engineering role while earning a credential from Meta. From Meta Engineers, you will learn about how they collaborate to create and test high-performance databases. You'll also discuss interesting topics with other aspiring database engineers. And complete a range of coding exercises to improve your skills. It's important to complete all the courses in this certificate in order, as each course will build on your skills. Although we have a recommended schedule for each course, the program is entirely self-paced, which means your time is your own to manage. As you make your way through the courses in the certificate, you'll learn how to model and structure a database according to best practice and create, manage and manipulate data using SQL, one of the most widely used languages for working with databases. You'll also learn how to use the Django Web Framework to connect the front end of a web application to your database. For your final project, you will create a functional relational database designed and developed with best practice architecture to showcase as part of your portfolio during your job search. You'll also be ready to collaborate with other developers as you will have learned to use Git and GitHub for version control. In the final course, you will prepare for the coding interview. You'll practice your interview skills, refine your resume, and tackle some common coding challenges that typically form part of technical job interviews. Once you complete the program, you'll get access to the Meta Career Programs Job Board, a job search platform that connects you with over 200 employers who've committed to sourcing talent through Meta's certificate programs. Who knows where you will end up? Whatever the future of connection looks like, you'll be part of its creation. Let's get started. Welcome to the next course in database engineering. The focus of this course is on database structures and management with MySQL. Let's take a moment to review some of the new skills that you'll gain in these modules. In the first module of this course, you'll learn how to filter data using logical operators, 
perform joins on tables and make use of aliases, group data using the group by and having clauses, and deploy the any and all operators in the database. In the second module, you'll explore key concepts around the topics of updating databases and working with views. For example, you'll learn how to insert and update data using the MySQL replace statement, make use of constraints in a MySQL database, and change the structure of tables using alter and copy table statements. You'll also learn how to use subqueries and how to combine them with comparison operators, and you'll discover how to create virtual tables with a MySQL create view statement. In module three, you'll explore functions and MySQL stored procedures. By the end of this module, you should know how to make use of common MySQL functions like numeric, string, and date functions, deploy comparison and control flow functions, and work with stored procedures. During these modules, you'll encounter activities to test your knowledge and skills. You'll receive the opportunity to demonstrate some of this learning along with your practical database skill set in the lab project. And you'll also demonstrate your knowledge of these topics in a graded assessment. So, what are you waiting for? Let's get started. You know what's amazing is databases are present in our everyday interactions with these amazing like digital experiences we have. So whether it's looking up uh, somebody's phone number on your smartphone, or whether you're looking for your next movie to stream, or uh, paying for your groceries at the checkout counter and scanning your groceries, like you're interacting with databases every step along the way. My name is Daniel Bloomfield Ramagen. I'm a software engineer working out of our Meta DC office. And I've worked in security, in community integrity, and currently in the privacy space. As your use of data for an application grows, you increasingly need to be able to find that information quickly, uh, need to manage it, delete it, update that information quickly. And so without a database management system, you're either left to kind of create those structures on your own, and you may be successful at first, but as your, your, the scale of what you're trying to do grows, it becomes increasingly harder. So these database management systems, something like MySQL, gives you that almost for free. You have all of that service and functionality already available to you, which frees you up to then focus on, let's say, the business problems that you're trying to solve, like the user problems you're trying to solve without having to necessarily worry about all, everything that's powering the, the data management layer. MySQL is a, it's a relational database management system. So it allows you to store data, retrieve that data, and manage it, delete, and update it for a variety of uses. So it can be applied to many different application types. So everything from the uh, motor vehicle administration managing my uh, driving records to uh, something like the likes and shares I get on my Facebook app. All of that can be managed in the database, and MySQL is one of the most popular databases we have in the world. So MySQL allows you to automate a lot of things like uh, making backups and setting up failovers, uh, updating schemas. It allows you to handle very high concurrency requests. So if you've got web applications or needs where there's a lot of requests coming in, it's particularly good at that. It also has this fantastic community, which means you have forums where you can reach out for help. You've got great people that can provide you support, documentation, and it's open source, which means you can always take a look at the code and you can actually make a request to the creators uh, and contributors to that software. We at Meta use MySQL to store and retrieve the social graph, the interactions, the shares, the likes. And so I know that when my friends used the Facebook app and saw my picture last week, that I can visualize the thousands of requests being made across our fleet of MySQL servers to retrieve that information and display it to them and to me. So MySQL is powering all these amazing digital experiences for us. We use MySQL because it provides um, automation. And that means a small group of engineers can manage a very large fleet of servers and can do things like these backups and failovers and can automate all those functions. And it's also very good for these high transactional uh, 
requests. So a lot of what we do at Meta are these short bursts of very uh, uh, precise requests for insertion of data, deletion of data, lookup of data, and S MySQL excels at that. It's incredibly rewarding to learn about databases, and it can be challenging not only to code, but to learn database management and configuration, data structures. But the rewards are that you are empowered to build incredible experiences, incredible solutions to real user problems, or you can build applications that will serve you know, for entertainment. There's a variety of uses for software that are all going to be powered by well-organized, structured data. So hang in there, go through this lesson, you know, learn, because you will be standing on the shoulders of giants with all this data layer that will be readily available for you, and you will propel you to take it to the next level. I hope you will have learned that data is at the heart of every application, and that structuring that data and managing the data effectively such that you can retrieve the data quickly, you can uh, process it effectively, and you can display the right information to the user is super important. And the knowledge you have of database management will help you not only structure that data, but you will influence everything else that comes after it, the processing, the APIs, and even something like the user interface. So you have a huge opportunity to influence software development projects all the way from the back end to the front end experience by your database management skills and data skills. I hope that you get a chance to apply this knowledge to a future role, and I wish you the best in your next endeavor. You might already be familiar with using a WHERE clause and a condition to filter data in a database table. But what if you need to specify multiple conditions in a WHERE clause? You can use logical operators to specify multiple conditions or rules. So when the data is filtered, all specified conditions are applied. By the end of this video, you'll be able to identify the logical AND and OR operators and explain how they're used to combine conditions, and develop a working familiarity with the logical NOT operator and outline how it is used with data filtering. Before you explore how to filter data using multiple conditions, let's take a moment to recap how the WHERE clause works. It's important that you understand it before working with logical operators. When filtering data in a database table, you can add a WHERE clause to your SQL SELECT statement to specify a condition or rule for how the data should be filtered. A SELECT statement begins with the SELECT keyword or command. You must then specify the data or columns to be queried. You then add the FROM keyword, followed by the table you need to query. Finally, you must add a WHERE clause and a condition. But as you've just learned, it's also possible to specify multiple conditions in the WHERE clause. These conditions are specified using logical operators. Let's begin by exploring the AND and OR operators. The AND operator is used with the WHERE clause to filter data. It checks if all combined conditions meet the value of true and the OR operator checks if any of the combined conditions meet the value of true. Let's take a moment to explore the syntax for each of these logical operators. Write the SELECT statement as usual. However, in this instance, multiple conditions are placed after the WHERE clause and combined using the AND operator. The statement checks if all these conditions yield a value of true for a record. If so, then that record is included in the result set. With the OR operator, a record is included in the result set if any of the conditions separated by OR is true. That is, if at least one condition yields a true value for a record in the table, then that record is included in the query result set. Next, let's look at the NOT logical operator. The NOT operator works slightly differently to other operators. It selects a result to be included in the query result set only if the conditions specified in the WHERE clause are not true. In other words, it reverses or negates the results that are returned once the condition is evaluated. To use the NOT operator, you just type NOT after the WHERE clause, followed by the required condition. Let's take a few minutes to find out how these operators are used over at Lucky Shrub. Lucky Shrub are reviewing their accounts and need to generate specific details on their customers and the purchases they've made. They can complete this task by filtering data with the use of logical operators. In Lucky Shrub's database is a table called Customer Purchases. This table contains the data Lucky Shrub needs to complete their queries. The data is divided into the following four columns. Customer ID, 
customer names, customer locations and purchases. The value of each customer's individual purchase. Lucky Shrub first need to identify customers from the location Gila County who have made purchases of over $2,000. This requires two search conditions. The first is customers who are from Gila County and the second is customers who have made purchases of over $2,000. You can retrieve these details by writing a basic select statement as follows. Begin with select all from the table customer underscore purchases. Next, type the WHERE clause, then the first condition as follows. Purchases column, the greater than operator, and the figure of 2000. Then type the AND operator to include a second condition. This second condition targets the location column and uses an equal operator to return all results for Gila County. The AND operator here combines the two conditions. It ensures that both conditions are evaluated when filtering data from the table. So, your SELECT statement is instructing SQL to select all records from the customer purchases table that satisfy the following criteria. Purchases greater than $2,000 and made by customers in the location of Gila County. For a record to be included in the result set, its purchases column must have a value greater than 2000 If so, then the first condition yields a true value. In addition, the location column must have a value of Gila County. If this is the case, then the second condition also yields a value of true. And as you just learned, the AND operator here insists that the results of both conditions are combined. This is another instance which yields a value of true. So any records that match are included in the result. Any records in the table that do not yield the value of true for both conditions are omitted from the results. Your query is now ready to run. So press enter to execute. The results set that this query returns contains two records. There are two customers from Gila County who've made purchases over $2,000, Benjamin Claus and Julie Marr. Now Lucky Shrub need to identify customers who are from Gila County or Santa Cruz County. The logical operator OR can be used to combine multiple conditions in the WHERE clause, so it's perfectly suited to this task. For this query, you first need to generate a list of customers who are from either Gila County or Santa Cruz County. So the first step is to write the following SELECT statement. Select all from customer purchases and then add the WHERE clause. This WHERE clause is then followed by the first condition, location equal to Gila County. Then insert the OR operator followed by the second condition, location equal to Santa Cruz County. You now have a WHERE clause that uses the OR operator to combine the two conditions. For a record to be included in the result set, its location column must have a value of Gila County. If so, then it meets the first condition and yields a true value. Or the location column must have a value of Santa Cruz County. If this is the case, then the second condition yields a true value. The OR operator ensures that at least one of these conditions will yield a true value. Any matching records will be included in the result. A record in the table that does not yield a true value for either condition is omitted from the result. Press enter to execute the query. In this case, the result returns three records or customers. Next, Lucky Shrub need to retrieve the details of customers who do not reside in Gila County or Santa Cruz County. They can perform this task using the NOT logical operator. It's used in a similar way in the WHERE clause of a SELECT statement. You can write the statement as before, but this time type a NOT operator after the WHERE clause. Then list the conditions, location equal to Gila County or location equal to Santa Cruz County. In this query, the conditions have been enclosed in parentheses because there are multiple conditions. Parentheses are not required where you have just one condition. The NOT operator checks the records for values that do not yield a true value for the given conditions. In other words, records that do not yield a value of true for either of the listed locations. Press enter to execute the query and generate the output. So all the records that have a location value which is not Gila County or Santa Cruz County are included in the result. The remaining records are omitted. The output shows four records from the customer purchases table. If you find all these examples and operators a bit complicated, don't worry. You'll review detailed examples of how to use these operators in later videos in this course. For now, you should just be able to identify each of the operators and explain their syntax.
You might already be familiar with filtering data using the AND and OR operators. But what if you need to perform more complex data filtering tasks, like filtering data based on a pattern? You can use more logical operators such as in, between, and like. By the end of this video, you'll be able to identify the in, between, and like logical operators and explain how they're used, and explain how wildcard characters can be used with logical operators to filter data. Let's begin with a review of the in, between, and like operators. The in operator lets you specify multiple values in the WHERE clause. The BETWEEN operator selects values within a given range. These values can be numbers, text, or dates. And the LIKE operator is used to filter data based on pattern matching. Let's look at the syntax for the IN operator. The IN operator requires slightly different syntax than a typical SELECT filter statement. After the WHERE clause, you must type the column name to which the IN operator is applied. You then need to add the IN operator and you must also include the set of values within parentheses. If the specified column's value of a record matches with any value in the set, then that record will be included in the query result set of the select statement. The in operator is like a shorthand for multiple OR conditions. You also can use NOT IN to filter the opposite results of those you receive from the in operator. Next, let's review the BETWEEN operator. For the BETWEEN operator, you must also specify the column name after the WHERE clause. The BETWEEN operator is then applied along with the two required values. These two values mark the boundary of a range. In other words, they're the beginning and ending values of the range. The operator then selects values within this given range. The values that can be used with the BETWEEN operator include numbers, text and dates. If the specified column's value of a record falls within the value range specified here, that record will be included in the query result set of the SELECT statement. Finally, let's look at the LIKE operator. The LIKE operator is used to filter data based on pattern matching. The operator is placed after the WHERE clause and specified column name. A pattern to be matched against the column data is then added. This pattern can be written using what are referred to as wildcard characters. The first of these is the percent sign, which represents zero, one, or multiple characters. The second is the underscore sign, which represents one single character. For example, a pattern could be written as G underscore underscore percent sign within a pair of single quotes. As you've just discovered, each underscore represents one single character while the percent sign is zero, one, or more characters. So this pattern searches for values that start with the letter G and are at least three characters in length. If the specified column's value of a record matches the given pattern, that record will be included in the query result set of the select statement. Let's look at a demonstration of these operators in the Lucky Shrub database. Lucky Shrub are performing a review of their accounts. They need to generate specific details on their customers and the purchases they've made. They can complete this task by filtering data with the use of the in, between, and like logical operators. In Lucky Shrub's database is a table called Customer Purchases. This table contains the data Lucky Shrub need to complete their queries. The data is divided into the following four columns, Customer ID, Customer Names, Customer Locations, and Purchases the value of each customer's individual purchase. First, Lucky Shrub need to use the MySQL in operator in the WHERE clause to identify customers from the location Gila County who've made purchases of over $2,000. You might already be familiar with filtering data using the OR operator. The in operator is like a form of shorthand for multiple OR conditions. You can get the same result as the OR example by using the in operator. To extract the required data using the in operator, write a basic SELECT statement as follows. Begin with SELECT ALL DATA from the table customer purchases. Next, type the WHERE clause, then the first condition as follows. Purchases column, the in operator, and the figure of 2000. Then, within parentheses, specify the set of values separated by a comma, Gila County and Santa Cruz County. When run, this query returns three records or customers. These are the same results as the OR operator returns. Now let's check out how the MySQL between operator functions in the WHERE clause. In this example, 
Lucky Shrub need the details of customers whose purchases are in the range of $1,000 and $2,000. Write the select statement as before. Then add the where clause. The where clause is followed by the filter column, which is purchases. Then add the between operator and give the value range. The range begins with the value 1000 followed by and, then ends with the value 2000. The between operator filters out the records that have a purchase value between $1000 and $2000, including the beginning and end values. In this case, the between operator is a quicker and easier way to filter out the records that have a purchase's value greater than or equal to $1,000 and less than or equal to $2,000. Finally, let's see how Lucky Shrub make use of the MySQL like operator. The like operator is used for pattern matching. When used in a WHERE clause, it searches a column for the given pattern. This means that it filters out data from the table based on the pattern. It's often used in conjunction with wildcards for single or multiple characters. Let's demonstrate an example using the pattern on the location column. You can filter out the records that have a location value that matches the pattern. Lucky Shrub's pattern must be set to find any values that start with G and are at least three characters in length. First, write the select statement just as you've done before. Then add the WHERE clause followed by the name of the filter column, location. Finally, add the like operator followed by the pattern, which in this example is G, followed by two underscore characters and a percentage symbol. Press enter to execute the query. The output that's generated contains three values that start with G and are at least three characters in length. Any values that don't match the pattern have been omitted from the table. Lucky Shrub have completed their data filtering tasks and returned all the required results from their database. You should now be able to combine conditions and filter data using the in, between, and like logical operators. Great work. Little Lemon Restaurants has run into some problems with their database. Some of the table and column names in the database are too long, which is causing issues with the output of queries. They need to find a way to generate results that are simpler to use, read, and understand. Fortunately, they can solve these issues with MySQL aliases. Over the next few minutes, you'll discover how Little Lemon can make use of MySQL aliases and by the end of this video, you'll be able to Demonstrate an understanding of the concept of an alias in a database Identify examples of situations in which it is beneficial to use aliases and demonstrate the use of alias in MySQL queries But first, you might be wondering, what is an alias in the context of SQL? SQL aliases are used to provide database columns and tables with temporary names. These temporary names make it simpler to use, read, and understand the output of the database. For example, Little Lemon can use aliases to shorten the names of tables and columns in their database. There are three common situations in which it's useful to consider an alias. An alias can be used to rename a table or column whose original name is too long or technical. It can be used with a concatenation function to combine an output into one column instead of two. And you can also use an alias to create distinct table names when dealing with multiple tables. However, it's important to bear in mind that the syntax for creating and using an alias can change depending on which of these issues you're attempting to resolve. Let's take a few minutes to review an example of the syntax for each scenario, beginning with renaming tables. To rename a table, you need to use a SELECT statement which begins with the SELECT keyword. Then type the original column name followed by the alias. Both must be separated by the AS keyword. The AS keyword creates the alias. You can also include other columns in the table, with each separated by a comma. Then write the FROM keyword followed by the table name. If your table requires multiple aliases, then write out each column name and use the AS keyword for each column you need to create an alias for. For example, in their Client Orders table, Little Lemon can use an alias to rename lengthy columns like Client Order Information to just Orders. Next, let's review the syntax for a concatenation function that combines an output into one column instead of two. The SELECT command is used to retrieve data. This is followed by the concat function, which concatenates or combines the information extracted from the column names placed in parentheses. These names must be separated by commas and a pair of double quotation marks. 
The quotation marks split the output by creating an empty space between the concatenated values. The as keyword is then added, followed by the name or alias you want to assign to the new concatenated column. And the from keyword specifies the table SQL must extract the data from. Little Lemon can use a concatenation function to combine the values contained in the first and last name columns of their client details table. These values are then placed in a new concatenated column called client names. Finally, let's explore the syntax for querying multiple tables. The first thing to note when querying multiple tables is that you can use a one character alias to represent each table. For example, if you're querying two different tables, then you can use X for table 1 and Y for table 2. So the syntax then begins with a select command followed by the tables and columns to be queried. You can query columns using dot notation, such as X dot column 1 to query table 1 column 1 or Y dot column 2 for table 2 column 2. Next, add the from keyword. Then type the original name of each table alongside its alias with both separated by the as keyword. Finally, add a where clause and conditions as required. For example, perhaps you're querying prices in an online store database and want to return a list of items that are less than $12 for table one and $5 for table two. Those are the three main instances in which MySQL alias can be used along with their related syntax. Now that you're familiar with the concept of MySQL alias, let's see if you can help Little Lemon with their databases. Little Lemon Restaurant has a table in their database called Food Orders Delivery Status that keeps track of food orders. The table has two columns called Date Food Order Placed with Supplier and Date Food Order Received from Supplier. However, these column names are too long and complex, so they need to be simplified to make the database more efficient. You can use aliases to simplify the output so that the column names are easier to read and understand when queried. Begin with a select statement and target the order ID column. Then rename the date food order placed with supplier column as date order placed. And rename the date food order received from supplier column as date order received. Notice that there are double quotation marks used for order date received because the alias name contains a space. In other instances, you can declare the alias without the use of quotation marks. Finally, type a from keyword followed by the name of the table. Then click enter to execute the query. The output now shows the alias names instead of the original column names, which makes it much easier for Little Lemon to track food orders. However, you can make this table even more efficient. For instance, you could concatenate order ID and order status into one column instead of two. As you learned earlier, you can use a SQL alias with functions. Write the statement as follows. Begin with a select command and then the concat function. Then place the columns you want to concatenate in a pair of parentheses. You should also make sure that you include quotation marks to split the output. Next, use the as keyword to create the alias. In this instance, you can call the alias column order status. Then use the from keyword to identify the table. Finally, hit enter to execute the query. The output shows the new order status column with the concatenated info. Finally, let's review how to work with multiple tables in the database. The restaurant has divided their menu into two tables called starters and main courses. Both tables show the names of the meals available to order and their respective costs. As part of a new promotional campaign, Little Lemon want to promote starters that cost $7 or less and main courses that cost $15 or less. So, you need to query these tables and identify the meals that match these prices. In this instance, you can use a one character alias of S to represent starters and you can use C to represent main courses. Add these aliases into a select statement and use dot notation to request the name and cost of the meals. Then use the from keyword to identify the tables and the as keyword to create aliases for each one. Courses is C and starters are S. Finally, add a where clause and specify the condition. The condition returns all starters less than $7 and all main courses less than $15. Finally, press enter to execute the query. SQL generates an output that shows all related costs in one table. All issues with Little Lemon's database have now been solved using MySQL aliases. 
Thanks to your assistance, Little Lemon's database is now more efficient to use and they've identified some great meals to include in their next promotional campaign. With the skills you've gained from these tasks, you should now be able to demonstrate an understanding of the concept of an alias in a database, identify examples of situations in which it is beneficial to use aliases, and demonstrate the use of alias in MySQL queries. Great work. Lucky Shrub Gardening Centre need to gather information on their customers and the orders they've placed, but the records are held in three different tables. However, they can extract this information from their database using joins clause to join the required elements of these tables together. Over the next few minutes, you'll discover how the joins clause works, and by the end of this video, you'll be able to demonstrate an understanding of the join concept in a database and describe the main types of joins in MySQL. Let's take a closer look at the problem that Lucky Shrub has encountered with their database tables. Lucky Shrub needs to determine what products were ordered and which customers placed the orders. However, this information exists in three separate entities or tables. Customers, orders and products. So, how can Lucky Shrub extract records from three different tables? Before you can begin to assist Lucky Shrub, you first need to understand the concept of joins. The SQL join clause is used to query data based on a common column between two target tables. For example, the customers and orders tables both contain a customer ID column, and the product ID column is a common column between the orders and products tables. These common columns can be used to join these tables together and extract the required records. There are four types of join used to combine tables. An inner join, which extracts or selects records of data that have matching values in both tables. And a left join, that extracts or selects records of data from the left table and all matching records from the right table. The right join, which extracts or selects records of data from the right table and matching records from the left table. And the self join, in which a table is joined with itself to retrieve info that exists in the same table. Let's begin with a review of the inner join. An inner join returns records of data that have matching values or columns in both the left and the right tables. This relationship between the two tables can be conceptualized in the format of a Venn diagram, as can all other joins. In terms of syntax, the left and right tables are identified as table 1 and table 2 respectively. Lucky Shrub need to identify the full names of all clients that placed orders with the business. To complete this query, they need the client's table and the orders table. They can then create an inner join using the client ID column that exists in both tables. The output result reveals the records of all clients who placed orders, and the client ID represents all records with matching IDs to be listed. The syntax of an inner join begins with a select statement which queries the left table and the column with the matching values. The from keyword is then added, along with the name of the left table. Next is the inner join clause, followed by the name of the right table. Finally, the on keyword is used to identify the inner join that the tables share. Next, let's move on to review the left join. The left join returns all common records in a similar way to the inner join. In addition, it returns all available records of the common column from the left table, even if there isn't a match in the right table. Lucky Shrub can use the left join table to extract data from the clients and orders tables using the client ID values. The join locates four matching records between the two tables and places them in the common area of the Venn diagram. The left join syntax begins with a select statement in which the required columns from table one are identified. The as keyword is then used to create an alias for each column. The from keyword is used to identify the left table, which is the one that must be queried. And once again, the as keyword is used to create an alias for this table. The left join clause is then used to join table to and assign an alias. Finally, the on keyword equates the matching columns between the two tables. Now let's review an example of the right join. The right join returns all records from the right and left tables, but with the right table as the main target table. For example, Lucky Shrub can use the right join to extract records of data from the orders and products table based on the product ID values. This lists all products from the products table joined with the matching related orders details in the left table. 
The right join syntax is very similar to the left join. The only difference is that the right join clause is used to extract records of data. Finally, there's the self join. A self join is a special case in which a table must be joined with itself. In other words, one table is treated as two in order to extract specific information from either the left, right or inner join. In the case of Lucky Shrub, the business holds records of all staff members in a staff table. The table contains records on sales floor employees and line managers. Lucky Shrub can treat the table as two tables to determine who is a line manager and who is a sales floor employee. A self-join syntax is written as a select statement in which an alias is created for the common column in table 2. You've encountered a lot of information in this video, particularly in terms of syntax. Don't worry if it doesn't all make sense at this stage. In the videos that follow, you'll learn how to create each type of join in more detail. But for now, you should be able to demonstrate an understanding of the join concept in a database and describe the main types of joins in MySQL. Well done. Lucky Shrub Gardening Center require information on orders recently made by their clients. This information is stored in two separate tables, the Clients table and the Orders table. But there must be a more efficient way to review this information that doesn't involve using two tables at the same time, right? Thankfully, Lucky Shrub can use the Inner Join clause to return records of data based on a common column with matching values in both tables. In this video, you'll help Lucky Shrub to complete this task. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to apply the inner join concept in MySQL and use SQL aliases to create temporary column names. As you're probably aware by now, databases normally have more than one table. In fact, database normalization rules dictate that related data should be held in separate tables. So let's begin with a quick review of the two tables. The client's table has four columns, client ID, full name, contact number and address. And the orders table has five columns, order ID, client ID, product ID, quantity and cost. The first task is to identify the full names of all clients who made orders. You can do this using the inner join clause in a SQL select statement. The statement begins with the select command. This is then followed by the column full name attached to the client's table separated by a dot. This queries data from the full name column of the client's table. Then the from keyword is used to target the client's table. Next, the inner join clause creates a new row of data for each matching record. In other words, where the client ID in the client table matches the client ID in the orders table. And the equal operator ensures the matching condition must be met. Remember that it's important to specify the table name of each column when you are dealing with multiple tables in the same statement. This is especially important when the column name is used in more than one of the queried tables. For example, client ID exists in both the clients and the order tables. Press enter to execute the query. The output result set lists the full names for all clients that have made orders. This example just extracts a list of names. We can also query other information from both tables. For example, you can display the column names with more user-friendly labels if required. For instance, you can take the client ID, full name and contact number columns from the client's table and create a join with the product ID, quantity and total cost column from the orders table. You can do this with the following SQL statement. Start with a select command that selects the required columns from the client's table. Then use the as keyword after each column to create an alias. In other words, create a new name for each column. Then do the same for the required columns on the orders table. So in this statement, each column is attached to the related table name. And the alias technique is used to create new names for each column. Click enter to execute the query. The result set is a table with all required data related to the four matching clients IDs, CL1, CL2, CL3 and CL4 as shown in the output table. In this video, you explored how to work with the inner join clause in MySQL to query data from two tables in the database. Also, you learned how to use an alias to create temporary column names that have more readable labels. Lucky Shrub can now review the data they need using a more efficient table thanks to the inner join clause. And you should now be able to 
apply the inner join concept in MySQL and use SQL aliases to create temporary column names. Great work. Lucky Shrub need to review data on orders made by their clients. This data exists in two separate tables, clients and orders. Lucky Shrub can query data from both tables using the left and right join clauses in MySQL. These clauses will work because both tables share several closely connected columns. In this video, you'll help Lucky Shrub use the left and the right join clauses. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to demonstrate how to apply a left join and a right join in MySQL and utilize aliases to create temporary columns and table names. Let's quickly review the two tables before creating the query. The clients table contains four columns, customer ID, full name, contact number, and address. And the orders table contains five columns, order ID, client ID, product ID, quantity, and cost. The first step is to create a query for the client ID and client name columns within the clients table, which is the left table. Then you must create a join with the following columns from the order table, the right table. Order ID, quantity, and cost. You can use the left join clause in the SQL statement to complete this task. To start, use the select command to retrieve data, followed by the column, client ID, and full name attached to the client's table, separated by a dot. This syntax retrieves data from the two columns from the client's table. This data then joins the order ID, quantity, and cost columns from the orders table. As you're probably already aware, it's important to specify the table name of each column when dealing with multiple tables in the same statement. This is especially important when the column name is used in more than one of the query tables. For example, the client ID column exists in both the clients and orders tables. You can also use the SQL as keyword to create suitable aliases for the column names when displayed in the output result set. And you can use the as keyword to create aliases for the two tables as follows. C for clients and O for orders. This now means that instead of repeatedly typing clients to specify the column source table, you can just use C. And instead of using the word orders, you can write O. In this statement, the left join clause creates a new row of data for each matching record from the left table, the clients table. It does this even if there are no matching records in the orders table, which is the right table. For example, the clients with IDs CL5 and CL6 have yet to place any orders. This means that null values will be inserted for related columns from the right table. Finally, press enter to execute the query. The output result table contains several null values for the clients with IDs of CL5 and CL6. This is because they have not yet made any orders. Next, let's create a similar query using the right join concept. You can use similar syntax to the previous query. Just replace the left keyword with the right keyword. In this statement, clients represents the left table and the orders represents the right table. The right join clause extracts data from both tables based on the client ID values, just like the previous example. Executing this query should return all requested information from the orders table, right table, joined by the requested information from the clients table, left table, based on the common column, client ID. So, press enter to run the query and create the output. The output shows that the right join has returned all records from the right, or orders table, where a client has made an order. And it extracted the matching records from the left, or clients table, based on the client ID values. No null values were printed in the output result table. This is because all clients who made orders already exist in the clients table. Lucky Shrub now have the order and client information they need. And you should now be able to demonstrate how to apply a left join and a right join in MySQL and utilize aliases to create temporary columns and table names. Good work. The Lucky Shrub database has a table called employees, which lists all staff in the business. Some of these staff members are line managers and other employees report to these line managers. Lucky Shrub needs to query the data from this table to determine which roles everyone is assigned. They can complete this task using the self join clause, a special join case. This clause lets Lucky Shrub create a join between rows on the same table so that they can extract specific information. 
but the table must be treated as two tables to perform the required joins. Over the next few minutes, you'll help Lucky Shrub with this query. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to apply the self-join concept in MySQL and use an alias to provide same table with two different names. Let's begin by reviewing the employee table from the Lucky Shrub database. This is the table that stores the required information on employees and their line managers. The table includes five columns, employee ID, full name, job title, county, and line manager ID. In this table, the primary key employee ID values are also used in the line manager ID column to show who manages each employee in the Lucky Shrub firm. So your main task is to list the full name of all line managers and the employees they manage. The full names of both sets of employees exist within the full name column. To complete this task, you can create the employees table as two identical tables. Then create an inner join to investigate each employee ID and match it with the line manager ID. Then extract the full name value and print it as either line manager or employee. And remember that the line managers are also employees. Before writing the query, remember that the self-join clause creates two tables from one. In other words, know you're dealing with two tables in your query, not just one. So let's begin with a SQL select statement. The statement uses E1 with an as keyword to declare an alias for the first employee table. And it also uses E2 with an as keyword to declare an alias for the second employee table. Remember that the employee table is the same in both cases. In addition, your statement queries the full name column from the E1 table, and it uses the as keyword to declare a suitable alias name of line manager from the left table. It then queries the full name column from the E2 table and uses the as keyword to declare an alias of employee from the right table. Name columns from both employee tables, but only once there's a match between the column values. In this instance, the condition is e1.employeeid equal to e2.linemanagerid. In other words, the condition matches the employee ID with the line manager ID. If it finds a value of true, then the full name is returned from the left table and displayed in the line manager column. And the full name is also returned and displayed as an employee from the right table. Press enter to execute the query. The output result set links the line managers with the employees they manage. A quick summary of the output result set shows that the employees, Seamus and Greta, report to the line manager, Simon. Simon reports to himself, and all other staff report to Seamus. Thanks to the self-join clause, Lucky Shrub have now determined which employee is in which role. And you should now be able to apply the self-join concept in MySQL, and use alias to provide the same table with two different names. Good work. Lucky Shrub are filing their end of year tax returns and must provide information on all employees that they have hired over the last 12 months. There are several full-time employees in the business and there are several part-time employees who were recently hired to help with the holiday season. But the records for the full-time and part-time employees are stored in separate tables. So how can Lucky Shrub combine these records into one table? They can use the MySQL union operator. Over the next few minutes, you'll discover how the union operator works, and by the end of this video, you'll be able to demonstrate an understanding of the union operator and explain how the union operator is used in MySQL. Let's begin with a definition of the union operator. The union operator is used to combine result sets from the multiple statements in the same query. For example, you can use the union operator to join two select statements in order to combine their result sets and present as one table. So how does the union operator work? Let's look at the syntax and find out. You begin with a select statement, followed by the names of the columns that must be queried. The from keyword is then used to target the table in which the records are located. Next, you add a union operator, followed by a select statement that queries the required records from the second table. The union operator essentially creates a union between the two select statements. There are a few best practices that must be observed when creating SQL select statements with a union operator. Every select statement must have the same number of columns. All related columns have similar data types. And all related columns must have the same order in every select statement. 
But what about cases where the same value exists in both tables, but appears only once in the combined set of results? Like a name or a location. This happens because the union operator only returns distinct values from the targeted tables. To list all values, including duplicated data, you can use the all keyword. The use of the all keyword after the union operator ensures that all values remain, even duplicated ones. Let's explore a working example of the union operator. As you saw earlier, Lucky Shrub need to gather information on all employees that they have hired over the last 12 months. But the data for their full-time and part-time employees is stored in separate tables. Let's help them out. Lucky Shrub need to combine the records from two tables into one using the MySQL union operator. Both the full-time employees and part-time employees tables include the same four columns. Employee ID, full name, contact number and location. Lucky Shrub need to query the full names and addresses or locations of all employees. To combine the results from both tables, you can write two select statements that target the full name and location columns. One statement targets the full-time employees table, the other targets the part-time employees table and a union operator is placed in between both statements to combine the results. Before executing these statements, you must check that each of these select statements includes the same number of columns. In addition, all columns must contain the same data types and must be placed in the same order in both statements. Finally, click Enter to execute the query. The output places the results of both select queries into the one table that contains two columns, full name and location. These columns hold all required records for all Lucky Shrub's part-time and full-time employees. However, Lucky Shrub has two employees named Julia Marr, one who works part-time and another who works full-time. But only one Julia Marr appears in the combined set of results. This is because the union operator only returns distinct values. Yet it's interpreted both instances of Julia Marr as a duplicated value. Fortunately, you can use the union operator to generate an output that contains both employees. Just write the same select statements once again with a union operator in between. But this time, place the all keyword after the union operator. As you learned earlier, the all keyword ensures that the output retains all results from both tables, even if they're duplicate values. Finally, click enter to execute the query. The output is then generated on screen and it contains both instances of Julia Marr. Thanks to the union operator, Lucky Shrub now have all the information they need. And having helped them out, you should now be able to demonstrate an understanding of the union operator and explain how the union operator is used in MySQL. Well done. Lucky Shrub are reviewing recent customer orders in their database. They need to find a way to group records with similar values into one single record so that they can analyze the order data and produce summaries. The MySQL group by clause and its related aggregate functions are a great way for the company to complete this task. Over the next few minutes, you'll explore these concepts and use them to help Lucky Shrub produce summaries of their orders. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to group rows into subgroups using the MySQL group by clause and utilize the MySQL group by clause with SQL aggregate functions. So before you begin helping Lucky Shrub, let's take a moment to find out what database developers mean by the term group by. The group by clause is used in SQL syntax to group rows in a table based on given columns into summary rows, also known as subgroups. To get a better understanding of this clause, let's look at the syntax. The syntax begins with a select statement followed by the name of the required column. The from clause is then added and targets the name of the table that holds the required column. Finally, there is the group by clause. After this clause, a list of column names are added. Each one is separated by a comma. These are the columns according to which the data must be grouped. If there is a where clause in your select statement, then the group by clause must be placed after this clause. And make sure that the columns listed in the select clause include the columns listed in the group by clause. Additionally, the group by clause is also frequently used with aggregate functions. An aggregate function can be used with the group by clause to perform one or more calculations and return a single value for each subgroup. You might be familiar with aggregate functions from previous videos, but if not, don't worry. Here's a quick recap of the main aggregate functions used by database developers with the group by clause. 
Sum, used to add values of given columns together and return a single value. Average, used to determine the average of column values. And max, which returns the maximum value of one or more given columns. The minimum aggregate function determines the minimum value of one or more given columns. And finally, count is used to count the number of instances that a given column value occurs. Let's review the syntax of the SELECT statement when using the GROUP BY clause with an aggregate function. First, input a SELECT statement, followed by a list of columns. You can then apply the aggregate function on any of these columns as required. For example, you can use the MAX aggregate function to calculate the maximum values in column 1. Just make sure to place the column in parentheses. Next, include the FROM clause and the name of the table that holds the columns. Finally, include the GROUP BY clause, followed by the names of the columns by which the data should be grouped. Make sure that these same columns are also present in the SELECT column list. Lucky Shrub can make use of the GROUP BY syntax and aggregate functions to determine the total number of orders received by each department in the business. So, now that you've learned about the GROUP BY clause and aggregate functions, it's time to use your knowledge to help Lucky Shrub. Let's start with a quick review of the order table. The table contains five columns, order ID, department, order date, order quantity, and order total. There are multiple records with the same value for the department column. For example, there were five orders placed with the lawn care department. This means that there are a total of five records for the lawn care department. And there are more instances of multiple records with the same value for other departments, like decking. The best approach in this instance is for Lucky Shrub to group all these records so that they have just one row for each group or department. This will make it much easier to analyse the data and produce summaries. You can help them to reduce the departments into five groups or subgroups using the GROUP BY clause. First, write a SELECT statement followed by department, the column name. Next, insert a FROM clause followed by orders, the table name. Then add the GROUP BY clause and the name of the column. Finally, run the statement to generate the output. In the output that's returned, all records in the department column have been reduced to five groups, one row or one single record for each department in the business. Now that you've simplified the table, you can use aggregate functions to analyse the data. Lucky Shrub's report must show the number of orders placed with each department. You can use the COUNT function to produce this data. The syntax for this query is almost the same as the previous one you just performed. The key difference is that you must add the COUNT function followed by the column name in parentheses after SELECT DEPARTMENT. This specifies which column holds the data and the COUNT function counts the occurrences of each department among the order records. Now just execute the query to generate the output. The output returns the five departments alongside the total number of orders placed with each. Next, let's find out how much money each department made from these orders. You can use the same syntax from the previous query, but this time use the SUM aggregate function with the order total column. Then execute the query. The output returns the total sum of the selected numeric column. In other words, it adds the values in the order total column for each instance of each department. Now let's determine the minimum order quantities for each department. Once again, you can use the same syntax but with the min function targeting the order quantity column. Once you run the query, the output returns the smallest value of the column. Finally, Lucky Shrub also need the average order total for each department. So, write the syntax one last time. And in this instance, you can use the average aggregate function to query the order total column. The output that's returned shows the average value of the order total column. Thanks to your help, Lucky Shrub now have a summary that shows all the relevant data from the order table grouped together as required. Having proved your skills with Lucky Shrub, you should now be able to group rows into subgroups using the MySQL GROUP BY clause. And you should also know how to use the clause with SQL aggregate functions. Well done. At this stage of the course, you may be familiar with the GROUP BY clause, having helped Lucky Shrub group data from their customer orders in an earlier video. Lucky Shrub now need to filter this grouped data against a list of conditions to determine the best performing departments in the business. They can use the MySQL Having clause to specify filter conditions that will generate this data. 
Over the next few minutes, you'll explore the having clause so that you can help Lucky Shrub. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to identify the MySQL having clause and explain its purpose, and demonstrate the use of the having clause to specify a filter condition for groups of rows. So, what is the having clause, and what does it add to your grouping data skill set? The having clause is used in a SQL statement to specify a filter condition for the group data that the group by clause generates. Let's take a moment to review the syntax for this clause, starting with a quick recap of the syntax of a typical SQL statement. As you learned in previous videos, the WHERE clause is used in a SELECT statement to specify one or more filter conditions. And you must place a WHERE clause before the use of the GROUP BY clause. But the WHERE clause can't be used to specify a filter condition for the GROUP data that the GROUP BY clause generates. So how do you filter this data? You can add the HAVING clause to your SQL statement. The HAVING clause is added after the GROUP BY clause. The HAVING clause is used to specify the filter condition that needs to be applied to your grouped data. The HAVING clause evaluates the group filter condition against each group returned by the GROUP BY clause. If the result is true, the row is included in the result set. However, don't forget that if you omit the GROUP BY clause, then the HAVING clause behaves just like the WHERE clause. Let's take a quick look at a basic example of the HAVING clause. Lucky Shrub can use the having clause with aggregate functions to determine which of their departments received orders of a certain dollar amount. Now it's time to use your new having clause knowledge to assist Lucky Shrub. As you discovered earlier, Lucky Shrub needs to filter their customer order data to check which departments met their monthly sales target of $2,275. Let's see if you can help them out. Let's begin with a review of the order table, which holds the required data. The table is divided into five columns, order ID, department, order date, order quantity, and order total. The first task is to identify which departments have order totals of a value greater than $2,275, so you're only concerned with the department and order total columns. You can determine the order total of each department by using a SELECT statement with a GROUP BY clause. First, type the SELECT clause, followed by the department column. You then need to include the sum aggregate function. Then place the order total column in parentheses. Next, add the from keyword, followed by the table name, which is orders. And finally, include the group by clause and target the department column. Run the statement to retrieve an output that shows the total sales figures for each of the five departments. Your next step is to filter this data to retrieve the results that have an order total value greater than $2,275. You can use the same statement as before, but this time add the HAVING clause after the GROUP BY clause. The HAVING clause is followed by a second instance of the SUM aggregate function, which once again targets the order total column. Finally, use the GREATER THAN operator, followed by the figure 2275. This instructs the SQL statement to fill the results greater than $2,275. This SQL statement is now ready to execute. However, you can make the syntax more efficient by using an alias. You should be familiar with the concept of an alias from previous lessons. You can use an alias called total in the SELECT clause for the aggregate function. This alias can then be referred to in the HAVING clause. This makes the condition concise and easier to read. Now you can execute the query. The output that's generated reveals three departments in Lucky Shrub which met this month's sales targets. Thanks to your assistance, Lucky Shrub has identified their best performing departments. You should now be able to identify the MySQL having clause and explain its purpose. And you should also be able to demonstrate the use of the having clause to specify a filter condition for groups of rows. You're making great progress with grouping data. Congratulations, you've reached the end of the first module in this course. Let's take a moment to recap on some of the key skills you've gained in this module's lessons. In the first lesson, you received an introduction to the course in which you learned why MySQL is a key language for database engineers and how Meta uses MySQL. And you enhanced your knowledge by reviewing some key additional resources. In lesson two, you explored the topic of filtering data. You began the lesson by learning about the concepts of data filtering and logical operators. You then discovered how to use logical operators to filter your data sets. Next, you completed a reading in which you explored some real-world examples of data filtering. 
Finally, you reviewed some additional resources on the topics of data filtering and logical operators. You then progressed to Lesson 3, in which you learned the skills required to join tables. You first learned about the concept of aliases and how they can be used in MySQL. You then learned how to identify different types of joins and how to utilize them in your database tables. And you demonstrated these new skills in a lab environment. Next, you learned about the concept of a union operator and you demonstrated its use in your databases. Finally, you enhanced your knowledge of these topics by exploring additional reading materials. In the fourth and final lesson, you gained skills in grouping data. You began the lesson by learning how to identify and make use of the group by clause. You then learned how to use a having clause. Next, you completed a reading in which you learned how to utilize the MySQL any and all operators. Finally, you were challenged to demonstrate these new data grouping skills within a lab environment. You should now be able to filter data, join tables, and group data in a database using MySQL. Great work. I look forward to guiding you through the next module in which you'll discover how to update databases and work with views. Lucky Shrub Gardening Centre are hiring some new employees. Once these new employees have been hired, the company then needs to add their contact details to the database. Some of these contact details must also replace those of employees who've recently left. The replace command is the best method for Lucky Shrub to make these changes. In this video, you'll learn how the replace command can be used to help Lucky Shrub make these changes. And once you've helped Lucky Shrub, you'll then know how to explain how the replace command works in a MySQL database and demonstrate an understanding of the replace command by inserting or updating data. Let's begin with an overview of the replace command. The replace command is used to insert or update data in a table. However, Unlike the standard insert and update commands, replace first checks for a duplicate key. If found, it deletes the existing record and replaces it with the new one. So, now that you know what the replace command is used for, it's time to look at the syntax. But first, let's quickly recap the syntax for the insert command. Its similarity to the replace command should help you to understand the replace command better. You should be familiar with the insert into command from the previous course. With this command, you instruct SQL to insert new values into designated columns within your chosen table. The replace command works in much the same way. You type out your table name, column names, and values just like before. The only difference is that you must begin the statement with a replace command. You can also use the replace command with the set keyword. The set clause assigns a value for the selected column, but without using the where clause to specify the condition. In other words, it locates the required record of data, then replaces the values with the new set. If you don't specify a column value in the set clause, then the replace command uses a default value or sets the value to null. The replace command is a complicated concept and its similarity to other commands can be confusing. So, to help you out further, let's take a moment to visualize how the replace command works. As you just learned, the replace command first checks if the new record of data already exists in the table by checking the primary or unique key of existing records. If there's no matching key, then replace works like a normal insert statement and adds the new data. If a matching key is found, then the command deletes the existing record and replaces it with a new one. Now that you're familiar with how the replace command works, Take a few moments to see if you can help Lucky Shrub insert and replace new and existing employee records in their database. Lucky Shrub's employee contact records are stored in the employee's contact info table. The table consists of three columns. The employee ID, which is the primary key, the contact number, and email address columns. You need to insert a new record of data for the new employee Seamus Hogan with the following details. An ID equal to one, a contact number, and an email address. You can add this data to the table using the standard insert command. Just type insert into followed by the table and column names. Then add the values to be inserted into each column, ID, contact number, and email address. Click enter to execute the query. The new employee record is added to the table. You can do the same with the replace command for the employee Thomas Erickson. Begin with the replace into command, followed by the table and column names to be updated. Then use the values keyword and list of values to be added to the table for Thomas. These values are his ID, contact number, and email address. 
Click Enter to execute the query. You can then use a SELECT statement to check the table's records. The output shows that Thomas's contact details are now in the table, as are those of Seamus. However, Seamus has decided to leave Lucky Shrub to work for a rival gardening centre. So, you now need to replace his details with those of a new employee, Maria Carter. You can try updating the table using the INSERT command. Type an INSERT into statement just like before and assign Maria an ID of 1 in your statement's values, alongside her contact number and email address, so that her records replace those of Seamus in the table. Then execute the query. But it looks like SQL can't execute this query. Instead of adding Maria's details to the table, it's returned an error message warning of a duplicate entry. This is because you're trying to assign Maria an ID of 1. But this ID is already assigned to Seamus as a primary key value. The primary key must always have a unique value in each row of the table. Otherwise, MySQL returns an error message. So, how can you replace Seamus's records with Maria's? Type the statement again, but this time use the replace command instead of insert. Then click enter to execute the query. MySQL has accepted the statement with no errors. Let's query the table to make sure it contains Maria's records. Type a SELECT statement and FROM keyword followed by the table name. Then click ENTER to execute the query. The output returns the contact details for Maria and Thomas. MySQL has replaced Seamus's records just like you instructed. There's one more task to complete. Maria has recently changed her contact number, so the number also needs to be updated in the table. You can use the REPLACE command to update the record of data. Type the REPLACE command and the table name. Then use the set clause with Maria's employee ID of 1, followed by the new value, which is her contact number. But make sure that you set values for all columns. Otherwise, they'll be set to null or default values. Press Enter to execute the query. You can use a select statement to check the table and confirm that Maria's details were updated. Thanks to your efforts, Lucky Shrub's employee contact info is now up to date. You should now be able to explain how the replace command works and demonstrate the replace command by inserting or updating data. Great work. Little Lemon Restaurant have built two new tables in their database that allow customers to create accounts and register bookings. To make sure that these tables work as required, the restaurant has set up constraints which ensure that the tables only accept valid data. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn about the concept of constraints in MySQL by exploring how Little Lemon have made use of them in their database. And by the end of this lesson, you'll be able to identify the main types of constraints and explain how they function, and explain the MySQL on delete cascade and on update cascade options. Let's begin with an overview of what database engineers mean by the term constraints. When creating a table, you might decide that each column must hold a unique value in each row of the table, like a phone number. You can enforce this rule using the unique constraint, which prevents any violation of the rule whenever data is inserted or updated in your database. There are three main types of constraints in MySQL database, which can be used to enforce these rules. Key constraints, which apply rules to key types. Domain constraints, used to govern the values that can be stored for a specific column and referential integrity constraints, which establish rules for referential keys. Let's take a few moments to explore each of these three MySQL constraint types and discover how they're used by Little Lemon in their database. As you learned in the previous course, all tables include different types of keys, like primary keys and foreign keys. You can use constraints to establish rules for these keys. For example, the primary key constraint can be used to specify that one or more column values must always be unique, and they cannot accept a null value. Little Lemon's database contains a table called Customers. This table records key data on customer bookings using the primary key constraint. The table has three columns called Customer ID, Full Name, and Phone Number. Customer ID is defined as the primary key which returns data on the table's unique records. Thanks to the primary key constraint, this column's values must always be unique and it can never accept null value. In other words, every row in the column must hold a customer ID and all customer IDs must be unique. Next, let's look at domain constraints. As you learned earlier, these are special rules defined for values that can be stored for a certain column. 
Little Lemon's database contains a bookings table that records data on customer bookings. However, the restaurant can only facilitate a maximum of eight guests per booking. So, they enact the SQL check constraint on the number of guests column. This limits the value range that can be placed in the column, which means the table rejects any numeric values greater than eight. Finally, let's explore referential integrity constraints. You learned earlier that this type of constraint establishes rules for referential keys. But how exactly does this work? Basically, in a referential integrity constraint, there are two types of tables. A referencing table that holds a primary key and a referenced table that contains a foreign key. The value of the foreign key column that exists in the referencing table must always exist in the referenced table. Otherwise, a connection can't be established between the two tables. To understand this better, let's explore the example of the related tables in Little Lemon's database in the form of an entity relationship diagram. Little Lemon's database includes two related tables, the customer's table that holds data on customers and the bookings table that records information on customers' bookings with the restaurant. Each booking in the booking table must relate to a specific customer in the customer's table. Otherwise, the restaurant can't identify who made the bookings. And this also means that each customer must already be registered in the customer's table before they can make a booking in the bookings table. The customer ID column in the bookings table is defined as the foreign key. This is the attribute that joins the two tables together and establishes dependency between them. This means that if a row of data is altered or deleted in the customer's table, then this action destroys the related row of data in the bookings table. In other words, deleting a row of data from the customer's table violates the referential integrity rule. And this results in an error message from MySQL, warning that the action directly impacts on the bookings table. So, how can you make the required changes to the bookings table without violating the referential integrity constraint? In this instance, you can use the onDelete cascade option. This option automatically deletes the related rows of data from the bookings table. And if you want to update a primary key value in the customer's table, you can use the onUpdate cascade option to automatically update the related rows in the bookings table. You'll discover more about these options in a later video. You should now be able to identify the main types of constraints and explain how they function. And you should also be able to explain the MySQL onDelete cascade and onUpdate cascade options. Well done. Little Lemon Restaurant need to build two tables in their database that let customers create accounts and register bookings. They also need to apply constraints to the columns in these tables to ensure data consistency and integrity. Over the next few minutes, you'll help Little Lemon create these tables and apply the following common constraints. Not null, unique, check and foreign key. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to demonstrate how to apply these common constraints in a MySQL database table. The first table that must be created is customers, which records customer details. And the table requires the following constraints. The primary key constraint on the customer ID column, the not null constraint on the full name column, and a unique constraint on the phone number column to ensure that each customer has a unique number. So let's get started. Begin with the create table command and call the table customers. Then add a pair of parentheses. Within the parentheses, define the customer ID column as not null and as the primary key. This ensures that all IDs are unique in each row of the table and that the column does not accept a null or empty value. Next, add a full name column with the constraint not null. And assign a value of varchar with a character limit of 100. Then declare the phone number column as not null unique. This ensures that it only accepts a unique number for each customer. Finally, execute the statement. Now let's view the output by writing and executing the following statement. Show columns from customers. This shows the customers table. The table contains all relevant constraints. The columns are defined with not null. Two keys have been declared. The customer ID column is the primary key, and the phone number column only accepts unique values. The next task is to apply referential integrity. This ensures that each customer can make a booking in the restaurant and that each booking must be assigned to a specific customer. 
In other words, any customer ID that exists in the bookings table must also exist in the customers table. Otherwise, it won't be possible to identify who made the bookings. When creating the bookings table, it's important to focus on the referential integrity constraint and the check constraint to limit the number of guests to a maximum of eight. Begin with a create table command, followed by bookings and parentheses. In the parentheses, create the following columns, booking ID, booking date, table number, number of guests, and customer ID. All columns are defined as not null to ensure that each one must accept a value. All columns are also assigned the integer value, except bookings date, which is assigned a date value. The booking ID column is defined as the primary key. The number of guests column is defined with a check constraint that specifies it's not null. And use a smaller than or equal to operator so that it can only accept a maximum of eight guests. Next, define the customer ID column with the foreign key constraint. Then use the references constraint so the foreign key references the customer ID column in the customer's table. Now, use onDelete and onUpdate cascade options to delete and automatically update the related rows of data in the bookings table. However, be aware that these actions depend on the update and delete operations taking place in the customer's table. Click Enter to execute the statement. To display the table structure, type the following syntax. Show columns from bookings. The output set result shows all columns are assigned the required constraints and values and the customer ID column is mul. This means that it's not a unique key and multiple rows can have the same key value. This makes sense because each customer might make multiple bookings at the same or at different times. This code also joins the two tables and establishes dependencies between them. So if you change or delete the customer ID in the customer's table, then you also update or delete the related record in the bookings table. You should now be able to apply different types of constraints in MySQL database to maintain data integrity and consistency. Great work. Lucky Shrub Gardening Centre has bought new heavy machinery, but it can only be operated by qualified employees. The business has a database table called Machinery that records the contact info of all qualified employees. However, the table has issues with its constraints and it's also missing some key information. Lucky Shrub can fix these issues by making alterations to the table using the alter statement. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn about the alter statement and then use what you've learned to help Lucky Shrub alter their database. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to add, delete, and modify columns and constraints in an existing table. Let's begin with an overview of the alter statement and its syntax. You might often encounter tables in a database that contain missing columns or constraints, or their existing columns and constraints may need to be modified. You can use the alter table statement to make these changes. The alter table statement is often used alongside different SQL commands. Here's a quick overview of some common commands used with the alter table statement. The modify command is used to target specific columns and instruct SQL to make changes to them. The add command can be used to add a new column to a table, and the drop command can be used to drop or delete a column from a table. So, how are these commands used to make alterations to a table? The alter table statement begins with the alter and table clauses, followed by the name of the table to be altered. Next, insert a modify command, followed by the name of the column to be altered and the changes to be made. For example, you can change a column's data type and add a not null constraint. Then repeat the modify command for all other columns you want to alter. You can also alter a table by adding another column. Just use the add column command, followed by the name of the new column. To remove a column from a table, just use the drop command, followed by the name of the column you want to drop or delete. Now that you're familiar with the alter table statement, see if you can help Lucky Shrub make the required changes to their table. The tasks that Lucky Shrub need to complete are as follows. Set the employee ID column as the primary key, change the column constraints, and add a new column to the table. Let's get started. Lucky Shrub's machinery table includes four columns, employee ID, full name, phone number, and county. The table is missing a primary key. Fortunately, the employee ID column is the perfect candidate because all values are unique. 
To set this column as the primary key, you can write an alter table statement. Add the alter table clauses followed by the table name. Then write the modify command and the employee ID column name. Next, set the data type as varchar with a character limit of 10. Then set a not null value to ensure that the column always contains data. Finally, add the primary key value to the column. The employee ID column is now the table's primary key. It looks like each column in the table is also set to accept null values. This means that the table can contain empty fields or rows, which is poor practice in a database. So to change all columns to not null, you can write another alter table statement. In fact, you can use the same statement as before and just add a new line for each column. For the full name and county columns, you can write the following syntax. Add a modify command, set the varchar data type to 100 and a value of not null. For the phone number column, you can write the same syntax but with integer and unique values. This means that the column now accepts unique numeric values only. This avoids any duplicate values. To view the new table structure, write the following statement. Show columns from machinery. This query's output shows that the employee ID is now set as the primary key, the phone number is a unique value, and all columns are set as not null. Now, your final task is to add a new column to the table. Lucky Shrove's machinery can only be operated by employees aged 18 and over. So, the company needs to identify each employee's age and determine who is old enough to operate the machinery. There's currently no age column in the table, so you'll need to create it and add a constraint to ensure every new employee added to the table is at least 18 years old. You can write the statement as follows. Alter table followed by the machinery table name, then the add column command. Next, call the new column age and assign it an integer value. Finally, use the check function to limit the values in this column to at least 18 or more. Then click enter to execute the query. To view the table's new structure, write show columns from machinery. The output now displays the machinery table with a new age column. Thanks to your help, all the required changes have now been made to Lucky Shrove's machinery table. You should now be able to use the alter table clause to add, delete and modify columns and constraints in an existing table. Great work. Lucky Shrove are planning an overhaul of their database. In preparation, they want to create copies of their data to keep it safe during the rebuild. They can complete this task using the copy table process. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn about the process for copying a table and then help Lucky Shrub to copy tables in their database. And by the time you complete this video, you'll have learned how to copy data from an existing table to a new table within the same database, copy a table to a new location while ensuring it retains its constraints, and copy data from an existing table to a new table from a different database. These tasks are carried out using the create table syntax. However, before you explore this syntax, let's take a moment to review the process for copying tables. It's important that you're familiar with the process before you begin copying tables. You first need to identify the database and the table you want to copy the data from. Next, determine the columns you want to copy, either all columns or just some of them. Then, use the create table statement to build a new table with a relevant table name. And finally, use the select command to structure the new table by specifying the columns you want to copy data from. Now that you're familiar with the process steps, let's review the create table syntax. The copy table SQL statement begins with the create table command followed by the name of your new table. Next, write the select command, then identify the columns to be copied. You can copy one, several, or all columns. Finally, use the from command, followed by the name of the existing table you want to copy. But what about copying a table between two different databases? Once again, begin with a create table command. However, in this instance, you must use dot notation to identify the names of the new database and table. Then use the select command to select the existing table's columns. And finally, use the from clause, then follow this with another instance of dot notation that identifies the names of the existing table and database to be copied. Lucky Shrub are now ready to begin copying tables in their database. 
they want to carry out the process as follows. First, they need to copy the client's table to a new table called client's test in the same database. They then need to copy a few select columns to the table. Next, they need to make sure that all constraints from the original table were copied over to the new one. And finally, they want to copy a table from one database to another. Use your new knowledge of the copying tables process to help them out. First, let's review the clients table in the Lucky Shrub database by typing select asterisk from clients. Then click enter to execute the query. This generates the client table on screen. The table contains four columns, client's ID, full name, contact number and location. For the first part of the test, Lucky Shrub need to copy the client's table to a new table called client's test in the same database. You can perform this task using the create table SQL query to create two statements. In the first statement, use a basic create table clause to create the new client test table. In the second statement, type the select command with the asterisk as shorthand for all columns. Then type the existing table name, which is clients. Finally, click enter to execute the query. This query copies all columns and their data from the client's table to the new client's test table. To check that the query was successful, you can type the following statement. Select asterisk from client test. Then click enter to execute. This query generates the client's test table, and the table contains a copy of all the data as required. Next, Lucky Shrub needs you to copy partial data only. They need to copy the full name and contact number columns from the client's table to another table. Begin with a create table statement, followed by the name of the new table, which is client test2. Then use a select command. But in this instance, specify just the full name and contact number columns. Type the from keyword, followed by the name of the existing table, which is clients. Finally, use the where clause in the select statement to specify a condition. In this case, copy the data only for those employees who live in Pinal County. Click enter to execute the query. The query's output shows the client's test 2 table and the table contains a copy of all the data from client test for all employees from Pinal County. The test worked. Next, you need to make sure that all constraints from the original table were copied over to the new one. It's important to remember that copying data using the methods you've encountered so far doesn't copy the key constraints. You can check the constraints on the original table by typing and executing the statement. Show columns from clients. The query generates the clients table. The table structure shows all columns with the key constraints set for the client ID and contact number columns. Now let's check for these constraints on the client's test table by typing and executing the following statement. Show columns from client's test. This statement shows the client's test table. The table is missing the primary and unique keys defined in the original table. So how can you copy these keys? You can use the following statement. Create table, clients test three, like clients. The like keyword creates an exact copy of the existing table structure. Press enter to execute the statement. Then type and execute the following SQL statement to display the new table structure. Show columns from clients test three. The output shows an exact copy of the initial clients table. And all the key constraints have been copied as expected. Your final task is to copy the client's table from the Lucky Shrub database to the new test database. Begin with a create table statement. Then specify the new database and table names as testdb.clientsTest. Type select asterisk to instruct SQL to copy all data. And finally, add the from keyword followed by the existing database and table names, which are luckyshrub.clients. Click enter to execute the query. Now you just need to check that the query was successful by moving into the test database. Type testdb, then show tables to reveal all tables in the test database. This statement reveals all the tables created in the test database, including the client's test table you just copied over from the Lucky Shrub database. And the table contains all the data from the original one. Lucky Shrub now have all the required copies of their tables in their database. You should now be able to 
Copy data from an existing table to a new table within the same database. Copy a table to a new location while ensuring it retains its constraints. And copy data from an existing table to a new table from a different database. Great work. Little Lemon Restaurant need to extract financial info from their database to complete their accounts. They can carry out this task using a subquery. Over the next few minutes, you'll explore the concept of a subquery and learn how to recognize a subquery and understand its syntax, identify scenarios in which a subquery can be used, and explain how subqueries are used to retrieve data. So, to begin, let's answer the question of what is a subquery? As the name states, a subquery is a query within another query. In other words, it's an inner query placed within an outer query. The inner query is viewed as the child query and the outer query as the parent query. But what does a query within a query look like? Well, the best way to understand a subquery is through its syntax. As you just learned, a subquery is a query within a query. An inner or child query within an outer or parent query. The inner query or subquery executes first and its results are then passed to the outer or parent query. You can also build multiple subqueries in MySQL. The outer query is presented like any normal query. It contains select, from and where clauses. Likewise, the subquery is written as a standard query. However, the subquery must always be placed within a pair of parentheses. When executed, a subquery can return any of the following results. A single value, a single row, a single column, or multiple rows of one or more columns. A key advantage of a subquery is that you can compare it against other values using a comparison operator. You should be familiar with comparison operators from previous lesson items in this specialization. If not, here's a quick recap. Examples of commonly used standard comparison operators include equal to, less than, and greater than. There's also less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, and not equal to. Let's look at the syntax for subqueries and comparison operators. A subquery can be placed before or after a comparison operator in the WHERE clause of your parent query. Now that you're familiar with the basics of subqueries, here's a demonstration of how they're used. Little Lemon Restaurant are reviewing their accounts and need employee salary data from their database. This data is held in the Employees table. The table contains four columns, Employee ID, Employee Name, Role and Annual Salary. Little Lemon must use this table to identify which employees earn a salary higher than that of the assistant chef. You can use a subquery to complete this task. This query can be completed in two parts as follows. The outer or main query must extract details of all employees whose annual salary is greater than the specified value. And the subquery must identify the annual salary of the assistant chef. When executed, the subquery provides a subset of data from the employee's database. And this subset of data is then used as an input for the outer query. Begin by writing the outer query as follows. A select command followed by an asterisk. Then the from clause, which targets the employee's table. The next part of the outer query must filter out the employee's table data based on the annual salary. So, add a WHERE clause followed by the annual salary column. Then add the filter condition in the WHERE clause, the annual salary column followed by a greater than operator symbol. The greater than operator must target a specific value. But how do you determine what this value is? You can use a subquery. Write a subquery within your main query as follows. Add parentheses after your greater than operator. Within the parentheses, write select annual salary column from employees table. Then write a WHERE clause followed by the ROLL column. Finally, add an equals operator followed by the assistant chef value. Now that you've written both queries, press enter to execute. The subquery executes first and extracts the annual salary of the assistant chef. This value is now the input for the outer query's WHERE clause. Next, the outer query is executed. The outer query's WHERE clause filters out the records of all employees earning an annual salary greater than that of the assistant chef. In other words, 
the outer query filters out the values greater than the value retrieved by the subquery. The subquery's result shows that the assistant chef earns $45,000 a year. And the outer query shows that there are three employees who earn more than the assistant chef. These employees are the manager, assistant manager, and head chef. And that's an example of how the subquery is used in a database. You should now be able to recognize a subquery, understand its syntax, and identify scenarios in which a subquery can be used. Well done. Little Lemon Restaurant need to perform complex queries in their database and standard subqueries might not be enough for this task. So, they'll need to use multiple row subqueries with complex comparison operators. Over the next few minutes, you'll explore subqueries and complex comparison operators and learn how to explain how subqueries interact with complex comparison operators and demonstrate the use of subqueries in a complex data retrieval scenario. As you might already know, a key advantage of a subquery is that you can compare it against other values using an operator. However, there are more complex operators that can be used with multiple row subqueries. The any operator returns data for any values that meet the specified condition. All returns data for all values, and the sum operator returns data for one or more matching values. Let's look at how to write multiple row subqueries using the all, any, and sum operators. These comparison operators let you perform a comparison between a single common value and a range of other values. They result in multiple records or target multiple values within a table. Subqueries can also be used with the exists and not exists operators. The exists operator tests for the existence of rows in the results set returned by the subquery. It returns true if the subquery returns one or more records. On the other hand, the not exists operator checks for the non-existence or absence of results from the subquery. Not exists returns true when the subquery does not return any row of results. Let's review the syntax for the exists and not exists operators. The syntax is very similar to a standard subquery. The key difference is that the exists operator is placed after the where clause to determine the existence of the value specified in the subquery or you can use the not exists operator to check for the non-existence or absence of results from the subquery. Let's look at a demonstration of how subqueries are used with these operators. The Little Lemon restaurant need to identify all employees earning an annual salary that's less than or equal to the annual salary earned by all employees in the following roles. Manager, assistant manager, head chef, and head waiter. The data required to complete this query is in the employees table. The table has four columns as follows. Employee ID, employee name, role, and annual salary. You can extract the data required from this table using two queries. An outer query to identify all employees who are earning an annual salary that's less than or equal to the specified values and a subquery that extracts the data of annual salaries earned by employees who were in the roles specified earlier. Let's begin with the outer query. It starts with a select command and an asterisk. Then add a from clause that targets the employees table. Next, write a where clause followed by the annual salary column name. Finally, write a less than or equal to operator. Now you must write the subquery within parentheses. Write a select command to select the annual salary column, then a from clause to target the employee's table. Next, write a where clause followed by a condition that extracts data from the role column. Finally, in parentheses, write the required roles, manager, assistant manager, head chef, and head waiter. These queries must return a result that lists all employees earning an annual salary that's less than or equal to the annual salary earned by all employees in the role specified. So to ensure that you get the desired result, place the all operator after the less than or equal to comparison operator, but before the subquery. Then execute the query to return the output. The subquery executes first and identifies the salaries of the manager, assistant manager, head chef, and head waiter roles. These salaries are the values that the outer query uses. The values are 70,000, 65,000, 50,000, 
and 40,000. So the outer query filters out the employees who earn an annual salary less than or equal to all these values. The final output shows that the employees with IDs of 5 and 6 earn an annual salary less than or equal to the other roles. On the other hand, the any operator compares the results of the subquery to determine whether it can exclude records from the outer query that satisfy the conditions for any of the values returned by the subquery. Little Lemon's next task is to identify employees earning an annual salary that's greater than or equal to the annual salary earned by any employee in the four roles specified earlier. You can use the same query as before, but remember that this time you're checking for values that are greater than or equal to those in the subquery. So change the comparison operator in the WHERE condition of the outer query to a greater than or equal to operator. Now, just before the subquery, Replace the ALL operator with the ANY operator. Finally, press ENTER to execute the query. The output shows that there are five employees who earn a salary greater than or equal to the other roles. For their final query, Little Lemon need to determine if their head chef and waiter are assigned to a booking. They can do this using the EXISTS or NOT EXISTS operators. The query involves two actions. In the first action, the outer query extracts details of employees. And in the second action, the subquery determines if the head chef or head waiter have been assigned to a booking. The required data is held in the bookings table. This table has six columns as follows. Booking ID, table number, first name of guest, last name of guest, a column for each booking slot or time, and a column that shows the ID of the employee assigned to the booking. Begin by writing the outer query as follows. Select asterisk from employees. Then add a WHERE clause. The subquery must determine if there are any employees in the role of head chef or head waiter assigned to a booking. So add the EXISTS operator after the WHERE clause. Then write the subquery in parentheses as follows. A SELECT command and an asterisk. A FROM clause targeting the bookings table, a WHERE clause, and a condition that must return results for the required employees if they're assigned to a booking. Press ENTER to execute the query and generate the output. So the EXISTS operator has checked for the existence of the specified results in the subquery, and it has found that these results exist. Therefore, the operator result is true. The result is that the outer query filters out the details of the two employees who are assigned to these three bookings. Now, let's replace EXISTS with the NOT EXISTS operator to see what results are returned. The output returns the same three records as before. However, the NOT EXISTS operator checks for the non-existence of results from the subquery. Also in this case, the WHERE clause filters out employees that do not exist in the results obtained by the subquery. This returns results of four employees that don't exist in the subquery's results. In other words, this is the data for employees who don't meet the subquery's criteria and aren't identified in the results. You should now be able to explain how subqueries interact with comparison operators and demonstrate the use of subqueries in a complex data retrieval scenario. Well done. Lucky Shrub have had particularly good sales so far this year. They now need to identify the top three best-selling products to make sure they have enough quantity in stock for the next few months. There's a lot of data to parse through in their database, so they've decided the easiest way to identify the best-selling products is with the use of a virtual table or view. In this video, you'll explore views and then use what you've learned to help Lucky Shrub. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to Explain the concept of views in database and demonstrate how to create, rename and drop views in MySQL database. Let's begin by developing an understanding of what database engineers mean by the term views. Views are virtual tables created from one or multiple tables depending on the requirements. The view presents a table interface that lets the database users access and manipulate the data within the table using MySQL. So why do database engineers use views? Let's look at some common use cases. Views can be used to create a subset of a table's data. For example, a table might have seven columns, but you only need data from three. 
so you could create a subset from these three columns. And views can also be used to combine data from multiple tables. You might need to query two columns from one table and four from another. You can use views to combine both sets of columns into one virtual table. Now that you understand what views are, let's review the syntax. The syntax begins with the create command, followed by the view keyword and the name of the view or virtual table. The as keyword is then used to define the view table functionality. Next, use the select command to specify the columns the table must be built from. You can specify these columns using dot notation, making sure to include both the table and column name. For example, table one dot column one to select the first column in the first table. Then use the from keyword to specify the tables that the data must be extracted from. Finally, you can use the where clause and a condition to set data order and filtering rules. That's how you can create a view by extracting data from one table. However, creating a virtual view based on multiple tables requires a bit more effort. Let's find out more. When creating a view from multiple tables, much of the syntax remains the same. The key difference is after the select command. You must list the columns that you require from both tables using dot notation. You then need to create an inner join after the from keyword in which you join the two tables together. Then use the on keyword to determine the matching columns used to create the join. Let's take a closer look at the use of dot notation. Dot notation is used to link columns with tables. This is particularly important if you're dealing with multiple tables. Multiple tables might give rise to a potential conflict in names. For example, two tables could use the same name for a specific column. To avoid this, you can establish a link between each column and its respective table by placing a dot in between them. However, dot notation is optional if your query is only dealing with one table. The view syntax presents a clear five-step process for creating a virtual table or view. Create the virtual table using the create view syntax. List the columns to be moved from the original table to the virtual one. Specify the original table from which data must be extracted to create the view. Set the conditions. And finally, set the data order and filtering rule. Now that you've been introduced to what a view is and been shown how to create one, it's time to see if you can assist Lucky Shrub. As you discovered earlier, Lucky Shrub need to identify their top three best-selling products with the use of a virtual table or view to make sure they have enough quantity in stock for the next few months. Let's use your new knowledge of views to help them out. You can create a virtual table or view for Lucky Shrub using the data in the orders and products tables in their database. Let's take a moment to familiarize ourselves with these tables before using them to create the view. The orders table has five columns that include information about the order ID, client ID, product ID, quantity, and cost. While the products table has three columns that include information about the product ID, item name, and price. Lucky Shrub want to identify their top three best-selling products. So to create the view, you only need data from the item name column from the products table, the order quantity, and total cost columns from the orders table. As you learned earlier, the key steps for creating the view lie in the syntax. So write a create command and the view keyword. Then write the name of the view, which you can call top three products. Include the as keyword to define the view table's functionality. Then use the select command and dot notation to target the required columns for your view. Next, use the from keyword to identify the tables. However, the view is created from two separate tables. So you'll need to join these tables together using inner join based on their matching product ID value. Finally, use order by to list the products based on the highest cost with only the top three products appearing on screen in descending order. Execute the query to generate a new virtual table called top three products with the three required columns, item, quantity, and cost. You can now query this virtual table just like any other normal table using the following basic SQL statement. Select asterisk from top three products. The table prints the top three best-selling products along with their name, 
quantity and cost. Why don't you try renaming the table to something shorter, like top products? You can rename a virtual table using the MySQL rename command. To rename the table, write rename table top three products to top products. This syntax is used to rename all types of tables in MySQL. In this statement, you just specify the view's current name after the rename table clause. Then you specify the view's new name after the to keyword. Finally, click enter to execute the query. The table has now been renamed top products. What if you no longer require a virtual table? You can just drop it using the SQL drop command, drop view top products. Click enter to execute the query. The view has now been removed and there's no impact on the original table it was created from. Thanks to the view, Lucky Shrub now know what their top three best selling products are and they can make sure that they have enough quantity in stock for the next sales period. You should now be able to explain the concept of views in database and demonstrate how to create, rename and drop views in MySQL database. Well done. Congratulations, you've reached the end of the second module in this course. Let's take a moment to recap on some of the key skills you've gained in this module's lessons. In the first lesson, you learned how to insert and update data and should now be able to explain the concept of the replace statement, outline how the replace statement is used to insert or update data in a database table, and demonstrate the replace statement following your completion of the projects in the lab environment. In lesson two, you learned how to work with values and constraints. Now that you've completed this lesson, you're able to identify the main types of constraints, explain how constraints work in a database, outline the MySQL on delete cascade and on update cascade options, and demonstrate your ability to utilize values and constraints as proven in the lab environment. You then moved on to the third lesson in which you learned how to change the structure of a table. Having completed this lesson, you're now able to Add, delete, and modify columns and constraints in an existing database table. Copy data within and between tables and databases using the copy table syntax. You also demonstrated your ability to alter tables in the labs, and you reviewed the additional resources to learn more about these concepts. In the fourth lesson, you explored the concept of subqueries. Now that you've completed this lesson, you're able to recognize a subquery and understand its syntax, identify scenarios in which a subquery can be used, and explain how subqueries can be used to retrieve data. You also demonstrated your ability to work with subqueries in a lab environment. Finally, in lesson five, you learned about virtual tables or views. Now that you've reached the end of this lesson, you're able to explain the concept of views in a database, demonstrate how to create, rename, and drop views in a database, identify the advantages of using views in MySQL, and you completed readings in which you gained additional knowledge on the topics of views. Having completed this module, you should now be able to update data, work with values and constraints, change the structure of a table, and utilize subqueries and virtual tables. Great work. I look forward to guiding you through the next module in which you'll discover how to work with functions and MySQL stored procedures. The jewellery store Magenta and Gallo, also known as M&G, are reviewing client orders in their database. They must determine the average amount of money that each client has spent with the business. M&G can use numeric functions to extract this information. In this video, you'll explore numeric functions and learn how to identify common MySQL numeric functions and explain how these functions are used to process and manipulate data in a MySQL database. At this stage of the course, you've encountered some basic functions. So here's a quick reminder of what database engineers mean by the term functions in the context of MySQL. As you've learned in earlier lessons, a function is a piece of code that performs an operation and returns a result. Some functions accept parameters or arguments, while other functions do not. Functions are very useful for manipulating data in a database table. Broadly speaking, MySQL functions can be grouped into five different categories as follows. Numeric functions, string functions, date functions, comparison, and control flow functions. You'll review each of these functions in more detail over the course of this lesson. 
The focus of this video is MySQL numeric functions, which can be divided into two categories. Aggregate functions, which can be used on a set of values, and math functions, which perform basic mathematical tasks on data. You should already be familiar with aggregate functions, having used these previously in the course with select statements to calculate aggregated values. So let's just recap them briefly. Commonly used aggregate functions include sum, average, and max. There's also the minimum aggregate function and count. Now that you've recapped aggregate functions, let's look at some common math functions. A number can be rounded to a specific decimal place using the round function. And the mod function can be used to return the remainder of one number divided by another. These functions are a great way for MNG to perform additional tasks while also determining the average dollar amount that each client has spent with the business. But how can you and MNG make use of these functions in a MySQL database? You can build them into your SQL select statements. Let's review the syntax. The round syntax begins with a select command, followed by the name of the column to be queried. You then call the round function, followed by a pair of parentheses. Within these parentheses, write the required arguments. The first argument can be a column name or any numeric value. The second argument must be the number of decimal places. Finally, write the from keyword, followed by the required table name. The mod syntax is very similar. Just call the mod function instead of round. And within parentheses, identify the column or value and instruct MySQL what number to divide the value by. Finally, identify the table that holds the data. When working with the mod function, bear in mind that the first argument can be a table column or any numeric value, while the second argument must be the value by which the first will be divided. For example, MNG can use the round syntax and average numeric function to determine the average dollar amount each client spent rounded down to two decimal places. Let's take a few moments to explore MNG's database and find out more about how they make use of numeric functions. As you learned earlier, MNG are reviewing client orders and must determine the average dollar amount that each client has spent with the business. The company has a table called Client Orders that shows the average amount each client has spent. The table has two columns, Client ID, which shows the ID of each client, and Average Cost, which displays the average amount each client has spent. However, even though this table shows the average amount, MNG need to round down these values to two decimal places. You can help them using the round function. Write select, followed by the column names. Then call the round function on the average cost column. In parentheses, put the average cost column as the first argument. Then pass the number two as the second argument to round the value to two decimal places. Next, use the from keyword to target the client orders table. Finally, group by client ID. Execute the query to create the output and display all decimal places reduced to two. In the next task, MNG are restocking their inventory and need to identify which items they've placed an even number of orders for. The data they need is in the table MG orders. The table contains several columns, but the ones you need to complete this task are order ID, item ID, and quantity. To determine if a given quantity is odd or even, you can divide the quantity by two. The remainder is your answer. This can be done using the mod function. First, write select, followed by the column names. Then call the mod function. Pass the quantity column as the first argument, and the number two as the second argument. Execute the query. The query returns the following values. A value of zero if there is no remainder when all data is divided by two, or it returns just the remainder value. The output shows that an even number of orders have been placed for items one, three, five, and six. M&G have now completed their database tasks using common MySQL functions. And you should now be able to identify frequently used MySQL numeric functions, and explain how these functions contribute to data processing and manipulation in a MySQL database. Well done. Magenta and Gallo, or MNG, are performing an inventory review. They require a list of item names and their available quantities. 
They can extract this data from their database using common MySQL string functions. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn how string functions can be used to perform tasks like this. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to identify common MySQL string functions and explain how these functions are used to process and manipulate data in a MySQL database. Let's take a moment to find out what database engineers mean by the term string functions. String functions are used to manipulate string values. For example, adding strings together or extracting a segment of a string. Here's a few examples of some commonly used string functions. The concatenation function is used to add several strings together. And there's also the substring function, which extracts a segment of a string from a parent string. Uppercase converts a string to uppercase, and lowercase converts a string to lowercase. Next, let's explore the syntax of these strings to find out how they're used in a MySQL database. A very simple example of a concatenation function begins with a select command, which calls a concatenation function. You then type a pair of parentheses in which you include the string values to be concatenated. Ensure both are contained within double quotes and separated by a comma. Then include the from keyword and the name of the table that contains the data. You can also use the WHERE clause to specify a condition. A more complex example of the concatenation function might involve extracting string values from two separate tables. For example, the data that MNG require is on two separate tables, items and MG orders. MNG can pass their arguments in the SELECT clause, identify the two tables they required in the FROM clause, and specify the condition in the WHERE clause so that SQL filters the required data from the combination of the two tables. This example might seem complicated, but don't worry. You'll explore it in more detail in a few moments when you help MNG query their database. Let's continue to review string function syntax with substrings. The syntax of a substring function is similar, but there are three arguments contained within the parenthesis. The first of these is the string itself. The next one is the start index, the point in the string at which the substring must begin. And length refers to the length of the string portion that must be extracted. Next, let's review the syntax for the uppercase and lowercase string functions. M and G often convert the values in one column of a table to uppercase and the values in a second column to lowercase. Here's how they perform this task. An uppercase string function begins with a select statement and uppercase function. In parentheses, write the name of the column whose values must be converted to uppercase. Finally, instruct SQL which table to target. A lowercase string function is very similar. The only difference is that the parentheses must contain the name of the column whose values are to be converted to lowercase. Next, let's look at how MNG make use of string functions in a MySQL database. As you learned earlier, MNG need a list of item names and their available quantities ordered in the format item name order quantity. The item details are in the items table and the order details are in the MG orders table. The items table records information on items in MNG's inventory within the following columns item ID, name, and cost. The MG orders table records data on deliveries within the following columns order ID, item ID, quantity, cost, order date, delivery date, and order status. You can extract the required data from these tables using the concatenation string function. Begin with a select command, then call the concat function and write a pair of parentheses. Within the parentheses, pass the arguments name and quantity. These are the names of the columns for your output. These columns stand for the items table and MG orders table, respectively. Then add a hyphen in between the arguments to combine them. Use a pair of single quotes for the hyphen and ensure all arguments are separated by commas. Use a from keyword to specify the two tables. Finally, use a where clause to specify a condition that filters the required data from the combination of the two tables. Then execute the query. MySQL extracts a table that shows the total quantity of each item in the inventory. The next task is to retrieve all string values in the order status column of the MG orders table in both upper and lower case. 
You can target the string values from the order status column using the upper and lower case string functions. In your select query, call the uppercase function and pass in the column name order status. Then target the MG orders table with the from keyword. Execute the query to retrieve all values in uppercase. To retrieve all values in lowercase, just type the same query again, but this time call the lcase function. Execute the query once more to retrieve all values in lowercase. As part of their next task, M and G are reviewing an order from a client. They need to extract the first name of this client from the clients table. The clients table records key information on clients and stores it in the following columns. The client ID column, in which the required client is assigned an ID of one, the client name, address, and contact number columns. You can retrieve the information M and G need by using the substring function to extract the relevant part of the string from the table's client name column value. First, write a select statement and call the substring function followed by a pair of parentheses. Then pass in the client name column as the first argument to the substring function. Pass in the start index as the second argument, which is the letter K, or character one of the string. And pass in the length of the string portion you need to extract as the third argument. The client's name is Kishin, which is six letters long. So six is our third argument. Then identify the table to target with the from keyword. Finally, add the where clause with the client's ID as the condition. Run the query to extract the client's first name. You've now helped M and G to complete their database tasks using string functions, and you should now be able to identify common MySQL string functions and explain how they're used to process and manipulate data. Great work. M and G are reviewing some recent orders delivered to the store. They must determine how many days have passed between the date these items were delivered and the day they were ordered. They can complete this task using date functions. In this video, you'll explore date functions and learn how to identify common MySQL date functions and explain how these functions are used to process and manipulate data in a MySQL database. First, let's find out what date functions are. Date functions are used in a MySQL database to extract time and date values in a range of different formats. M and G often use date functions to identify key time and date details for customer orders. Commonly used date functions that M and G take advantage of include current date, which returns the date in year, month, date format, and current time, which returns the time in hours, minutes, seconds format. There's also date format, which is used to format a date according to a given format, once that format is valid in MySQL. And date difference identifies the number of days between two date values. Perhaps M and G can use the date difference function to find out how many days have passed between orders. But before you find out how, let's take a few moments to explore the syntax for these functions. In most instances, date functions are written as select statements. To extract today's date in year, month, date format, just type select, the current date function, and open parentheses. For the current time in hours, minutes, seconds format, type select, the current time function, and open parentheses. However, the syntax becomes a bit more complicated with date format and date difference. To change the date format, type the date format function and open parentheses. Within the parentheses, Type today's date in standard SQL year month date format, enclosed in double quotation marks. Then input a valid MySQL format in a pair of single quotes. You can refer to the further reading section at the end of this lesson for a list of valid formats. To determine the number of days between two date values, type the select command and date difference function followed by parentheses. Within the parentheses, type the first and second date values in year month date format and ensure both are enclosed in double quotation marks. Then run the query to create the output. Now that you've reviewed the syntax for date functions, let's see if you can use this knowledge to help M and G. M and G need to complete a series of time and date tasks using date functions. The first of these tasks is extract the current date and time. To retrieve this data, just write select command followed by the current date function and a second select command followed by the current time function. Execute these queries to return the current date and time. 
Now MNG needs you to format a date by displaying the month name of a given date. You can do this by using select and calling the date format function. Then pass in the order date as the first argument. Type the required format to get the full month name. Finally, identify the required table. Execute the query to create the output. For the final task, MNG must determine the number of days between the delivery date and order date for their most recent orders. As you discovered earlier, the date difference function can be used to complete this task. The delivery data is contained in the MG orders table. The table records delivery data within the following columns, order ID, item ID, quantity, cost, order date, delivery date, and order status. To complete this task, you need to focus on the values from the delivery date and order date columns. First, write a select query and call the date difference function. Pass the values from the delivery date column as the first argument. Then pass the values from the order date column as the second argument. Use the from clause to target the MG orders table. And finally, use the where clause to filter out the records that do not have a null delivery date. Once executed, the query reveals the number of days between the delivery and order dates for the most recent orders. MNG now know how many days passed between the delivery date and order date for their most recent orders. And you should now be capable of using common MySQL date functions to process and manipulate data. Well done. MNG are approaching the end of their business year and need to extract sales revenue data for each item in their inventory. They can extract this data using comparison functions. Over the next few minutes, you'll explore the concept of comparison functions. And at the end of this video, you'll be able to identify common MySQL comparison functions and explain how these functions are used to process and manipulate data in a MySQL database. So, what do database engineers mean by the term comparison functions? MySQL comparison functions allow you to compare values within a database. For example, the function can be used to determine the highest, lowest, and other values. A benefit of comparison functions is that they can be used with a wide range of values, including numerical, strings, and characters. Here's a few examples of MySQL comparison functions. The greatest function is used to find the highest value. Least determines the lowest value. And isNull is used as an alternative to the equals operator to test if a value is null. To demonstrate the syntax, let's identify the highest and lowest values from a table that contains numerical values only. The syntax begins with a select command, followed by the name of the required column. Often this is the column that holds the table's primary key or identifying attribute. Next, type the greatest function, followed by parentheses containing the names of the columns you need to compare. Then use the as keyword with a column alias of highest to ensure SQL returns the required values in a new table under this column. Next, utilize the least function in the same manner. Finally, identify the table to be queried. For example, MNG can use the greatest and least syntax to extract sales revenue data. They can target the last four business quarters and deliver the highest and lowest values from each. You'll find out more about how MNG can do this in a few moments. For now, let's look at the syntax for the final comparison operator, isNull. isNull is often used with a select command, followed by the name of the required column. Then a from keyword is used to identify the required table. An isNull function can also be used with a where clause. The clause calls the isNull function and identifies the column it must pass through. Now that you're familiar with the syntax of comparison functions, Let's take a few moments to find out how they're used in the MNG database. As you learned earlier, MNG require data on their sales revenue for each item in their inventory for the last four business quarters. The sales revenue data is contained in the sales revenue table. The table has five columns. One column called item ID, which identifies each item in the inventory and an individual column for each quarter. MNG first need to identify the highest and lowest revenue each item brought in over the past four quarters. You can help them by using the greatest and least comparison functions, just like the syntax example from earlier. Start with a select command and list item ID as the first column. 
Then, to identify the items that brought in the highest revenue, call the greatest function and pass the four business quarter columns as arguments. Then create the alias highest. Write a similar line of syntax for the least function and assign it the alias of lowest. Finally, use the from keyword to target the sales revenue table. Once executed, the query's output presents the highest and lowest sales revenue values for each item over the last four business quarters. For example, the item with the ID of 1 was worth $138,000 to M&G at its peak and $60,000 during its lowest sales period. M&G need to determine which of their most recent orders have yet to be delivered. The delivery data is held in the MG order table. The table contains seven columns, order ID, item ID, quantity, cost, order date, delivery date, and order status. The delivery date column is your primary concern here. All orders yet to be delivered have a null value within this column. So you can use the isNull function on this column with the WHERE clause to filter these orders. Begin by writing the SELECT statement as usual, followed by an asterisk. Then use a FROM keyword to target the table. Finally, write a WHERE clause and call the isNull function to pass through the delivery date column. Once executed, the query returns a value of 3. This is a true value for all records that have a NULL value for the delivery date column. M&G now have their required sales data, and you should now be able to use comparison functions in a MySQL database. Great work. M&G need to determine which items in their inventory are turning a profit and which items are making a loss. They can use a control flow function to carry out this task. Over the next few minutes, you'll explore control flow functions, and by the end of this video, you'll be able to Identify common MySQL control flow functions and explain how these functions are used to process and manipulate data in a MySQL database. So, what are control flow functions in a MySQL database? Control flow functions let you evaluate conditions and determine the execution path or flow of a query. The most common control flow function used in a MySQL database is the case function. The case function runs through a set of conditions contained within a case block and returns a value when the first condition is met. Let's take a moment to explore how this function operates. The case function is held within a case block. It operates in a similar manner to an if-then-else statement. Once it finds a condition that's true, it returns the result. If no conditions are true, then it returns the value specified in the else clause. If there's no else clause and no conditions are true, it returns null. So, what does the full syntax of a case function statement look like? First, write a select keyword followed by the name of one or more columns that contain the required values. This is followed by the case function, which denotes the start of the case block. Next is the list of conditions which are written using the when and then clauses. The case block is then closed with the use of an end clause. You can also add an alias for the expression, depending on the needs of your code. Finally, identify the table to be queried. For example, MNG can use the case function to identify which items in their inventory are loss-making and which ones have turned a profit. They can extract the sales data for each item from the sales revenue table. Any items with a value less than or equal to $25,000 are considered loss-making. Any items with a higher value are viewed as profitable. MySQL displays the terms profit or loss next to each item's ID depending on the result. Let's take a few minutes to explore MNG's database and find out how they extract sales revenue data using a control flow function. As you've just discovered, M&G need to check which items in their inventory have turned a profit this year. Any items that have accrued at least $25,000 in sales are considered profitable. All other items are making a loss and should be removed from sale. The data they need is contained in the sales revenue table. The table has five columns. One column called item ID, which identifies each item in the inventory, and an individual column for each of the four business quarters. By checking if the value of the lowest quarter is less than or equal to 25,000, M&G can determine which items made a profit and which items made a loss. 
The easiest way to perform this task is by using the case control flow function. First, write the select statement and target the item ID column. This is the column you need to display results against. So, write the case keyword to begin your case block. In the case block, write when and give the condition with the least function. Then list the quarterly sales columns in parentheses. The next set of steps involves the operator and conditions. Write a less than or equal to operator and write then to specify what information you intend to display if the condition is true. In this instance, you need to display the word loss. Then write the else keyword and specify what information must be displayed if the condition is false. In this case, it's profit. End the case block with the end keyword. Now you need to create the aliases and identify the table to be targeted. Use an as keyword to create the profit loss alias. This is the name of the column that the results of your case query are placed in. Finally, write the from keyword and target the sales revenue table. Execute the query to extract the results. The results show that items 1, 4, 5 and 6 generated a profit, while items 2 and 3 made a loss. M&G have now completed their database tasks with your help. And you should now be able to use control flow functions when writing SQL select statements. Nicely done. Lucky Shrub often perform the same queries on their database every day. And each time they perform these queries, they have to rewrite the same SQL code again. There must be an easier way, right? Well, with MySQL, Lucky Shrub can use the stored procedures method to save a specific query as a block of code that they can then recall whenever required. Over the next few minutes, you'll discover how this works by exploring the concept of stored procedures. And by the end of this video, you'll be able to demonstrate an understanding of stored procedures in a MySQL database and create and drop simple stored procedures in MySQL. So, let's begin with an overview of what database engineers mean by the term stored procedures. A stored procedure is a block of code or pre-prepared query that can be stored in your database. You can then invoke or call the stored procedure using the call command. There are a lot of benefits to be gained from using stored procedures. With stored procedures, your code is more consistent. Your code is also reusable. You no longer need to write the same SQL statements repeatedly. And your code is also easier to use and maintain. Next, let's explore the syntax to get a better understanding of how the stored procedure works. First, to create a basic stored procedure, write the create procedure command. This must be followed by the name of the procedure and a pair of parentheses, which hold the list of parameters. This parenthesis is required even if your stored procedure contains no parameters. Then write the rest of your procedure logic as required. For example, if your procedure must select all data from a table, then write a select command with an asterisk and the from keyword followed by the table name. When writing a stored procedure with one or more parameters, the syntax is much the same. The key difference is that you must include all required parameters within the parenthesis. Then write the rest of your procedure logic. Once you've created the stored procedure, the next step is to invoke it. To invoke a procedure, you can use the call command followed by the procedure name. Make sure to include the parenthesis. But what if you no longer required a stored procedure? How do you remove it from your database? To delete a stored procedure, you can use the drop procedure command followed by the procedure name. In this instance, you don't need to include any parenthesis. As you learned earlier, Lucky Shrub make heavy use of the same queries in their database. For example, they often need to query the list of products in their database products table to find items for customers or check what's in stock in their store. However, they need to rewrite the same query each time they interact with the products table. It's a time-consuming process. Why don't you use your new knowledge of stored procedures to help them create a reusable query? Lucky Shrub need to create a stored procedure that can extract all data from their products table. The table holds data on all products in the store and is divided into three columns. The product ID column, the item column used to list all products by name, and price column which lists all prices rounded to two decimal places. 
To create a stored procedure that returns all data from the table, you can write the following syntax. Begin with the create procedure command, followed by the procedure name. Since the goal of this procedure is to return details of all products, you can call it get products details. Then add parentheses. This stored procedure doesn't require any parameters, so you can leave the parentheses empty. Next, write a select command and an asterisk symbol to instruct MySQL to extract all data. Finally, write the from keyword and target the products table. Click enter to run the query. The new procedure get products details has been created. Lucky Shrub can now call this query to extract data from the table instead of rewriting a new select statement each time. To demonstrate the stored procedure, just write the following call command. Call get products details and parenthesis. Click enter to run the procedure and extract a set of results that includes all product data. Lucky Shrub also frequently write queries to identify the lowest priced products in their database so that they can add these items to sales or promotions. You can create a stored procedure with one or more parameters for this query. Begin with the create procedure command, then write the procedure name. You can call it get lowest priced products. In parentheses, you need to declare the parameters, lowest price and the integer value. These parameters return the lowest integer values in the form of a table column called lowest price. Next, write a select command and an asterisk symbol. Then write the from clause and target the products table. After the from clause, include a less than or equal to operator, followed by the lowest price parameter. Click enter to execute the query. In this statement, you've declared a parameter with an integer data type that must pass an integer value into the stored procedure. However, don't forget that this query also includes parameters. So each time the query is called, you need to specify the value the stored procedure must process. As an example, let's return the data of products with a price of less than or equal to $50 by typing the call command, the get lowest price product stored procedure name, and placing the value of 50 in parentheses. Click enter to execute the query. The query passes the value of 50 to the stored procedure through the parameter. The output appears on screen with a list of all products priced less than or equal to $50. Finally, Lucky Shrub have decided to remove the get products details stored procedure from their database. To drop the stored procedure from the database, type drop procedure command and the name of the procedure, get products details. Click enter to execute the query. The stored procedure has now been dropped from the database. Lucky Shrub can now perform queries in their database much more efficiently thanks to the use of stored procedures. You should now be able to demonstrate an understanding of stored procedures in a MySQL database and create and drop simple stored procedures in MySQL. Well done. Congratulations. You've reached the end of the third module in this course. Let's take a moment to recap on some of the key skills you've gained in this module's lessons. In the first lesson, you learned about functions in MySQL and should now be able to explain the concept of MySQL functions, differentiate between common types of MySQL functions, and make use of basic MySQL functions in a MySQL database. And you demonstrated your knowledge and skills with MySQL functions in the labs and quizzes. The MySQL functions that you encountered included numeric functions which are used to aggregate data or perform mathematical operations, string functions deployed on string values in a database, and date functions which return time and date information. You also explored comparison functions and discovered how they can be used to compare values in a database. And finally, you learned how control flow functions are used to evaluate conditions and determine the execute path of a query. In the second lesson, you explored stored procedures and should now be able to explain the concept of stored procedures in a MySQL database and create and drop simple stored procedures in MySQL. You also demonstrated your skills in a lab environment. Having completed this module, you should now be able to make use of functions and MySQL stored procedures. Great work. In this course, you learned about database structures and management with MySQL. Let's take a few moments to recap the key topics that you learned about. 
In the opening lesson, you received an introduction to MySQL. During this introduction, you learned about databases, discovered how Meta makes use of MySQL databases on a day-to-day -day basis, and you learned how to make the most of the content in this course to ensure that you succeed in your goals. You then moved on to the next lesson in which you learned how to filter data. In this lesson, you learned how to filter data using the AND, OR, NOT, IN, BETWEEN, and LIKE logical operators. Combine conditions with the use of logical operators. You learned how to identify wildcard characters and explain how they're used to filter data. And you then demonstrated your knowledge of data filtering in a series of knowledge checks. In the next lesson, you explore the concepts of aliases and table joins. You can now explain the concept of an alias and demonstrate how they're used in a lab environment. Outline what a table join is and explain different types such as inner, left, right and self joins. Demonstrate how to join tables and make use of the union operator in a MySQL database having completed the video and demonstrated your skills in a knowledge check. You then learned about grouping data. Use the MySQL group by clause to group rows and deploy it with aggregate functions. Demonstrate the use of the MySQL having clause to apply filter conditions. Make use of the any and all operators. And you demonstrated your ability to group data in a lab environment. Next, you began the second module in which you explored different techniques for updating databases and working with views. In the first lesson of this module, you learned how to insert and update data. You can now update and insert data using the replace command. Identify the main types of constraints like key, domain, and referential, and explain how they function. Add, delete, and modify columns with the use of the alter table command, and make use of subqueries. You then learned about views in MySQL databases. You can now explain the concept of views, create, rename, and drop views in a MySQL database, identify the advantages of using views, and you demonstrated your knowledge and skills with views in a series of knowledge checks and ungraded labs. In the third module, you were introduced to functions and MySQL stored procedures. You can now explain what a function is and identify different types of functions. You can use numeric functions to aggregate data or perform mathematical operations. You can manipulate string values using string functions. Extract data on time and date values with the use of date functions. Compare values using comparison functions. And you can deploy control flow functions to evaluate conditions and determine their execution path. In the final lesson of this module, you explore the concept of stored procedures. You can now explain what stored procedures are in a MySQL database and create and drop simple stored procedures in MySQL. You've reached the end of this course recap. It's now time to try out what you've learned in the graded assessment. Good luck. You've reached the end of this Meta Database Engineering course. You've worked hard to get here and developed a lot of new skills along the way. You're making great progress on your database journey, and you should now understand database structures and management with MySQL. You were able to demonstrate some of this learning along with your practical database skill set in the lab project. Following your completion of this course in Meta Database Engineering, you should now be able to filter, join, and group data. Insert and update data in a database using constraints, subqueries, and views. And deploy functions and stored procedures in a MySQL database. The key skills measured in the graded assessment revealed your ability to demonstrate your knowledge of key MySQL topics like filtering, joins, and data grouping. Explain database concepts related to virtual tables, data integrity, and subqueries. And exhibit your experience with functions and stored procedures. So what are the next steps? This Meta Database Engineering course has given you an initial introduction to several key areas. You probably realize that there's still more for you to learn. So if you found this course helpful and want to discover more, then why not register for the next course? You'll continue to develop your skill set during each of the Meta Database Engineering courses. In the final lab, you'll apply everything you've learned to create your own fully functional database system. Whether you're just starting out as a technical professional, a student or a business user, the course and projects prove your knowledge of the value and capabilities of database systems. The lab consolidates your abilities with the practical application of your skills. And the lab also has another important benefit. 
It means that you'll have a fully operational database that you can reference within your portfolio. This serves to demonstrate your skills to potential employers. And not only does it show employers that you are self-driven and innovative, but it also speaks volumes about you as an individual, as well as your newly obtained knowledge. And once you've completed all the courses, you receive certification in Meta Database Engineering. The certification can also be used as a progression to other Meta role-based certifications. Depending on your goals, you may choose to go deep with advanced role-based certifications or take other fundamental courses once you earn this certification. Meta certifications provide globally recognized and industry-endorsed evidence of your technical skills. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to embark on this journey of discovery with you. Best of luck in the future. Welcome to the next course in database engineering. The focus of this course is on advanced MySQL topics. Let's take a moment to review some of the new skills that you'll develop in these modules. In the first module of this course, you'll learn how to create and work with functions, along with both basic and complex stored procedures in MySQL. This is so you can reuse or invoke code blocks to perform specific operations. You'll then learn how to make use of variables and parameters to create more complex stored functions and procedures in MySQL. You'll also learn how to develop user-defined functions for when MySQL's built-in functions don't meet the needs of your project. In the next lesson, you'll make use of MySQL triggers to automate database tasks. You'll explore different types of MySQL triggers like insert, update, and delete. And you'll learn how to make use of each type. You'll also develop an understanding of how you can make use of scheduled events to ensure that your database tasks and events are completed at specific times. The next module focuses on core rules and guidelines for database optimization. In this module, you'll develop an understanding of the concept of database optimization and the advantages it brings to a MySQL database. You'll review techniques for optimizing database select statements so that they're executed quickly and efficiently. For example, targeting required columns or avoiding the use of complex functions. You'll also learn how to work with indexes in MySQL to speed up the performance of data retrieval queries. In the next lesson, you'll be exploring further optimization techniques. You'll start by learning how to use MySQL transaction statements to manage database transactions. You'll discover how you can use common table expressions to manage complex SQL queries by compiling them into single blocks of code. You'll learn how to make use of prepared statements to limit the number of times MySQL must compile and parse code. And you'll discover how to interact with a MySQL database using the JSON data type. In the third module, you'll explore the concept of data analytics in MySQL. First, you'll develop an understanding of the relationship between database analytics and MySQL. You'll discover how to make use of data collected during data analysis by converting it into useful information that can inform future decisions. You'll also explore the different types of data analysis that can be performed within a database. You'll then move on to learn about the relationship between MySQL and data analysis, including the benefits and limitations of MySQL as a data analytics tool. In the second lesson of this module, you'll learn how to perform data analysis in MySQL using SQL queries like joins, subqueries, and views. You'll then explore how to emulate a full outer join in MySQL to extract all records from two tables, including those that don't match. And finally, you'll learn how to extract data from multiple tables using the join method. During these modules, you'll encounter numerous activities designed to test your skills and knowledge. These include lab exercises, knowledge checks, and module quizzes. And in the final module, you'll receive the opportunity to demonstrate some of this learning along with your practical database skill set in the lab project. And you'll also demonstrate your knowledge of these topics in a graded assessment. So let's get started. In the previous courses, you learned that you could reuse code within your database projects with the use of functions and stored procedures. These methods save you from having to repeatedly type the same code. Over the next few minutes, you'll recap the basics of functions and stored procedures, and you'll also learn about their benefits and key differences. As you might recall, Lucky Shrub frequently make use of these methods to query stock data in the products table of their database. This means that they don't have to repeatedly type the same code each time they check their stock. Over the next few minutes, you'll take a closer look at how they achieve this. 
So, as you've just learned, the main purpose of creating stored procedures and functions is to wrap or encapsulate code together in the body of a function or procedure. This means that instead of typing the same code repeatedly, you can call a code block to perform a specific operation by invoking the identifier name. But there are other benefits to functions and stored procedures. They make code more consistent and more organized, and introduce reusability to make the code easier to use and maintain. Let's look at a few examples of these concepts to find out more. As you just saw a moment ago, Lucky Shrub make use of procedures when checking their stock. First, they create the query as a stored procedure using the create procedure command, followed by the name of the procedure and the required logic. They then invoke this procedure using the call command to extract the required data from the database. If there's no data in the table, then function returns a null value. Let's look at an example of a function. The mod function can be used to find the remainder of the division of two numeric values, x and y. For example, 7 divided by 5. To find the result, invoke the function by using the identifier name within a select statement. In this instance, the result is 2. Remember that unlike stored procedures, a function always returns a value. For example, you might recall the scenario from the last course in which M and G used a function to determine the average dollar amount each client spent with their business. This function always returns a value because it specifically targets clients that spent money. Let's take a few moments to explore a key difference between functions and stored procedures. Parameters. Functions can only have input parameters, while stored procedures can have both input and output parameters. Both functions and procedures can accept values within their respective code. In other words, they both accept an input. But only procedures can pass values back out again with the use of output parameters. Don't worry if you find this concept confusing. You'll learn more about parameters in later videos. You can create as many functions and procedures as you need. Just make sure you know when to use one over the other. For example, functions are best when you need to return one specific value, like in a SQL statement or within another function. Stored procedures are mostly for processing, manipulating, and modifying data. So, as you've just learned, functions and procedures are an effective way of reusing code to complete repetitive tasks. And even though they may bring many benefits, it's important to know when to use one over the other. In this course, you'll explore these concepts in more depth. You might already be familiar with basic stored procedures and functions from earlier courses. However, MySQL also offers more complex stored procedures and functions, which rely on variables and parameters. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn how to use variables and parameters to build sophisticated functions and procedures. Lucky Shrub Gardening Center have several repetitive but complex queries they need to create for their database. They can create these queries using variables and parameters. Let's follow their process and find out how it works. First, you need to know what the term variable means in the context of MySQL. A variable represents a placeholder that stores a value. This value may change at times depending on the needs of the query. Basically, variables are used to pass values between SQL statements or between a procedure and a SQL statement. There are two different ways in which variables can be used in MySQL. You can create variables inside or outside of a stored procedure, and inside or outside of a select statement. So, what does a variable look like? In MySQL, a user-defined variable is created from alphanumeric characters. You just type the at symbol followed by the name that you want to call your variable. Then, assign a value to your variable using an equal to operator. Make sure that you end your syntax with a semicolon. But how do you create a variable inside or outside of a stored procedure? To do this, you need to use the set command within your syntax. The set command is used to assign a value to a variable within a stored procedure. Let's take a moment to see what the set command looks like in practice. When creating a variable inside or outside of a stored procedure, type the set command followed by the name of the variable. Then assign a value to the variable. For example, Lucky Shrub have an orders table in their database that records orders placed with the business. They can create and use a variable called order ID to target the record with the order ID number of 3. 
They can now use this variable to delete, update, or query the record. Or you can create a variable inside a stored procedure using the declare command. In this instance, you type the variable name without an at sign. Then you assign the variable a relevant data type and default value. Lucky Shrub can use this method to create a variable called minimum order cost. The expectation is that this variable stores a value equal to the cost of the minimum order in Lucky Shrub's database. As you learned earlier, you could also create a variable inside a select statement. However, when assigning a value to a variable in a select statement, you need to use the assignment operator syntax. This instructs MySQL to assign a value to the variable. A standard equals operator just checks that one value equals another. So type a select command and then the name of your variable. Then assign a value to your variable using the assignment operator. For example, Lucky Shrub can create a max order variable that retrieves the most expensive order from their orders table. They can then access the value by typing select max order. The output shows the most expensive order. It's also possible to create a variable inside of a select statement and assign it a value returned from a function. You just type the select command followed by the function, then the into keyword and the variable name. Finally, type the from keyword and the name of the table the value must be extracted from. Lucky Shrub can use this method to create a variable called average cost, which returns the average cost of items from their orders table. Now that you're familiar with variables, let's move on and explore the topic of parameters. A parameter is used to pass arguments or values to a function or procedure from the outside. In MySQL, a function only takes input parameters, but there are three different types of parameters that can be declared in stored procedures, in, out, and in-out parameters. Let's take a few moments to explore how each of these works. The in parameter is the default parameter. It's used to pass an argument or value to a stored procedure. To use this parameter, type the create procedure command and your procedure name. Type the in keyword in a pair of parentheses. If you don't specify a keyword, then MySQL uses in by default. Then within your parentheses, add another pair of parentheses with your parameter names. Then add a select statement that outlines the logic of your query. For example, Lucky Shrub can create a procedure that calculates 20% of each employee's salary for tax purposes. They can then call the procedure against a specific salary value. This passes the salary to the procedure and returns the amount due in tax. Next, let's investigate the out parameter. The out parameter is used to pass a value to a variable outside of the procedure. Here's an example where Lucky Shrub use a procedure called get lowest cost to identify the order with the lowest cost in their orders table. They use the out keyword to pass the value outside the parameter. So the next step is to call the procedure. The value of the procedure can then be stored in the form of a variable within a pair of parentheses. To display the variable's stored value, just use a select statement to return the output. Finally, there's the in out parameter. This is a combination of both parameters. It's used to pass an argument to the procedure and then pass the new value back to the outside. So it's effectively an in and an out parameter. For example, you could create a procedure called square a number that returns the squared value of a specific number using the in out keyword and a number variable. The procedure expects an input number through the a number parameter. It multiplies this number by itself, then returns the result to the same a number parameter again. Then you can set a variable called x number with a value of five. Call the procedure using the x number variable value. The procedure passes the value through the parameter. It then performs the calculation and returns the result back through the parameter. Use a select statement to output the variable value. You should now be familiar with how to create more complex stored procedures and functions using variables and parameters. Great work. You might already be familiar with MySQL's built-in functions, but what if none of these built-in functions meet your project's needs? No problem. You can develop your own user-defined functions. In this video, you'll find out what user-defined functions are and learn how to create your own. Lucky Shrub are having a sale in which they're offering a 10% discount on selected products.
but rewriting the same statement for every product during every transaction would be very time consuming. Instead, Lucky Shrub need you to create a user defined function that they can invoke when needed to calculate these discounts. Before you begin helping Lucky Shrub, let's make sure you understand what database engineers mean by the term user defined functions. You might already be familiar with built in MySQL functions like string or numeric functions. User defined functions are created to perform operations that can't be completed with built in functions. Users develop code that implements equations or formulas to complete a task and return a result. Let's break this process down. A database engineer creates their own code. The code carries out a specific function, and the function then returns the required result. To build a function in MySQL, you can use the create function command alongside the returns clause and the return command. These commands and clauses specify the data type and values to be returned by the function. Let's find out how this syntax works. Begin your statement with the create function command. Then assign a name to your function. Follow the function name with parentheses and parameters. The parentheses are mandatory, but you don't always need to include parameters. Next, specify the return data type, followed by the keyword deterministic. Deterministic means that the function always returns the same result for the same input parameters. For example, if a sum function is defined as deterministic, then it always returns the same result for the numbers it adds together. Finally, you can implement the logic with a return keyword. Let's look at how Lucky Shrub can make use of a user defined function. Lucky Shrub can use this syntax to create a function called find total cost. A cost parameter with a decimal data type passes a user input value of cost. And the returns clause defines the function's return type as a decimal number with five digits. Finally, the return command calculates and returns the final cost after deducting 10%. So, each time Lucky Shrub needs to determine the sale price of their items, they just invoke the function in a select statement, followed by the current price in parentheses. But what if you want to develop a more sophisticated function? For example, Lucky Shrub want to offer a 10% discount to customers who make purchases of $100 or more, and a discount of 20% on purchases of $500 or more. The first step is to use the delimiter command to compile the whole function as a single compound statement using begin end keywords. Then click enter to change the delimiter from the default semicolon to a double forward slash. Next, use the create function command and name your function get total cost. Include a cost parameter with a decimal data type that passes a user input value of cost. The returns clause defines the function's return type as a decimal number with five digits, and the return command calculates the final cost after the discount has been deducted. The function is also defined as deterministic so that it always returns the same result for the same input parameters. The next step is to use the begin and end keywords to determine the body of the function. Use an if else statement to check the input cost and deduct the appropriate amount. Then add the return command to calculate the final cost once the discount has been deducted. Finally, click enter to create the new function. Then change the delimiter to the default semicolon so you can use MySQL as usual. Now it's time to test the function using a select statement. A customer has just made a purchase that cost $500, so Lucky Shrub need to determine the discount to be applied. Type a SELECT command followed by the name of the function alongside the purchase value in parentheses. Then click ENTER to execute the function. The output result is 400, so this customer's purchase now costs $400 following a 20% discount. If you want to drop the function, just use the DROP FUNCTION statement followed by the function's name. Click ENTER to drop the function. Lucky Shrub can now apply discounts to their customers' purchases as required. And you now know how to create your own user-defined functions in MySQL for your own specific projects. Great work. You should already be familiar with the process for creating basic stored procedures. So in this video, you'll learn how to create more complex stored procedures that require multiple statements. You can learn how these procedures work by helping Lucky Shrub. Lucky Shrub need to determine the current cost of each of their products ahead of their upcoming sale. They must identify all products that cost less than $50 so they can add an appropriate discount. 
and they need to identify all products that cost more than $50 for further discounts. The required data is stored in the products table in their database. You can help them to complete this task using a complex stored procedure. First, you need to use a delimiter command so that MySQL can compile the code in a begin end block as one compound statement. Type the delimiter command to change the delimiter from the default semicolon to a double forward slash. Click Enter to apply the changes. Next, type the create procedure command. Then type the procedure name get product summary. Add a pair of parentheses and include two out parameters along with relevant variables. These parameters output the low price products and high price products outside of the procedure. They also store the output values in the variables. Next, you need to create the body of the procedure. Implement the logic within the begin and end keywords. The logic consists of two select statements followed by a count command that targets the product ID column within the products table. The first statement returns the ID of all products that cost less than $50. The second statement returns all products that cost more than $50. A double forward slash indicates the end of the query. Click Enter to create the procedure. Finally, change the delimiter to the default semicolon again so that you can keep using MySQL as usual. Now it's time to execute the procedure. Type the call command followed by the name of the procedure. Then in a pair of parentheses, create the two required variables. You can call the first variable total number of low price products and the second variable total number of high price products. These variables hold the output results from the out parameters. Click enter to execute the call statement. The procedure retrieves data from the table and passes it to each variable. Now you just need to access the data using a SELECT statement. Type the SELECT command followed by the two variable names. Make sure the names are separated by a comma. Click ENTER to execute the statements. The output result shows the total number of low and high priced products. Lucky Shrub now have all the data they require for their sale thanks to your stored procedure. Good work! As a database engineer, you'll often need certain actions to occur automatically when specific events take place, like when data is inserted, updated, or deleted from a table. But how can you make sure that these actions happen automatically and avoid the need to rewrite code each time they must be invoked? You can do this with the use of MySQL triggers. In this video, you'll learn what a MySQL trigger is and how to code and use them. Lucky Shrub's sales team are adding discounts to products. However, any discounts over 25% must be reviewed by a manager. This means that the sales team needs to add a trigger to the database that flags items when they're assigned a discount above the 25% threshold. Let's explore MySQL triggers and find out how Lucky Shrub can use them to complete this task. The first question to answer is, what's a MySQL trigger? A MySQL trigger is a set of actions available in the form of a stored program. These set of actions are invoked automatically when certain events occur. Examples of these events include inserting, updating, and deleting data from a table in a MySQL database. However, before you can use a trigger, you need to create it. And you'll also often need to drop or delete a trigger once it's served its purpose. Let's take a moment to explore the syntax for creating and dropping triggers. A trigger is created using the create trigger statement. To create the trigger, type the create trigger statement followed by the name of your trigger. Because a trigger is often user defined, you can create a custom name. However, make sure that each trigger's name is unique within the database. Then define a trigger type. For example, is it an insert, update, or delete trigger? And should it execute before or after? Don't worry about this for now, you'll explore trigger types in a later video. Next, specify which table the trigger must be assigned to, and identify how it should be applied to the table. Next, you need to define the trigger's logic. In other words, specify what it is that the trigger must achieve. The trigger can insert, update, or delete data. It can even combine these actions as required. If it requires multiple statements, then these must be enclosed within a begin end block then execute the statement to create the trigger. Again, this part of the syntax isn't a concern at this stage in the lesson. You'll review different types of triggers and what they can achieve in a later video. To drop or delete a trigger that you've created, you can use the drop trigger command. To use this command, just write drop trigger. Then add the if exists clause. 
This clause makes sure that the drop command only works if MySQL can locate the trigger within the database. If you try to drop a non-existent trigger without this clause, then MySQL returns an error. Next, identify the schema that the trigger belongs to using dot notation to identify both the schema and trigger names. This makes sure that MySQL only deletes the trigger from the specified schema and not the entire database. Finally, type the name of your trigger. Then execute the statement to drop the trigger. It's also important to remember that if you drop or delete a table from your database, then MySQL automatically removes all triggers associated with that table. So how can Lucky Shrub's sales team make use of these methods? As you learned earlier, the team need to add a trigger to their database that flags when employees attempt to add a discount of more than 25% to an item. An approval request must then be sent to a manager for any flagged items. Lucky Shrub can use create trigger commands to create this trigger. They can name the trigger approval request. They then assign a trigger type of after update so that the trigger executes the logic after an update operation has occurred within the table. Finally, they place the trigger logic within a begin end block. Finally, let's look at a few more benefits of triggers. Triggers are useful for keeping a log of records or changes made within a database. It's basically a way of maintaining audit trails where a record is inserted into the database each time a change is made. Triggers are also an alternative to constraints. They can be a useful way to help maintain data integrity by making sure all data is updated as required. They're also useful for performing tasks automatically on specified actions on a database table. You should now know what a MySQL trigger is and understand the basics of how to create and drop them within a database. As you might know by now, a MySQL trigger is a set of actions that can be invoked automatically when certain events occur. But how do you determine when and how these triggers are executed? Well, you can control the behavior of your triggers by using different types. Over the next few minutes, you'll explore the different types of triggers available and learn when to use them. Lucky Shrub are rebuilding their orders table, which records orders within their database. They need to assign a new set of constraints or rules on this table. Maybe they can create these rules using triggers. Let's find out which types of triggers Lucky Shrub can make use of and in what order these triggers should occur. First, let's explore the two main types of triggers defined in SQL, row level triggers and statement level triggers. A row-level SQL trigger is invoked for every row inserted, updated, or deleted in a table. So if 100 rows are added to a table, then the row-level trigger is invoked 100 times. A statement-level trigger, on the other hand, is invoked once for each action. And it occurs just once, no matter how many rows are inserted, updated, or deleted. So a single insert statement could add 100 rows to a table, but it only activates once for all 100 rows. It's important to be aware of both types of triggers. However, MySQL only supports row-level triggers, so they'll be the focus of this lesson. As you learned earlier, triggers are typically used to perform three types of actions. Insert data into a table, update data in a table, and delete data from a table. But how can you determine when an insert, update, or delete trigger occurs? Well, depending on when a trigger is actioned, it can be classified as either a before or after trigger. Let's find out what this means. The before keyword or modifier indicates that a trigger must be invoked before any action is performed on a table row, while after indicates that the trigger is invoked after the action is performed on each row. By combining these modifiers with the insert, update, and delete keywords, you can create different types of triggers. For example, the before insert trigger is automatically invoked before an insert event occurs on a table, while after insert is invoked after an insert event. Similarly, a before update trigger is invoked before an update event occurs, and an after update trigger is invoked after the event. Finally, before delete triggers are invoked before data is deleted in a table, and after delete triggers are invoked after data is deleted. In each instance, the syntax is largely the same for each type of trigger. Begin with a create trigger command, followed by the name of your trigger. Next, add the modifier and keyword to determine when your trigger must occur and on what action it must take place. For example, before insert instructs MySQL to invoke the trigger before an insert event occurs on the table. Then type the on keyword and the name of the table. This is followed by the for each row keyword. 
This instructs MySQL to carry out the action for each row in the table. Finally, type the logic of the trigger. As you might recall, this is usually typed within a begin-end block, particularly if you need to specify multiple statements. Let's look to Lucky Shrub for an example. They want to impose a new constraint on their orders table. This new rule must state that no minus values can be inserted in the table's order quantity field. So Lucky Shrub can begin with the create trigger command. They can then name the trigger order quantity check. Next, they add the modifier and keyword before insert. Then they assign the trigger to the orders tab and make sure it applies to each row. Finally, they create the trigger logic within begin and end statements. The logic states that if the table encounters an order with a value of less than zero, then it must set the value to zero by default. Now, each time a new row is inserted into the table, the before insert trigger carries out the required action before it inserts a new value. Let's take a moment to explore some more types of triggers that Lucky Shrub can use. Lucky Shrub want to maintain an audit trail of all updates made to their orders table. With an after insert trigger, they can send a log message from the orders table to the audits table each time a new order is inserted. The company also needs to create a log that captures the date and time an order record is deleted from the orders table. They can use an after delete trigger for this task. After a record is deleted, the trigger inserts a record in the log with the date and time. These are just a few examples of how the different types of triggers work in MySQL. You'll explore them all in more detail later in this course. But for now, you should be familiar with the different types of triggers available and know how to create them. Good work. At this stage of the lesson, you should be familiar with MySQL triggers and the different types of triggers available to database engineers. Now let's take a few moments to find out how you can create and drop these triggers into your databases. To help you understand these concepts, let's look at how they're used in Lucky Shrub. Lucky Shrub's database contains an orders table with several columns that record information on each order placed with the business. Lucky Shrub want to make sure that no minus values are inserted in the table's quantity column when a new order is recorded. Any minus values that the table encounters must be set to a default value of zero. They can complete this task using a before insert trigger. The trigger syntax begins with a create trigger command. This is then followed by the name of the trigger, which is order quantity check. Always make sure that the trigger name is unique within the database. Next, assign the trigger type and specify when it must be invoked. In this instance, it's before insert. In other words, it's invoked before an insert command. Then type the on keyword followed by the table name. This lets MySQL know which table to target. You'll also need to type for each row so that MySQL targets each row within the table. Finally, write the trigger's main logic. This must be a series of one or more SQL statements that execute when the trigger activates. If you have multiple statements, then enclose them within a begin end block. The trigger's logic checks if a minus value is about to be inserted into the quantity column. This action requires an if statement so that it can access the quantity column. To create this if statement, you need to use one of two modifiers, new and old. New suits our purposes here as it targets the value of a column after the operation. In other words, the value to be inserted. If you needed to access the column value before the operation, you'd use the old modifier. So type a statement that says if the new order quantity value is less than zero, then set the new value to zero. Don't worry if you don't quite understand these modifiers. They're covered in more detail later in this lesson. Now, let's find out how to run our trigger. Before running this trigger, make sure you redefine the MySQL delimiter semicolon to a double forward slash. Then execute the trigger. Once executed, change the delimiter back to a semicolon. Lucky Shrub now have the required trigger in their orders table. Lucky Shrub now need to delete this trigger from the table. You can delete or drop the trigger using the drop trigger statement. Type drop trigger. Then type the if exists condition to prevent MySQL from returning an error. Next, provide both the schema name and the trigger name using dot notation. The schema name is optional, but still recommended. It helps MySQL target the correct trigger. And don't forget that if you drop the orders table, then all related triggers are also deleted. You've now helped Lucky Shrub to create and drop the required trigger from their database. 
and you should now be familiar with how to create and drop triggers from your own databases. Great work. When working with MySQL databases, there'll often be tasks or events that must be completed at specific times, like inserting data or generating reports. With MySQL scheduled events, you can make sure that these events occur at the scheduled time, even if you're not present. In this video, you'll learn what a MySQL event is, review the syntax used to create events, and explore some examples. Lucky Shrub often make use of MySQL scheduled events. For example, the finance department has just requested a report on all orders received this month. However, this report must be generated at 11.59 p.m. on the last day of the month. Lucky Shrub can use a one-time event to create this report. They can schedule their MySQL database to generate the report at the specified time and date. Before you find out how Lucky Shrub can create this event, let's first find out more about what a MySQL scheduled event is. A scheduled event in MySQL is a task executed according to a given schedule. In other words, it's an event that takes place at a specified time. Each event has a unique name and contains one or more SQL statements. They're stored in the database and can be executed just once, or they can be a recurring event. The main types of scheduled events that you'll work with in MySQL include one-time events and recurring events. One-time events are scheduled events that occur just once, for example, inserting data into a table one hour from now. And a recurring event is a scheduled event that occurs on a regular basis, like generating a weekly report from a database. So, how do you create a MySQL scheduled event? Events are created in MySQL using the create event keywords. Let's find out more about how this syntax works. First, create the event using the create event keywords. You can follow these keywords with if not exists. This tells MySQL to create the event only if it doesn't already exist. Then follow these keywords with a unique event name. Next, type the on schedule keywords and specify a scheduled time at which the event must occur. Then type the do keyword. This keyword is followed by the event body in which you specify the logic of the event using SQL statements. So, how can you use this syntax to differentiate between one time and recurring events? If your scheduled event is a one-time event, then specify the schedule using the at clause. This is followed by a timestamp, an interval keyword, and a specific time at which the event must be executed. For example, Lucky Shrub can use this syntax to generate a one-off revenue report 12 hours from now. And they can create their event logic within a begin-end clause. Creating a recurring event is more complicated. The syntax is largely the same. The key difference is that you must use the every clause instead of at, followed by an interval. You can also use the starts and ends keywords with the timestamps and intervals to designate specific start and end points for the event. Lucky Shrub can use the recurring event syntax to create a daily stock check event. If the event identifies that some stock levels are too low, it sends out an order to restock those items. You'll find out more about how Lucky Shrub can create this and the previous event in just a moment. Before then, let's look at how to delete or remove an existing MySQL event that's no longer needed using a drop event statement. First, type the drop event keywords. It's also good practice to include if exists. This tells MySQL to check if the event still exists and hasn't already been dropped from the database. Finally, type the event's name and then execute the statement. Now that you're familiar with scheduled events and their syntax, let's see if you can help Lucky Shrub generate that report. As you saw earlier, Lucky Shrub's finance department has just requested a report on all orders received this month. They need the report generated at 11.59 p.m. on the last day of the month. However, it's now the last day of the month and it's also approaching 12 noon. So they need the report 12 hours from now. This is a one-off event. So begin with the create event keywords. Then assign the event a unique name. Let's use generate revenue report. Now you need to specify the schedule. Since this is a one-time event, use the act clause. Then schedule the event to occur 12 hours from now. So include the current timestamp and add a 12 hour interval. The next step is to add the schedule's logic. Type the do keyword and a begin and end block. Within this block, instruct MySQL to select all data inserted into the orders table this month and to place that data within a report data table. Great, 12 hours from now, the finance department will have their report.
Lucky Shrub need your help with another task. They're reviewing their stock and need to make sure that they have at least 50 units available for each item on sale. You can help them by using a recurring event. First, create the event and call it Daily Restock. Then specify the schedule. As this is a recurring event, use the every clause and schedule it to occur once a day. Next, add the do keyword followed by a begin and end block. Within this block, define the event's logic. MySQL must check if the number of items for any record in the products table is below 50. If MySQL locates a record below 50, then the number of items must be updated. If at any stage you need to remove this event, just type the drop event keywords, then if exists, followed by the event name. Great work, you've helped Lucky Shrub to create these events in their database. You should now be familiar with the basics of MySQL scheduled events, include different types of events and their syntax. Well done. Congratulations, you've reached the end of the first module in this course. Let's take a moment to recap on some of the key skills you've gained in this module's lessons. In the first lesson, you received an introduction to the course in which you learned about the role of an advanced database engineer in Meta, discussed what you hope to learn with your classmates, received an overview of the topics that you'll cover in this course, and you enhanced your knowledge by reviewing some key additional resources. In lesson two, you learned about advanced MySQL functions and stored procedures. You learned that the main purpose of creating stored procedures and functions is to wrap or encapsulate code together in the body of a function or procedure. The benefits of stored procedures and functions is that they make code more consistent, more organized, and introduce reusability to make the code easier to use and maintain. And you also know that the key difference between functions and stored procedures is parameters. Functions can only have input parameters, while stored procedures can have both input and output parameters. You then learned how to make use of variables and parameters to create more complex stored functions and procedures in MySQL. You learned that variables are used to pass values between SQL statements or between a procedure and a SQL statement. You can create variables inside or outside of a stored procedure and inside or outside of a select statement. You learned that a parameter is used to pass arguments or values to a function or procedure from the outside, and that there are three different types of parameters that can be declared in stored procedures, in, out, and in-out parameters. You also learned how to develop user-defined functions for when MySQL's built-in functions don't meet the needs of your project. A database engineer creates their own code. The code carries out a specific function, and the function then returns the required result. In lesson three, you explored MySQL triggers and events. You discovered that a MySQL trigger is a set of actions available in the form of a stored program. These set of actions are invoked automatically when certain events occur. Examples of these events include inserting, updating, and deleting data from a table in a MySQL database. The two main types of triggers used to manage SQL events include row-level triggers and statement-level triggers. Next, you discovered how to create and drop these triggers in MySQL. You can now create a trigger using the create trigger statement and drop or delete a trigger using the drop trigger command. You also reviewed other aspects of the syntax used to create a MySQL trigger. This includes defining the trigger name and type and specifying the logic by enclosing multiple statements within a begin end block. You then learned about MySQL scheduled events. As part of this lesson, you reviewed the syntax and process steps for creating a scheduled event in MySQL. You should now be able to work with functions and triggers in a MySQL database. Well done. I look forward to guiding you through the next module in which you'll learn how to optimize a database. You need your databases to respond quickly to your SQL queries. But as your data volumes grow and your data requirements become more complex, the response times can increase. Fortunately, you can use database optimization to improve the performance of your databases. In this video, you'll learn about the concept of database optimization and its importance. Over at Lucky Shrub, they've had a large increase in clients and orders during their latest sale. Their data volumes have grown considerably, so they now need to make sure that they can still retrieve information from the database quickly. Let's find out more about database optimization and discover how Lucky Shrub can optimize their own databases.
Database optimization is improving the performance of a database system to reduce the time it takes to query, process, and transmit a user's query. Basically, it's the process of maximizing the speed and efficiency of the database's performance. An optimized database can process a SQL query and return the required data fast. It's also important to note that database performance depends on hardware and software. In this lesson, you'll focus on optimizing queries using MySQL software. At this stage of the course, you've encountered a lot of different kinds of SQL statements. These SQL statements can be divided into two categories. Data retrieval statements, which return data from the database. These are also known as select statements. And data change statements, used to alter data within the database, like insert, update, and delete. Both types of statements require different kinds of optimization. Later in this module, you'll explore optimization techniques in detail. But for now, let's look at the basics. Data retrieval statements are select statements. There's a lot of work involved in optimizing select statements, and it typically involves indexes. An index is a type of handle that you can use to quickly look up data. Indexes are created on table columns. You learn more about indexes later in this lesson. Other methods for optimizing select statements that you'll encounter in this lesson include targeting specific columns in the select command, efficient use of functions and wildcards in predicates, and making use of inner joins instead of outer joins. You'll also learn about deploying the distinct and union clauses and explore the importance of using the order by clause to sort results. Different methods are required for optimizing data change statements. For example, to optimize update and delete statements, you first need to optimize the conditions in the where clause. And insert statements can be optimized by performing batch inserts. This means inserting more than one row in a single insert operation. For now, you just need to be aware of the distinction between data retrieval and data change statements. You'll explore them in more depth later in this lesson. Although database optimization can be complex, it's worth the effort. As you've learned, an optimized database offers improved performance with faster turnaround times, and it removes unwanted task loads from the database. By optimizing their database, Lucky Shrub can process their sales data much more quickly and efficiently. They'll avoid any potential issues that could arise from the growth in data. You should now be familiar with the concept of database optimization, along with the different kinds of SQL statements that can be optimized. Good work. When working with a database, it's important that your SQL queries are compiled and executed quickly and efficiently by the database. But this can only happen if your queries are optimized. Over the next few minutes, you'll explore techniques for optimizing select statements. Lucky Shrub have received large numbers of orders from their clients. This has led to increased volumes of data in their database. They need to query this data using select statements. To improve the performance of their queries, they'll need to make sure that the statements are optimized. Let's find out more about optimization guidelines and explore some techniques that Lucky Shrub can make use of. As you might already know, select statements belong to a category of SQL statements called data retrieval statements. These types of statements are designed to return data from the database. But if they're not optimized correctly, then they add extra load to the database and slow down its performance. This means that it then takes longer for the database to execute your SQL select statements or queries and return the data you need. However, there are a few basic guidelines or best practices that you can follow to optimize your select statements. You might already be familiar with some of these methods. Target only required columns in your select clause. Avoid using functions in predicates and avoid using a leading wildcard in predicates. Use inner join where possible and make use of distinct and union clauses only when necessary. Let's take a few moments to explore some examples of these guidelines. When querying a table, you might often make use of an asterisk in your select statement to extract all available data. However, instructing MySQL to query all data in a table adds extra load on the database and slows down its performance, particularly if you only require data from specific columns. A more optimal approach is to list only the columns in your statement that hold the data you require, instead of using an asterisk. Lucky Shrub can use this method to target the required data in their orders table and return the data faster. Another common mistake that database engineers make is using MySQL functions in predicates that refer to columns which aren't indexed. A predicate is an expression that returns a true or false value. 
An example of this is WHERE clause conditions. You should also avoid using functions in the WHERE clause on a column that's indexed, because this prevents the database from using the index. You'll explore indexes in more detail later in this lesson. Using a leading wildcard on predicates can also lead to a slowdown in the database. An example of this is using patterns that begin with a wildcard when combining the LIKE operator in the WHERE clause. MySQL can't make use of an index in a column during a search when it's matched against a pattern with a leading wildcard. Another method for optimizing databases involves using the inner join instead of the outer join where possible. An outer join retrieves all records from both tables, including rows that don't contain matching values. This takes longer for MySQL to process. The inner join is more efficient because it retrieves only the necessary data or matching records from both tables. This helps to optimize your queries. Often, when creating SQL queries, you'll use the distinct clause to eliminate duplicate values or the union clause to combine multiple query results. This can slow down the query because it must perform a sorting operation and eliminate duplicate records. However, if you use union all instead, then this eliminates the need for a sorting operation and speeds up the execution process. You should now know how to optimize MySQL select queries and be familiar with basic optimization guidelines. Well done. Lucky Shrub have received large numbers of orders from their clients and need to query this data quickly and efficiently using select statements. They must make sure their queries are optimized so that MySQL can compile and execute them efficiently. First, the sales department needs to find out which orders are arriving on September 12th. They can write a select query that uses the WHERE clause and DATE underscore ADD function. But sorting through the data to calculate delivery dates using the DATE underscore ADD function in the WHERE clause places a lot of extra load on the database. A more efficient method is to generate a custom column in the orders table called EXPECTED DELIVERY DATE. This column shows the expected date of each delivery. So now Lucky Shrub just need to scan this column for all values that match September 12th, and they no longer need to use a function. The sales department's next task is to process an order for a customer with the surname of Ito. First, they need to find the customer's details in the client's table in the database. One method is to use a select statement that combines a leading wildcard with the like operator. But MySQL can't make use of an index when there's a leading wildcard. The solution is to add a new column to the client's table using an alter table statement and call it reverse full name. The reverse full name column contains the client names, but reversed. In other words, the client's last name or surname is listed first, then their first name. You can run an update statement on the client's table to carry out this task. Next, use the create index syntax to create an index on the new column. Don't worry about this syntax for now, you'll explore it in more detail in a later video. You can now make use of a trailing wildcard with the like operator on the reverse full name column to achieve the same result. And you can still use the index. Finally, the finance department need a report on all orders placed with the store. They can extract this information by targeting the product and orders tables in the database. Usually, this task could be completed by using an outer join query. However, this type of query also returns records that don't match from both tables, even though they're not required. A more efficient method of querying these tables is for Lucky Shrub to use an inner join that targets the shared product ID columns from both tables. This returns only the matching records, so it's a much more efficient way to execute the query. You should now know how to optimize MySQL select queries and be familiar with basic optimization guidelines. Well done. When performing data retrieval, MySQL often scans an entire table, even though it only needs to locate specific column values. These queries take a lot of time to execute and place extra load on the database. But MySQL can execute these data retrieval queries faster with the use of indexes that target specific column values. In this video, you'll learn how to use indexes to speed up data retrieval. Over at Lucky Shrub, the sales department needs to retrieve the contact numbers of clients from the database. But there are thousands of clients and phone numbers to sort through. Fortunately, Lucky Shrub can make use of indexes to retrieve this data faster. Before you explore Lucky Shrub's process, let's take a few moments to get a better understanding of indexes. 
An index is a data structure that helps to maintain pointers that lead to sorted data. Although you can't see an index within a database, it's still helpful to visualize it as a table that contains two columns, one for pointers and another for sorted data. For example, Lucky Shrub can use an index that lists pointers in one column and the full names of clients as sorted data in a second column. There are two types of indexes used in a MySQL database. The first is a primary index, also called a clustered index. The second is a secondary or non-clustered index. A primary index is an index that is stored within the table itself. It's generated automatically once you create a table that contains a primary or unique key. The index enforces the order of rows in the table within the table itself. A secondary index is created using the MySQL create index statement. The syntax begins with create index, then write the name of the index. A commonly used approach is to write the name of the column you want to create the index on, prefaced by IDX for index. Next, use the on keyword to assign the index to a table. And finally, add a pair of parentheses and write a list of columns that the index is to be used against. An index can be created using one or more columns from a table, but you should only create indexes on columns that you'll frequently perform searches against. This is because when you update or insert data into the table, that same data must also be added to or updated within the index, which takes time. Lucky Shrub can use a secondary index to optimize their SQL select query. They can create an index on the full name column so that client details can be located faster. Now that you're more familiar with the concept of an index, let's see if you can use your new knowledge to help Lucky Shrub. Lucky Shrub need to find the contact number for the client Jane Delgado. However, there are many client names to search against, and MySQL must scan all rows until it locates the correct name. Let's quickly review the approach that MySQL usually takes to complete this task. First, type the explain clause to output data that explains how the database executed the query. You can pinpoint potential bottlenecks and suboptimal queries by reviewing the output. Then type a select statement that selects a contact number from the client's table that matches the value of Jane Delgado. Press enter to execute the query. The query returns the contact number for Jane Delgado. But as the output results have shown, MySQL had to scan and filter 10 records before it found a matching value. The possible keys column also shows a null value. This means that there's no key or pointer that can help to make the search easier. So the solution is for Lucky Shrug to speed up the search process by creating a secondary index. First type create index, then add IDX for index to the full name column. Next, target the client's table using the on keyword, and then place the full name column name in parentheses. Finally, execute the statement to create the index. To test the efficiency of the index, you can create and execute another explain statement. This time, the output result shows that MySQL only had to locate one row, and it was able to locate possible keys using the index full name index. This means that Lucky Shrub's SQL select query can now search the index and locate the data faster instead of searching through all records in the client's table. And you should now be able to explain what an index is, outline the differences between primary and secondary indexes, and describe the process for creating an index. Well done. How often have you encountered an error during a critical activity, forcing you to begin the task from the beginning? This can be particularly stressful when you're working on many related queries at the same time. Thankfully, you can use MySQL transaction to roll your database back to a previous state. In this video, you'll learn how to manage database transactions with MySQL transaction statements. Lucky Shrub are updating new sales in their orders table and the stock levels in their products table. To carry out this transaction, Lucky Shrub need to create and execute several different queries. But they could encounter an error at any point in the process. For example, the internet connection could fail while inserting data into the table. And this could result in invalid data or an incomplete transaction. However, if such an event were to occur, Lucky Shrub can roll back their database and restore it to its original state using transaction commands. So what are transactions in MySQL? As you just saw with Lucky Shrub, a transaction in MySQL is one or more queries that can be committed permanently to the database. 
and the database can be rolled back to its original state if any of the queries fail to execute as required. MySQL provides the following set of statements for managing database transactions. Start transaction, begin or begin work, commit, and rollback. Let's explore each of these statements in more detail. Start transaction is the standard SQL statement for starting a transaction process. This syntax marks the point that you'll return to should you decide to roll back the process. So begin your syntax with start transaction. Then list your SQL statements underneath. For example, Lucky Shrub can begin their database updates with a start transaction statement, and then follow this with a list of the required SQL queries. However, start transaction isn't the only way to begin a transaction. With MySQL, you can also use the begin or begin work aliases as alternative ways to initiate a transaction. Whichever method you choose, once you've finished typing your SQL statements and you're happy with the result, then it's time to commit the transaction to the database. You can use the commit statement to commit the transaction changes permanently to the database. Just type the commit statement at the end of your code block. But what if you encounter an error during your transaction, like Lucky Shrub and their internet connectivity issues? Or maybe you typed incorrect code, executed the wrong statement, or entered incorrect data. You can use the rollback command to roll back the current transaction and cancel the changes made to the database. Just add the rollback statement to the end of your SQL statements to return to your start transaction point. However, it's important to remember that the rollback statement must be enacted before you commit your SQL statements. Once you've rolled back your code, you then need to type the correct SQL statements. And once you're happy with these statements, type commit to commit the changes to the database. So let's quickly recap the process. Begin your transaction with start transaction. Type your required SQL statements. And use commit to commit your changes to the database. And should you encounter any errors or other issues, just use the rollback statement to return to your start transaction point. Now that you're familiar with MySQL transactions and the related statements, let's see if you can help Lucky Shrub update the sales and stock levels in their database tables. A client with an ID of CL1 has just placed an online order for 10 bags of artificial grass. This item has a product ID of P1 in the products table. There are currently 100 bags in stock. This number must be updated to 90 once the client's order is processed. First, type start transaction to determine the point you can roll back to if an error occurs. Now you need to add the required SQL statements. The first is an insert into statement. This statement inserts a new set of values into the required columns in the orders table for the client's order. Then type an update statement that updates the number of bags of artificial grass in the products table by deducting 10 units from the current stock level. The next step is to use a SELECT statement that creates an inner join between the orders and products table using the product ID key, which is common to both tables. Execute this statement to check if the transaction was completed as you expected. Unfortunately, it looks like there was a mistake. These updates have been applied to the client with the ID of CL11. It seems you typed the wrong client ID in your code. No problem, you can restore the data by using the rollback statement. Now check the orders and products tables again using select statements. All data has been restored to its original state. So let's type start transaction once again, followed by the same SQL statements as before. Only this time, make sure to update the correct client details. Once you've completed your new set of SQL statements, check that the output is as you expected. Great, this time all details are correct. You can now type commit to commit your changes to the database. You should now be able to manage transactions in your MySQL databases using transaction statements. Great work. When working with databases, you'll often need to write complex SQL queries. These can be difficult to manage. However, you can optimize these queries by compiling them into simple blocks using a common table expression, or CTE. In this video, you'll learn how to make use of CTEs to optimize your database queries. Over at Lucky Shrub, the finance department must calculate the average sale for each customer over the last three financial years. To carry out this task, Lucky Shrub need to create one select statement that contains several complicated SQL queries that include functions, strings, operators, and clauses. Fortunately, you can help Lucky Shrub to minimize the complexity of these queries using a CTE. Before you help them out, let's explore the basics of a CTE. 
A CTE is a method of optimizing complex database queries by compiling them into simple blocks of code. These blocks can then be used to rewrite the query by calling the CTE when required. This simplifies the query and makes it much easier to read and maintain. A common table expression can be created for one or multiple queries. It all depends on the requirements of your database. Let's begin with an exploration of the syntax for a single CTE. The syntax for a single CTE query uses the with clause to start the common table expression. This is then followed by the name of the CTE. This can be a custom name. The as keyword is then used to associate the query within parentheses with the CTE name. Finally, create a select statement to query the name of the common table expression. The syntax for creating multiple queries is a bit more complex. Start your code block using the with clause, then list the queries underneath the with clause. Make sure that each query has a unique name and is separated by a comma. Finally, type your select statement. To execute a CTE, type its name after the select statement, or you can execute multiple CTE at once. To execute more than one CTE, add a select statement for each CTE. Place a union operator in between your statements to return data for all statements in the output result. For example, Lucky Shrub can use multiple queries to calculate their average sale. Let's explore Lucky Shrub's use of CTEs in more detail. See if you can help them out using your new skills. As you discovered earlier, Lucky Shrub need to calculate the average sale over the last three financial years. Their current approach is to create three separate select statements, one for each year. The statements are combined using a union operator. Each statement calculates the average cost by using aggregate and string concatenation functions. The data is extracted from the orders table and the conditions are specified using a WHERE clause. You can click ENTER to execute these statements and return the average sale for each year. Although they work as intended, these queries are quite complex and difficult to manage, but you can use a common table expression or CTE to improve their readability. Start by using the WITH clause, then rewrite the first expression as AVERAGE SALES 2020, followed by the required logic. You can use an AS keyword to return it as AVERAGE SALE for improved readability. Then create the second and third expressions. Use the AS keyword to associate the expression with the query and make sure that each expression is separated by a comma. Now you just need to type three select statements. Each statement uses an asterisk symbol to extract all data from each of the three expressions. Place union operators between the queries to combine the results. Finally, press enter to execute the code. The output is the same as the last query you executed. However, this time you've created a query that is more optimal. All expressions are now contained within a simple block of code that is easy to read and maintain. You should now be familiar with how to use a CTE to optimize your database. Nice work. Each time you create a statement, it must be compiled and parsed by MySQL before it can be executed. This process uses a lot of resources. A more efficient method is to create a prepared statement that can be used repeatedly without requiring clearance each time. In other words, you can create a prepared statement that MySQL compiles and parses just once before it's executed. The statement functions as a template that holds unspecified values as parameters. These values can then be added as required. Each time the statement is invoked, MySQL knows it's safe to execute. This is a much more efficient and optimal way of executing statements without using valuable MySQL resources. Let's look at an example of how to create and execute a prepared statement from the Lucky Shrub database. Lucky Shrub need to extract data on customer orders from their orders table. Let's help them carry out this task using an optimized prepared statement. The prepared statement must return the following information from the orders table in the database for each specified record, client ID, product ID, quantity, and cost. The first step is to prepare the statement using the prepare command. Then type the statement name. This can be a custom name. In this instance, you can call the statement get orders statement. Then type the from keyword. Follow this syntax with a select statement in single quotation marks. This select statement extracts the required data from the orders table against a specified value. However, you might have noticed that the value is currently unspecified because it requires an input value. Later, you can enter any value you like to process the statement with a new argument. You don't have to wait for MySQL to compile and parse the statement. 
click Enter to execute the statement. The database returns the output result, a confirmation message that declares statement prepared. The get order statement is now ready to use. Next, you need to declare a variable named order ID and assign it a specific order ID. Let's use an ID of 10. Now you can use this variable with the prepared statement. First, type the execute command followed by the statement name. This command is used to execute prepared statements. Next, type the using keyword followed by the variable name. The using keyword specifies the variable value to be passed to the parameter in the prepared statement. So this prepared statement is basically instructing MySQL to extract the client ID, product ID, quantity and cost data associated with the order ID 10 in the orders table. Click enter to execute the query and return the results. Although this prepared statement targeted the order ID 10, you could also target any other order ID from the orders table. The statement can extract the related data and it doesn't have to wait until it is compiled by MySQL. You should now be able to create and execute a prepared statement in MySQL. Well done. As a database engineer, you need to work with many different types of data. This can place a lot of pressure on MySQL's resources as it compiles and parses through these different data types. One method of optimizing MySQL's use of resources is to store data using the JSON or JavaScript object notation data type. JSON is an easy method of communicating data between different database systems, and it stores data in a simple text format that doesn't require any special parsing. Here's an example of a line of JSON code from the Lucky Shrub database. Lucky Shrub used this line of code to store properties and assign them specific values. This line of code is placed within a pair of single quotation marks and curly braces within the insert into statement. Each property and value are typed in double quotation marks and separated by a colon. These are known as key value pairs. Each pairing is separated by a comma. Let's explore how Lucky Shrub makes use of this MySQL JSON code in their database. Lucky Shrub need to track the actions of clients who use the online store as they browse Lucky Shrub products and place orders. Lucky Shrub can capture this information and store it in JSON format in MySQL. MySQL can then quickly and efficiently process this data. First, create a table called Activity that stores client activity. Then create two columns. The first column is called Activity ID and provides a unique identifier for each client activity using an integer data type. The second column is called Properties. This is a JSON data type column. It stores the properties of each client activity, like client ID and product ID. It also records if the client has placed an order by placing either a true or false value next to the order property. The next step is to populate the table with data. Create three activity IDs and then log client activities using JSON code for three client IDs. Two of these clients have ordered products. One client has not ordered a product. Now you need to retrieve data from the properties column. Since you're working with the JSON data type, you need to retrieve or access this data using a column path operator. Type a select statement that selects the activity ID and properties columns. For the properties columns, use the dollar sign symbol and dot notation to denote each element inside the JSON property. Place the column path operator between the columns and their elements. Finally, execute the statement to return the output results from the activity table. You've now helped Lucky Shrub to create an optimal method of storing and accessing data from the activity table in their database. You should now be familiar with how to use JSON in MySQL to optimize the database. Great work. Congratulations, you've reached the end of the second module in this course. Let's take a moment to recap some of the key skills you've gained in this module's lessons. In the first lesson, you learned how to optimize database queries, and you now understand that database optimization is the process of maximizing the speed and efficiency of the database's performance when executing queries. You know that optimization focuses on two different kinds of statements, data retrieval or select statements, which return data from the database, and data change statements, used to alter data within the database. You learned that by optimizing a database, you can process data much more quickly and efficiently. During this lesson, you also learned how to implement different optimization techniques on select queries, including targeting only required columns in your select clause, avoiding the use of functions in predicates, and avoiding the use of a leading wildcard in predicates.
You also learn to use inner join where possible and make use of distinct and union clauses only when necessary. And you also explore the use of indexes to help maintain pointers that lead to sorted data. During your study of indexes, you learned that there are two types of indexes. The first is a primary index, also called a clustered index. The second is a secondary or non-clustered index. And you then review the syntax for creating a secondary index. This involves using a create index statement, a custom index name, and the on keyword to target the required table and columns. In lesson two, you explored further optimization techniques. Now that you've completed this lesson, you're able to make use of MySQL transaction statements to manage queries and roll the database back to its original state if any of the queries fail to execute as required. You can manage database transactions using statements like start transaction, begin or begin work, commit and rollback. You can start your transaction using start transaction. And you know that if you encounter an error with your queries, you can add the rollback statement to the end of your SQL statements to return to your start transaction point. As you work through this lesson, you also learned how to optimize select queries using MySQL common table expressions. You can now use a CTE to compile complex queries into simple blocks of code. These blocks can then be used to rewrite the query by calling the CTE when required. This simplifies the query and makes it much easier to read and maintain. Start your code block using the with clause, then list the queries underneath. Finally, type your select statement followed by the query name. You can also execute multiple CTE at once using the union operator between statements. You then explored MySQL prepared statements. You can now make use of prepared statements to limit the number of times MySQL must compile and parse code and you discovered how to interact with a MySQL database using the JSON data type. As you worked through these lessons, you also enhanced your understanding of the topics through reading items, tested your knowledge of optimization techniques in quiz environments, and demonstrated your ability to make use of MySQL optimization techniques in a lab environment. Having completed this module, you should now be able to make use of a wide range of database optimization techniques, you can deploy these techniques to make sure that your statements are compiled, parsed, and executed quickly and efficiently in MySQL. Great work. At this stage of the course, you should be familiar with the role that data analysis plays in databases, but it's also important to understand the close relationship between data analysis and data analytics. With data analytics, you can take the data collected during data analysis and convert it into useful information that can inform future business decisions. Over the next few minutes, you'll explore how this works and learn about different types of data analysis. Lucky Shrub have had a great holiday sales season. They've collected a lot of data around their sales. They now need to use this data to help plan for their next sales period. Lucky Shrub can use data analytics and related variables to make sense of this data and plan effectively for the future. So Lucky Shrub's use of data provides a good base for understanding what the term data analytics means. Data analytics involves taking data analysis a step further by converting and processing the collected data into useful and meaningful information. This information is then used to inform and make predictions about future events. Data analytics also involves the use of special tools, which you'll explore briefly later in this lesson. So your next question is most likely, how do organizations make use of data analytics? Over at Lucky Shrub, they can make use of their data with data analytics tools to predict what products sell best and should be kept in stock, what kind of special offers attract the most customers, and how best to manage their online sales. However, before you can perform data analytics, you first need to analyze and generate insights into the data you've collected. This data is collected through data analysis and SQL queries. There are different types of data analysis that can be performed within a database. Let's take a few moments to explore these different types of data analysis and learn how they inform data analytics. Descriptive data analysis presents data in a descriptive format. In other words, it describes what happened. You can use the data extracted from a database to explain a particular event. For example, Lucky Shrub can analyze their sales over a specific period. They can then describe the period using this data by referring to top selling products and profits that they made. 
Exploratory data analysis is the attempt to establish a relationship between different variables in a database. In other words, is there a relationship between variables A and B? Or can you establish a link between variables X and Y? Over at Lucky Shrub, they use exploratory data analysis to determine if there's any correlation between an increase in sales for a specific product and the season in which it's sold, like an increase in the sale of trees during the holiday season. Inferential data analysis focuses on a small sample of data to make inferences about a larger data population and draw general conclusions. Lucky Shrub often make use of inferential data analysis. Their data shows an increase in the sale of barbecue products over the summer months. So they can infer that this is the best period in which to sell these goods. Predictive data analysis uses existing or legacy data to identify paradigms and patterns. These patterns can then be used to make predictions about future performance. For example, Lucky Shrub's data show that the sale of gardening tools increases when these items are discounted. They can use this data to predict that further discounts will lead to more sales. And there's also causal data analysis, which explores the cause and effect of relationships between different variables. Did variable A cause B, or did variable X have any effect on Y? Lucky Shrub's data showed that many customers who bought gardening tools also bought outdoor lighting products. Causal data analysis is a great way for Lucky Shrub to try and identify the relationship between these purchases. Finally, know that database engineers often use the terms data analysis and data analytics interchangeably. Although separate concepts, they are closely linked. You can't have data analytics without data analysis. So be aware of this fact when working with data analytics. You should now understand the concept of data analytics and be able to recognize different types of data analysis. Well done. At this stage in the lesson, you should be familiar with the concepts of data analytics and data analysis and the differences between them. Over the next few minutes, you'll explore the relationship between MySQL and data analysis, along with the benefits and limitations of MySQL as a data analytics tool. Lucky Shrub make use of MySQL to host their data and carry out data analysis. Lucky Shrub's database processes a large volume of data every day, including online orders, client information, and data around the store's products. With MySQL, Lucky Shrub have an effective set of tools to host and work with this data. Over the next few minutes, you'll discover how Lucky Shrub can make use of MySQL to analyze this data. As you've progressed through these courses, you've learned how powerful MySQL is. And another advantage of MySQL is that it offers database engineers the tools required to perform data analysis on the data in their database. However, MySQL also has its limitations when compared to other more advanced data analytical tools. Let's take a few moments to explore these. MySQL databases are built using a relational database model. As you learned in a previous course, relational models structure data sets in related tables, and these related tables make it easy to access, retrieve, and analyze related information. With MySQL, Lucky Shrub can connect their database tables using foreign keys. This means that they can use one table to locate information in another. For example, the orders and products tables are both connected through the product ID key. This relationship helps Lucky Shrub identify the products that each client ordered. MySQL is also a free open source database management system, so there's no cost or intellectual property to consider when managing a database with MySQL. This is of great benefit to Lucky Shrub because it reduces the cost of doing business. And because of its capacity and accessibility, MySQL is a very widely used database management system. Large numbers of businesses, governments, and other organizations make use of MySQL to collect, store, and process data. This makes it easier for these organizations to communicate data and improve their data analytics. For example, Lucky Shrub suppliers also use MySQL to manage their data. So Lucky Shrub can keep their suppliers up to date with information on their stock levels by sending them data from the products table in their database. However, despite all these advantages, MySQL also comes with limitations. MySQL's capacity to perform data analysis is much more limited than other more advanced data analytics tools. With these other tools, database engineers can perform much more complex data analysis backed by powerful artificial intelligence. MySQL also lacks data visualization features. Other database analytics tools offer database engineers visualization features like bar charts, graphs, and maps. 
These tools are a much more effective way of communicating information than just presenting data in the form of tables. With these visualization tools, Lucky Shrub could quickly spot trends in their data and identify any major issues. So, as you've just learned, there are a wide range of benefits to using MySQL as a database management system. It's free and open source, holds large amounts of data in a relational system, and is widely used across various organizations. However, its data analysis and visualization capabilities are limited when compared to other more advanced data analytical tools. Analyzing data in a MySQL database requires a good understanding of how to access data and extract relevant information using SQL queries. You should already be familiar with many of these, like subqueries, joins, and views. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn about the role that these SQL queries play in the data analysis process. Over at Lucky Shrub, they need to perform data analysis on the client orders within their database. However, the types of data analysis they need to perform are very different. They include simple data extraction tasks using basic SQL queries, and tasks that involve advanced subqueries, joining tables, and creating virtual ones. Once these tasks are completed and the required data is extracted, they can analyze it and prepare it for data analytics. Let's explore the relationship between SQL queries and the data analysis process to find out more about how they support Lucky Shrub's business. As you should already know, data analysis involves collecting and presenting the data in your database. The data can then be used to gather further insights to support the data analytics process in MySQL. Data can be collected from a database using a wide range of SQL queries. At this stage of the course, you should be familiar with many of these SQL queries. For example, you can extract or collect data using joins to join two tables together, subqueries to create a query within a query, and views to create virtual tables. You can also use functions to perform sophisticated operations and return different results, and filter required data using operators. So the basic process for performing data analysis in MySQL using SQL queries works as follows. You can extract the required data from your database using a wide range of one or more SQL queries. You can then use further SQL queries to present a description of the results of your data analysis. And you can then gain further insight from these initial results using data analytics. Let's explore an example of this process. Lucky Shrub need a list of all products that sold in quantities of 100 items or more. They can extract this data using a subquery that targets the tables that hold the data and filters the required results. Once they execute the subquery, MySQL returns the records that they need, a list of the top selling products. Once Lucky Shrub identify their top selling products, they can then use different types of SQL queries and data analytics tools to generate further insights and plan for the business's future. All these insights and potential strategies are made possible by the data collected through SQL queries. For example, now that they know what their best-selling products are, they can continue to buy more of them. And they can buy less of the products that don't sell as well. They could even offer discounts on certain items to try and increase sales. So, to recap this process, Lucky Shrub create a SQL subquery to target the data they require. They then extract this data from the database through data analysis. And this data can then be explored further using more sophisticated queries to generate business insights. Now that you're familiar with this process, it's time to put it into action. As you discovered a few moments ago, Lucky Shrub need to perform data analysis on their client orders. Let's see if you can help them out. The data that Lucky Shrub require is in the orders table in their database. They've extracted the data from the table, but they now need to target specific data that provides insight into the performance of the business. For example, Lucky Shrub need a list of all products that sold 10 items or more. You can extract this data with a select statement that targets the order table's product ID column. Then add a WHERE clause that targets any product ID that has sales data. Next, add a subquery that selects product IDs from the orders table that sold in a quantity equal to or greater than 10. Execute the statement to extract the data. MySQL outputs a table that displays the required records. Joins are also a useful method of performing data analysis in MySQL. You can use different kinds of joins to explore the relationships that exist between data. Lucky Shrub need to analyze and extract data on their clients and the orders they placed over the last 10 days. However, the data exists in two separate tables. You can help them analyze the data in these tables using joins. Write a select statement to join the required columns from the orders and products tables using an inner join.
Then use the between keyword to filter the client IDs and related orders from the required dates. Execute the statement to show the required data. Views are also helpful for analyzing data. They can be used to create virtual tables that focus on specific types of data. Lucky Shrub need to analyze their sales data and extract the top five best-selling products. You can use a select statement and a virtual table or view to help Lucky Shrub analyze their data for this information. Write a create view statement. Call the new virtual table top products. Then write a select statement that uses an inner join to combine the required columns from the products and orders tables. These tables hold all the sales data you need to help Lucky Shrub carry out their analysis. Finally, use an order by clause to order the extracted records in descending order. Then execute the statement. The statement creates a new virtual table called top products that shows the name, quantity and cost of the top five best-selling products. You can use a select statement to extract all data in this virtual table to perform further data analysis. All these insights and potential strategies are made possible by the data collected through SQL queries. And what SQL queries you use all depends on what data you need to extract and analyze and what you want to achieve from this analysis. You should now be familiar with performing data analysis in MySQL using SQL queries. Great work. When analyzing data, there may be times you need to extract all records from two separate tables. You could use a join, but this would just return matching records. Sometimes you'll also need records that don't match. So the solution is to emulate a full outer join. This method extracts all records, even those that don't match. In this video, you'll learn how to emulate the full outer join or full join in MySQL to extract data from tables. Lucky Shrub need a list of all their new orders and the clients who placed them. They also need the data of clients who didn't place orders. This data is stored in two tables, clients and orders. MySQL supports inner, left and right joins, but these won't return the required data from both tables. So Lucky Shrub need to emulate a full join to extract this data. You can help Lucky Shrub to complete this task. But first, let's find out more about what a full join is and how it works. In SQL, a full outer join returns all records from a left and a right table when it identifies a match between the two. This includes records that match and those that don't. However, MySQL doesn't support the full outer join, so you need to emulate it using a combination of the left join and the right join. You also need to use the union all operator to return duplicate records should they exist. Alternatively, you could use the union operator to retrieve unique records only. Let's take a few moments to explore the syntax for these methods. Here's how to emulate a full outer join using a union all operator. First, type a SELECT command followed by the names of the columns that you require. Then use a FROM clause to target the first table, which is your left table. Next, use a LEFT JOIN clause to join the first table with the second table, the right table. Then use an ON keyword and dot notation to equate the matching columns between the two tables. Now that you've scripted the left join, you need to create the right join. But you also need to combine these joins using a method that returns all duplicate records. It's at this point in your syntax that you can add the union all operator. Once you've added the operator, create the right join. As you should already know, the syntax is almost the same as the left join statement. The key difference is that you must use a right join clause. When executed, the union all statement returns all duplicate records, should any exist. But what if you only want unique records? To retrieve unique records only, you can use the union operator. The syntax is largely the same. You need to script a right join and a left join statement as before. But this time, place the union operator in between the two statements instead of union all. Then when executed, the statement only returns unique records. For example, Lucky Shrub can use the union operator syntax to return unique records from the clients and orders tables. Let's see if you can help Lucky Shrub to emulate a full outer join using the union operator. As you learned earlier, Lucky Shrub need records of all new orders from the orders table and the records of the clients who placed these orders from the clients table. They also need the data of clients who didn't place orders. Start with a select statement, then target the following required columns from the clients table using dot notation, client ID, full name and contact number.
Then target the following columns from the orders table, order ID, cost, and date. Then use the from clause to identify clients as the left table. Join it to the orders table with a left join clause. The next step is to use the on keyword to equate client ID as the matching column between both tables. Then add the union operator so that the syntax retrieves unique records only. Now it's time to script the right join statement. Again, the syntax is mostly the same as the left join statement. Just use a right join clause instead of a left join one. Finally, press enter to execute the statement. The output shows all client IDs with their related order IDs. It also shows matching order IDs and client IDs, along with IDs that don't have a match. Lucky Shrub now have all the records that they require from their database, and you should be familiar with how to emulate a full outer join in MySQL using the union and union all operators. Good work. At this stage of the module, you should now be familiar with the data analysis process and how the results can inform data analytics. Now let's look at an example of how to perform data analysis in MySQL by querying multiple tables using joins. Lucky Shrub need to identify all clients who bought 10 items or more from a specific product line so that they can send them a special offer to make more purchases. The clients must have made their purchases after the 5th of September 2020, and there must be 50 units or more of the product currently available in stock so that all special offers can be redeemed. There are three tables in the database that contain the required data. The orders table with information on each order, the clients table which contains key information about each client, and the products table which holds the data on all products in the store. You can help Lucky Shrub to query these tables by using an inner join to target the following data. The client ID and contact number columns from the clients table, the order ID, quantity and date columns from the orders table, and the number of items column from the products table. Let's get started. Begin with a select statement, then use dot notation to identify the required columns from each table. Next, use an as keyword to create an alias for the product table's number of items column. Rename it as items in stock. Then target the clients table with a from keyword and use the inner join clause to join it to the orders and products tables within a pair of parentheses. The first join is created between the clients and orders table using the client ID column, which exists in both tables. The second join is created between the orders and products tables using their respective product ID columns. Next, add a WHERE clause and parentheses. Within the parentheses, state the following. Customers must have purchased 10 or more units of the item. All purchases must have been made after the 5th of September 2020. And there must be at least 50 units of the item currently in stock. Finally, click ENTER to execute the query. MySQL extracts the required data from the tables and displays it on screen. You've now performed data analysis on three tables within the Lucky Shrub database. And through data analytics, you can use this data to identify clients that you can send special offers to. Great work. Congratulations, you've reached the end of the third module in this course. Let's take a moment to recap on some of the key skills you've gained in this module's lessons. In the first lesson, you learned how to evaluate MySQL for data analysis. You are now able to explain that data analytics involves taking data analysis a step further by converting and processing the collected data into useful and meaningful information. This information is then used to inform and make predictions about future events. You then learned about the main types of data analysis. These are descriptive data analysis, which presents data in a descriptive format, exploratory data analysis, used to establish a relationship between different variables, inferential data analysis, used to make inferences about a larger data population and draw general conclusions, predictive data analysis, which identify paradigms and patterns, and there's also causal data analysis, which explores the cause and effect of relationships between different variables. You also learned about the benefits of using MySQL as a database management system, particularly when it comes to supporting decision makers in an organization. The primary benefits of MySQL are that it's free and open source. It holds large amounts of data in a relational system. It's widely used across various organizations, and it also offers database engineers the tools required to perform data analysis on the data in their database. 
And you also know that there are limitations around MySQL's ability to perform data analysis. For example, it's less powerful than other tools and lacks data visualization tools. In lesson two, you learned how to perform data analysis in MySQL. Now that you've completed this lesson, you should be able to perform basic data analysis using SQL queries. In this process, you extract the required data from your database using a wide range of one or more SQL queries. These SQL queries are used to present a description of the results of your data analysis and to gain further insight from these initial results using data analytics. You then explore the different kinds of SQL queries that can be used to perform data analysis. You can emulate a full outer join to return all records from a left and a right table when it identifies a match between the two. This includes records that match and those that don't. You also learned that you could use the union all operator to return duplicate records, or the union operator to retrieve unique records only. However, MySQL doesn't support the full outer join, so you must emulate it using a left and right join. You can also use functions to perform sophisticated operations and return different results, and filter required data using operators. You can make use of subqueries to create a query within a query and deploy views to create virtual tables. And as you work through these lessons, you also enhanced your understanding of the topics through reading items, tested your knowledge of optimization techniques in quiz environments, and demonstrated your ability to make use of data analyzation techniques in a lab environment. Having completed this module, you should now be able to evaluate MySQL for data analysis and perform data analysis in MySQL. Great work. I look forward to guiding you through the next module in this course. In this course, you learned about advanced MySQL topics. Let's take a few moments to recap the key lessons you encountered during this course. In the opening lesson, you received an introduction to advanced MySQL topics. During this introduction, you learned about advanced database engineering. You discovered how Meta makes use of advanced database engineering techniques, and you learned how to make the most of the content in this course to ensure that you succeed in your goals. You then moved on to the next lesson in which you learned about functions and stored procedures. In this lesson, you learned how to create and work with functions and both basic and complex stored procedures in MySQL so that you can reuse or invoke code blocks to perform specific operations. You then learned how to make use of variables and parameters to create more complex stored functions and procedures in MySQL. And you learned how to develop user-defined functions for when MySQL's built-in functions don't meet the needs of your project. You then moved on to the final lesson in this module, in which you learned how to use MySQL triggers and events and automate database tasks. In this lesson, you discovered that a MySQL trigger is a set of actions available in the form of a stored program. These set of actions are invoked automatically when certain events occur. You explored different types of MySQL triggers like insert, update, and delete. And you learned how each type can be used to control the behavior of your triggers. And you also developed an understanding of how you can make use of scheduled events to ensure that your database tasks and events are completed at specific times. You also reviewed other aspects of the syntax used to create a MySQL trigger. You're now familiar with the create trigger command and defining the trigger name and type and specifying the logic of a trigger by enclosing multiple statements with a begin end block. You then moved on to the second module in which you learned about the core rules and guidelines for database optimization. In the first lesson of this module, you explored how to optimize database queries, and you developed an understanding of the concept of database optimization and the advantages it brings to a MySQL database. You also reviewed techniques for optimizing database select statements so that they're executed quickly and efficiently. For example, targeting required columns or avoiding the use of complex functions. And you also learned how to work with indexes in MySQL to speed up the performance of data retrieval queries. The second and final lesson in this module presented an overview of further optimization techniques. You began by learning how to use MySQL transaction statements to manage database transactions. You then discovered how you can use common table expressions to manage complex SQL queries by compiling them into single blocks of code. You learned how to make use of prepared statements to limit the number of times MySQL must compile and parse code. And you discovered how to interact with a MySQL database using the JSON data type. In the third module, you explored the relationship between MySQL and data analytics. The first lesson in this module focused on evaluating MySQL for data analysis. 
First, you developed an understanding of the relationship between database analytics and MySQL. And then you discovered how to make use of data collected during data analysis by converting it into useful information that can inform future decisions. You also explore the different types of data analysis that can be performed within a database. You then moved on to learn about the relationship between MySQL and data analysis, including the benefits and limitations of MySQL as a data analytics tool. In the second lesson of this module, you learned how to perform data analysis in MySQL using SQL queries like joins, subqueries, and views. You then explored how to emulate a full outer join in MySQL to extract all records from two tables, including those that don't match. And finally, you learned how to extract data from multiple tables using the join method. You've reached the end of this course recap. It's now time to try out what you've learned in the graded assessment. Good luck. You've worked hard to get here and developed a lot of new skills along the way. You're making great progress on your MySQL journey, and you should now understand advanced topics in MySQL. You are able to demonstrate some of this learning along with your practical MySQL skill set in the lab project. You should now be able to deploy functions and triggers in a MySQL environment, optimize a database and perform data analysis using SQL queries. The graded assessment then further tested your knowledge of these skills. However, there's still more for you to learn. So if you found this course helpful and want to discover more, then why not register for the next one? You'll continue to develop your skill set during each of the database engineer courses. In the final lab, you'll apply everything you've learned to create your own fully functional database system. Whether you're just starting out as a technical professional, a student, or a business user, the course end projects prove your knowledge of the value and capabilities of database systems. The lab consolidates your abilities with the practical application of your skills. But the lab also has another important benefit. It means that you'll have a fully operational database that you can reference within your portfolio. This serves to demonstrate your skills to potential employers. And not only does it show employers that you are self-driven and innovative, but it also speaks volumes about you as an individual, as well as your newly obtained knowledge. And once you've completed all the courses in this specialization, you'll receive a certificate in database engineering. The certificate can also be used as a progression to other role-based certificates. Depending on your goals, you may choose to go deep with advanced role-based certificates or take other fundamental courses once you are in this certificate. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to embark on this journey of discovery with you. Best of luck in the future. Welcome to the Programming with Python course. Python is a versatile, high-level programming language available on multiple platforms. It's a language that's used by companies large and small to build a diverse range of applications. Areas that Python is used in include web development, data analytics, and business forecasting. The Python programming language syntax is very similar to English. It's intuitive and beginners will often quickly understand what's going on. It's also a great choice for experienced programmers who will appreciate its power and adaptability. Because Python is a very popular software development tool, it's important for you as a new developer to know how it works and to know how to code with it. This course covers the key points you need to know to begin programming in Python. Starting with module one, you'll get started with a Python programming language and associated foundational concepts. You'll learn to recognize common applications of Python and you'll be able to explain foundational software engineering concepts, use operators to program output in Python, and use control flow and loops to solve a coding problem. And in module two, you'll build on what you've learned in the first module by learning about the core concepts that underpin the Python programming language, variables, and different data types in Python. And you'll get to use control flow and loops to execute code under specific conditions. This module also introduces you to working with functions and data structures in Python, recognizing errors, determining their causes and deciding how to handle them, and creating, reading and writing data in files. In module three, you'll learn about the programming paradigms of functional and object-oriented programming. You'll use functions to explore algorithmic thinking. Furthermore, you'll learn how to work with objects, classes and methods in Python. Then you move on to dealing with modules, packages, libraries and tools in module four. Here, you'll learn how to find, import, and use popular Python modules and packages. Leverage powerful tools to optimize the programming workflow. You'll discover different types of testing and their features. 
and you'll be able to use testing tools to write a test. Module 5 is the graded assessment where you get to demonstrate your Python coding ability. You'll be able to exercise the skills and knowledge from this course, and you'll have the opportunity to reflect on the course content and the learning path that lies ahead of you. You may have encountered some concepts or terminology in this video that you don't fully understand. Don't worry about that right now. This course is designed to address all such issues and give you a solid coding foundation in Python. Enjoy the course. The developer that wrote Python loved Monty Python's Flying Circus, a TV show. Um, instead of the a snake, the Python, um, he thought the name Python was short and cryptic and he made it the language name. Hi, I'm Layla Rizvi. I am a backend software engineer on Instagram Calling in San Francisco. I've been coding in Python for 10 years. It was the first programming language I learned. I use Python every single day um, for my job at Meta. It's my favorite language to write in because it's so easy to use and simple. The first application I had to code in Python was to create a calculator. Since Python was the first language I learned, my first application in Python was a little tricky for me to build. Learning how to indent right, how to do spacing, learning the syntax and learning what loops are and all of these core computer science concepts was very hard for me, um, but I tried for a while and it worked out. Some important ways that you have interacted with Python in your day-to-day -day activities likely include using Instagram, using Facebook, using Google or Spotify. Python is such an ubiquitous language that you've likely used it regardless of whether or not you know you've used it. Python is also used for TensorFlow, which is a machine learning framework that Airbnb uses to classify images and um, some healthcare companies use to classify MRI data. At Meta, Python is used for the Instagram backend. It is used for our ads, machine learning algorithms. It is also used for our production engineers um, who keep our services alive and running. You should go through the process of learning Python, even though it might be challenging because it's an easier language to learn. It's simple. Um, it has a lot of libraries that support it. So it also makes it easier to build more and more features because there's a lot of engineers that use it already. So it makes it easier to develop features quickly and you can see results a lot faster with Python. Thanks for watching the video with us today and good luck on your journey as a software engineer. Computers and their programs are integrated into our lives at a scale we could not have imagined. Over the past 20 years, we have seen dramatic jumps in technological gains in areas of distributed computing, cloud computing, and AI improvements such as voice and face recognition and self-driving cars. In the next few minutes, let me give you a brief overview of the history of programming, and you'll also learn the basics of how programming works. Computing dates quite far back in our history. Charles Babbage in 1822, while studying at Cambridge University in Britain, was working on bettering calculating devices such as navigation charts and astronomical tables, which at the time were used by many ships at sea. Babbage came to the realization that all these calculating devices contained various amounts of human error, and he wondered if there was a better solution. His solution was the difference engine. The difference engine used mechanical gears with numbers 0 to 9 etched onto their gaps, separated by gears teeth. Its key function was to carry out one operation that was computed by manually moving hand cranks until the final answer was revealed. After building a working prototype, Babbage spent many years working on further improving his designs and constructing improved versions of the original idea. He created another device called the Difference Engine 2, but ultimately produced a new and better concept called the analytical engine. The analytical engine is widely accepted as being the basics of modern day computing. Babbage's friend Ada Lovelace published a document describing how the analytical engine could perform a sequence of calculations, which is essentially what a computer program does. However, the analytical engine was never completed and Babbage, like a lot of developers, did not invest in good documentation. With the historical side of things covered, let's now delve into understanding what programming is. Before I explain programming, it's helpful to understand how computers work at the most fundamental level. Computers only understand binary code, which consists of two digits, zero and one. This may seem quite strange at first, but with a little explanation, it will all make sense. 
Zero and one relate to different electrical states, similar to a light switch. Zero is equal to off and one is equal to on. For example, in programming, when you calculate numbers, cost or any arithmetic, you mostly use decimal numbers. Every program written needs to be converted to binary code or machine code. An example of decimal to binary conversion is decimal one is binary one. Decimal two is binary one, zero. Decimal three is binary one, one, and so on. A computer represents the binary code by using tiny electrical conductors called transistors. These transistors are housed inside the central processing unit, CPU, which is essentially the brain of the computer. When a program is written using any type of language, it needs to be compiled or interpreted. The outcome is to turn readable programming code for us into readable programming code for the computer. It's essentially extremely hard for humans to read and understand binary, and therefore using it is error prone. It's far easier for us to read and write programming languages. So what is programming? Programming is the ability to provide a computer with a set of instructions in a particular language that it can understand and perform those operations or tasks. In other words, you need to tell the computer what you want it to do in a format and language it can understand. Programming is a skill. The more you practice and learn, the better you become. At first, it can take quite a while to write straightforward programs. As you progress, you'll become more familiar with the language and how the logic and conditions should be applied. Programming is also a creative skill. That's because you can write computer programs to solve problems in many different ways. And that brings us to the end of this video. You now know the brief history of programming and how typical computer programming works. Would you like to be able to program on different platforms, for example, Windows, Mac, and Linux, in an easy syntax similar to the English language? Then Python is your solution. It's a high level programming language that works on many different platforms. By the end of this video, you'll know the benefits of learning Python and understand where to use Python. Python was created by Guido van Rossum and released in 1991. It was designed to be readable and takes a lot of similarities between the English language and mathematics. Since its release, it has gained greatly in popularity and supports a rich selection of frameworks and libraries. At present, it's currently one of the most popular programming languages to learn today. It's widely used in all areas of business, such as web development, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data analytics, and various different programming applications. Python is also very easy to learn and get started with. Given that the syntax resembles the English language, it makes it easier to read and decipher. Programs that are written in Python also require less code in comparison to programming languages such as C or Java. One of Python's key advantages is that it makes developers very productive and allows projects to be completed more quickly. Creating good software that is used by many is hard and very time consuming. The simplistic nature of Python abstracts a lot of complexity away from the developer to allow them to focus on the task at hand. Given the language is quite easy to understand and pick up, it can be an easier route to market for new programmers starting out to get something produced in much less time. Compared to some other languages, Python has a much easier learning curve. It lends well to the philosophy of write less, do more. Now that you can describe the benefits of learning Python and where it can be used, it's also good to know that Python developers are in high demand. Becoming a Python developer makes for a good career choice. When you start using Python, it's important to make sure that it works correctly on your operating system with your chosen Integrated Development Environment, or IDE. In this case, Visual Studio Code, or VS Code. So, an essential step in using this software is to make sure that the right version of Python is used as the interpreter when running VS Code. In this video, I will demonstrate how to set up VS Code on Windows and make sure that it points to the correct Python interpreter. So, I start by opening the VS Code editor. To do this, I click on the Windows icon in the taskbar, which brings up a menu. I then type Visual Studio Code in the search bar. The best match for the search is the Visual Studio Code app, which I click on to open. VS Code is now open. Next, I select Get Started with Python Development. 
This is a useful guide to setting up Python on the VS Code IDE. The first step in the guide is to install Python. I already have Python installed, and I can verify it by typing Python dash dash version in the terminal. To open the terminal, select the Terminal tab on the top menu and choose New Terminal. After I press Enter, it displays Python version 3.10, which is correct. The second step in the guide is to create a Python file. I do this by clicking on the Create a Python File option in the guide menu, and then clicking on the Create Python File button that appears. Next, I put in a print statement by typing print hello world. I will explain what a print is at a later stage, but for now, you just need to know that it's for printing out a value within the terminal itself. Now I save this as a Python file in my root level directory by clicking on File, Save As, and then entering the file name hello world.py. PY is the file extension I have to use when saving a Python file. The next step in the guide is to select a Python interpreter, and I click on this option in the guide menu. And then I click on the Select Python Interpreter button that appears, which brings up all the versions of Python I have installed. I do this because I want to make sure that when I run the Python script, it will choose the correct interpreter. The version that comes up is Python version 3.10, and I set this as the interpreter because it is the most recent version. To test and verify that everything is working correctly, I have to run the Python file. In the top right of the screen, you'll notice a play button. I close the guide so that it displays better. The play button has a drop down menu that has the option for running the Python file or running it in debug. I click on the run Python file option. Note in the terminal window that it has run the file using Python 3.10 as the interpreter, and I get the output of hello world. And that means that I'm now set up to use Python directly in the IDE so I can run and debug my scripts. You now know how to create and save a Python file and how to select the correct Python interpreter to run your files in VS Code. When you start using Python, it's important to make sure that it works correctly on your operating system with your chosen Integrated Developer Environment, or IDE. In this case, Visual Studio Code, or VS Code. An essential step in using this software is to make sure that the right version of Python is used as the interpreter when running VS Code. In this video, I will demonstrate how to set up VS Code and make sure that it points to the correct Python interpreter. On my Mac, when I open Launchpad, I type in Visual, or V-I-S for short, and it opens VS Code. VS Code provides a walkthrough guide for setting up Python. This can be found on the welcome screen. However, if I don't see it in the main view, I can click on More, and then I click on Get Started with Python Development. It brings up the guide I can use to verify that I have everything set up correctly. Next, I check that Python is installed by opening the terminal window. I click on the bottom left of the screen, and then on the terminal tab. Then I type Python, space, dash, dash, and the word version. When I hit Enter, Notice that it returns Python version 3.10, which is correct. By default, Mac comes with Python version 2.7, but this is not the version I want to use. Instead, I want to use the most recent version. Next, I create a simple Python file. To do this, I click on Create Python File in the Get Started with Python Development Guide. I put in a print statement by typing print hello world. I will explain what a print is at a later stage, but for now, you just need to know that it's for printing out a value within the terminal itself. Now, I save it by clicking on File, Save As, and then entering the file name, hello underscore world dot py. py, or pi, is the file extension I have to use when saving a Python file. Now I have to check that I can run that file, and to do that, I need to set my Python interpreter. So, I go to the Get Started with Python Development Guide again, and I click on Select Python Interpreter, which opens up the Python Interpreter screen. Here I can choose which version to use from the drop-down menu. Notice that I have different versions of Python installed, but the one I want to use is the one I installed through Homebrew, and it is also the recommended one. To bring up the Python interpreter screen without the Get Started guide, I can press the command key, Shift, and the letter P. Then, I type in Python, followed by a colon, and I choose Python Select Interpreter from the top of the menu. 
Then I press enter. When selecting the version of Python, it's best to choose the recommended one, but make sure that it's the latest version that you have installed on your operating system. Next, I'll run the file. First, I close the get started guide. Then, in the top right of the screen, you'll notice a play button with a drop down menu, which has the option for running the Python file or running it in debug. I click on the run Python file option, and then I click on the play button. Note that the output appears in the terminal. I have now validated that I have VS code pointing to the correct Python version that I want to use, and that I am able to run and execute scripts directly on the IDE. You now know how to create and save a Python file and how to select the correct Python interpreter to run your files in VS code. Did you know that Python can be run directly in the command line on Windows or Terminal in Mac and Linux? In this video, you'll learn more about the core differences of running code from the command line via the IDE, as well as exploring ways in which you can run programs through Python. Let's explore the two main ways to run Python's programs. The first way is using the Python shell, and the second way is to run a Python file directly from the command line terminal. The Python shell is useful for running and testing small scripts. For example, it allows you to run code without the need for creating new .py files. You start by adding snippets of code that you can run directly in the shell. Let's explore the second main way to run Python's programs, which is running a Python file directly from the command line or terminal. Note that any file that has the file extension of .py can be run by the following command. For example, type Python, then a space, and then type the file name with a .py extension. VS Code is a better choice than using the Python shell or running it directly from the terminal because besides including both of these options, it comes with a plethora of additional improvements that make coding in Python a better experience. Visual Studio Code also offers features such as auto-completion, debugging, and code syntax, highlighting white space and indentation helpers. I'm now going to demonstrate the different ways that you can run Python programs in VS Code. There are two options to run programs through Python. One is to run directly from the command line or the terminal if you're on Mac. And then the other option is to run directly from the IDE, which in this case is Visual Studio Code. Let's find out how to do this. First, I open the terminal window or command line window from within the IDE by clicking on the terminal menu and selecting new terminal. Now I run the hello world.py script directly from the terminal. So I can run this by typing the command Python and then the name of the file hello world.py followed by the name of the file. Then hit the enter key. The result is hello world. There's a second option using the terminal, which is entering it into the Python shell. So if I only type the Python, hit the enter key, it opens the Python shell approach. Here I can write code and run it directly within the terminal window. I can, for example, use the same code that I have above the print hello world code. I hit the enter key and that will print out the words hello world directly in the shell. Let's say I want to exit from the shell. I then type in the word exit. As this is a function, I must add the parenthesis, hit the enter key, and now I'm back in the command window. To do the same from within the IDE, I just close the terminal window. Here I can run any Python scripts from the IDE directly by using the button in the top right hand corner of the screen by selecting from the drop down either the run Python file or the debug Python file. Now I click on the run button and the terminal should open automatically. The result is hello world that is printed. You have now explored the two options that are available for running Python code directly from the terminal or command line and from the IDE. That brings us to the end of this video. You now know the core differences of running code from the command line via the IDE. You are also able to demonstrate ways in which you can run programs through Python. In this video, you'll explore Python syntax and learn how both whitespace and indentation can impact a program when used incorrectly. In VS Code, I create a new file called python underscore syntax.py. I start by using a print statement to generate a line of text. 
Don't worry if you're not familiar with print or variable declaration at this point, as that will be covered later in the course. I type print followed by the string hello. When I click on the run button, the text hello appears in the terminal panel. Now let's say we want to use another print statement on the same line, which will output the text value world. So I add a space and then type another print statement with the string world, and we expect this to give us the words hello world. But when I click on run, we actually get an error. Specifically, it says syntax error invalid syntax. This happens because the interpreter doesn't know when the new line or statement occurs. There are two ways to solve this problem. One is to move the second print statement to another line. I do this by placing the text cursor before the print statement for world, and then pressing the enter key to move it down one line. When I click on run this time, there is no error, and I get the words hello and world on separate lines. Let me undo the edits I made to my code by pressing Ctrl and Z, or Command Z on a Mac, and then try the second method, which is separating the two print statements with a semicolon and a space. When I click on Run again, it also runs both statements as expected. Next, you'll cover the impact of whitespace in Python syntax. I first clear my screen and then declare a variable and assign it a value by typing x equals 1 plus 2. On the next line, I will add a print statement for x. Before I click on Run, however, I'll go back to my variable assignment and add a random number of spaces around the plus symbol. Doing this will not cause any problems with this line. However, issues will arise if I add a new line or an end statement. To demonstrate it, let's input a new line and type plus three. Writing this code then returns a value of three. What has happened is that the interpreter has executed our first line of one plus two correctly, despite the extra white space, but it did not account for the plus three on the second line. There are a few ways to work around this issue. The simplest approach is to use a force line. To do this, I type a backslash at the end of the first line. Now, when I click on run, it returns a value of six, which means that both lines have been accounted for. To summarize, any amount of white space or indentations on a line is fine, but keep in mind that if you are combining it with additional lines, then you will need to give clear indicators of where a new line has occurred. Next, you will explore indentation in Python. I start by clearing my screen and declaring the new variable name with the string value of John. I want to write an if statement, which will return John only if the name variable has a new value of John. I do this by typing if name double equals John. And then on a new line, I input a print statement for name. To make this program work, I need to have an indentation before the print statement, which VS Code added automatically. When I click on run, I get back John as expected. But what happens when the indentation isn't there? If I delete the indentation from my code and then run it again, I get the error indentation error expected an indented block. This tells us that an indentation was not found where it should have been. Fortunately, the error message directs us to the specific line where the issue was detected. I could then edit my code and fix it. When writing programs in Python, it's a good habit to read the output whenever you encounter an error, as you are often given the specifics of what went wrong and where it happened, as you noticed here. Variables are an essential part of programming, and they're used to store all different types of data. You might even say they are the cornerstone of programming. This is because they allow you to work with and manipulate data. Therefore, it's important that you can identify variables and recognize how they are used. Declaring variables in Python is very straightforward. All you need to do is declare a name and assign it a value. The word variable refers to something that can be changed. To do this in Python for a variable that has already been declared, you only need to reassign or redeclare it. Let's explore an example. Let's say the variable x has been assigned the value of 10. To change this, you only have to redeclare it so it will have the value of 20. The examples so far have relied on simple naming conventions such as x, y, and z. When working on a project with other developers, it will become increasingly difficult to know what these variables mean or refer to. As a programmer, you will write a lot of code over time. And if it's been a few months, you'll most likely not remember exactly what the code was supposed to do. Using generic variables like x and y doesn't give any information about that variable and where it is used. Giving meaningful names to your variables that make sense in the given context will allow you and other programmers to easily understand what's going on. As a programmer, it's important to understand that data will change throughout the life cycle of your program. Whether it's getting user input via a web form 
or working with variables inside a code itself, the key function of the variable is to keep a reference to some sort of value. Now that you have a basic grasp of variables and their role in Python, let's move on to a more practical demonstration of the variables and how to use them. I'll demonstrate how to use variables in Python, but first, I want to briefly talk about naming conventions. There are different options available to you as a developer when it comes to naming your variables. One option is called camel case. The first letter of the first word is lowercase, and the first letter of every word after that is uppercase with no spaces between words. For example, if I have a variable called my name, I'll put the M of my in lowercase and the N of name in uppercase with the rest of the letters in lowercase and no space between the words. I can take a different approach with snake case. When using snake case, you keep everything in lowercase letters, but you use an underscore between words. So if I want to make the variable my name, my underscore name would be the result of this approach. Although you have different options as a developer, it's a good idea to be consistent when you are creating variables across your programs. Let me clear the screen so I can begin. So I create a variable in Python by initializing a variable and assigning it a value. All I have to do is name the variable. For example, if I type x equals 5, I have declared a variable and assigned it a value. I can also print out the value of the variable by calling the print statement and passing in the variable name, which in this case is x. So I type print x. When I run the program, I get the value of 5, which is the assignment that I gave the initial variable. Let me clear my screen again. You have several options when it comes to declaring variables. You can declare any different type of variable in terms of value. For example, x could equal a string called hello. To do this, I type x equals hello. I can then print the value again, run it, and I find the output is the word hello. Behind the scenes, Python automatically assigns the data type for you. You'll learn more about this in an upcoming video on data types. You can declare multiple variables and assign them to a single value as well. For example, making a, b, and c all equal to 10. I do this by typing a equals b equals c equals 10. I print all three values separately. And when I click on the run button again, I find that all three of those assignments have 10 as their value. Again, I clear my screen before I move on to the next example. Yet another option you have is to do multiple assignments. For instance, I type A, B, C separated by commas equals one, two, three, also separated by commas. In this way, I have assigned each of those values to the corresponding letter. So A equals one, B equals two, C equals three. To test this out, I can print all three variables Click run, and I'll find that the values one, two, three correspond to the declaration above. Another important point that you should be aware of is variable assignment and how you can change it. A variable is subject to change. Throughout the life cycle of your program, you will make changes to the value or the assignment of the variable itself, so you need to know how to do that. Let's explore another example. I type a equal to 10 and I print that value. After this, I change the value of A to five and I print that value too. When I click the run button, A prints out as 10 on the first line and as five on the line below because the value was reassigned. Finally, you need to know how to delete a variable. My variable is A, its value is 10 and I've printed it out. And then on a new line, I type the delete command or D-E-L for short followed by a space and the letter A, which represents my variable. I then print the variable by using the print function, and then I click the run button. The value is first given as 10 because the variable still existed. But after the deletion, it shows an error saying that A is not defined. You just covered variable naming conventions. Now you know how to declare a variable and assign it a value. And you know how to declare any different type of variable in terms of value. You can declare multiple variables and assign them a single value, and you can do multiple assignments. Finally, you also learned how to delete a variable. That brings us to the end of this video. You can now identify variables and recognize how to use them in Python.
Computer systems need to interpret different data values. In programming, data can come in different types. By the end of this video, you'll be able to describe the different data types in Python. A data type is an attribute associated with a piece of data that tells a computer system how to interpret its value. Knowing what data types to use ensures that data is collected in the preferred format. It also ensures that the value of each property is as expected. Python offers raw data types to allow data to be assigned to variables or constants. The five main types which are classed as literals consist of numeric, sequence, dictionary, boolean, and set. Some of these data types can be extended. For example, the numeric data type can consist of types integer, float, and complex number. For now, let's just discuss data types in more detail, starting with numeric. In programming, you need to decide on what type will suit your needs. For example, when working with currency, you are most likely going to use the numeric type of float, as it allows decimal places to be counted. To determine a type of variable, Python also provides a function named type, which will provide the class type based on the variable being passed. Python offers three different kinds of numeric types, which are integers, floats, and complex numbers. The integer class represents any non-fractional number, that is whole numbers with no decimal places. These numbers can be positive or negative, for example, 10 or minus 10. Floats are numbers that contain decimal places and are represented by the float class. Examples are 10.5 or 6.7. The complex class is used to represent complex numbers which are made up of both real and imaginary numbers. A equals 10 plus 10J. Next, let's explore the sequence data types. Sequence types are classed as container types that contain one or more of the same type in an ordered list. They can also be accessed based on their index in the sequence. Python has three different sequence types, namely strings, lists, and tuples. Let's explore each of these briefly, now starting with strings. A string is a sequence of characters that is enclosed in either a single or double quotes. Strings are represented by the string class, or str for short. Lists are a sequence of one or more different or similar types. They are essentially an array and hold any type inside square brackets. Each item can be accessed by its index. Tuples are similar to lists in many ways. They contain an ordered sequence of one or more types, but the main difference is that they are immutable. This means that the values inside the tuple cannot be modified or changed. Tuples are represented by the tuple class and hold data types wrapped in parentheses. The next data type is dictionary. Dictionaries store data in a key value object structure. Each value can be accessed directly by its key. Dictionaries can also store any data type. For example, suppose you declare a variable named ed and assign a dictionary to it. The dictionary contains a grouping of key value pairs. The first pair is a, 22, where a is the key and 22 is a value. The second pair is b, 44.4, where b is a key and 44.4 is the value. You can then output the value of 22 by accessing its key, which is a. Next, let's explore Boolean data types, which are simply represented as true or false. Combined with logical operators, Booleans are used to check whether a condition is true or false. In this example, I'm checking the underlying data type of the values true and false. The class bool is returned, meaning it is Boolean. The last data type is set, which is an unordered and non-indexed collection of non-repeated values. Let me demonstrate an example of this data type. Suppose I assign a set of four items to the variable named example set. I then check the type of the value stored in the example set variable by passing it to the type function. Python reports that the underlying data type that the example set variable holds is a set. In programming, data type is an important concept. Variables can store data of different types and different types of data can do different things. Let's explore these in further detail. Whenever you declare a variable in Python, the data type is automatically assigned for you based on the value of that variable. 
Let me demonstrate this by typing a variable called a and assigning it a value of 10. To check the data type that has been assigned by Python, I select print and use the type function. I then pass in the variable a as the parameter and click on run. From the output on the terminal, I can see a class of float was assigned because there was a decimal place. Here is another example. I'm using the variable b and I assign it a decimal value of 2.3. To check the data type assigned by Python, I print out type b and click on run. From the output on the terminal, I can see a class of float was assigned because there is a decimal place. This is a different assignment than the standard integer. These are the numeric data types offered in Python. To declare a variable as a string, I wrap the text with single or double quotes. Again, I run the print statement with the function type and pass the variable c as the parameter. When I click on run, the output in the terminal now displays the classes int, float, and str for string. This sequence is also applicable for other data types. For example, I can create a list of numbers by using the variable d and assigning it the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. When I run the print statement with the function type and pass the variable d as the parameter, the class list displays after I click run. Each time I assign a value to a particular variable, Python behind the scenes is automatically assigning the correct data type for that variable. In this video, you learned about the different data types in Python. I encourage you to start experimenting with these data types in your practice code. You may recall that Python can work with several types of data. In this video, you'll learn how to declare and use strings in Python. You'll also gain a general understanding of sequences and how to access individual items in a sequence. In Python, a string is a sequence of characters enclosed in either single or double quotes. As you may know, computers only understand binary code, which consists of ones and zeros. This means that characters need to be converted to a form that computers can interpret, a process known as encoding. Python uses a type of encoding called Unicode to communicate with computers. Strings in Python can be declared in several ways. For example, for a single line, you can type the variable name followed by an equal sign, and then the characters encased in quotes. If your string is too long for one line, you can add a backslash at the end of each line to create a multi-line declaration. When you run print on your variable, all those strings will be combined and appear on one line. If needed, you can reassign the value of a string. Say, for example, the variable name has a string value of John, but you want to change the value to Paul. This can be done simply by typing name equals Paul. Now, when you run print on name, this update should be reflected. It's important to know that a string is just a sequence of characters, which in turn means it is essentially an array. Each character in the sequence can be accessed based on its index. For example, Python strings use zero indexing, so you can access the first character with the number zero in square brackets, or the number two to access the third one. If you need to check the length of a string, Python has functionality to assist you. You can apply the len function to a variable with a string value. This will then return a number that represents how many characters are in the string. Now that you've learned what strings are in Python, let's explore some code examples of strings in action. First, let me demonstrate the two ways to declare a string. The first method is by placing the characters inside of single quotes. So I type a equals and then hello in the quotes. On the next line, when I type print followed by a in parentheses, and then click the run button, my code returns the string hello as the output. The second method is similar but uses double quotes. So I would enter it as b equals hello with double quotes. When I run the print function again, it also returns the string hello. Both quotation types are equally valid declaration methods. The choice is a matter of personal preference, but it's best to pick one option and use it consistently throughout your code. In addition to the quotation types, you can declare single line or multi line strings. An example of a single line string can be a equals this is a single line. I ask to print out the value of a. When I run it, the value is printed out as I declared it. However, there may be cases in which a string is very long and you want to break it up into segments to make it more readable. 
To do that, I can use the backslash key to create a multi-line string. To declare a multi-line string, I type b equals followed by the string this is a multi. Before continuing, I add a backslash at the end of this line. On the next line, I type the continuation of my string, line string example. Note that I enter a space before the word line so that it's separated from the last word of the string on the previous line. And now when I run print on b, the backslash has the effect of joining both segments so that the output appears as a single string. Another thing you can do with strings is concatenation, which is the joining of separate strings. To demonstrate this, I first create two new variables, a equals hello with a space at the end and b equals there. When I run print this time within the parentheses, I type a plus b and get back both strings joined together. The plus symbol is usually used as an arithmetic operator, but when applied on strings, it combines them instead. And one more thing to know about strings is that they are considered collections of characters. What this means is that, much like an array, you can access individual characters based on an index, and you can also check the length of a string using the len or len function. To give an example, I create a name variable with the string value John. Now I want to print only the first character of this string, to do so, I run print on name, followed by the character index number inside square brackets. Strings in Python are zero indexed, meaning that the sequence count begins from zero. So zero is the number that I place in the brackets. When I click on run, I get back the letter J. If I change the number to three and run it again, I get back the letter N, the fourth character in the string John. Next, let's check how many characters are in this string by using the len function. I start a print function and in it, I type len followed by name inside of parentheses. When I run it, it returns four as the length. In this video, you've learned about strings in Python. Specifically, you now know how to declare and use them and understand that they are sequences of characters. See you in the next video. Python uses different data types to process and use information effectively. Sometimes you need to change the data type of a variable after you've collected values for it. Let's say, for example, a user submits a form on a website and one of the fields was an integer, but the data was passed as a string. This is a problem because the only way to perform calculations with the numbers saved as a string is to convert it to an integer data type. To do this, you can use typecasting in Python. In this video, you'll learn about two different typecasting methods in Python. You will also learn to apply typecasting using the provided Python functions. So, what is typecasting? Typecasting is the process of converting one data type to another. Python has two different types of conversions, implicit and explicit. Let's explore each now in a little more detail, starting with implicit. Implicit data type conversion is performed automatically by Python's compiler to prevent data loss. It will convert, for example, an int to a float if it picks up that the inserted value is a decimal. It's important to note that Python will only be able to convert values if the data types are compatible. Int and float are compatible, but strings and int are not. So if data types are not compatible, Python will throw a type error. Alternatively, developers can perform typecasting with the explicit data type conversion. You do this by using the provided Python functions. There are many functions, but some of the most common are string, integer, and float. Let me take you through some of these functions and how to use them. First is the string cast function. This is used to convert any data type into a string data type. To use this function, you type str followed by the value that you want to convert between parentheses. Next is the int typecasting function. To use this, type int followed by the value that you want to convert between parentheses. The float function is another common type of casting function. Once again, you type the word float and add the value that you want to convert in between parentheses. Python has many more typecasting functions and they also have a similar structure. They are ORD, which returns an integer representing the underlying Unicode character. The hex function, which converts a given integer to a hexadecimal string. And OCT, which takes an integer and returns a string representing an octal number. There are also tuple, set, list, and dictionary, which you will learn more about later in the lesson. In this video, you learned about typecasting in Python. 
It's important to remember that data types are not unchangeable. You can convert data types using the provided Python functions if you need to. Like other programming languages, Python focuses on taking inputs from users or other services and providing output. Python has many helper functions that make it easy to perform both of these actions. You may recall that you use the print function to output variables and other values. In this video, you'll learn more about the print function and how to use another new function called input. The input function is designed to get data from a source of input, and it can be used in different ways. For example, one of its most basic uses is when you use the input function to get data that the user types in the keyboard. This input can then be printed to the screen. In many cases, you want to get input directly from a user. For example, when you ask for a user's email address, let's say you want to use the input function to prompt the user to enter their email address and then save that input to a variable called email. If you run this code, the user will be presented with a prompt to enter their email. The email variable will then contain the email address. Okay, let's switch back to the print function, which is used for output in Python. It can be used to print all different types of data and it allows for more complex formatting. The print function itself accepts any number of arguments. For example, comma separated to print numbers in sequence, arithmetic to print the output of an equation, and string concatenation to join or concatenate two strings together. Python's print function also has reserved keywords that can be passed as additional arguments. These include objects, that is, values that are printed on screen, sep, which defines how the objects being printed are separated, and end, which defines what gets printed at the end. There's also a file which specifies where values get printed to, and by default, it is std out. And lastly, flush, a Boolean expression to flush the buffer, which essentially just moves the data from a temporary storage to the computer's permanent memory storage. For example, suppose you can pass three parameters to the print function, the word hello, which is a string, the word u, which is another string, and sep, which is a built-in parameter whose value is set to a string containing a comma and a space. This will be used as a separator between the hello and u strings, and the output is hello u. Often while programming, you need to know the value of a variable and output it onto the screen. Python allows for direct formatting inside the print statement. You can also control the order by specifying the numbers inside the curly brackets. For example, if you print the same statement twice but with a number switched, the output will differ. Let's move on to a more practical application of what you've just learned using some code examples of input and output. I'll demonstrate how to use input and output in Python. I'll begin by demonstrating the input function. I start by typing input, opening parenthesis, and closing parenthesis. I then click on the run command, and you'll notice that it runs the input function. And I'm provided with a console where I can actually type an input. So I type hello there, and I press enter. Nothing happens because I'm not actually collecting data. I'm just triggering the input function. And by default, it'll open up access to the command line or the console and allow me to input data. I can also add a prompt to the input function. For example, I can ask a question to the user such as, please enter a number. So I type, please enter a number in between the parentheses after the word input. First, I clear the console and then I click on run again. You'll notice that the output now asks me to enter a number. I type five and press enter. Again, nothing shows up from an output perspective. This is because I haven't actually done anything with the input value. I'm just demonstrating how the input function works. If I want to get the value of the input, I need to assign a variable. So I type in num equals input. Please enter a number. I clear my console screen again, and I click on the run button. It asks me for a number in the console, and I enter the number six this time. Now the num or number value will contain the number six. But in order to see that, I have to output that variable to the screen. I can do this by using another function called a print function. So in this case, I print the number after the input itself by typing print, opening parenthesis, the abbreviation num, and a closing parenthesis. I clear my screen again and click on run. 
This time, I type the number seven when asked to enter a number. I press enter and you'll notice that the output prints seven. Now I want to show you that you can collect more than one input as part of the input because inputs work in a sequential manner. So I call this variable num1 and I enter another variable called num2 on the next line. The input for this variable is please enter a second number. And I just change the first variable's input to please enter a first number so that the instructions are clearer. I print out the value of num1 and num2. The print statement accepts both variables because they are separated by a comma, and it'll print out each one in that order. Again, I clear my console and I click run. I type four as the first number. I press enter and type five as a second number, followed by the enter key again. You'll notice four and five are printed out. You can also do arithmetic within the print statement. In other words, you can do addition, subtraction, standard multiplication, and division. So instead of using commas in the print statement, I type num1 plus num2. I clear the screen once more and I click run. I enter the numbers five and four again, and I get back 54. Now this isn't exactly what I intended to do, and the reason is because both variables are strings. This goes back to what you've learned previously with data types. If I want to do the arithmetic calculation, I'll need to convert each variable into an integer first. So I can use the integer function on num1 and num2. I click on the run button once more and I enter the same two numbers, five and four. But now what I get back is nine. If I want to see what type the input is, I can check the data type by using the type function. To do this, I type print, opening parenthesis, the word type, opening parenthesis, num1, followed by two closing parentheses. Let me just clear the screen. I click on run and enter the numbers five and four again in the console. And it says that the class is string and not integer, which is the type I actually want to do arithmetic. So just be mindful when you are using input that you will get a string. You'll most likely need to use the explicit data type casting to convert it to the data type that you need. The print statement can also be used for concatenation. So instead of num1, I change it to str1 or string1, and I do the same with num2 by changing it to str2. Then I amend the input to read, please enter your first name for string1, and please enter your second name for string2. After that, I print out hello, and then use concatenation so that the user can be greeted by their first and second name. Now I want to run this program. I'll just clear the terminal quickly, and then I click on run. In the console, I type Tom for the first name and Jones for the second name. And the result is the output of hello Tom Jones. So concatenation can be used with a print statement as well. Finally, you can also change how you assign variables. You don't have to use concatenation. You can just use string replacement. I'm going to use a function within Python called format for this. Based on the order of the brackets, you can pass in the variables that you want it to be replaced with. In this case, string one and two. Once more, I click run and I enter the username of Tom Jones and hello Tom Jones gets printed. In this video, you've expanded your knowledge by learning about the input and output function in Python. An operator is a symbol that tells Python to perform a certain operation. You can think of them like road signs in real life. For example, Suppose you're driving on a dangerous road and you spot an alert sign to reduce speed. Then you encounter a stop sign and finally a sign instructing you to turn right. You may not have realized that you were on a dangerous road. These symbols help keep you safe by instructing you to perform a specific operation. Similarly, when Python comes across an operator that you place in your code, it will also perform that specific operation. These operations can be mathematical logical and comparison. In this video, you'll learn about math and logical operators in Python. Most of the time, operators work on two values. Math operators are used for simple and complex calculations. It's essentially all the same options as the calculator would have. Let me explain this with examples of math and logical operators. The first operator I want you to know about is the addition or plus operator. The plus sign is a symbol that you must use when adding numbers together. For example, two plus three. To subtract numbers from each other, 
you use the subtraction or minus operator. Use the minus sign to subtract numbers. An example of this is three minus two. The division operator is next, and the symbol you use for it is a forward slash. Division is an operation in which one number is divided by another. For example, 35 divided by five. The last operator you need to know about is the multiplication operator. And the symbol you use for that is the star or asterisk key. Use this to multiply numbers with each other. For example, seven multiplied by four. Okay, now let's explore logical operators. Logical operators are used in Python on conditional statements to determine a true or false outcome. Let's explore some of these now. The first logical operator is named AND. This operator checks for all conditions to be true. For example, A is greater than five and A is less than 10. The second logical operator is named OR. This operator checks for at least one of the conditions to be true. For example, a is greater than five or B is greater than 10. The final operator is named not. This operator returns a false value if the result is true. For example, A is not greater than five. Operators are usually combined with conditional statements to control the flow of a program that meets specific criteria. For example, let's say a restaurant gives discounts based on the following two conditions. Is the customer part of the loyalty program? And did they spend over $100? To determine this, you can write code using logical operators to check if the customer is in the loyalty program and if they spent over $100. You'll learn more about conditional statements in a later lesson. Now, let me demonstrate how to use Python, math, and logical operators. Math operators basically give you the same functionality as what you have on a standard calculator. So you can perform operations like addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication. I start with a simple addition example. I'm using the print statement, so the output displays on my console. I type print, and in parentheses, I add two plus two. The value I expect back is four. When I run the statement, the value of four displays in the terminal. For subtraction, I change the plus sign to a minus sign. I click on the run button and the value displayed is zero. If I subtract two minus two, the answer is zero. For division, I change the minus sign to a forward slash. I type 35 forward slash five in the parentheses. I click the run button and the result is the value of 7.0. Just a note on this, the value returned is a float instead of an integer. Now let's cover multiplication. I change the forward slash to a star sign that represents multiplication. I type 25 asterisk five. I click on the run button and get back the value of 175. That was a short introduction to the math operators. Next, you'll explore logical operators. Logical operators are used to control the flow of your application. The logical operators are and, or, and not. Let's cover the different combinations of each. In this example, I declare two variables, a equals true and b also equals true. From these variables, I use an if statement. I type if a and b colon, and on the next line, I type print, and in parentheses and double quotes, I type all true. You'll learn about the if statement shortly, but for now, just know that this print statement will only be executed if both A and B are true. The print statement of all true is displayed in the terminal. If I change the value of B to false and I run the statement again, nothing gets printed out. The reason for it is that the AND statement as a condition needs both A and B to be true so that it will print out the statement. Now let's cover the OR operator. So I'm changing AND to OR and I click on the run button. The all true value has been printed out again. The reason for it is that with the or operator, if either A or B is true, the if statement is true. If I set the values of both variables to false and click on the run button, nothing gets printed out. This is because A is false and B is false, so the condition in the if statement has not been met. In this last example, I'm going to demonstrate the not operator. I'll keep the OR operator. Before OR, 
I type if not A in parentheses, then OR, then NOT B in parentheses, followed by a colon. I click on the run button and the value returned is all true. And what that's doing is it's looking for a negation against A. So not A is not false, which is true. And the OR, a negation of B, which results in true. The OR condition checks to see if either is true. Now I change the A and the B to be true. I click on run and nothing gets printed out. The reason for that is that it's checking again for if not A, essentially if A is not true. In this case, A is true and its negation is false, so it's not going to meet that condition. Or not B also results in false and does not meet that condition as well because both are the negation of true. This is still not going to print out any value because again, none of the conditions are being met. And that's a brief introduction to using both math and logical operators in Python. Congratulations. In this video, you learned about math and logical operators. Great job. If you'd like to learn more about math operators in Python, there's an additional reading at the end of this lesson. In programming, it's important to understand how to control the order in which your code is executed. For example, suppose you're invited to an event. You have to consider whether you need to dress formally or informally. Another example of a control flow is to consider a light switch. The flow is represented by the electrical current and the control is the switch itself with the two states of on and off. The order in which you make decisions matters and the same applies to writing effective programs. In this video, you'll learn how to use conditional statements to control flow in Python programs. So, what is control flow? Control flow refers to the order in which the instructions in a program are executed. All programs have decisions that need to be made. As a result of this, the program will take different actions or directions. In Python, there are two types of control flows. First, you can use conditional statements such as if, else, and l if, or else if. And second, you can use loops such as the for loop and the while loop. Let's explore these a little further now. The if keyword states that if the condition proves to be true, a function is performed. The else keyword catches anything which isn't caught by the preceding conditions. The elif or else if keyword is Python's way of saying, if the previous conditions were not true, then try this condition. The for loop checks for specific conditions and then repeatedly executes a block of code as long as those conditions are met. The while loop repeats a specific block of code an unknown number of times until a condition is met. Let's explore conditional statements in more detail with some practical examples using the if, else, and elif. I'll now write some code for a restaurant that wants to apply different discounts based on the amount its customers spend. To start off, I define a variable for the customer's bill. I'll call it bill total and assign a value of 114 to it. Now I apply a condition with an if statement. If bill total is greater than 100, print the statement bill is greater than 100. Next, to apply a discount to bill total, I need to create a second variable. I'll do this above the if statement in my code, call it discount one and assign a value of 10 to it. The condition also has to change. So inside the if statement, I add bill total equals bill total minus discount one. At the very end of the code snippet, outside the if statement, I'm going to print out what the value of the total bill is. To do this, I type a print statement that says total bill and then a plus sign. To add the value of bill total here, I need to convert the integer to a string. I use the str typecasting function to do this. Let's click on run. Great. In the terminal, two strings are printed. Bill is greater than 100 and the total bill is 104. But what happens if the bill is less than 100? I change the value of bill total to 95 and press run. Notice that this time, because the if condition is not met, it only prints the statement total bill is 95, but I'd like to print a statement that says the bill is less than 100. To do this, I add an else statement below the if statement. I type else colon, and in the next line, I print the statement bill is less than 100. Let's run the code. The output in the terminal now says bill is less than 100 
and total bill is 95. Up to this point, you've learned how to use the if and else statements to control the order in which values are assigned and printed. You are now ready to take program flow one step further. Say this restaurant wants to add another discount for bills over 200. How would you do that? Once again, I first need to create a new variable above the condition that I name discount2, which I set equal to 20. If I run the code now, it will still print out the same output because I haven't changed any of the conditions or values yet. Let's change the value of bill total to 210 and click run. Notice that both statements are printed, but discount one is still applied. It's clear that the if statement is still executed. Since the value is 210, the condition is still met. To change the program flow for values over 200, I need to add an and condition to the if statement. I change the statement to if bill total is greater than 100 and bill total is less than 200. Let's run the code and see what happens. Now the discount wasn't applied. The output just says bill total is 210. Why? Because the condition is not met. Now this is where it gets really interesting. To add a second condition for bills above 200, I'll use an else if statement. In between the if and else statements, I type L if, which stands for else if, and then bill total is greater than 200. Print the statement bill is greater than 200. In the next line, I apply the new discount. I type bill total equals bill total minus discount two. First, let me clear my screen so you can focus just on the results. Now I press run. Notice how the program flow has changed. The first condition was not met, so the code went to the second condition where the value of bill total was compared to 200. And since it was greater than 200, the statement bill is greater than 200 was printed. The code then proceeded past the else condition because the previous L if condition was true. Remember the else condition only executes if none of the preceding conditions are true. Finally, it printed the statement at the end of the code snippet, namely total bill is 190. This proves that discount two was applied. Congratulations. You now know how to control program flow with if, else, and else if. Once you become proficient in using conditional statements, programming becomes a lot of fun. I encourage you to test it out. In this video, you learned how to use conditional statements in Python. Writing conditional statements is an essential part of programming, and I encourage you to practice them in your code. The next time you need to make a decision, think about the conditions involved and how they can be represented if you were to code them in Python. You may recall how to use the if, else, and else if statements to test a variable against a few conditions. But on some occasions, you will have to test a variable against many conditions. To deal with this, you can use something called a match case statement. In this video, you'll learn how to use a match statement as an alternative to an if statement. Now let's consider an example to compare the match statement to the if statement. Say you want to write code to print HTTP error messages according to error codes. To do this with the if statement, you would have to write the if condition, all the alternative if else conditions, and finally an else condition. Conditional statements like if, l if, and else work well over a small number of conditions, but over a large number of conditions, your code can get large, complex, and messy. Fortunately, there is a cleaner way to achieve the same result using the match statement. The match statement in Python was introduced in version 3.10. Using the match statement, you can achieve cleaner, more readable code that allows all the same functionality as the if controlled statement. When using match statements, there are a few things to remember. You can combine several conditions by using the or operator in the conditional statement. The default is essentially the final outcome if nothing is found in the case checks. It's the equivalent to the else in the if blocks. Let me demonstrate this example now using VS Code. Okay, so I've written a simple if statement that checks for an HTTP status code. If the value of the variable HTTP status matches one of the conditions, it will print out the equivalent message. I'm now going to add a match statement below the if statement. 
For a clear comparison, I will test the same variable against the same values. I type match and then the variable HTTP status and a colon. On the next line, I type case, which is the equivalent of the word if and the value of 200. On another line, I repeat the action using the if statement for 200, which is to print the word success. So in other words, the variable is matched against the value of 200 and the if values are equal. It will print out the word success. Notice that the value of HTTP status is indeed 200 at the moment. So let's run the code to test how the if and match statements are processed. In the terminal, the word success is printed twice because the value of HTTP status is matched twice in my code run, once for the if statement and once for the match statement. Now let's change the value of HTTP status to 201 and run the code again. In this case, success is only printed once. Why do you think that happens? Because there is an or condition for the value of 201 in the if statement, but none in the match statement. To do the equivalent in the match statement, you use the OR operator. So I place my cursor in between 200 and the colon and add an OR character and the value of 201. I clean my screen by using CLS and then click on run again. Now success is printed twice again. So in the match statement, the pipe command is shorthand for IF OR. The great thing is that you can add many case statements in a match statement. But what if none of the values match the variable's value? Now let's change the value of HTTP status to the value of say 550 and explore what happens. I click on run and this time the word unknown is printed. You may be wondering why that is. Because the else statement is like a catch all. If the value does not match anything within the if or the l if statement, the default will be the else statement, which in this case has a print function for the word unknown. Well, the match statement also has a default class, and you add it by typing the word case underscore colon, and on the next line, print unknown. Let's run the code again. Great, the output is unknown unknown, which means that the default statement in both the if as well as the match statement was actioned. My match statement is coming along well, but it still needs a few tweaks to make it act exactly like the given if statement. To do that, I'll add a few more case statements that will test for the same values as the L if statements. I type case 400 colon, and then I add a print command with the words bad request. I add another case and the value of 500, and I also need to test for 501 like in the LF statement above. So once again, I add an OR character and type 501 colon. On the next line, I add the error message that I want to print, which is server error. The match saves a bit of space by combining the OR statement, so you don't have to do a comparison against a variable each time like in the IF statement. Let's change the value of HTTP status one more time to 501. I just clear the screen again and click on run and server error is printed for both statements. Now you know that there are some differences between the two, but the match statement does exactly the same as the if statement. In summary, the match statement compares a value to several different conditions until one of these conditions is met. So you now know how to use the match statement as an alternative to the if statement to test a variable against many possible values. The match statement is relatively new to Python. Prior to version 3.10, developers had to get creative and code their own solutions. You'll learn more about those alternative methods later in this lesson. Have you ever come across a song that you like so much you want to listen to it again and again? You select the loop option so that you can listen to it repeatedly. This action of repetition is known as looping and also exists in Python. In this video, you'll learn to use looping constructs when the same set of steps must be carried out many times. Python has two different types of looping constructs for iterating over sequences, the for loop and the while loop. Looping is used to iterate through the sequence and access each item inside the sequence. Let's start with a basic example of looping using a string. First, you declare a variable called str, which is of type string. 
Recall that a string in Python is a sequence, which means you can iterate over each character in the string. A sequence is just an ordered set. Now let's break apart the for loop and discover how it works. The variable item is a placeholder that will store the current letter in the sequence. You may also recall that you can access any character in the sequence by its index. The for loop is accessing it in the same way and assigning the current value to the item variable. This allows us to access the current character to print it for output. When the code is run, the output will be the letters of the word looping, each letter on its own line. Now that you know about looping constructs in Python, let me demonstrate how these work further using some code examples to output an array of tasty desserts. Python offers us multiple ways to do loops or looping. You'll now cover the for loop as well as the while loop. Let's start with the basics of a simple for loop. To declare a for loop, I use the for keyword. I now need a variable to put the value into. In this case, I am using i. I also use the in keyword to specify where I want to loop over. I add a new function called range to specify the number of items in a range. In this case, I'm using 10 as an example. Next, I do a simple print statement by pressing the enter key to move to a new line. I select the print function and within the brackets, I enter the name looping and the value of i. Then I click on the run button. The output indicates the iteration looped through the range of 0 to 9. It's important to note the three main points. The iteration starts at 0 based on the index of the item itself. Every for loop usually starts with 0. Most arrays start at 0. The reason for that is that it's the first item in an array or the first item in the index. In this case, the last item in the array or index will be 9. Now I want to change what I loop through. As an example, I'll enter a simple array above and call it favorites. To do this, I start by removing the hash sign in front of favorites. Next, I replace the range function in the current for loop with favorites to loop through. The i that I declared as part of the for loop can change to any value. And in this case, I'm using item. I now change my print statement to include item in my print loop. I also change the text to I like this dessert. I click on the run button to print the value stream. In this case, item calls each of the five desserts titles in turn and our print statement combines them into a sentence. The next looping option I'm discussing is the while loop. The while loop differs slightly from the for loop. To demonstrate this type of loop, I first comment out the for loop on my screen. Let's start by using the while keyword. As in the for loop, I need to specify a condition to make the loop over n times, depending on the value itself. First, I need to declare a counter. I do this by typing count equals zero above my looping statement. Next, I enter count after the while keyword, followed by the less sign and the word favorites. Now I insert the function len to provide the length of favorites. This means the loop will run while the count is less than the length of favorites. In other words, while it is less than five. To print the value of the looping statement, I press the enter key to move to a new line. Then I select the print function and within brackets, I enter the text, I like this dessert. The key difference here is that I need to use the index to access the items within the favorites array. To do this, I type favorites and add counts to represent the index. It's important that I now increment counts so that it will essentially match the loop statement. If I do not increment count, I'll end up with what is called an infinite loop. This means it will just keep looping and looping until the compiler stops it from running out of memory. To increment the count, I press enter to move to a new line and add count plus equals to one. I clear my screen and click the run button. I get the same print output as the for loop. It's important to note that in a standard for loop, I don't have access to the index but I can use the enumerate function to do that. So I change my current for loop statement by adding idx and it becomes for idx item in. Then I call the enumerate function with favorites in parentheses. On the next line, to print the output, I replace the text I like this dessert with idx and click the run button. The results display the index and the value of the item within the array. 
Congratulations. In this video, you learned about looping constructs in Python using the for loop. In Python, nested loops can be used to solve more complex problems. For example, the nested for loop is written by indentation inside the outer loop. Let's explore this further now and break down how a nested loop works. First, the outer loop will start and then step into the inner loop. Then the inner loop will run until its range limit is met, 10 in this case. Once the inner loop completes, it will come back to the outer loop for the next iteration and then step into the inner loop again. This will happen until the outer loop has reached its limit. Now let's explore an example using nested loops to iterate over two lists. For example, suppose you have two lists of integers from one to nine and a count variable that is set to zero. You again have two loops, the outer loop which will iterate over list one and the inner loop which iterates over list two. If you run this code, it gives an output of 90. Let me break it down for you. The outer loop runs a total of nine times. The inner loop runs a total of nine multiplied by nine, which is 81 times. And nine plus 81 gives a total of 90. To help visualize how this would look, you can make some minor changes to the loop to output what it looks like. Okay, so you now know that the number of times a loop is run is based on the size of the list. Now that you've learned about nested loops, let me demonstrate some code examples of nested loops. So I have VS Code open, and first let me start with a simple example and write a for loop. I type 4i and I use the range function, so I have in range 10. Above the loop, I label it with a comment outer loop. This first for loop is considered an outer loop and inside I will have an inner loop. I write a comment inner loop right under the first for loop. Now I type 4j in, then I use the range function again and I pass in a 10 and end with a colon. The 10 indicates the number of times the loop will iterate or repeat. In this example, I print out zero and then I use end equals and a string with space in double quotes to ensure it prints out in an even manner. And lastly, I'm going to print out an empty line so that it goes to a new line in each iteration. If I run the for loop, the system prints out a 2D array grid. This is just to demonstrate how the for loop works. If I want to print out a single line, I can change the outer loop to one. I clear my screen, run it again, and this time a single line of zeros is printed out because the outer loop only iterated once. This is all based on the outer loop only. It runs once, but when it goes to the inner loop, that it runs 10 times and prints out a zero for each item on the same line. Every time the outer loop starts, it will go into the inner loop. The inner loop must finish before it comes back to the outer loop to start on two, three, four, and so on. I can showcase that by simply changing the outer loop range to two. In this case, only two lines are printed. So the first when i equals zero, it comes into the inner loop and prints out 10 times. When that's finished, it comes back to the outer loop. Then i is incremented again to one, and then it'll be printed out from j's inner loop and another 10 zeros again. The other issue to consider with nested loops is the complexity or what is commonly known as time complexity. The larger the array, the more time it's going to take to run my code. Let me showcase this by running a for loop for a larger range, but also putting a timestamp on it. I import the time module to put a timestamp in what's printed out. I class it as the start time equals time dot time, which is the function that I want to call. The start time is initialized the moment I run the script. I also want to print out how long it took to finish. I do that by putting a print statement outside the for loop. I then calculate the time as in the time it took to finish and then subtract that from the start time above. This is going to print out many decimal places, so I use another function named round, which rounds numbers to a decimal of my choice. In this case, I round it off to two decimal points. Let me clear my screen one more time. I click on run and it outputs the time of 0.0, .0 seconds. This makes sense because the time my code takes to run is really short. Now let me increase the range in the outer loop to 100 and I also increase the range in the inside loop to 100 
and I click on run one more time. The time now goes up 0.01. In this case, it's not a big difference, but when you're dealing with large data sets, this will have a huge effect on the running time of my code. This time, let's say for example that I keep the outer loop to 100, but I increase the inner loop to 1000. I clear the screen and click on run. The time increases to 0.04. If I increase the inner loop one more time to 10,000 and I clear the screen and click run, now the time goes up to 0.45. So the larger the array or the larger the range, in this case, the more time it's going to take for a program to complete. It's always important to remember how you can optimize code to make it run more efficiently and consider the amount of time your code will take to run. You just covered nested for loops and learned about the issue of time complexity. In this video, you learned about nested loops and how they work. Congratulations on reaching the end of control flows and conditionals and the end of the module on getting started with Python. Let's recap what you've learned. So now you know how to explain the history of programming and how it works in a general sense. Describe the benefits of Python and where it's used. Evaluate if your system is set up correctly for Python development. Identify the differences of running code from the command line via the IDE. Explain the importance of syntax and space in Python. Describe what variables are and how they are used. Identify data types in Python. Explain how to declare and use strings. Describe the two types of casting and how to apply them. Describe the basics of user input and console output. Recognize math and logical operators in Python. Use conditional statements to control the flow of programs. Use match case statements as an alternative to if statements. Explain looping constructs and how to use them. And explain nested loops and how they work. You've learned a lot about the structure and rules that guide Python, and now you're ready to create programs. Great work. See you next time. So, what are functions? At the most basic level, you can think of functions as a set of instructions that take an input and return an output. For example, the primary task of the print function is to print a value. This value is usually printed to the screen and it's passed to the print function as argument. In the example we have here, the string hello world is the value passed to the print function. By the end of this video, you'll be able to declare a function in Python, pass data into a function, and return data from a function. A Python function is a modular piece of code that can be reused repeatedly. You've used some Python functions already in this course, such as print and input. Both are functions, and each one has a specific task or action to complete. The input function will accept parameters too, but will also accept input from the user. So, how do you declare a function? A function is declared using the def keyword, followed by the name and task to complete. Optional parameters can also be added after the function name within a pair of parentheses. Here's an example of creating a function to add two values. Type the def keyword, followed by the function name of sum, then enter x and y as parameters. And finally, enter return x plus y as the task to complete. I'll now give a practical demonstration of functions, how to declare them, how they're used, and how they can also simplify your code by putting it into a reusable structure. Let's start with a short example that explains how to calculate a tax amount for a customer based on the total value of that bill. I'll start by declaring two variables. I type the first variable called bill, and I assign it the number, let's say 175.00. I know this is going to be a data type known as floats because I'm using decimal points, as is the norm for currency. The second variable is the tax rate, which is the percentage tax rates that should be applied to the bill. So I put in 15, and then what I want to do is calculate the amount of tax for the bill itself. What I do is add this into another variable called total tax. I then do the calculation which is the bill multiplied by the tax rate and then divided by 100 to get a dollar amount. To output the value, I print the total tax and pass the total tax variable and then run the program. 
total tax is 26.25, which is 15% of 175. In the real world, the bill value will be different for each customer and the tax rates may also change. Updating each variable every time is inefficient. To overcome this problem, I'll create a reusable function. To start creating a function, I use the define command, or def for short. Then I'll give it a name that relates to the task it's carrying out. So in this case, it's going to be calculate tax. With functions, you can pass in arguments. And the purpose of that is to make it more dynamic. So consider the arguments that I need to take in. I'll take in a bill, which would be the total value of the bill itself, and then also a tax rate. And then, like I've done before, I will calculate the total tax by taking the bill, multiplying it by the tax rate, and then dividing it by 100. OK then, I do a return, wrap bill in parenthesis, multiply it by tax rate, and divide by 100. Now I can remove the declaration I made earlier for the variables and the calculation. With a function, if you run the current code as is, it will come back with nothing because a function is only ever run when it's actually been called. I'll demonstrate this. If I do a print, I can calculate tax and then I pass it as I've done earlier. 175 is the total bill and then the tax rate will be 15. I'll also put in just a total tax and then click on run and the total tax rate is 26.25. If I want to change the rate, I can reuse the same function, total tax. I'll call the function again, calculate tax. I'll give it a different value for a bill, say 164.33. This time I'll change the tax rate to 22%. Clear the screen and then click on run and my total tax for the second item is 36.1526. To clean the output up a bit and make it more visually appealing, I'll put in a round function which allows control of the number of decimal places that I want returned. In this case, I'll do two and then rerun the code. This is a lot neater with 36.15. One of the nice things about a function is that you can update it once and any part of the code that calls that function will get those changes as well. In this video, you've explored basic functions in Python, how to declare functions and pass and return data to and from them. The concept of scoping in Python allows for greater control over elements in your code, which reduces the chances of accidental or unwanted changes. By the end of this video, you'll be able to understand the basics of scoping in Python and identify the four types of scope. Before you explore scope and its intricacies, it's important to know that Python has different types of scope. You'll examine each one in detail and I'll demonstrate them with coding examples. In order of ascending coverage, the four scopes are local, enclosing, global, and built-in. Together, they are referred to as LEGB. Variables within the built-in and global scope are accessible from anywhere in the code. For example, if there's a variable A in the global scope, it can be called in code at the local level. The purpose of scope is to protect the variable so it does not get changed by other parts of the code. For instance, Let's say you've declared variable B in the enclosed scope and variable C locally. While B can be called in local code, it doesn't work the other way around. As a rule, global scope is generally discouraged in applications as it increases the possibility of mistakes in output. Now I'll explore using the four different types of Python scopes in this practical demonstration. The first one I want to use is global scope. I declare a variable called myGlobal and then give it a value of 10. So the next thing I do is declare a function and I call it fn1. And inside this function, I'll declare another variable, which I'll call local variable or local v, and give it a value of 5. To show that my global variable is accessible from anywhere, I can do a print statement, say access to global, and then print out the value of the myGlobal variable. And if I want to run that function, I need to specifically call it. So fn1, click on run, and then the value of 10 is printed out for the global variable. But if I try and print out the local variable inside fn1, outside the function, it will return an error. So I access to local and then put out local underscore v. 
I then clear the console, click on run, and I get an error saying name error, name local underscore v is not defined. That's because it's only accessible from within the local scope of the function fn1. Next, to illustrate an enclosing scope, I'm going to declare a second function inside fn1 called fn2. I then declare an enclosed variable, which I call enclosed v, and assign it the value of 8. The local v will be local to the fn2. I'll now explain how enclosed scope works. Within fn2, I've got access to the enclosed v, which I can demonstrate by doing another print statement and printing out the enclosed v variable. I'll just test that this all works by calling the fn1 function and then making sure that I call our fn2 function inside fn1. I must physically call a function to make it run. So I clear the console, click on run, and then print out access to global 10 and access to enclosure 8. The way scoping works is that the innermost function has access to almost everything from the outside. You can access the enclosed variable at this level and then also access the global variable at the outer level. The same rules still apply from the outside. So if I try and access the variable of enclosed v or try and access the variable of local v, I get the same error that the variable enclosed v is not defined. The nested items have access to both the global and the enclosed, but from the outside, it can't be accessed from a nested or an enclosed scope, both for local and enclosed. The last scope is built-in scope, which you've been using when writing code in Python. Built-in scope refers to what's called the reserve keywords, such as print and def. Built-in scope covers all the language of Python, which means you can access it from the outermost scopes or the innermost scopes in the function classes. That's a brief demonstration of scope in Python, including examples of global, local, enclosed, and built-in. By completing this video, you've gained a broad understanding of why scoping is important in Python programming, and you are now able to identify the four types of scope. Lists are a sequence of one or more different or similar data types. A list in Python is essentially a dynamic array that can hold any data type. Let's move to the console and I'll demonstrate some practical examples of Python lists. First, I'll go through a few examples of declaring lists. So I create my list by typing list1 equals and then the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 within brackets and separated by commas because you use commas to separate items in a list. List2 is a list of strings a, b, c. I can also have a list of different data types. For example, in my list3, I can have a string, an integer, a boolean, and a float. So the type doesn't necessarily matter. It's just going to be stored in the same way. One thing to keep in mind with lists is that they are based on an index. For example, let's suppose I wanted to access the number 3 from my list1 example. Since the index always starts with zero, I'd have to write list one open square bracket two close square bracket. This gets the third item in the list, which is number three. So if I do print that, I get the value of three being printed out. An important option with lists is that you can also have nested lists. So if I declare another list, for example, list four, and I put in one, and then I can have a nested list of two, three, and four, and then get back to a five and six. That's completely valid as well. So any data type can be stored within the list itself, just to keep that in mind. Let's see what else lists can do. I've got a few different options to add items to a list. One is to use the insert function. So just before I do that, I'll just do a print. To print out the entire list, there are a couple of different ways I can do it. I can use the star sign list one, click on run, and I get the entire list printed out. To print it the way it is displayed in my code, I can use the print statement type in list one and just put in a separator, equals, and then comma, or just single space. I click on run and I get this type of print returned. Right, back to adding something new to the list. The first option that I have is what's called the insert function. I can do list one dot insert, and what it looks for is the index of where to insert to. Here I can use the len or len function to get the length of the list one. 
then I put in what the next value should be. So in this case, I put in number six. I do the same print statement directly underneath that. Then click on run, and I find that I get six added to the end list. I can also use another function called append. Instead of having to specify the index or where the item should be placed, I can just put in the append keyword. So I type append six and click on run, and it's added in without having to specify the index. There is another function I can use if I want to add one or more items to the list. It's called extend, and this will accept a list as well. I can put in extend six, seven, eight, nine, and then click on run, and then my list is extended with six, seven, eight, and nine. To remove something from a list, there are a few different options. The first way is to use pop and then specify the index or location of which item I want to remove. To demonstrate pop, I'll say pop four for index four. I click on run and the last item from the list is removed. Remember, within a list, the index always starts at zero. So index four means the fifth item being the value five and that's what has been removed. Another option is the delete or del keyword. I can say del list one and then specify the index to delete. In this case, I put in the index of two, click on run and the index two is removed, which in this case is the number three. Zero, one, two is the number three. Lastly, I can iterate through a list. One of the main reasons I use lists is that I can iterate through the values and gain access to large amounts of data. So to iterate, I can use a simple for loop. So for x in list one, and then I can do a simple printout. I'll just remove this one underneath. I'd like to print out the value of x, so I just put in print value and then x. When I click on run, it'll print all values of the list. That's a brief demonstration of what you can accomplish using lists in Python. You just covered how a list in Python works as a dynamic array. You explored lists and learned how to use inbuilt functions of a list to access the list items, modify them, add to the list, and remove items from the list. In this video, you will learn about tuples and how they can be used to store different types of data. They are used as data structures and help to create solid, well-performing code. To declare a tuple, I declare a simple variable. I'll name it my underscore tuple, and then I do the assignment operator of equals. Then, to declare the tuple itself, I use parentheses. A tuple can accept any mix of data types, and it can range from integers, like one, to strings, to a double, such as 4.5, to a boolean, like true. To access any of the items within the tuple, I can use methods similar to those used with a list by referring to an index. So, in my underscore tuple, if I want to get access to the string, which I know is going to be on index one, I just print out the value. So I write print my underscore tuple brackets one. Remember, index always starts with zero. I click on run and I find that it returns the value of strings. If I want to determine the type of the tuple, I can use the type function that Python provides. I click on run and I get a class tuple. We could also declare a tuple without using the parentheses. It has the same effect and will still be classed as a tuple. However, it's best practice to use the parentheses. Tuples also provide different methods of count and index. I can do my underscore tuple dot count and pass in the value of strings. I click on run and I get back the count of one. What it does is it looks for the number of occurrences of that value within the tuple. Before I move on, I'll type clear into my terminal to clear the previous output so we could start fresh and see what's going to happen next. The other method is index, which should give me back the index of where the value lies in the tuple. I'll change the print statement to look up the index of the double 4.5. When I click on run, I get back two. This means that the double 4.5 is at index two in the tuple. I can also do a loop on a tuple. That is, iterate through the values and print them out. I can write a loop. 4x in my underscore tuple, and then print out the value of x. I click on run and I get back one, strings, 4.5, and true. So all of the values of the tuple itself. The one key difference of a tuple over a list is that tuple values are what's called immutable, 
and this just means that they cannot be changed. So I'll prove this and demonstrate how this works. Let's say that I want to change the value of the very first item in the tuple being the value one. I'll use zero to access it based on the index. And let's say that I want to change it to be five. If I run this, I'll get back an error and it gives me the error saying type error, tuple object does not support item assignment. That's because anything that is declared in a tuple is immutable. In this video, you learned about tuples, including how to declare them and work with their contents. In this video, you will learn about sets and how they can help with storing certain types of data in different types of formats. First, I declare a set. I can start by declaring a simple variable called set a equals, and then use curly braces to define the set itself. Then the values go inside the brackets. I put in one, two, three, four, and five. I'll do a simple printout to prove that we have a set. I click on run to get the values one to five printed out. Sets differ slightly from lists in that they don't allow duplicate values. I can demo this by putting in another five. When I click on run, I find that the second five is not printed out in the list. Sets also have methods that we can use. I can use a method to add new content. If I use set.add6, I can add in the number six. I click on run to find that the value six is added to the set. I can also use the remove method. I'll remove the number two. When I clicked on run, I found that the number two was removed from the set. There's also discard, which essentially does the same thing as remove. Using discard, when I click on run, I'll find that I get the same output. Let me clear the console before we go any further. There are also a few useful methods that could be used with sets to perform mathematical operations. Let me demo some of them now. First, I will create a new set, set B. I will put in four, five, six, seven, and eight and reset the values of set A to the original values. There are two ways I could use mathematical operators. For instance, for a union join, I can do set A dot union and then pass in set B. Then I can click on the run button to see what happens. I discover that it joins the two sets together minus the duplicate values like four and five. Union merges them into one. So you have a set one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. For the other options for union, I can use the vertical line symbol or the or symbol, and that works in the same way. Let me clear the console before we go on. Another operation I can use is the intersection. I can apply this to set A by writing set A dot intersection and passing set B as the argument. When I click run, I get back all the items that match in both set A and set B. Here we have four and five. The intersection can also be represented by the ampersand and will work in the same way. When I click on run, I also got back four and five. Let me clear the console again before we continue. Another mathematical operation I can use is the set difference. To use this, I'll print set A dot difference set B and this should give me back all the elements that are only in set A and not in set B. When I clicked run, we got the correct output of one, two, and three. I could also represent difference by using the minus symbol. When I click on run, I'll also get back the same values, one, two, and three. The last operation I'll discuss is what's called symmetrical difference. This is represented by the symmetric difference function which is used in a similar way. When I click on run, I get back one, two, three, six, seven, and eight. In other words, all of the elements that are present in set A or set B, but not in both sets. Symmetrical difference can also be represented by the caret operator. When I click on run, I get back the same values. An additional important thing about sets is that a set is a collection with no duplicates, but it's also a collection of unordered items. Unlike a list where I can print out content based on index, if I try to print out set A brackets zero to get the zeroth element in the set, I'll get an error. Let me clear my console before we attempt to print this output. 
When I click on Run, I get back a type error saying that the set object is not subscriptable. This means that the set is not a sequence. It doesn't contain an ordered index of all elements inside. OK, that concludes our gentle introduction to sets. Great job. So what is a dictionary in Python? In many ways, it's very similar to how an actual dictionary works. In a normal dictionary, to locate a word, you look it up by the first letter and then use the alphabetical ordering system to find its location. Likewise, Python dictionaries are optimized to retrieve values. You may remember how useful Python lists are to access an array of values. Dictionaries access values based on keys and not an index position. Therefore, they are faster and more flexible in operation. By the end of this video, you'll be able to explain the purpose and function of dictionaries in Python and identify the performance benefits of dictionaries. With a Python dictionary, a key is assigned to a specific value. This is called the key value pair. The benefit of this method is that it's much faster than using traditional lists. To find an item in a list, you need to keep reviewing the list until you locate the item. But in a Python dictionary, you can go straight to the item you need by using its key. A dictionary is also mutable in that the values can be changed or updated. For example, you could declare the number one as the key and coffee as the item, and then change these to any other number or drink item. But how does this work? How do you access or locate the item you need within a Python dictionary with the use of the keys? To demonstrate this, I'll access the coffee item within a Python dictionary. First, I declare my dictionary name as sample dictionary, then an equals with a series of key value pairings or keys and items in a pair of curly braces. I also make sure to separate each pairing with a comma. I then type the print function, followed by the name of my dictionary. I need to access coffee item, which has been given a key of one. So I insert the number one in square brackets. I run the print function and it returns coffee as a result, just as I intended. I can also update a dictionary by replacing one item with another. I just need to use the key to reference it while using the assignment operator of equals to assign the value. For example, I can change item two in my dictionary from tea to mint tea. I just write a new line of code that starts with the name of the dictionary, followed by the key I want to change in square brackets. Then I add an equals operator followed by the name of the new item. What the coding says is to take item two in the sample dictionary and change it to mint t. When I run this function, it changes the item. I can also delete an item from the dictionary. To do this, I write a line of code with the delete function followed by the name of my dictionary. Then I add the key for the item I want to delete in square brackets. In this instance, I want to delete item three, juice. When I run this delete function, it will remove the juice value from my dictionary. Finally, I can also use three different methods to iterate over a dictionary. I can use the standard iteration method, the items function or the values function. Let's explore these iteration methods and the other dictionary operations functions in more detail. To create my dictionary, I'll start by declaring a simple variable called my underscore d, and then use the assignment operator, and then curly brackets. It can be the same as a set, but by default, that's classed as an empty dictionary. I can print that out by using a print statement, using the type function, and then passing in the my d variable, clicking on run. The class has actually come back as a type dictionary. So next, I'll add some values into the dictionary, and I need to do it in two parts. A dictionary holds what's called a key and a value. The key can be numeric, it can be string, but to signify the assignment, I use a colon and then put in whatever value that I want. In this case, I'll put in a simple string value of test. To signify that I can change or have different keys, strings, integers, or ints, I put in a string key of name and then the value Jim. I print out my dictionary using the print function. I now have a basic dictionary setup with a key of one name and then one being test name being Jim. If I want to access a key in the dictionary, I just have to use the square brackets and then pass in the key value. So in this case of one, I'll pass in the numeric one. In the case of the string value, 
I just need to pass in the actual string value itself, so name. Click on run and I get back both test and gym, which are the values for each corresponding key. If I want to add a new key into the dictionary or update it, I can simply do my D and then add a new assignment, two in this case. Test two, click on run. The key is then added with the current dictionary. To update a key, I have to call out the value that I want. I'm just going to update the first key, which is number one with a value of not a test, instead of test. Click on play and it's updated on the screen. The other thing to note about the dictionary is that if I try and put in a duplicate key, it doesn't allow this. So if I put in a number one and then not a test, click on run and the key will actually be overridden with the latest one. So number one only appears once in the outputs and it doesn't allow the two keys to be printed out because it won't allow duplicate values to be set. If I want to delete a key from the dictionary, I use the del operator. Now I type my D and then specify which key I want to delete. In this case, number one. It's then removed from the dictionary. With a dictionary, I can also iterate though. For example, I can use the for x in my dictionary and then print out the value of x. Click on run and I get one. This only prints out the keys. In a lot of cases, I may need access to both. To do that, I use a method called myItems. With that, I can then gain access to the assignment of both the key and the value. So I do a printout here, key plus value. I'll use some concatenation to print out both the key and the value. Click on run. I have to be mindful because I'm using an integer with a string. So I wrap that with a type str, click on run again, and I get the value of the key and the value for each of the items in the dictionary itself. You should now understand the purpose and function of dictionaries in Python and their benefit in terms of performance. In this video, you'll explore args and also quargs or keyword args. Using these has the advantage that you could pass in any amount of non-keyword variables and keyword arguments. To start with the short example, I'll define a sum of function that accepts two parameters, a and b, and then return back the addition a plus b. If I do a print statement, call the function sum of with the two values four and five, I should get back the value of nine, which I do. That all works fine, but let's say I want to add in another value, six, for example. If I click on run again, I get back an error, and it tells me that the sum of function takes two positional arguments, but three were given. If I want a way around this, this is where args are useful. To define args, I use the star symbol, and I call it args for naming purposes. Instead of passing in just two arguments, args will allow n arguments to come through, any number of arguments. When dealing with more than one argument, there may be many to iterate through. To calculate the total sum, I'll have a variable called sum, assign it to zero, then I'll create a simple for loop, and then I'll loop through the argument parameters that's been passed in. Then I'm going to add all the values that come in as part of args, which is assigned to the x variable using the plus equals and then finally return the value of sum. So again, if I run the statement, I get back the value of 15. As I mentioned, you could pass in any number of arguments and the total sum should be returned for each. In this case, it's 30 with the number of arguments that have been passed through. That's a simple intro to args. So now I'll demonstrate quargs. Let's clear the terminal and switch to my quargs file. I'll copy the code from the args file to start. Let's say, for example, you wanted to calculate a total bill for a restaurant. A user got a cup of coffee that was $2.99. Then they also got a cake that was $4.55 and also a juice for $2.99. The first thing I could do is change the for loop. Let's change the argument to quargs by adding another star and then update the variable in the for loop. Next, I get the key and the value, and then I extend the quargs with the items function. And then I could simply change the sum to add all the items that are passed through on the value because adding the key makes no sense. It's just the string and it won't give you the actual value you intend to get. When I run this, I get back a value of 10.53 with a bunch of extra zeros. Now I can change the decimal place for the final return statement by using the round function and I limit it to two decimal places. When I click on run again, I get back a total of 10.53. To summarize, with args, you could pass in any amount of non-keyword variables. With the quargs, you can pass in any amount of keyword arguments. 
That's a simple intro to both args and quarks. In this video, you'll learn about errors and exceptions, two very important aspects of learning Python as a new developer. You'll cover the difference between errors and exceptions and explore what happens when something goes wrong with your code. Errors are a part of coding and they happen for many reasons. Let's start by exploring two types of errors. Syntax errors, which are caused by human error, and exceptions, which are known errors that need to be handled. Syntax errors are usually caused by the developer. It could be the result of a misspelling or a typo in the code. Generally, these types of errors have minimal impact because most IDEs, like Visual Studio Code, will warn the developer and give clues about how to fix them. A common error for new developers learning Python is not adding the colon at the end of conditions or statements. If you're using a code editor with syntax checking, errors like this may be highlighted at the point of the error. For example, a missing colon will be highlighted in the code. The output will indicate the file name and the line where the error occurred, with a caret character pointing to the error. Running the code will result in an invalid syntax error, informing that there is a syntax problem. Other common mistakes include indentation problems, which are also syntax errors. For example, if there is an indentation problem, the error code will be indentation error. The more you learn Python, the less you'll have to deal with these types of errors because you'll become better at creating and analyzing your code. Now let's move on to exception errors. They happen during code execution and they can easily go unnoticed by the untrained eye. But exceptions need to be handled by the developer. They need to deal with any potential issues in the code base to keep the application from failing. Let's explore an exception being thrown. As an example, your code can be syntactically correct, but if it attempts to divide five by zero, it doesn't make mathematical sense. Therefore, when you run this program, the zero division error exception is thrown. Luckily, by default, Python includes many exception errors that you can use to pick up potential issues in your code. In this video, you explored the basics of errors and exceptions, which is a step in the right direction to becoming a better Python programmer. In this video, you'll explore how to handle exceptions in Python. You will learn how to change error messages and how to wrap your code within try and accept statements. As an example, I will write a simple math function. I define a new function called divideby and allow it to accept two parameters, a and b. The purpose of this function is to return the value of the division of both numbers. So, in the next line, I'll type return a divided by b. Now, I add a print statement for the divide by function. Inside the print statement, I'll also add a new set of parentheses with the value of 40 and 4. These are the values that will be divided by the function. I click on run, and the value returned is 10, which is correct, because 4 goes into 40 10 times. Now let's test what will happen if I pass in the values of 40 and 0. Now when I click on run, I get an error or an exception. The exception in this case says, 0 division error, division by 0. It gives this error because in math, you can't divide a number by 0. You might agree that getting cryptic errors could upset users. So, the question is, how can you handle errors in a more user-friendly way? How can you prevent a user from seeing the actual exception being printed out? You do this with Python's try and accept statements. Simply type try, colon, and in the next line, accept, colon. You add the code that you want to run within the try statement. So, I delete the print statement at the bottom and cut the divide by zero function. Within the try statement, I type a n s equals and paste the function. Now, in the accept statement, I will add my own error statement. I add a print statement for the string something went wrong. Let me just clear the terminal so you could focus on the output. I click on run and now the error statement is printed. So what's happening? The try statement will try and execute the code that you added inside it. If an exception occurs, it will trigger the accept line and execute any code added underneath the accept statement. But Python allows you to make the accept statement more specific. If you want to trap the exception itself, you could add the base class exception right after accept. The base class exception is used for all exceptions that are written within Python. You can gain access to the exception information by using the 
as e after exception. The e variable acts as an alias for the exception. I can use e to print out the exception in the print statement. So let's edit the print statement. I add e at the end of the error message. I press run and what happens? Our custom message is printed out, but the contents of e are also printed. So this time it reads, something went wrong, division by zero. In Python, you could also get access to the actual type or class of exception that's occurred. To do this, I add another print statement of e dot underscore underscore class underscore underscore. I run this statement one more time. This time, the output includes the class of error as well, namely class zero division error. Let me clear the terminal again. Let's take this one step further to provide even more specific feedback to the end user. In the accept statement, I replace the base class exception with the actual error that was printed out, namely zero division error. I will change the print statement so that it first prints the actual error by adding E at the start of the statement. And now I'll add some user-friendly text saying we cannot divide by zero. I click on run, and now the output is division by zero, we cannot divide by zero. Up to this point, you've covered how to wrap your code with the try and accept statements and how to optimize the message that a user sees. But how can you handle more than one exception without knowing what they are ahead of time? Fortunately, you can chain the accept statement by adding another accept statement. Say the code doesn't trip the zero division error in the first accept statement. You can add another accept statement that tests for a generic exception. Now I will add the base class exception. Again, I add a print statement with E and a message with some general information. I'll click on run, and in this case, because there is still a math error, the function will still trip at the first accept statement. But this gives you a good idea of how you can test for more exceptions. Congratulations. You now know how to wrap code in the try and accept statements to handle all potential exceptions in your code. While handling is an essential part of learning Python, Python has several built-in functions to create and manipulate files. File handling includes opening, reading, and writing files, amongst other operations. As a developer, you'll probably work with large amounts of data, and file handling makes that easier. This is why it's important to learn how to work with files. Whether you're working with data on your computer, on the web, or in the cloud, it will most likely be saved in some type of file. There are two file handling functions in Python open and close. Let's explore the open function first. The open function is used for reading, writing, and creating files. The open function accepts two arguments. The first is the file name and or the file location, and the second argument is the mode. The mode indicates what action is required, such as reading, writing, or creating. It also specifies if you want the file output in text or binary format. Let's explore the modes of file handling you can use in Python. First, you have R, which is used to open and read a file in text format. And RB opens and reads a file in binary format. You'll learn more about this later. R plus, on the other hand, opens the file for both reading and writing. And W opens the file for writing. Note that W will overwrite the existing file. Lastly, A opens files for editing or appending data. Next, there's the close function. The close function is used for closing the open file connection. Note that it does not take any arguments. There is one more way to open and close a file in Python, and that's with the with open function. The advantage of using it is that it closes the file automatically. The with open function will be demonstrated shortly. By now, you understand how to open files for certain actions, but you might be wondering what the difference is between opening a file in text and binary format. In Python, you generally handle files in two ways, either in text or binary format. The text format is more user-friendly because humans can read it. You'll not be able to read files in binary format, but they are much more compact and therefore result in better performance. Now let's cover how to specify the type of file handling in Python. Python uses text as the default format for file handling, so just passing in any mode for reading or writing a file will automatically set it to a text format. To set the file handling to binary, you need to pass the letter B along with either the read or write option. 
For example, you write open the file name in RB to read a file in binary format, or AB to append or add to a file in binary format. You'll now explore file handling in code. First, I declare a simple variable called file and assign the open function to it to gain access to a file. But before I can use the open function, I first need to create a new file for testing. Let's call it test.txt. Inside this text file, I add a simple line of text. Hello there. Good. Let's go back to the Python file. Inside the parentheses of the open function, I can now add the first argument, namely test.txt between quotation marks, since it's a string. For the second argument, I type in the word mode, equal sign, and then I will just use R for read, also between quotation marks. So far, the variable called file will have access to the contents of the test.txt. But to actually read the file, you need to add a read line or read lines function. Read line will just return the first line of the file, while read lines will output an array with multiple lines. Since we only have a single line of text in this file, I'll just use the read line function. I type file.readline and parentheses. I assign the line of code to a new variable named data. Then I add a print statement to print the contents of data. Lastly, I add a close function that will close access to the last text.txt file. I simply close with a set of parentheses. I click on run and the content of the file is printed out, namely, hello there. Next, I'll demonstrate another way to gain access to a file in Python. I'll change the open function to the with open function. I'll just clear the screen. To assign a variable to the with open function, you need to add as after the parentheses and then the variable name. Why would you use the with open function? The with open function is better at exception handling and will automatically close the file for you. Just like before, I create a second variable data, read line, and then print the contents of data. I'll click on run and just like before, the contents of the file are printed. You've covered how to work with files in Python. This includes the built-in functions to create and manipulate files and the functions to open, read, and write files. In this video, you will learn how to create files in Python and explore methods of inserting content into a new file. Files are used to permanently store data. Anything stored in the variables of your code exists in random access memory, or RAM. Since RAM loses its data when the computer is turned off, it's important to be able to create files so data is available for future use or as a permanent record. In Python, we can create new files using the open function and enabling the write mode. Let's start with a short example. I'll use a with statement with the open function and pass in the following parameters. Our file will be new file.txt and we'll set the mode by passing mode equals w. Now I assign this file to a variable by typing as file. A shorthand way to assign the mode is to enter a single character that represents the mode you need. In this case, I can replace mode equal to w with just the letter w and it means the same thing. Now that I have access to the newly created file as a variable, I can begin to add content to the file using the write function. On a new line, I type file.write and I'm going to add some simple text. This is a new file created. When I click run, the Explorer pane on the left-hand side of VS Code displays that my file called newfile.txt has been generated as a new file. Clicking once on the new file to select it displays its content and confirms that the text I pushed through using the write function is now present in the file. If I choose to write multiple lines of content to the file instead of a single line, I can use the write lines function. The write lines function accepts a list. A list in Python is represented by square brackets and then a comma for each line. I edit my file.write to say file.write lines. Then, within square brackets, I add a comma after the sentence and type the next sentence. This is another line to be added. I click on run and the new file.txt now has the two lines created by my write lines function. But it's not exactly the way I need it to be. Python will add the contents of the list exactly as it's specified within the list. If I want the content to break on a new line, 
I need to specify a new line by putting in a backslash and the letter N, no space. So, just inside the open quote of the second sentence, I add backslash N. Now, when I click on run, the content of newfile.txt is more readable with each sentence on a separate line. One thing to note is that every time I run my script, it's replacing the current file. For example, if I insert the number two into the first line of text, click on run, then check my text file. That has now replaced the previous file with one where I just added the number two in the first sentence, thus overriding the existing file with a fresh new file.txt. On the other hand, if I want to add to the file as opposed to replacing it each time, I just need to change the action of mode. To do so, I replace the letter W and put in a letter A, which stands for append. Now I click on run three times, then I check my new file.txt to find that the contents have been added. It now has multiple lines. However, it has not pulled in exactly the way I wanted it to be. And the reason for that is I don't have a new line specified at the very beginning. So, I add a backslash n before my first sentence. Since I need to replace the file, I change the mode back to w to ensure I am overwriting the last file. I click on run, and that replaces the existing lines that were there. Now I want to add to the file again, so I change the mode back to append by changing the w to an a, and I click run three times. I check the file and confirm that the new lines were appended each time. The final part of my code will be to trap exceptions. Always keep in mind the necessity to deal with any exception by using the try and accept statements. I add a new line above my existing code, and there I type try colon. As an example, I use file not found error, which is an error that occurs often. This needs two new lines added to the end of my code. So I type accept file not found error as e and press enter for a new line. Then to print out the error, I type print error comma e. Now to force the error to happen, let's say I ask for a directory that I know doesn't exist in my current directory. So the faulted directory is called sample. I edit my code to read sample forward slash new file dot text. Now I'll clear my terminal and run my screen again. I get the error generated by my print command, no such file or directory. So take care when you are creating files that the directory where you want to place the file actually does exist. In cases like that, you must ensure the directory already exists or create a directory from within Python and then create the file inside it. In this video, you learned about creating files within Python using the append and write modes and inserting single or multi-line content into the file. You already know how to handle files in Python, but do you know how to read the content of a file? Being able to read files is essential when working with stored data in Python, and Python offers several built-in functions to make this easier. The three methods we'll explore in this video are read, read line, and read lines. Let's start with read. The read method returns the entire content of the file as a string that will contain all the characters. You can also pass in an integer to return only the specified number of characters in the file. The second method to read files in Python is readLine. Let's explore this method. The readLine function returns a single line as a string. If, for example, you have a file with two lines of text that say, this is the first line and this is the second line, the read file function will return as the output, only the first line of text, this is the first line. The read line function can also include an integer argument for returning a specified number of characters on a single line. Let's say you use the same testing file, but pass an integer of 10. Your output will be the first 10 characters of the first line. In this case, the words this is and the letters th for a total of 10 characters. The third method to read files in Python is read lines. Let me demonstrate this method. The read lines method reads the entire contents of the file and then returns it in an ordered list. This allows you to iterate over the list or pick out specific lines based on a condition. If, for example, you have a file with four lines of text and pass a length condition, the read files function will return the output, all the lines in your file in the correct order. Files are stored in directories and they have paths. 
Reading files from the same directory is straightforward. You only need the name of the file. When working with different locations, however, it's important that you know the difference between absolute and relative paths. Let's start with absolute paths. Absolute paths contain a leading forward slash or drive label. An absolute file path includes all the information you need to locate a file, whether you are in that file's directory or not. Relative paths normally don't contain any reference to the root directory and are normally relative to the calling file. A relative file path only includes the information you need to locate a file in your current working directory. I'm now going to demonstrate how you can read files in Python. I start with a simple sample txt file. It just has some text with a couple of lines that I'll use to demo some of the options there are for reading in files. I start by using with open and I pass in my file name, which is sample.txt. I just want to read in the content, so I set the mode to be R and I assign it to a file variable. The first option to read a file is to print the entire contents of the file. To do this, I use the function print file.read and I click on the run button. Notice that the entire contents of the file is printed out as is. The second option allows me to print out only a certain section of the file. For example, let's say I only want to print out the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. That's 44 characters. I can pass in a parameter to the read function, which tells the function to read in the first 44 characters. To do this, I enter the number 44, and you notice that it prints out only the first line when I click run. The way this works is that it starts at the very beginning based on the index of zero, and 44 is the last character that needs to be printed out. In this way, I can control what sections are printed out. The third option I have is to read in a line. So the function I want is dot read line, and it will only take in the very first line from the file. I click on run and it prints out only the first line of text within that file. The fourth option is to use the dot read lines function that will return a list of lines. I click on run and you notice that the text in the file is now wrapped in square brackets. Lastly, because it's a list, I can assign it to a variable. For example, I can say data equals file dot read lines, and then I can write a for loop for x in data. I print the value of x, and then when I click on run, you'll notice that the list items are printed out line by line. Something to note is that when you use the with open and you get as file, it returns a list by default. I can just change the for loop so that it points to the file variable. When I click run, the same option is returned. These are just some of the methods you can use in Python for reading in files. You should now be able to describe how to read files in Python and demonstrate how to output different formats using the read, read line, and read lines functions. You've reached the end of this module on basic programming with Python. During this module, you've received an introduction to Python functions and data structures, and explored how Python deals with errors, exceptions, and file handling. Now it's time to recap the key points of this module. As with most programming languages, functions are the basis for creating actions in Python. And by completing the first lesson in this module, you should now be able to declare a function in Python, pass data into a function, return data from a function, and explain scoping at a basic level. In order to use functions efficiently across a project, it's important to determine their accessibility across different levels of code. In this lesson, you also learned how to identify the four scopes, Describe how functions control scope at different levels. Explain data structures and describe the concept of lists in Python. Python has several built-in data structures to help you to organize and store your data for easy access. And you've learned about the most common ones. On successfully completing the second lesson, you should now be able to identify list methods, explain what types can be stored in a list, describe how to iterate over a list, and explain the main uses of tuples, sets, dictionaries, and quags. Python file handling and exceptions were topics in the final lesson in this module. Having completed this lesson, you should be able to 
Identify how to create and manipulate files with the open function. Describe how to read files in Python and demonstrate how to output different formats and store file contents in data structures. This module gave you the opportunity to get started with basic Python programming. Well done. That's one more step towards becoming a Python developer. Developers can structure their code in many different ways. Python allows for object-oriented, procedural, and functional programming models, or as they are often called, paradigms. In this video, I'll focus on procedural programming, which is like writing step-by-step -step instructions that a program executes. It's an important stepping stone to object-oriented programming. Therefore, as a new developer, it's important to learn more about it. The main purpose of a programming model is to structure your code. That structure makes it easier to update the code and create new functionality within the code. But there's no one perfect model that's a solution to coding structures. And sometimes a combination of approaches works best. Procedural programming structures code into procedures, sometimes called subroutines or functional sections of code. Because of this approach, the code is made up of logical steps to complete a specific task. For example, adding two numbers to return their sum. I can add together the numbers five and 10 with a short piece of code. Now I want to add together the numbers eight and four. However, the code I wrote was specifically to add five and 10. For my new numbers, I must create another similar piece of code to do the calculation. That would not be a very efficient way to code. Instead, I change the code into a function that will accept two numbers as arguments and return the sum. With this function, I don't declare the actual numbers as variables. Instead, I use the parameters a and b. Less code is needed. But something more important has happened. I now have the function called sum, which can be reused as many times as I like with many different sets of numbers. In programming, there is a principle called dry, don't repeat yourself. And it's all about reducing duplication in code. The original code I wrote to add two numbers together to return their sum is a good example of what not to do because I had to write the code twice to accommodate the second set of numbers. A guideline to keep in mind is to create functions that can be reused throughout your application. Let's examine another example. This time, for calculating the total of a bill and adding tax to it. The code will be presented in four sections to help you focus on what each procedure does. First, the build total function accepts a build as a parameter and loops through it to calculate the total build and return its total. The calculate tax function accepts two parameters, the percentage and the bill total. Then it returns the total amount of tax to be added to the bill, which is also rounded off to two decimal places. The food bill, which contains its items, represents a customer's bill which is static, but could also be changed to an input to accept data from the user to dynamically create a bill. The last few sections will call the two functions to calculate the bill and tax, and then print each out along with the overall total. Could you identify the subroutines or functional sections of the code? And did you note how these sections reuse one another? Now let's put the four subroutines together to examine the four ways in which the footprint of the code is reduced by procedural programming. It's best to inspect the code by starting at the end. Tax total reuses food total. Food total reuses bill total and food bill. Calculate tax reuses bill total. And bill total reuses food bill. In summary, the advantages of the procedural paradigm are, it's easy for beginners to learn and get started. Procedures can be reused by other parts of the code. Code is easy to understand because each procedure is broken into specific tasks. Procedural programming does have some disadvantages, including it can be harder to maintain and extend. In some cases, it doesn't relate well to real world objects. Data is exposed throughout the whole program. Procedural programming has both its advantages and disadvantages. As you learn more as a new developer, you will be better able to decide if it's the best approach to a specific piece of coding or not. In this video, you'll learn about algorithms. An algorithm is a series of steps to complete a given task or solve a problem. 
On a day-to-day -day basis, you use algorithms all the time to complete tasks. One such example is following a recipe to make an egg omelette. First, you have the list of ingredients to use in your omelette. This can be called your input. Next is the method or the instructions to follow step-by-step -step to create your dish. Finally, you complete the omelette, your output. The steps to make the omelette are the same every time. An algorithm in programming works in a similar way. In programming, algorithms are used to solve a multitude of problems that range from simple to very complex. The key to understanding and creating an algorithm is to break the problem into smaller parts, just like the egg omelette recipe. That way, you build up the steps to complete the algorithm that will resolve the overall problem. Now, let's explore a practical application of algorithms in coding. I'm going to demonstrate a particular algorithm that checks if a word is a palindrome. A palindrome is a word that can be spelled the same both backwards and forwards. For example, the word race car is a palindrome because I can spell it forward as R-A-C-E-C-A-R -E and backwards it's still the same, R-A-C-E-C-A-R. -E to be able to check if a word is a palindrome, I need to use an algorithm. As mentioned earlier, an algorithm is a series of steps to solve a problem. Let me break down the problem. I know the string in my example race car has an index and I need to check if the index at the front of the string is equal to the index at the end of the string. In this way, I can compare the two values at the indexes. So I print str0 because that's the first index. And I also print str6 because that's the last index. I can just count that up to double check. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then I click on Run. The output is the two values I need to compare, both of which are the letter R, at the beginning and at the end of race car. Now I'm going to break down our problem into smaller steps. First, I need to check if the value of index 0 is equal to the value of the last index, 6, which in this case is R. Then I need to check that the next or second character, which is index 1, is equal to the second last character, which is index 5. Finally, I need to check if character 2 is equal to character 4. What I need to do is to check if these conditions are true or false. So let's check how I can write this out in some code. I begin by creating a function def is palindrome, and I know that it will accept a single parameter called string, which I've entered. Now I want to get the starting index as well as the end index. I put the start index into a variable that equals zero. Every string will always start at the index zero, and then the end index is going to be the length of the string. So I enter end index equals len function str and then minus one. This is because a string always starts at zero, and I have to think about the last index. Next, what I want to do is iterate through the string itself and compare the starting index with the end index characters to validate that they are the same. To do this, I create a for loop by typing 4x in str, and I'll make the comparison within the for loop. I can check if the first index is equal to the last index, and since the two characters r and r are the same, it'll continue to be true. But it would be quicker for me to check if it's false because then I'll know straight away if it's not a palindrome. So I do an if statement and I use the string being passed in as the parameter. Then I use the start index to get the character. And then I check if it's not equal to the string within the end index. If this condition is met, it will return false, which confirms that it's not a palindrome. But if the condition is never met outside the for loop, then it returns true, which confirms that it's a palindrome. I've done all the checks across the starting index and the end index, and it returns back to the condition of true to confirm that it's a palindrome. Now I'm going to test the algorithm to verify that it works. I use a print statement. I call the isPalindrome function, and I pass in race car because I know that it's a palindrome. I click on run, and it returns the value of true. If I change race car to race cars, and I run it again, the condition of false is returned. This is an example of creating an algorithm in code to solve a problem. It has a series of steps that have to be followed to resolve the problem in code to give back the condition of, is the string a palindrome or not? Now you know how useful algorithms can be as a step-by-step -step way to solve a problem with coding. An algorithm can be used to solve problems, whether small or complex. 
Once the steps of an algorithm are created, they will then execute the same way each time the algorithm is used. As a developer, your main task will be to write code to suit business needs. That code will have to go through what's called refactoring. This means that you rewrite or rework the code to make it easier to manage or to run more efficiently. Refactoring is a standard part of the software development cycle. Making code easier to manage may be straightforward, but what about making it faster or making it perform better? To determine how to make code faster or perform better, you must be able to measure it. Code is measured by time and space. Time is measured by how long it takes, and space is about how much memory it uses. Big O notation has different complexities or categories ranging from horrible to excellent, and it's used to measure an algorithm's efficiency in terms of time and space. Let's explore the different kinds of time complexities. First, constant time. This is an algorithm that will always run under the same time and space regardless of the size. Take a dictionary for example. To get the value of an item, you need to have the key. The key is a direct pointer to the value and does not require any iterations to find it. It's considered constant. Second is a linear time algorithm. This will grow depending on the size of the input. For example, if I have an array of numbers with a range of 100, it will run very fast. But if it's increased to a million, it will take a lot longer to complete. The size in this case affects the running time of the code. Third, a logarithmic time algorithm refers to the running time of the input against the number of operations. I can take a linear approach to try to find a number out of 100. Let's say the number is 97. In a linear equation, it will take 96 iterations before it's found. This is because it must iterate through each item one by one until it finds the target value. Using a binary search, I can drastically cut down the iterations and find it under seven iterations. This is measured by logarithmic time. The binary search works by splitting the list into two parts each time to check if the target is less than or greater than one. Fourth, quadratic time refers to a linear operation of each value of the input data squared. This is often a nested list as in this for loop. This for loop is considered quadratic time as the outer loop will need to iterate in a linear way 10 times. But it also has to iterate the inner loop the same 10 times for each single outer loop. This means its total iterations are 10 times 10, which is 100. Fifth and last is exponential time, which is an algorithm that doubles with each iteration. The Fibonacci sequence is a prime example of this. Refactoring code can be a big task, but understanding algorithmic complexity and how it's calculated makes it easier to optimize code. Now that you know about constant, linear, logarithmic, quadratic, and exponential time, you are one step closer to your goal of being a developer. Perhaps you've heard of functional programming. It uses a different paradigm than other models such as object-oriented. It's particularly adept at processing large amounts of data at high speeds. This video will get you started with what functional programming is. Later in the lesson, you'll explore topics such as pure functions, recursion, reversing a string, and useful Python functions such as map and filter. Let's start by exploring the role of a function. Functions take some input, process it, and then produce some output. There are two types of functions, traditional and pure. Pure functions will always do the same thing and return the same result, no matter how many times they are called. There are several differences between traditional and pure, so let's list them. Traditional functions can access and modify variables on the global state, but pure functions cannot. Both traditional functions and pure functions can access variables in the local state. Traditional functions can change args, whereas pure functions cannot. And lastly, the output of traditional functions does not depend on inputs. However, the output of pure functions does depend on input. Functional programming, in essence, is a programming paradigm that utilizes functions for clean, consistent, and maintainable code. Compared to object-oriented programming, which we'll learn about later, functional programming differs by design. Functional programming does not change the data outside the scope of the function. This simply means that the function should avoid modifying the input data or arguments being passed. 
Instead, it should only return the completed result of the intended function being called. Functions are considered standalone or independent, and this aids the clean and elegant nature of the code. In fact, many of the strongly typed object-oriented languages have incorporated functional programming into their structure. In order to support functional programming, the language itself needs to allow functions to be passed as an argument and also return a function to its caller. In Python, functions are what is known as first-class citizens, which essentially means they have the same level of strings and numbers. They can be assigned to a variable, passed as an argument, or returned to its caller. Let's explore a few examples of functions available in Python. Take, for instance, the sorted function. The sorted function accepts a list of items and then returns that list in a sorted order. You can use a sorted function to list items in alphabetical order. By passing a list of coffees to the sorted function, the return sorts the list in alphabetical order. The great thing about functional programming is that the logic behind certain tasks is already built in for you. Functions are reusable and thus save a lot of development time. But did you know that you can also create your own functions specific to your own requirements? Let's look at a simple example. Imagine you want to spell the names of the coffees backwards. This might not be entirely useful, but it's a good showcase of functional. You can create your own simple reverse function to do this. Define the function. Let's call it reverse and assign the variable str to it. Now return the value of str with a slice function. You'll learn more about the slice function later in the lesson. Then assign a variable to get the result to the map function. The map function accepts as its first argument the reverse function and then the iterable, coffees. It will then automatically handle the iterations to go through each coffee and apply the reverse function to it. In this video, you have learned what functional programming is and you were introduced to examples of built-in functions in Python. A good coder will try to keep code clean, make it easier to debug, and ensure it's extendable. The great thing is that pure functions can help you do all that. In this video, you'll learn what pure functions are and how you can use them in functional programming. It's important to understand that there is a clear difference between traditional and pure functions. A pure function is a function that does not change or have any effect on a variable, data, list, or set beyond its own scope. For example, if you have a list with a global scope, a pure function cannot add something to that list or alter it in any way. Let's explore an example function and then determine if it is a pure function or not. This code includes a list on the global scale and a function called add to a single parameter called item. The value of item is then set to four. The output is one, two, three, four. What do you think? Is this a pure function? No, it's not a pure function as it changes the global list by appending the item which is passed as an argument. In order to change it to a pure function, you need to think how to extend the function to accept a list as an argument. Add the item to the list without modifying the original list. And how to return a new list with a newly added item. The solution is to create a new list and copy or clone the data from the original list. Let's revisit the code to make some changes. This time, you make a copy of the original list. The new item is added to the new list. Then the new list is returned to the caller. Now that you have a better idea of what a pure function is, let's review a few benefits of pure functions. Firstly, with pure functions, you always know what the outcome will be. Pure functions are consistent snippets of code that do exactly what they are intended to do. Thirdly, pure functions include the ability to cache since you know the return is always going to be the same. Lastly, pure functions lend themselves well to a multi-threaded program. In multi-threaded programs, more than one process could run concurrently, which creates many threads of data. Pure functions will help prevent changes on the global scope, assuring data stays reliable. Now I think it's time to offer you a step-by-step -step demonstration in VS Code of how to alter a normal function to a pure function. Pure functions are especially useful because they are easier to read, better to debug, and more consistent. I'll now take you through a simple example to demonstrate how to create a pure function. I'll start by creating a function that does not behave like a pure function. 
and then I'll tweak it until it's a pure function. First, I create a list called my list, and inside it, I add three numbers, one, two, and three. Then I add a simple function called add to list, which takes a single variable called item. This function will return my list and append the new item that is being passed through. Below that, I call the function add to list and assign the value of four to the variable item. Finally, I add a print statement of my list so that I can focus on the output in the console. I click on the run button and the numbers one, two, three, and four are printed out. This means that my list now contains the inserted number four as well because the function appended it to the existing list. What do you think? Is this a pure function? No, it's not, because the data has been manipulated at the global scope from inside the scope of the function. Let's try to turn it into a pure function. The first thing I'm going to change is how the function is being called. I want to pass in a new argument. I type new list equals add to list. I keep the value of four, and I'll also print out the new list below the first print statement to compare the output. Now let's make some modifications to the function itself. I add a simple append to my list, which is going to take in the item variable. I type my list dot append and item in parentheses. Then I want to return back the list. I type return my list. Now I click on run and the output in the console indicates that both my list and new list include the values of one to four. It's clear that the function is still not a pure function. Why? Because even though it's returning a new variable, it still has a reference to the my list variable. Let's try something else to turn it into a pure function. This time, I'll accept a parameter called LST for the variable item. I type LST, comma, in front of item in the parentheses. I also change the append statement to LST dot append item. And I also change the return action to return LST. Finally, I change the call action by passing in my list comma inside the parentheses before the value of four. Let's run that. And once again, both lists contain the values of one to four. The reason for this is that the function is still using the list as an argument and it's still being updated from within the function. So ultimately, in order to create a pure function, the problem that I have to solve is how to create a new list. And then I need to solve how to get all the values from the list that's being passed through and then return the new list back to the calling action. Let's give it another try. This time I create a new list by creating a copy. In the function, I type the name of the new list nl equals lst dot copy and a set of parentheses. Now, instead of putting the passed values into the lst, I'll put it into the copy. So I type nl dot append, and then I also change the return action to return nl. I clear the console screen so that I can focus on the output and click on run. And finally, I get two different results. My list is printed with the values one, two, and three, but the second print statement for new list includes the values of one to four. This function is now a pure function because it adds a value to a list, but it doesn't manipulate the original list outside the function. In this demonstration, you've learned what a pure function is and what you need to do to change a function that's affecting a list on the global scope to a pure function that does not interfere with the original list. It's likely that you'll use pure functions regularly in your programming career because pure functions will keep your code cleaner, easier to debug, and easier to extend. In programming, recursion is used for solving problems that can be broken down into smaller repetitive problems. It's especially good for working on things that have many possible branches and are too complex for an iterative approach. One good example of this would be searching through a file system. So what is recursion? Recursion is essentially a function that calls itself. Recursion creates a pattern of repeating itself over and over and over. So what does that mean from a coding perspective? In this example, a function accepts a single argument and inside the function, it has some logic to deal with the problem it's trying to solve. The key part is the return. In the code, the return statement is returning the same function. Recursion is quite similar to a for loop. It will iterate, or in the case of a recursive function, call itself multiple times. 
but a warning. When you create a recursive function, you must always consider the result. If you don't, it will spin into an infinite loop and suck up all the memory until the program eventually crashes or gets terminated. Let's compare how to use a looping and a recursive solution to find the factorial of a number that can be solved. Let's start with the looping solution. The looping function accepts a single integer called n as an argument and first checks if the number is less than zero. If it is, it returns zero as you can't have a factorial negative number. The else condition sets the factorial to one and then loops through the range of the argument, which is five in this case. The loop will calculate one times two times three times four times five, which will give the answer as 120, the factor of five. Now let's explore the recursive solution to the same problem. The recursive function is simpler than more compact. The main reason for this is that you no longer need the for loop to do the iteration of the n argument. The first line of the function verifies that the number is one and returns one if true. The else condition multiplies the argument n by calling the find factorial recursive function and passing in n minus one. Recursion can be difficult to understand. By way of explanation, let's demonstrate exactly what happened as the function calls itself. The function is being called over and over, and the part that changes is the value being passed into the function each time. The argument of n, or 5 in this case, is decreased by 1 each time until it finally is 1. This stops the function from being called again and exits out of the recursive process. So how exactly did this code get the result of 120? This is provided by the return statement. It keeps a reference to the incremented value, and this is the final return after it has been completed. Right. It's time to review the advantages and disadvantages of recursion. First, the advantages are recursive code can make your code neater and less bulky. Complex tasks can be broken down into easier to read subproblems. Generation of sequences can be easier to understand than nested loops. But there are disadvantages. It can be harder to follow the logic in recursive code. In terms of memory, they are expensive and sometimes inefficient. It can also be difficult to debug and step through the code. You should now be able to explain what recursion is and how it can be used to solve problems. I believe you'll benefit from using recursions in your code in the future. One of the basic ways to test a Python developer's problem solving skills is by asking them how they would reverse a string. Knowing how to do this is very useful in the production environment. Some programming languages have a built-in function to reverse a string. Python doesn't have such a function, but fortunately, due to the language's flexibility, there are several ways to do this. In this video, I will show you two ways to reverse a string in Python. First, I'll demonstrate how to do this with the slice function. To start off, I create a file called stringreversal.py. The format or syntax of a slice function is that it always starts with the name of a string, open square bracket, the start parameter, colon, the stop parameter, another colon, and then the step parameter, followed by a close square bracket. I'll add a hash symbol in front of this line to indicate that it is a note. This is called the extended slice syntax. The start and stop parameters are the indices between which the function manipulates the string. The step parameter is the hops or jumps the function makes while it traverses a given string. I will now first define a string, then manipulate the string with the slice function, and finally print the string. I'll call the string trial and assign the word reversal as its value by typing trial equal sign and the word reversal between double quotes. To manipulate the string, I create a new string called new trial. Now, I assign a value to new trial with the slice function. I type an equal sign, trial, and open square bracket. To instruct Python to use the entire string, I leave the value of the start and stop parameters empty. I simply type two colons and then add the value of the step parameter as the number minus one, followed by a closed square bracket. The negative value of the step parameter indicates that the string needs to be traversed from the right, one index position at a time, instead of the conventional method of starting from the left. Finally, I print the manipulated string to test if it works. I type print and between parentheses, I add the string name new trial. I click on run. Great! In the terminal, the string has successfully been reversed. 
In summary, the entire string is traversed from right to left one index position at a time. This new sliced object is then copied to another string, which is then rearranged and printed. It should be noted that you can use the slice function to manipulate the same variable. I only used a second variable in this example for clarity. The slice function is the simplest way to reverse a string. I will now demonstrate another way you can use the slice function to reverse a string, this time using recursion. I start by creating a new file and saving it as stringreversal2.py. Next, I define a function and pass a string variable to it, namely str. I type def and the function name string reverse and str between parentheses followed by a colon. This function will act as a conditional if statement. I type if len open parenthesis str close parenthesis two equal signs the number is zero followed by a colon. On the next line, I'll return the value of str. Now let's add the else statement. The else statement will recursively call the slice function, but with a modified string every time. On the next line, I add else and a colon. Then on the next line, I type return string reverse str. But before I close the parentheses, I add a slice function by typing open square bracket, the number one and a colon followed by the closed square bracket. This time, the string is traversed from the front, skipping the first character in every loop. And this first character skipped is appended to the remaining string. So I now add a plus sign, str, and the value zero in between brackets. Outside the function, I give str the value of reversal. Then I create a second variable that will store the value of the return string. I'll call this variable reverse and assign to it the value of the function. Finally, I add a print statement for the variable reverse. Let's run the code. Success! The string displays in reversed order in the terminal. Essentially, the function calls itself by passing a different string in each recursion and appending the element it has kept right after it. In this video, you learned two different methods to reverse a string in Python. The first by just using a slice function, and the second by using a slice function with recursion. Let's say I want to generate a list using an existing list. The general process would involve applying some sort of operation to each element of the existing list and using those outputs to generate the new list. There are many ways you could do this in Python. In this video, you will learn how to process a list with the map and filter functions. My file contains a list called menu, and it contains a list of various coffees. I want to filter this list for specific coffees. Say I want to print all coffees that start with the letter C. I will do this by creating a function through which I will pass the list to compare it to the letter C. Then I will demonstrate how to get the output first as a map and then as a filter. Before I start, let me talk you through the format of a map function, but keep in mind the filter function follows the same format. To create a map, I type map and then need to define its arguments. The map function accepts two arguments. The first argument is an actual function. In this case, it will be the function that I will use to match values based on a condition. The second argument is the articles that will be passed through that function. In this case, the coffees from my menu list. Now, let's create the function with the condition. I press enter twice to move the map function down. I type def and the name of the function, which is find coffee. I then add a single parameter coffee between the parentheses and a colon after the closed parenthesis. The coffee parameter I added will be the coffee from my list. I now need to check if the first character of the items in the list matches the letter C. To do this, I will create an if statement by typing if coffee and pass in zero to set the action on the first letter of the coffee variable. I then type the equal sign twice followed by the letter C and a colon. I press enter, and on the next line, I type return coffee if the statement is true. To use the map function, I'm going to assign it to a variable called map coffee. I follow that by entering an equal sign and the map. Now I can pass in the arguments for the map function. Remember, the first argument is the function itself. I enter the function name find coffee. It is important to note that I am not calling the function. I'm just passing it in like an argument. 
I add a comma after find coffee, and then the second argument, the article, in this case, menu. Finally, I want to print out the value of map coffee so you can focus on the results in the terminal. I click on run, and in the terminal, I receive a map object as output. The next step is to iterate through the map object. I type for x in map coffee, print out the value of x. I click on run again, and now I get the output as a map. In the terminal, a list appears with a lot of values that say none, except cappuccino and cortado. And that is because cappuccino and cortado are the two matches for the letter C in the function. The great thing about the map function is that I did not have to create a for loop to go through the list. The map function takes the function as an argument and passes the menu list values into the function one by one. So that handles the iteration for me, which makes it quite useful. Next, I'm going to demonstrate how to get the output with the filter function. To start, I'll comment out the section of the code related to the map function and clear my terminal. The filter function works much the same as the map function. I declare a variable called filter coffee and assign the filter function to it. Again, I add the two arguments, namely the find coffee function and menu. Then I print out the variable filter coffee. I click on run and receive a filter object as output. Now I will iterate through the filter object just like I did with the map object. I type for x in filter coffee, print out the value of x. I'll clear the terminal now and click run. This time, only cappuccino and cortado are returned. Why is that? Let me explain the difference between a map and a filter function. A map takes all objects in the list and allows you to apply a function to it. A filter also allows you to take in all objects in the list and runs through a function, but it creates a new list and only returns values where the evaluated function returns true. That is why there are no none values displayed in the output for the filter function. You now know how map and filter work in Python and should be able to also explain the difference between the two functions. Programming languages are built upon certain models to ensure that code behaves predictably. Python primarily follows what is known as an object-oriented paradigm or model. As you'll soon discover, object-oriented programming or OOP relies heavily on simplicity and reusability to improve workflow. By the end of this video, you'll be familiar with the object-oriented programming paradigm. You'll also be able to identify the four main concepts that define object-oriented programming. Programming paradigms are a strategy for reducing code complexity and determining the flow of execution. There are several different paradigms such as declarative, procedural, object-oriented, function, logic, event-driven, flow-driven, and more. These paradigms are not mutually exclusive so programs and programming languages can opt for multiple paradigms. For example, Python is primarily object-oriented, but it's also procedural and functional. In simple terms, a paradigm can be defined as a style of writing or program. OOP is one of the most widely used paradigms today due to the growing popularity of languages that use it, such as Java, Python, C++, and more. But the OOP's ability to translate real-world problems into code is arguably the biggest factor in its success. OOP has high modularity, which makes code easier to understand, makes it reusable, adds layers of abstraction, and allows for code blocks to be moved between projects. To help you better understand OOP, I'll first clarify some of its key components, which are classes, objects, and methods. A class is a logical code block that contains attributes and behavior. In Python, a class is defined with a class keyword. The attributes can be variables and the behavior can be functions inside of it. You can create instances from these classes which are called objects. In other words, a class provides a blueprint for creating an object. In more practical terms, let's say you want to record the attributes of employees at Little Lemon, such as their position and employment status. You could create a class called employee and conveniently bundle those attributes in one place. Next, let's discuss objects. As mentioned, an object is an instance of a class and you can create any number of them. The state of an object comprises its attributes and behavior and each one has a unique identifier to distinguish it from other instances. The attributes and behavior of the class are what define the state of the object. 
For example, you can create the object emp1 by calling the employee class. Once called, you can define the position and employment status attributes as shift, lead, and full time, respectively. In code, this would be written as emp1 equals employee, followed by shift lead and ft in parentheses. This is a case of instantiation or creating an instance of a class. Finally, there are methods which are the functions defined inside a class that determine the behavior of an object instance. Let's say you want the employee object to output a string that states their position. You would first declare their function intro in the employee class and then call it on an object to get the output. Now that you know about classes, objects, and methods, let's explore the concepts that OOP hinges upon. The first one is inheritance, which is the creation of a new class by deriving from an existing one. The original is called the parent or superclass, while any derivatives are referred to as the subclass or child class. The next concept is called polymorphism. It's a word that means having many forms. In the context of Python, Polymorphism means that a single function can act differently depending on the object that calls it. For example, the built-in plus operator works differently for different data types. In the case of integer data types, the built-in plus operator performs addition operations such as 3 plus 5 equals 8. On the other hand, in the case of string data types, the built-in plus operator performs a concatenation or combining two strings together. This ability of modifying functionality is called polymorphism. The third concept is encapsulation. Broadly, this means that Python can bind methods and variables from direct access by wrapping them within a single unit of scope, such as a class. Encapsulation helps prevent unwanted modifications, in effect reducing the occurrence of errors in output. And finally, there is a concept of abstraction. This refers to the ability to hide implementation details to make data safer and more secure. Note that Python does not support abstraction directly and uses inheritance to achieve it. This is something that you'll explore in more detail later. There are some other important concepts in OOP, such as method overloading, method overriding, constructors, and more, which you'll learn about in more detail later. In this video, you became familiar with OOP paradigm and the four concepts that support it. Inheritance, polymorphism, encapsulation, and abstraction. See you next time. Classes have the ability to combine data and functionality, which is a very useful feature when you are coding. By the end of this video, you'll be able to explain what classes, instances, and objects are in Python. You'll also be able to create a class, instantiate it, and access its variables and methods. You may have also heard of classes discussed in terms of attributes and behaviors. In general, attributes refer to variables declared in a class, while behaviors are associated with the methods in a class. Creating a class creates a new type of object from which you can create instances. An important thing to keep in mind is that everything in Python is an object or derived from the object class. To demonstrate how this all works, I'll create a class that I can then derive objects from. In a new VS Code file, I first type the keyword class, followed by the name my class and a colon. I do need to take one more step so that Python doesn't throw an error, and that is to type the pass keyword on the next line. The pass keyword plays the role of a placeholder when nothing needs to be executed. In practice, this tells Python that I won't do anything with this class just yet. Next, let's create an object for this class. I create a variable called my class and then assign the class to it by typing equals my class followed by parentheses. If I run this code, the output shows that it has executed without errors. However, just to check that it's working as expected, let's add a print statement to the class. So that would be print followed by the string hello in parentheses. When I run the code again, the word hello appears in the output. Let me clear the terminal before continuing. You may have noticed that I used the same name for both the class and its object, but the object name can really be anything. For example, if I change the object name to myc and run the code once more, it will execute the same as before. Everything I've typed is part of the instantiation process in Python, which involves three key steps. One, class definition. 
two, creating a new instance, and three, initializing the new instance. Since everything in Python is an object, it makes sense to follow naming conventions to make things less confusing later. In this case, I have my class for the class object and myc for the instance object. There is a third type of object called the method object, which you can use to call a method whenever it's needed. Classes mainly perform two kinds of operations, attribute references and instantiation. I've already written an example of the latter, so let's try building an attribute reference this time. First, I create a variable a for the class object and assign it a value of five. To print this variable, I first need to refer to the class. So under the instance object, I type print and then my class dot a. When I run the code, it returns five in the output. To confirm that the class reference is necessary, I delete my class from the print statement and run the code again, and Python throws an error. So I'll correct the code and put my class back in. Let me clear the terminal quickly before continuing. So you know what happens if you reference a class object, but what if you reference an instance object? Let's find out by typing a print statement for myc.a and then running it. In the output, I get five, which shows that attribute reference still works with instance objects. Finally, let's finish up by creating a method inside this class. I'll use the def keyword and follow it with hello, a pair of parentheses and a colon. On the next line, I type a print statement for the string hello world. I'll also delete the first print statement to avoid confusion. To call this method, I add a new print statement at the end of the document for myc.hello, which uses the instance object. This should work just as I successfully called a variable through an instance object, right? Running the code results in an error, so methods are not quite as simple. Fortunately, I can resolve this by adding the keyword self within the parentheses of the method as defined in the class. Running the code again produces the words hello world in the output. You'll also find the word none printed below as there is no return value from the given function. That's a brief demonstration of classes, instances, and objects. I created a class, then I was able to instantiate it and access its variables and methods. Code reusability is the use of existing code to build new software. Reusability is a core programming concept. By the end of this video, you'll not only be able to create a class and instantiate it with variables and methods, but you'll also discover how referencing the same variables and methods in separate instances can produce different outcomes, meaning that the code is reusable. I'll start by creating a new file called recipes.py, where I'll also create a class called recipe. Before continuing, let's also explore two special methods in Python. The first one is the new method, which is responsible for creating and returning a new empty object. To write it, I start with the def keyword, followed by double underscore new. It then appears as a suggestion, so I click on it to fill out the rest. The CLS here is not a keyword, but rather a convention. It acts as a placeholder for passing the class as its first argument, which will be used for creating the new empty object. The second method is the init method, which is similar to what is known as a constructor in some other programming languages. It takes the object created using the new method, along with other arguments, to initialize the new object being created. I write it with the def double underscore init, and then choose the first suggestion that pops up. The init method takes the new object as its first argument. The self keyword here is another convention. It has no function itself, but serves as a placeholder for self-reference by the instance object. So let's delete the two example methods and then write some code that demonstrates how to use the state of the object to your advantage. I begin with an init method, which I then use to initialize a few values. I do this for the value dish by typing self.dish equals dish. I then do the same for the values items and time. Before moving forward, I want to check that the arguments in the initializer will match those of my instances. To do so, I add dish, items, and time after self. Imagine a real world scenario where a restaurant chef wants information about the recipes they have been using. So let's write a class that will help them with that. 
I have the variables dish, items, and time, in which items will hold the recipe ingredients. I now write a function to produce a string out of this information. I type def contents and then self in parentheses. On the next line, I write a print statement for the string the plus self.dish plus has plus self.items plus and takes plus self.time plus min to prepare. Here we'll use the backslash character to force a new line and continue the string on the following line. For this to print correctly, I need to convert the self.items and self.time references to strings by appending str at the beginning and encasing each reference in parentheses. Now that I have a class set up, let's use it to create a pizza instance. I write this as pizza equals recipe, opening parenthesis, the string pizza, comma, opening square bracket, cheese, comma, bread, comma, tomato, closing square bracket, comma, and 45 to represent the time followed by the closing parenthesis. I also want a pasta object. So let's copy and paste the code for the pizza object and change the object name to pasta, the ingredients to penne and sauce, and the preparation time to 55. Now that I have a class and two instances, let's see if I can access the instance attributes and methods. I write two print statements for pizza.items and pasta.items. When I run the code, I find that despite passing the same function and variable items, the two instances produce different contents. So next, let's try printing the instance method contents over pizza. Before we move forward, let's clear the terminal so we can more clearly see what the output will be. I type another print statement for pizza.contents and empty parentheses. I run the code once more, and the output uses the class method to print a line stating the pizza has cheese, tomato, and bread, and takes 45 minutes to prepare. That's a demonstration of creating a class and instantiating it with variables and methods, then referencing the same variables and methods in separate instances to yield different outcomes. Let's try to solve a problem that may occur for managers at a restaurant. Because the managers are busy running the restaurant, they have limited time to deal with the needs of employees. The current system for paying wages requires managers to update each other every time an employee requests payment. Because this is cumbersome, they would like to implement an automated approach. So what can be done? Fortunately, there's a way to reduce the number of steps using instances. By the end of this video, you'll be able to explain what instance variables and methods are. You'll also know how to use them to change the state of an instance object. So let's write some code to help those busy restaurant managers. Let's start a new file called paymentinfo.py. In this file, I'll create the class payslips and initialize three variables in it called name, pay status, and amount. I start by typing class payslips and then on the next line, I call an init function with def double underscore init, and then select the triggered suggestion. For the variables, I type each one in the format self.variable equals variable. Next, I'll create two functions, one to display the status of the payments and another to update the status. The first function is written as def pay with self in parentheses, followed by self.payment equals yes, on the next line. The second function is def status and contains an if else statement. If self dot payment double equals yes, return self dot name plus is paid plus self dot amount with str appended to the beginning. The second part of the statement is else return self dot name plus is not paid yet. Finally, Let's create instances of this class for the employees. I'll call them Nathan and Roger. I type the first instance, Nathan equals payslips, and in parentheses, Nathan for name, no for payment, and 1000 for amount. For Roger, I copy and paste this instance and set the values to Roger, no, and 3000 respectively. I also need to make sure to pass these values inside the init method, so I type name, payment and amount after self. 
Now I'm ready to call the instant method status to check the status of the payments. I write a print statement for Nathan dot status parentheses and for Roger dot status parentheses. When I run the code, the output all appears on one line, which is not very presentable. I add a new line character between the items in the print statement, which is backslash n. This time, the output is much cleaner. The output states that neither Nathan nor Roger have been paid. But let's say that one manager decides to pay Nathan, so I'll use the pay function to update the status. Remember that the pay function is set up to update the value of the payment variable. I type nathan.pay parentheses and then copy and paste the last print statement. Above this line, I type another print statement with the string after payment. I run the code once more and it now tells me that Nathan was paid 1000, whereas Roger still has not been paid. That's a demonstration of instance methods in action. Now I'll describe the code to you in more detail. Now let's discuss what happened in that coding example in more detail. The two instance objects, which are Nathan and Roger, each have their own states. You may have noticed that when the instance method pay was called to change the state of Nathan, Roger was not affected. This is because the method inside the class is not affected. Rather, it provides a separate blueprint to each instance, which can then be updated for that instance only. In the coding example, I didn't print the variable values after calling the pay function, but if I did, it would show that the payment instance variable for Nathan changed from no to yes, while Roger remained no. Now let's imagine that this code is the basis for an online payment system. It would allow either manager to click on the paid button for an employee, which then updates that employee status. No more back and forth calls. In this video, you learned how to use instance variables and methods to change the state of an instance object without affecting any other instances. When instantiating objects from a class, you may find that the class is missing some properties that you use frequently. In that case, you could decide to make a new class that replicates the first one, but also adds a few more properties. It would be cumbersome to write everything from scratch, but thanks to inheritance, you don't have to. By the end of this video, you'll become familiar with inheritance in terms of child classes being derived from a parent class. Inheritance is a core concept in object-oriented programming generally, and in particular in Python, and it's a major part of code reusability. You may know that everything in Python is an object, but let's explore that idea more closely. It specifically means that every class in Python inherits from a built-in base class called objects, which is found in builtins.objects. In other words, a class declaration such as some class with empty parentheses implies some class with object as its argument. When speaking of class derivation, the originating class is known as the parent class, superclass, or base class. The class which inherits from it is the child class, subclass, or derived class. Any name pairing is acceptable, but the important thing to know is that the child class extends the attributes and behaviors of its parent class. This allows you to do two things. You can add new properties to the child class, and you can modify inherited properties in the child class without affecting the parent. So now let's explore an example of how this is done in Python. Here you have a parent class P, which holds the variable A with a value of seven. Then there is the empty child class C, in which class P is passed as an argument. And finally, a lowercase c represents an instance of child class capital C. If you write a print statement for C dot A and run the code, the output is seven. So even though C itself is empty, it still holds the attributes inherited from P. Keep in mind that any changes in the parent class will also affect any child classes. Now that you have an idea of how inheritance works, let's explore an example that demonstrates the flexibility it provides. I begin by creating a new file called employment.py, and my first step is to create a parent class called employees, where I'll define two variables for first and last names. I do this by typing class, employees, colon, and on a new line, def double underscore init to trigger and select the init method suggestion. 
for the first variable, I type self dot name equals name on a new line. And for the second, I advance another line and type self dot last equals last. I then add name and last to the init argument on line two after the word self. Next, I'll create two child classes that both extend the employee class. The first one I create is supervisors. And to call the employees class, I type class supervisors, open parenthesis, employees, close parenthesis, and a colon. I then need to modify the init method of the supervisors class so that I can add another variable named password. Again, I trigger and select the init method, but this time it already includes the name and last variables. By calling the employees class, the super method has automatically been applied to access the variables there and initialize them within the supervisors class. I proceed with adding the third variable, password, inside of the init method. I then make it an instance variable with the line self.password equals password. Now I'll write another child class called chefs. Again, I extend the employees class by adding employees as a method inside this class. I want this one to contain a new function called leave request. So I type def leave request and then self and days as the variables in parentheses. The purpose of the leave request function is to return a line that specifies the number of days requested. To write this, I type return the string may I take a leave for plus str open parenthesis the word days close parenthesis plus another string days. Now that I have all the classes in place, I'll create a few instances from these classes, one for a supervisor and two others for chefs. First, I type Adrian equals supervisors, followed by the values Adrian and A in parentheses. I can then copy and paste this instance two more times to serve as a template for the chef's instances. The first chef is Emily and will hold the values Emily and E, while the second chef Juno has the values Juno and J. Finally, as an instance of the supervisors class, Adrian needs another value for the password variable, so I'll assign Apple here. Next, let's call the instance method over Emily and pass a value to it. She wants to request three days off, so I type print Emily dot leave request and the number three. I'm also going to add another print statement that will check the value of the instance variable over the supervisor Adrian. I type print Adrian dot password. The third print statement prints the value of Emily's name variable. Now I run the code and get the following outputs. The words, may I take leave for three days from the first print statement, the word apple from the second one, and the word Emily from the third print statement. Note that both the instance variables and methods inside the individual inherited classes are present along with the variables from the parent class. In this video, you've learned how inheritance in Python helps to make code reusable, organized, and less redundant. In this video, you'll learn about abstract classes and methods. If you have an abstract class, you can ensure the functionality of every class that is derived from it. For example, a vehicle could be an abstract class. You can't create a vehicle, but you can derive a car, a tractor, or a boat from a vehicle. The methods we put in the abstract class are guaranteed to be present in the derived class because they must be implemented. If a vehicle has a turn on engine method, then we are sure that any method calls to a derived class that is looking for turn on engine will find it. This could be for reasons of interoperability, consistency, and avoiding code duplication in general. In object oriented programming, the abstract class is a type of class for which you cannot create an instance. Python also does not support abstraction directly, so you need to import a module just to define an abstract class. Furthermore, methods in an abstract class need to be defined before they can be implemented. With all these limitations, one might wonder why you would use abstract classes at all. One of their key advantages is the ability to hide the details of implementation without sacrificing functionality. Implementation in abstract classes can be done in two ways. One is that as base abstract classes lack implementation of their own, 
then methods must be implemented by the derived class. Another possibility is that the super function can be used, but that's a topic for another time. For now, let's focus on the module for defining an abstract class. You may not be familiar with modules right now, but they will be covered in more detail later. For now, it's okay just to follow along. The module is known as the abstract base class or ABC and needs to be imported with some code. After that, you can create a class called some abstract class and pass in the ABC module so that it inherits that class. The next step is to import the abstract method decorator inside the same module. A decorator is a function that takes another function as its argument and gives a new function as its output. It's denoted by the at sign. You may not be familiar with decorators, but for now, it's enough to know that decorators are like helper functions that add functionality to an already existing function. Finally, here you'll define an abstract method which cannot be called on an object of this class. You will be able to call this method over objects of classes that inherit from this class. Similarly, we can define abstract methods with the help of what we call an abstract method decorator present inside the same module. Any given abstract class can consist of one or more abstract methods. However, a class that has abstract class as its parent cannot be instantiated unless you override all the abstract methods present in it first. With that in mind, imagine a scenario in which an employer wants to collect donations from employees for a charitable cause. With your newfound knowledge, let's write some code to make that possible. First, I import the ABC module and its abstract method. Then I create the employee abstract class that calls abstract method to define a method called donate. Note that there's no implementation for this method here. After that, I create the class donation, which derives from the abstract class. Note that this class also overrides the abstract method. I write an implementation for the donate function, which takes a user input stores it in variable A and returns it. Next, I create two employee instances called John and Peter and call the function over each of them. I also create a list amount to which the returned values will be appended. Finally, I have a print statement for amount, which will give the value of the total donations from both employees. In this video, you learned about abstract classes and methods and how to implement them in your code. Up to this point, you've explored class relationships that were relatively straightforward. But what happens when things get complex? How will you know which classes inherit from which? Fortunately, Method Resolution Order, or MRO, provides rules that can help make sense of that. By the end of this video, you'll know how to explain the basic rules of method order resolution and how they apply to inheritance classes. Explain the concept of code linearization with respect to multiple inheritance and deploy method order resolution functions in Python. You've likely encountered some examples of single inheritance where a child class only inherits from a single parent class. But it's important to know that Python has many types of inheritance. The categorization types are based on the number of parent and child classes, as well as the hierarchical order. Including simple inheritance, there are broadly four types of inheritance. The first type is called simple inheritance, which you've already dealt with. There is also multiple inheritance, which involves a child class inheriting from more than one parent. Next is multi-level inheritance, which is inheritance taking place on several levels. Then you have hierarchical inheritance, which concerns how several subclasses inherit from a common parent. And finally, you could say that there is a fifth type called hybrid inheritance, which mixes characteristics of the others. As these inheritance types demonstrate, inheritance becomes increasingly complex as the number of classes in a project grow and become more interdependent. So how do developers solve this issue? With the use of MRO. MRO determines the order in which a given method or attribute is passed through in a search of the hierarchy of classes for its resolution, or in other words, from where it belongs. The order of the resolution is called linearization of a class, and MRO defines the rules it follows. 
The default order in Python is bottom to top and left to right when imagining the inheritance of these Python classes in a tree structure. Let's take the simplest example of single inheritance. The object is first searched in the class of that object and then in its superclass. What about in an example where class Z is inheriting from two classes? Let's say Z is inheriting from classes X and Y. In this instance, the MRO will be Z, Y, and then X. In other words, the MRO works its way bottom to top and then from left to right. But things become much more complicated when more levels are added to the hierarchy. So developers rely on algorithms to build MROs. Old style classes used in-depth first search algorithm or DFS. From Python version three onwards, Python versions have moved to the new style of classes that rely on the C3 linearization algorithm. The implementation of the C3 linearization algorithm is complex and beyond the scope of this lesson. But for now, here's an overview of a few rules that it follows. The algorithm follows monotonicity, which broadly means that an inherited property cannot skip over direct parent classes. It also follows the inheritance graph of the class, and the superclass is visited only after visiting the methods of the local classes. This logic will make more sense later when you explore more complex class relationships in a future lesson. Next, let's take a moment to explore some methods of finding the MRO of a class. First, I'll begin with a demonstration of the MRO attributes or function. Let's take a multi-level inheritance example comprised of three classes class A, class B, and class C. Class A is the parent class, with B and C the respective child classes. In other words, B inherits from A, and C inherits from B. When I print the return for calling the MRO function over class C, the output indeed confirms that this is the order that is followed. So why is this important? Well, imagine that class A has a variable num with value of five. And then class B also has a num variable with a value of nine. Here, the MRO function tells you quickly that class C will inherit the nine value from class B. Finally, let's examine one more function, which is the help function. If I take the code from earlier and replace the MRO function in the print statement with a help function, it provides a much more detailed output with MRO information at the top. It also contains information about the data descriptors and types used inside the code. In this video, you received a brief introduction to method resolution order and how it affects inheritance in different scenarios. These are both very broad topics, but hopefully it helps you understand the complexity of code that is possible in Python. Well done. You've reached the end of this module on programming paradigms. In this module, you explored procedural programming, functional programming, and object-oriented programming. We started the module by saying that procedural programming is considered the easiest and a basic stepping stone to object-oriented programming and the first choice for new developers. Next, you explored functional programming, which in essence is a programming paradigm that utilizes creating functions for clean, consistent, and maintainable code. Lastly, you learned that object-oriented programming is about creating objects that contain both data and methods. These concepts should now make sense to you. It's now time to recap the key lessons you learned and the skills that you gained. With that in mind, let's summarize the key points you learned in this module. You should now be able to describe the concept of procedural programming, describe what algorithms are and how they can be used to solve problems identify how algorithmic complexity is calculated, and recognize how algorithmic complexity can help in improving performance. You should also be able to describe big O notation, explain what functional programming is, explain how pure functions are used in functional programming, and explain recursion and how it can be used to solve problems. What you have learned, however, did not stop here. You should therefore also be able to use different methods to reverse a string in Python. Explain the difference between the map and filter functions. Explain object-oriented programming and the four concepts it is built upon. And describe the relationship between classes and instances in Python. 
finally, having studied the remaining key points in this module, you should now be able to create classes, instantiate classes, access their variables and methods, and change the state of instance objects by using instance variables and methods. This module gave a comprehensive introduction to different programming paradigms in Python. This is essential knowledge that prepares you to be able to create even better programming code. Cars are a major part of our lives that make it easier to move around. But if you needed your car to do more, such as handle driving in the snow or carry large objects, well, you'd probably modify it by adding winter tires or hitching a trailer to it. In a similar way, Python is a powerful language that allows developers to build amazing things, but it can gain even more functionality with the use of modules. In this video, you'll learn about modules in Python and why they are used. You'll also explore the different types of modules and be able to explain where they can be found. Now, you may wonder what a Python module is. Imagine that modules work like instructions to make a pie. Instead of trying to figure out what the steps are to create your pie, you follow the instructions. Modules work in the same way. They are building blocks for adding functionality to your code, so you don't need to continually redo everything. A Python module contains statements and definitions. So a file like sample.py can be a module named sample and can be imported. Modules in Python can contain both executable statements and functions. But before you explore how they are used, it's important to understand their value, purpose, and advantages. Modules come from modular programming. This means that the functionality of code is broken down into parts or blocks of code. These parts or blocks have great advantages, which are scope, reusability, and simplicity. Let's delve deeper into these. Everything in Python is an object, so the names that you use for functions, variables, and so on become important. Scoping means that modules create a separate namespace, so two different modules can have functions with the same name. And importing a module makes it a part of the global space in the code being executed. Reusability is the most important advantage of modularity. So when you write a piece of code, modules help you avoid the need to write all the functionalities that you may need. Duplication of code duplicates your efforts, uses more computer memory, and it's less efficient. Let's say, for example, you want to import a math package. You automatically get access to a lot of functionalities, such as factorial, the greatest common divisor, used as GCD, and so on, that are reused without defining them. One other feature that using modules brings is simplicity. When modules have a little dependency on each other, it helps achieve simplicity. So each module is built with a simple purpose in mind. Modules are defined by their usage. So you can also use a regular expression or RE module for managing regular expressions. Simplicity also helps in avoiding interdependency among these modules. So if you're working on data visualization, import of a single module like matplotlib is sufficient for visualizing your data. There are different types of modules that exist in Python. The main difference between these modules is the way the modules are accessed. Let's cover built-in modules. Some modules are already built into the standard Python library. When you use a statement like import math in your Python code, for example, the interpreter first tries to find built-in modules. So, how do you import and execute modules in Python? The first important thing to know is that modules are imported only once during execution. If, for example, you import a module that contains print statements, print, open bracket, close bracket, you can verify it only executes the first time you import the module, even if the module is imported multiple times. Since modules are built to help you, standalone modules hold all the functions, but will most likely not contain functions that execute without calling. It's only when the user executes the different functions inside that module that they will find the utility of those functions in the code. The module is normally defined at the beginning of the code, but you can define it at any point in the code. Since code execution in Python is serial, you must import the module first before you execute any function inside of it. Modules can also be executed from within the function. This means that the code inside that module can only be used once the function is executed. In this video, you covered modules in Python.
You learned about the different types of modules and how they can be used to save you time and make your work more efficient. In Python, you can access different types of modules, such as built-in modules and user-defined modules from different locations. Think of the built-in modules as a house that you want to build using pre-built and packaged floors, walls and a roof that you can just assemble. This means you don't have to try and find hammers, bricks, plaster and tiles to build walls and floors, saving you time and making your work more efficient. Accessing built-in and user-defined modules in Python works in the same way and helps to save time and build efficiency while you're coding. Remember that any Python file can be a module. The modules are searched by the interpreter in the following sequence. First, the current directory path. Second, the built-in module directory. Third, the Python path, an environment variable with a list of directories. And finally, it investigates the installation dependent default directory. Let's explore this in greater detail. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to access different types of modules, such as the built-in modules and user-defined modules from different locations. Let's write some code and learn how to access some built-in modules. I begin by creating a new file called my calendar in visual code. I then use the sys.path function and return the values that I get from it in a variable called locations. I finally print the values using the print function. I now try running this code. Unfortunately, this does not work as Python has no idea what sys is. To resolve this, I'm going to try and import the built-in sys function. I'm going to run the code again. The print function returns all the possible locations that the interpreter is going to look for when searching for modules, including the current working directory. But this doesn't look very clean. I know that I have a list of values, so I'll run a for loop that loops through every location in turn. This returns a much cleaner result by printing each location on its own line in the terminal. Now it's always good practice to import all the required modules right at the beginning, but I can do this in a different way. I'll import a module here in the middle of the code. I'll import another built-in module called calendar. I'll now use a couple of functions that the calendar has. I'll now use a function called leap days, which has two inputs, year one and year two and it will be returning another integer value. So what I'm going to do is write the leap days function, write two input years and return the value in a variable called leap days. I'm going to print the value of the variable. I get a return value of 13, which means there are 13 leap days in between 2000 and 2050. Now I'll use another function. This function is called isLeap. It takes one of the years as an input and returns a Boolean value. It tells you if a given year is a leap year. So let's try 2036 and return the value in another variable called isItLeap. This time I get the value of true because 2036 is a leap year. If you decide to explore a little bit, you can hover over calendar. If you use a MacBook, press the command key. Or if using Windows, press the control key which will take you to the calendar file by clicking on it. Note how the calendar module itself has imported a few other modules, and other than that, it contains all the functionalities. I now find the location of calendar inside the Python 3.9 package, which is one of the locations listed in the terminal by the print locations loop I ran earlier. You just learned how to access built-in modules and user-defined modules from different locations. I encourage you to start using modules in your code to make your work more efficient. In this video, you will learn how to use import statements for accessing modules from different directories. You will also learn how to create packages from the Python package index using pip. Every Python file, which means any file with a .py extension containing a script, is effectively a module. The check imports file I am currently creating is therefore a module for some of the files. The code that you are working with is generally called the main module. In this case, check imports is the main module present in the current working directory, also called the scope of the project. You can import any Python file that is present in the current scope. For example, I can import the sample.py file by typing import, followed by the file name without the extension. I then click on Run in the top menu. The system returns a message in the terminal pane that the import was successful. 
If I try to import a file with a .txt extension, the import will not be successful. For example, if I type import followed by sample text and click on run, the system will return an error message in the terminal pane as it is not a Python file. Python has a library of standard modules called built-in modules. These modules are directly built into the Python interpreter and don't have to be installed separately. I can import a module like JSON by typing import JSON. Once I execute the command, I can start using its functions directly. The list of built-in modules can be found in the Python standard library. You can think of packages as the structuring of Python modules as a collection. Special files called init.py files are required for Python to treat directories containing the file as packages. Python has a rich collection of community-built packages that I could find on the Python package index, or PyPI. PIP, or PIP3, is the default package installer for Python and helps with the installation of packages from PyPI. Since I have already installed NumPy, I can import it directly in Python. I do this by typing import numpy, clearing my terminal, and clicking run. If I try to import a package that is not installed, I will get an error message. For instance, if I type import seaborn and click run, the message module not found error is returned. If the package seaborn were installed, I could run the command again in Python without any error messages. To do this, I would run pip install seaborn in the terminal to download the package from the PyPI index. I can also import files I have created in one of the folders within the current working directory. I have a folder called workplace containing a file called trial.py. The file consists of a list with a variable names and two entries inside it. I'm going to import this file and access its contents. I start by importing the sys module. Next, I use a path function in sys by typing sys.path.insert. Now I must enter the path name to my workplace package in the first index location. To do this, right click on the workplace directory and select copy path. I enter this path name as the first index location. When passing the path as an argument, I must use single quotes and type the letter R in front of the path string. The sys.path list now has a new directory where it will look for modules. Now I must import my trial file here by typing import trial and pressing enter. A squiggly line appears below the word trial. This is because the IDE does not know about the path I've added inside sys.path. However, I can still proceed as the interpreter will know about this path. To print the output, I type print followed by trial.names, and click the Run button to execute. The values of Adrian and Maria from the names list variable are printed. In this video, you learned how modules can be imported from anywhere within your system. Inserting the path name can, however, be very specific and often tricky and confusing. Don't worry about this too much for now. It is more important to focus on importing files from your current directory. It is nice to know that importing modules from other directories is an option if you need it. It is good practice, though, to move the required files into the directory that you are working in. Let's explore how to use modules with the import statement. I have already created a file called imports.py. I will now import the built-in math module by typing import math. Just to make sure that this code works, I'll use a print statement. I do this by typing print importing the math module. After this, I'll run the code. The print statement has executed. Most of the modules that you will come across, especially the built-in modules, will not have any print statements, and they will simply be loaded by the interpreter. Now that I've imported the math module, I want to use a function inside of it. Let's choose the square root function, sqrt. To do this, I type the words math.sqrt. When I type the word math, followed by the dot, a list of functions appears in a drop-down menu and you can select sqrt from this list. I pass 9 as the argument to the math.sqrt function, assign this to a variable called root, and then I print it. The number 3, the square root of 9, has been printed to the terminal, which is the correct answer. Instead of importing the entire math module as we did above, there is a better way to handle this, by directly importing the square root function inside the scope of the project. 
This will prevent overloading the interpreter by importing the entire math module. To do this, I type from math import sqrt. When I run this, it displays an error. Now, I remove the word math from the variable declaration and I run the code again. This time, it works. Next, let's discuss something called an alias, which is an excellent way of importing different modules. Here, I assign an alias called m to the math module. I do this by typing import math as m. Then, I type cosine equals m dot. I then select cos, C-O-S, from the list of functions after which I add the number zero in parentheses. On the next line, I'll print cosine, and then I run the code. The result is the cosine value of zero, which is one. This is possible because I used the alias called m. If I tried writing math.cos, it wouldn't work because the math module is now recognized as m instead. Let me remove this code from the screen and clear the terminal before we continue. An alias can also be used for a function that's imported. For example, I can type from math import factorial as f to alias the factorial function. Now I assign f of 10 typed as f opening parenthesis, the number 10, and a closing parenthesis to a variable called factorial 10. I'll print the variable and see if it works. When we run the code, we see that it works just fine. Using an alias in this way reduces the effort of typing factorial every time. After I remove the alias, I can import as many functions as I'd like from a given module. I'm going to import log and sqrt. I create a variable using the log function to find the value of log base 10 of 50. I do this by typing x equals log 10, opening parenthesis, 50, and closing parenthesis. And again, I print the variable on the next line. And when I click run, I'll see whether or not it worked. Once again, it worked just fine. Now, what if I want to import all the functions inside a given module? I can remove the functions I added earlier and replace them with a star. This basically translates to import all from the math module. When I run the code again, let's see if it works. And it does. However, this practice of using a star is not the best approach in certain cases. For example, this is a small file, and I know that the log10 function is present inside the math module. But when you work with a large code base, it could be difficult to track where the log10 function came from. Additionally, when you're importing other modules, it may get confusing. Importing packages is very similar to importing modules in Python. Just like you can have imported functions, you could also import variables and classes from a given module. Now I replace the star with a variable called some variable, which may be present inside the given module. Let me try to run the code again. Since the math module doesn't have such a variable, it throws an error when I print it. The interpreter is not able to import some variable from math. In this video, you explored different methods that can be used to import modules in Python using keywords like import from, star, and as. This enables you to use the modular structure of Python in object-oriented programming in general. Now you should be fairly familiar with how modules work. Let's look at another related concept in Python, namespaces and scopes. The official Python documentation defines namespace as mapping from names to objects, and scope is the textual region of a Python program where the namespace is directly accessible. At this point, the dictionary with its key value pairs serves as the ideal data structure for the mapping of names and objects. You have also learned how every Python file can be a module. You can view the same module as a place where Python creates a module object. A module object contains the names of different attributes defined inside it. In this way, modules are a type of namespace. Namespaces and scopes can become very confusing very quickly, and so it is important to get as much practice of scopes as possible to ensure a standard of quality. There are four main types of scopes that can be defined in Python. Local, enclosed, global, and built-in.
The practice of trying to determine in which scope a certain variable belongs is known as scope resolution. Scope resolution follows what is known commonly as the LEGB rule. Let's explore these. Local. This is where the first search for a variable is in the local scope. Enclosed. This is defined inside an enclosing or nested functions. Global is defined at the uppermost level or simply outside functions. And built-in, which is the keywords present in the built-in module. In simpler terms, a variable declared inside a function is local and the ones outside the scope of any function generally are global. Here is an example. The output for the code on screen shows the same variable name Greek in different scopes. There are three possible declarations of the variable. At the global level, inside the function b or inside the nested function c, which is called from within b. The id function is used here in the print statement, which returns the identity of the objects. You can make some observations from the output. The id for the global variable alpha remains same as defined after the code is completely executed. The ID for the local variable beta inside the function B remains unchanged before and after the execution of nested function C. The ID for gamma is assigned only within the scope of the nested function. And the ID for all three variables is different even if they all have the same variable name. Variables in Python are implicitly declared when you define them. That means Unlike other programming languages, there is no special declaration made in Python for the variable which specifies its data type. What it also implies is that a given variable is local, not global, when it is declared unless stated otherwise. This contrasts with most other programming languages where variables are global by default. So, when a variable is declared in a global space, it is also local to that space. This can be understood with a simple example. If you look at the content of both of these dictionaries, you can see how the value for the key country is different in both the cases. You have also used two special built-in functions called locals and globals that list the contents of the dictionary inside both of these scopes. Here you can see the output. In this example, you can see the global variable declared remains unchanged. While global variables are acceptable, they are discouraged for a number of reasons. When you are working with production code, the project structure can get complex and working with global variables can be hard to diagnose, which lead to what is called the spaghetti code. Other paradigms such as access modifiers, concurrency and memory allocation are better handled with local variables. While you were just beginning our journey using Python, it is always a good idea to integrate good practices in your code. There are two key words that can be used to change the scope of the variables, global and non-local. The global keyword helps us access the global variables from within the function. Non-local is a special type of scope defined in Python that is used within the nested functions only in the condition that it has been defined earlier in the enclosed functions. Now you can write a piece of code that will better help you understand the idea of scope for an attribute. You have already created a file called animalfarm.py. You will be defining a function called d, inside which you will be creating another nested function, e. Let's write the rest of the code. You can start by defining a couple of variables, both of which will be called animal. The first one inside the D function and the second one inside the E function. Note how you had to first declare the variable inside the E function as non-local. You will now add a few more print statements for clarification for when you see the output. Finally, you have called the E function here and you can add one more variable animal outside the D function. This will be a global variable you can add a call for the D function and a print statement for the global variable. You can save this file and run the code. First, the global animal variable gets assigned camel. Then, call this function and once inside it, assign elephant to the local animal. Then, D 
declare the inner function e and proceed by printing before calling functions animal where the value of animal will be the local value which is elephant. Once you are inside the inner function e, you use the non-local keyword to declare that you are going to use the animal variable and you change the value to giraffe and here you can see that the print statement will give inside nested function the value is giraffe which stays consistent even after you get out of the inner function. So when you print after nested function the value still remains giraffe. Once the function is fully executed come out to see that the value of global animal will be camel which you had assigned at the beginning. So you can see the changes that you have made inside are not going to affect the value of the global variable. Let's look at one last thing. If you comment the local variable out, this will throw an error. You can see there is no binding present for non-local animal present inside the D function, which was required here. In this video, I'll cover the reload function that's used with import statements. The reload function reloads an imported module in Python. The only precondition is that the argument passed to it must be a module that has already been successfully imported within the program. Previously, you learned how the import statement is only loaded once by the Python interpreter, but the reload function lets you import and reload it multiple times. I'll demonstrate that. First, I create a new file, sample.py, and I add a simple print statement named hello world. Remember that any file in Python can be used as a module, I'm going to use this file inside another new file, and the new file is named using reloads.py. Now I import the sample.py module. I can add the import statement multiple times, but the interpreter only loads it once. If it had been reloaded, we would have seen hello world several times. However, I can change this with the help of the reload function. Let me remove this code and add the import lib module where the reload function sits. Then, I pass the module name as an argument to this function. Note that the sample module has been imported more than once, and I could do it as many times as I want. Now, to better demonstrate how the reload function can be used, I'm creating another file called filechanges.py. This file is going to list the content of a particular directory. In the following code, I will be updating the contents of the directory and be able to monitor the changes using a file that I will import. Since the interpreter loads the file only once, the reload function will allow us to reload that import and effectively update the changes every time without stopping the execution of running code. I begin by importing the built-in OS module, and I use a function called os.listdir inside it. Next, I pass the current path as an argument by right-clicking the Files tab at the top and selecting Copy Path. I paste this as an argument to the listdir function and add an R before the path. Because I'm looking for a directory and not a file, I remove filechanges.py from here. I'll save the output from the lister function into a variable called contents. On the next line, I'll add a print function for the contents variable. Before running our program, I'll clear the terminal to make things clear. The return value should list the files that are present in the given directory. You'll notice that it indeed lists all the files present in this directory once printed. I now go back to the reloads.py file and I clear the file. Then, I once again import the import lib module. After this, I import file changes and create a function called changes. As good practice, I add a try block and use the reload function to pass file changes as an argument. Let me go back to the filechanges.py file and create a function that will print the contents variable. This is now complete, but I'll add another print statement for clarity. I save this file and then I go back to using reloads.py. I call this function that I just created inside the file changes module, and because I want to make a try block work, I add the accept and just pass for now. After this, I execute the code using a for loop. Because I want to do it more than once, I use the range function and call the function that I just wrote. To take some control of the program, I'll add an input statement here. Now the program will execute five times, and every time it will load the file changes module and list the contents of the directory. To make it more interesting, I'm creating a few text files inside the directory. Now I've returned to using the reloads.py file to run this code. Note that the content of the current directory is listed here, but I'll now remove the text file called text3.text. When I execute the code again by hitting enter, 
you'll notice that the particular text file has been removed. Now, without changing anything else, I'll execute the rest of the code. If I also change the content of filechanges.py, for example, changing the print statement before the file names, I could see the code reflected after I press enter again. As I demonstrated, the reload function can be used for making dynamic changes within your code with the help of import statements. Packages are bundled collections of modules in Python serving a specific purpose. In Python, there are currently tens of thousands of packages to choose from. And in this video, you'll learn about some of the most popular. You can think of this collection of packages like a traditional real world library. Each package is a book or magazine, and this library gets bigger every day. In programming, a package is a directory or folder, and in the same way, a module is a file or document. You import packages in the same way as a module using the import statement. And like with the import statement, it's important to remember that unless defined correctly, the import serves no purpose. For example, suppose you want to import a package named foo. The import statement on its own will not serve any purpose. It needs to be in a format like from foo import a, where foo is the package and a is the module containing the functions you want. Exploring the package's directory structure or referring to code blocks online can save time. To work with packages in Python, it's important to know that pip is the default package manager and Python package index or PyPI is the package index where you can find and publish packages. Python has an extensive collection of packages. As a developer starting out, it can be overwhelming, but it's important to understand what Python is most widely used for today. The major application areas for Python are data science, AI and machine learning, web frameworks, application development, automation, and hardware interfacing. With this in mind, packages can be grouped into categories. For example, built-in packages, data science, machine learning and AI, web and GUI development. Let's explore each of these briefly now, starting with built-in packages. These are packages that don't need to be installed separately and can be used as soon as you've installed Python. Almost every project uses one or more of these built-in packages, so it's worth getting to know them well. The most popular ones are OS, Sys, CSV, JSON, Importlib, Re, Math, and Itatools. In the world of data science, the most popular Python packages are NumPy, SciPy, NLTK, and Pandas. These are all used for data exploration and manipulation. Other packages like OpenCV and Matplotlib are used for image processing and data visualization. Within the world of machine learning, or ML and artificial intelligence, or AI, the most popular packages are TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Keras. PyTorch and Keras are currently the most popular for deep learning and neural network implementation. There are other packages such as SciPy, Scikit-learn, and Theano. Choosing which package to use will depend on the scale and scope of the project and how familiar you become with the package in question. Okay, let's move on to web development. Python today is primarily used for ML, AI, and web development. The most popular packages are Flask, which is a lightweight micro framework, and Django, which is a full stack framework. Other popular web development packages include Cherry Pie, Pyramid, Beautiful Soup, and Selenium. There are also other packages for robotics, game development, and other specialized domains. For any domain you want to work in, you'll find several Python packages relevant to it. While no one package may be a perfect fit for your current project, the open source community of Python developers is working relentlessly to fill the gaps. As a beginner Python coder, most functions you need will be met by one package. To continue expanding your knowledge of Python packages, you should think of a project you'd like to create and experiment with the packages I've mentioned in this video. In this video, you learned about packages in Python. You've covered built-in packages and some of the most popular packages in use today. Python is one of the best languages to use for various data science projects and applications. In this video, you'll learn about some of the commonly used Python libraries in data analysis and data science. 
The last decade has seen exponential growth in all data science areas. The demand for data analysis and scientists is continually increasing as it's a requirement for developers to incorporate scientific and data analysis into their code. Python has emerged as one of the most popular languages with data scientists. One of the main reasons for its popularity is the large number of different open source packages. These have been developed by thousands of contributors collaborating to provide free, usable resources. Many packages are top rated because they are efficient and provide outstanding functionality. In no particular order of preference, these packages include NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, and Scikit-learn. As an example, Scikit-learn is used for predictive learning and is built on top of other popular packages. It consists of various supervised and unsupervised machine learning algorithms for classification, regression, and SVMs. Modeling data is the primary focus of this library, and it provides popular models such as clustering, feature extraction and selection, validation, and dimensionality reduction. Pandas is an acronym for Python Data Analysis, and this is a data analysis and a manipulation tool. It's used primarily for working with datasets and provides functions for cleaning, analyzing, and manipulating data. Using it, I can compare different columns and find the arithmetic mean, max, and min values. The primary data structures used in pandas are series and data frames. While series are single dimensional and can be compared to a column in a table, data frames are multi dimensional and can potentially store tables efficiently. They are agnostic to the data types being stored. Pandas' most common applications are reading CSV files and JSON objects and using them within Python code for faster retrieval. Pandas are known to bring speed and flexibility to data analysis. Pandas library is normally imported by the code import pandas as pd. NumPy stands for numerical Python and is a powerful library forming the base for libraries such as scikit-learn, SciPy, Plotly, and Matplotlib. Python scientists use the abilities of NumPy especially when working in scientific domains such as signal, image processing, statistical computing, and quantum computing. NumPy carries out the calculations needed for algebraic areas such as Fourier transforms and matrices. The backbone data structure in NumPy is called ND array or n-dimensional array, which substitutes the conventional use of lists in Python and is a much faster solution than lists. The dimensions in NumPy are called axes and the number of such axes is called a rank. Conventionally, NumPy is imported with import NumPy as NP. Matplotlib is the visualization library used in Python. It can be used to create static, interactive, and animated visualizations. Many third-party tools such as ggplot and seaborn extend the functions of matplotlib. These functions are located inside the pyplot subpackage. Matplotlib is imported with import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. An example such as libraries 2.0 uses the matplotlib and numpy libraries to, for instance, display a graphical representation of students in a class or the distribution of their scores. To recap what you've learned in this video, you should now know about the most commonly used Python data analysis and data science packages. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is broadly about making machines think like humans. Data science primarily focuses on the management and exploration of data, which may include media such as text, audio, images, and video. Machine learning, or ML, is a subsection of AI and deals with algorithms for training and generating insights from data. Many fields utilize machine learning. Some of the most widely used areas are natural language processing, deep learning, sentiment analysis, recommender engines, computer vision, and speech recognition. With the amount of text, image, and video data available today, Data science and AI, in particular, are in greater demand than ever. Python is one of the most popular languages used in these domains. The reasons are syntactical efficiency and readability, 
flexibility with different languages, frameworks, and operating systems, a welcoming and large community of developers, ability to build ML models without having to understand the intricacies, user-friendly debug and testing tools, and modular structure. These all promote the development of many primarily open source libraries and frameworks. It's important not to get confused with the terms, packages, library, and frameworks. A package is a collection of modules, and both library and framework are often used interchangeably with packages. Libraries can also be a collection of packages with specific purpose, whereas the term framework is usually used where certain flow and architecture is involved. It's important to remember that all of these pieces of Python code are used with the help of import statements. Some of the most popular ML libraries in use today are in the areas of deep learning and neural networks, computer vision and image recognition, natural language processing, data visualization, and web scraping. It's important to understand that these are broad categorizations. Most of the libraries associated with them are not restricted to a particular field. Every project is unique and should be treated as such. The right selection of the library can save precious time when coding. In this video, you learned about machine learning libraries. Many fields use machine learning and those fields like deep learning and neural networks rely on open source machine learning libraries that make developers work easier. These libraries are collections of packages and the selection of the right library can save you time when coding. So in the future, think carefully about which library you should pick for a project to make sure that it suits your needs. Web frameworks are software applications designed to provide us with a standard way to build, deploy, and support web applications that we can use on the web. They help developers to focus on application logic and routines by automating redundant tasks which helps cut development time. They also provide easy structuring and default models that are reliable, stable, and easily maintainable, saving time and effort. Web frameworks are primarily written in high-level code, which removes the overhead required for understanding concepts such as sockets, threading, and protocols. As a result, time is better spent working on application logic instead of routines. Python is a popular framework in web development thanks to several features such as good documentation, abundant libraries and packages, ease of implementation, code reusability, a secure framework, and easy integrations. The different frameworks in Python are efficient and make it easy to handle tasks such as form processing, routing requests, connection with databases, and user authentication. They also provide debugging and testing tools to handle profiling, test coverage, and test automation, etc. There are mainly three types of web frameworks in Python. These are full stack, micro frameworks, and asynchronous. Let's explore each briefly now. Full stack frameworks are considered a one-stop solution and usually include all the required functionalities. This can include form generations and validators, template layouts, HTTP request handling, WSGI interfaces for connection with web servers, and database connection handling. Some of the most popular Python frameworks are Django, Web2Py, and Pyramid. Micro frameworks are a lighter version of full stacks that do not offer as many patterns and functionalities. They are usually used in smaller web projects and building APIs. Flask, Bottle, Dash, and CherryPy are some of the popular micro frameworks. As the name suggests, asynchronous framework types are used to handle a large set of concurrent connections. They are mainly built using asyncIO networking libraries. Growler, AIO HTTP, and SANIC are some of the names you'll encounter. Choosing a framework can depend on many factors. This can include things like available documentation, scalability, flexibility, and integration. While this categorization is pretty broad, it's important to remember that each framework in Python has its own unique set of features and functionalities. This can make certain frameworks more suitable than others for a specific project. Two of the most widely used are Flask and Django. Let's explore each briefly now. Django is a high-level framework that encourages clean design and rapid development. 
It's a full stack framework that's rich in features and libraries. It's secure and has templating systems and third party support. It primarily gained popularity due to its rapid deployment speed. You can quickly build scalable apps without extensive knowledge of low level programming. Flask is a micro framework and better used for smaller projects. It's easy to learn, simple to use, and has a large library of add ons. In this lesson, you learned about web frameworks and the different types. You also learned about the different web frameworks in Python, such as Flask and Django. Testing is an essential component in quality assurance that ensures our software, applications, and websites work as expected. For example, suppose you've built your own website and it has a few hundred visitors every day. One day, an article you've published goes viral. Suddenly, a million people are visiting your site and the website crashes. Another scenario is online forms. We've all faced situations where we fill out a form and a prompt appears telling us that we have made a mistake. For example, accidentally entering letters in space provided for credit card numbers or missing special characters and passwords. This type of data validation is even more critical, especially in the domains of banking and finance. In this video, you'll learn about testing and its importance in the software development lifecycle. But what exactly is testing? Well, software testing is a process of evaluating and verifying the various software applications and products in terms of performance, correctness, and completeness. It helps identify bugs, gaps in the product, defects, and missing requirements with set expectations. In the early days of computers, software developers relied heavily on debugging, a process for removing and detecting potential errors. After the 1980s, as software grew in size, several different testing types and products also grew in parallel, depending on the requirements. Testing was primarily done in the later stages of the software lifecycle. Now it's evolved to be integrated at the early stages as well. The efficiency of any testing type is dependent on how well written it is. The ideal testing scenario is to have the least tests written to find the largest number of defects. While software testing is important in any scenario, the real test of the product comes when it's launched to market. There, it's judged by stakeholders and users. We live in the internet age. Products with bugs, especially in the early stages, make consumers lose interest very quickly as many alternatives are available. This is where testing plays an important role, and here are a few reasons why it can help. Testing helps detect poor designs, change inefficient flow or functionality, address scalability concerns, and find security vulnerabilities. Testing helps provide A-B testing to find the best suitable options, address compatibility with platforms and devices, provide assurance to stakeholders, and a better experience for end users. There are a few good practices that must be followed in testing to achieve optimal results. Test code allowing reusability of tests. Tests must be traceable to the requirements set. Tests written must be purpose-driven, efficient, and allow for repeatability. These testing techniques can then follow a procedural approach according to the type of testing used. The testing lifecycle in general can be broadly described as planning, preparation, execution, and reporting. The steps involved in achieving this can include writing scripts and test cases, compiling test results, correcting defects based on them, and generating reports from our test results. Okay, so you've already learned about test cases. They are a general set of actions containing steps, data, pre and post conditions written for a specific purpose. This purpose can improve functionality, flow, and finding defects. A well-written test case eventually provides good coverage, reusability, better user experience, reduces costs, and increases overall satisfaction. As the tech industry is ever-growing, several testing categories, types, tools, and products have evolved, which are tailored to best meet the requirements of the software in question. For example, a web page will have different testing needs than an Android-based game. Even among web pages, a social media page will differ from one, say, from financial management. Testing can be categorized by several different factors. For example, depending on the amount we know about the internal implementation, we can call it black box or white box testing. There are also many testing types used in practice. These include compatibility, ad hoc, usability, and regression testing. 
Don't worry too much about these terms for the moment. You'll learn more about them later. For now, I just want you to know that with testing, there is no one size fits all solution. When testing products, it's also important to understand when to stop, as no application will ever be 100% perfect. Otherwise, a developer may feel the product is well tested, but realize it's full of bugs and flaws as soon as it's released to the end users. A few metrics can be established for this purpose, given that there are well-written test cases in place. These include a certain number of test cycles, passing percentage of test cases, time deadlines, and time intervals between subsequent test failures. Testing in software development can be seen as the anchor of a ship or insurance for your vehicle. You can hope that everything operates smoothly, but often it does not. And while you can aim for perfection, there is always potential for human error. Quality assurance today has become an important component in the software development life cycles. Much of the credit goes to development of testing tools and techniques. The question is, what type of testing should you use? In this video, you'll learn about the types of testing, including the four main levels or categories of testing, which is units, integration, system, and acceptance testing. There are different ways in which you can categorize the different test types. There are white box and black box tests. White box testing is where the tester has knowledge of the code, design, and functionalities. Black box tests function with no such information and the tester has no idea about the internal implementation. There are also other ways to categorize different tests as functional, non-functional, and maintenance tests. Let's explore these. Functional tests are based on the business requirements stated. They determine if the features and functionalities are in line with the expectations. Non-functional tests are more complex to define and involve metrics such as overall performance and quality of the product. Maintenance tests occur when the system and its operational environment is corrected, changed, or extended. But there are also manual and automated testing methods that are dependent on the scale of the software. The most broadly accepted categorization is in terms of the levels of testing as you move ahead in the software lifecycle. Let's delve deeper into these levels of testing. The four main levels of testing are unit or component testing, integration testing, system testing, and acceptance testing. The four types of testing levels build on each other and have a sequential flow. Let's explore these now. In unit or component testing, the program tests specific individual components by isolating them. The components are low level, which means that they are closer to the actual written code. They often involve use of automation for continuous integration given their small sizes. So you usually write these tests while writing the code. For example, if the code is in Python, unit tests can be written with packages such as PyTest. Integration testing combines the unit tests and tests the flow of data from one component to another. The keyword here is an interface. This means that you test if the data is correctly fetched from a database within the Python code and if you have sent it to the web page. There are different approaches to it, such as top down, bottom up, and sandwich approaches. Your approach depends on what code level interfaces you attempt first. It builds on the unit testing and a tester deals with it. Next is system testing, which tests all the software. You test it against the set requirements and expectations to ensure completeness. This includes measurements of the location of deployed components, such as reliability, performance, security, and load balancing. It also measures operability in the working environment, such as the platform and the operating system. This is the most important stage handled by a team of testers. It's also the most critical stage as the shipping of software to the stakeholders and end user happens after this phase. The final type of testing is acceptance testing. When the product arrives at this stage, it's generally considered to be ready for deployment. It's expected to be bug-free and meet the set standards. The stakeholders and a select few end users are involved in acceptance testing. It normally involves alpha, beta, and regression testing. One way of approaching this is to give pre-written scenarios to the users. You use the results for improvements and try to find bugs that were missed earlier. All the different testing levels are designed to optimize software at different stages. The key to testing is testing early and testing frequently. While each of the testing phases is important, 
Early detection saves time, effort, and money. As the code gets increasingly complex, mistakes become harder to fix. It doesn't necessarily mean that unit testing will happen only at the beginning and acceptance at a later stage. There are many testing cycles where these levels are approached iteratively. A typical example is the Agile model. Here you release different versions of the product iteratively and you perform acceptance testing every few weeks. In this video, you learned about some of the types of testing such as unit testing, integration testing, system testing, and acceptance testing. It's important to remember that the purpose of these testing methods is to build a systematic approach for testing and identify faults and improvements as early as possible. This results in improved overall performance and experience. Well done. With advancements in technology, an increasing drive is towards code automation. In this video, you'll learn about test automation packages and the importance of automated testing. In the past, machines have substituted human efforts in making goods, which helps us save both time and effort. In programming, the tests chosen for automation are the ones that have high repeatability and volume, predictable environment and data, and determinant outcomes. There are a number of testing types that can be automated. These include unit, regression, and integration. An ideal test code must form a bridge between the programming calls and the test cases. Python does a fine job in achieving this in addition to its clean, concise way of coding. There are some well-written frameworks in Python and some are more well accepted than others. The ideal steps involved in test automation are usually preparing the test environment, running the test scripts and analyzing the results. Okay, let's now examine some important Python testing frameworks that have grown in popularity over the years. First, let's explore the built-in testing package, PyUnit or Unitest. The Unitest framework supports test automation, independent testing modules, and aggregation of tests into collections. The first is PyTest, a native Python library that is simple, easy to use, and reasonably scalable. PyTest will be demonstrated later in this course. It can handle several functional test types such as unit, integration, and end-to-end. -end. There is support for parameterized testing which enables us to execute unit tests multiple times with different parameters passed. It can run parallel tests and generate HTML, XML, or plain text reports. You can also integrate it with other frameworks like PyUnit and Nose2 and web frameworks like Flask and Django. While primarily used with testing APIs, it's also well used with UI, database connections, and other web applications. Easy creation and quick bug fixes are why PyTest is the most popular testing framework for automation. Next is Robot, which is popular primarily for its keyword-driven development capabilities. These keywords are used in test cases and can be predefined or user-defined. Robot is very versatile and used for acceptance testing, robotic process automation, or RPA, and test-driven development. It can be used for many domains, including Android, APIs, and mainframes. Selenium is another open source testing framework that has gained popularity over time and is primarily driven towards web applications. It has support for the majority of web browsers and OS. There are browser-specific web drivers that enable testing functionalities like login, button clicks, and filling of forms. It allows the tester to select the speed and execution of tests and has an option to run specific tests or test suites. Apart from the popular frameworks PyTest, Robot, and Selenium, there are many more. It's important to know that a number of these testing frameworks are often used with other tools such as plugins, widgets, extensions, test runners, and drivers. These tools help integrate the software pieces being tested and add functionality. Sometimes, more than one framework is employed over the code being tested. In this video, you learned about test automation packages. Let's recap quickly. Automation testing is an important reason why the software industry is able to move ahead swiftly and more smoothly. Manual testing provides focused attention and the ability to handle nuances and complex problems with more sophistication. This kind of testing can't be replaced by automated tests yet. It's still some time before test scenarios can be fully automated, but the developments of all these frameworks are in line with that endeavor. 
In this video, I will demonstrate how to use PyTest to create simple tests for unit testing. PyTest is one of the most popular modules for unit testing in Python. This is because it allows you to do simple tests with minimal effort. And it also has simple, clean code with good documentation. First, I create a file called addition.py. Next, I add a function and pass two variables, a and b, inside it. I'm just going to do a simple calculation that will return the sum of these two variables. Similarly, I create another function called sub, which will perform the subtraction between the two variables. Second, I create another file called testaddition.py, in which I'm going to write my test cases. Now, I import the file that consists of the functions that need to be tested. Next, I'll also import the pytest module. After that, I define a couple of test cases with the addition and subtraction functions. Each test case should be named test underscore, then the name of the function to be tested. In our case, we'll have test underscore add and test underscore sub. I'll use the assert keyword inside these functions because tests primarily rely on this keyword. It checks for conditions in your code and expects a Boolean value of true or false. When the return value is true, the test passes. When it is false, the test fails. Let's add assert statements to our tests. In our first test, we'll assert that the addition of 4 and 5 is 9. And in the second test, we'll assert that the subtraction of 4 and 5 is negative 1. Next, I make a split screen so that I could see both files. Now, I run pytest and I specify the file over which I'm going to do the testing. To do this, open a new terminal and enter python-m pytest and the name of the test file, testaddition.py. I ran the code and both tests passed. This means that both the assert statements have been confirmed to be true. 4 plus 5 is 9, and 4 minus 5 is negative 1. These two dots after testaddition.py in the terminal also indicate that both tests passed. Now, I will intentionally make one of these tests fail. I do this by changing the negative 1 answer to negative 2. I make sure that I have saved the file, clear my terminal, and I'll run the test again. Note that the first test passed, but the second one didn't. Also note that where there were previously two dots, there is now only one dot and an F to indicate that the second test failed. The E's at the start of the lines show where the test failed, and it supplies the possible reason as to why it failed. I can also write these tests without the assert statement and just add pass. This passes the test regardless of any errors. When I run the code again, it indicates that both tests passed. You should note that I used an equality operator here, but I could have used less than, greater than, or keywords such as is, in, or not in. All that matters is that the assert statement gets a Boolean value. I can also add multiple assert statements in a single function. So, if I write assert true, that should return the result. And when I run the code again, it passes both tests. But, if I make it false, it will show that one test has failed. This indicates that all the assert statements within a given function should return a true value for the test to pass. Note that using the test underscore prefix for both the file name as well as the function name is good practice. Now I'll restore my code and save the file. If I want to run my test over a specific function, I just add a double colon at the end of the file name, and then I write the function name. I'll clear my terminal first, then run my code. Note that only the function I specified has run. Congratulations! you now know about simple functions. In this video, you learned that you could use PyTest to implement unit testing and how to create and use simple tests for unit testing. Testing has been a relatively recent entry in the software development lifecycle, but its importance has been growing as time passes. Software development is time sensitive, and in the process, developers often find testing gets squeezed into the time remaining after the code is written. This doesn't leave enough time to test and can lead to the software containing bugs that need to be dealt with over time.
Test-driven development, or TDD, is an alternative programming practice in which the tests are written first and the code is written so that the tests will pass. This differs from the convention of first writing the code and testing the application progressively. TDD follows an iterative approach beginning with writing the test cases. The initial work requires feature and test planning by the team. With slight variations, let's explore the standard steps. Step one, you write a test for a feature that fails. In step two, you write code in accordance with the tests. Step three requires that you run the test expecting them to fail. In step four, you evaluate the error and refactor the code as needed. And finally, in step five, you rerun the process. This process is also called the red-green refactor cycle. Red implies the failed tests and green shows the passing tests after refactoring. The whole point of following this cycle is to fail the tests and rewrite until you don't have to. A feature is complete when everything is green and you no longer need to rerun. You can use a package library such as PyTest when automation becomes a priority. PyTest only requires writing functions while Unitest requires classes. This means that PyTest has the advantage of being easier because it requires less effort. Okay, now let's explore some of the advantages you gain from TDD. Writing tests first and refactoring code based on it ensures the tests cover the code. You can now write tests with a specific feature and outcome in mind. The need for such forecasting provides clarity from the beginning. The forecasting also plays a role in integrating different components where you add new features and interfaces in accordance with the components that are already there. Working in cycles over the code gives the developer confidence to easily refactor in terms of additional changes. Overall, smaller code with early bug fixes, code extensibility, and eventual ease of debugging are the primary reasons TDD is growing in acceptance. Finally, let's briefly explore some of the differences between TDD and traditional testing. The main difference is that with TDD, the requirements and standards are highlighted from the beginning, making it purposeful. Modern day development often employs a combination of both these forms of testing, depending on the different parts and stages of the software development cycle. There are several subtypes and variations of test-driven development. These include behavior-driven, acceptance test-driven, scaling, and developer test-driven development. These are all options that can be used in the software development process. Congratulations. In this video, you learned about the process of test-driven development. In this video, you'll learn about how to apply the test-driven development methodology. In conventional testing, you follow the process of writing code and then writing test cases to ensure the integrity of that code. In test-driven development, or TDD, the approach is the other way around, and test cases are where you must begin your thinking. The steps involved are as follows. Write test cases with some functionality in mind. Write code in accordance with the test cases ensuring that they pass. And refactor code in case the tests fail. Let me demonstrate an example to design a test case that checks student enrollment with data stored in a database. The test needs to check the integrity of the names entered. First, I'll demonstrate how to design the test case and then write some code. Let's say I'm checking student enrollment for a class exam against the list of names that I already have. To keep things straightforward, I'm going to use a Python list with the names instead of a database. I want to make sure that the names I enter are on the list. And I also want to ensure data integrity, which means that I must be sure that the names are entered in the correct format. I've created two files. The first is test underscore find string, which is my testing file. And the second, find string, is my main file. I already have the PyTest package installed. And because this is test-driven development, I'll write my test function first. I begin by importing a curses module that will help me check the ASCII characters that are present. Then I import the PyTest module, as well as the find string module, which is my main file. I define a function named test underscore is present and I add an assert statement to check if the isPresent function works because I'm going to use it to validate my data entry. Contrary to the conventional approach of writing code, I first write test underscore find string dot py and then I add the test function named test underscore isPresent. 
In accordance with the test, I create another file named filestring.py in which I'll write the isPresent function. I define the function named isPresent and I pass an argument called person in it. Then I make a list of names written as values. After that, I create a simple if-else condition to check if the past argument is present inside the list. So the function called isPresent will check if the name passed is present in the list. Let me test my code. Note that the test has passed because the name Al is in the list. But this doesn't ensure the integrity of entries I may add. For example, I might not want numeric characters in the names. To address this issue, I write another function named test underscore no digit. I'm going to update some of the code in my main program, findString.py, in accordance with a newly added test. To do this, I create a function called no digit that matches my test. And again, I create a simple if else condition. I run the code and you'll note that one of the tests have passed and the other one has failed. So the name Al passed because it's on the list of names, but the value of N7 didn't pass because it contains a numeric character. I could also add more test cases and modify my code so that it's suitable for the test cases. And I can repeat the cycle until I have no more failed tests. Congratulations. You've now explored the test-driven development methodology. You've reached the end of this module on Python modules, packages, libraries, and tools. Great work. During this module, you learned that Python is a powerful language that allows you to build amazing things, but it can gain even more functionality with the use of modules, libraries, and tools. You may remember that we started with modules and learned that they are the building blocks for adding functionality to your code so you don't need to continually redo everything. Next, we explored some of the commonly used Python libraries in data analysis and data science. And lastly, you discovered that testing as a tool is an essential component in quality assurance that ensures your software, applications, and websites work as expected. It's now time to recap the key lessons you learned and the skills that you gained. With that in mind, let's summarize the key points you learned in this module. You should now be able to explain what modules are in Python and why they are used. Identify the different types of modules and explain where they can be found. Explain how to access built-in and user-defined modules from different locations and use import statements to access modules from different directories. You should also be able to create packages from the Python package index using pip, write modules using import statements and explain and use the reload function in Python. You have now learned that Python has an extensive collection of packages and should be able to describe typical module use cases, differentiate between built-in and user-defined Python packages, list some popular Python packages, and list some common Python libraries using data analysis and data science. In the module, you also learned about libraries, frameworks, and testing. You should therefore also be able to Recognize popular Python libraries using machine learning and artificial intelligence. Explain big data and analysis with Python. Define Python web frameworks and list different types of web frameworks. Describe testing and explain the different types of testing. List four main levels or categories of testing. Describe testing packages in Python such as PyTest, Selenium, Robot, and explore the importance of automated testing. And you should now be able to explain test-driven development, TDD, methodology, and list the features of test-driven development. This module was an introduction to Python modules, libraries, and tools. This knowledge enables you to extend the ability of your programming code. In this course, you were introduced to the foundations of Python development. Let's do a brief recap of what you covered. Module one was getting started with Python. In this first module, you learned about the different ways developers used Python in the real world and discovered the rationale for the existence of Python. You checked out your hardware and software by running Visual Studio Code and carrying out operating system environmental checks, identifying any required dependencies. You explored variables and data types and worked with strings, casting, and data files. This led you to the section on control flow and conditionals where you got to use Python operators and build looping and flow controls into your code. In module two, you moved on to some core programming skills with Python, including exploring functions and data structures, scopes, 
lists, tuples, sets and dictionaries, and quags. With all that coding built, it was time to check for errors. You finished module two by examining errors, exceptions, and file handling and considering approaches to error handling. Nearly halfway through the course on module three, you discovered all about the paradigms of functional and object-oriented programming and associated logical concepts. You also had an introduction to algorithms and to Python classes and instances. Nearly at the course end in module four, you learned how you could boost your coding environment by using modules, libraries, and tools in Python. You also learned about the different types of testing and how to write a test. Well done on completing this course recap. It's almost time to put your knowledge to the test in the graded assessment. Are you ready to display all your Python abilities? Congratulations on completing the programming in Python course. You've worked hard to get here and acquired a lot of important skills during the course. You should now have a great foundation of back-end web development skills. This is the base for you to continue building on in the future. And you've also demonstrated your skill set in the graded assessment. Following completion of this first course, you should now be able to complete basic programming with Python, distinguish between the programming paradigms of procedural, functional, and object-oriented programming, demonstrate how to use modules, packages, and libraries, and work within a test-driven development environment. So, what are the next steps? Well, this is one course in the Backend Developer Professional Certificate. While you've established a good foundation so far, there's still more for you to learn. So if you've enjoyed this course and want to discover more, why not enroll in the other courses? Throughout each of these courses, you'll continue to develop your skill set. Whether you're just starting out as a technical professional or student, this project will equip you with the knowledge of backend development practices as used in many business areas, such as web development, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data analytics, and many other applications. You'll have written a portfolio of Python code that will demonstrate your skills to potential employers. This shows employees that you are self-driven and innovative. It also speaks volumes about you as an individual and your drive to continue your growth. Once you've completed all the courses in this certificate, you'll receive a Coursera certification for backend developer. These certifications provide globally recognized and industry endorsed evidence of mastering technical skills. Congratulations once again on reaching the end of this course. It's been a pleasure to embark on this voyage of discovery with you. Best of luck and do continue to follow your learning journey. Welcome to the next course in database engineering. The focus of this course is on database clients. Let's take a few moments to review some of the new skills that you'll develop in these modules. You'll begin the module by learning about the MySQL Python connection, and you'll learn about using pip to install packages or software. You'll then learn how to install a front-end Python client and connect it to a back-end MySQL database. You'll then explore how to establish communication between Python and MySQL to perform CRUD operations. Once you've established a connection, you'll then access a cursor object. Once you access the cursor object, you'll create a MySQL database and table using Python. You'll then learn how to commit changes in a MySQL database using Python. In the third and final lesson of Module 1, you'll explore the concept of a cursor in a MySQL database. You'll learn how a cursor works in Python and MySQL. You'll also review the key characteristics of cursors and discover that they're read-only, non-scrollable and asensitive. You'll then learn that the cursor class is used to translate communication between Python and a MySQL database. And you also learn how to identify different cursor classes. And you'll also review the basics of interleaving requests. The second module focuses on performing, create, read, update and delete, or CRUD, operations in a MySQL database using Python. You'll start the module by learning how to create and read records in a database. You'll review the steps for this process and discover how Python communicates with a database to carry out these actions. You'll then explore how to perform MySQL update and delete operations using Python. And you'll learn how to commit the changes to the database. 
You'll then complete this first lesson by performing a series of lab exercises in which you demonstrate your ability to carry out CRUD operations in a MySQL database using Python. In the second lesson of Module 2, you'll review advanced queries in a MySQL database using Python. The first of these queries involves filtering and sorting data in a MySQL database using Python. You'll recap the basics of MySQL filtering and sorting techniques from earlier courses and learn how these same techniques are applied to Python. Next, you'll learn how to perform a range of different join operations to combine data from different tables in a MySQL database using Python. You'll receive an opportunity to test your ability to perform advanced queries in MySQL database using Python through a series of labs. Module 3 focuses on advanced database clients. The first lesson in this module begins with an overview of how to use MySQL functions with Python. You'll begin by learning how to identify the importance of MySQL functions, and you'll review the different types of functions available in MySQL. Once you finish recapping the basics of MySQL functions, you'll then learn how to implement or access MySQL functions using Python. You'll also explore datetime functions in Python and learn how to make use of these functions to update a MySQL database using Python. You'll then demonstrate your ability to make use of these functions in lab exercises. In the second lesson in this third module, you'll explore using MySQL stored procedures with Python. You'll recap the basics of stored procedures, learn how they differ from functions, and how they're created in a MySQL database using Python. You'll then learn how to access stored procedures through Python with the use of the call proc method. And you'll also review the use of delimiters. The third and final module focuses on connection pools. You'll begin by developing an understanding of the concept of database connection pooling. You'll learn how database connection pooling works, and you'll find out how to identify the advantages of database connection pooling. You'll then review the steps for creating a connection pool for a database, including the process for implementing the MySQL connection pool module. You've reached the end of this course introduction. It's now time to begin the next chapter of your database engineering journey. Good luck. There have been instances in my career where they were interdependent and I had to release them both at the same time. And so the only solution was to release code in the middle of the night when we had the lowest traffic and hope that for the five minutes we were down with one while the other one was updating that only a few users ran into the issue. And sometimes it's the only thing you can do. Hi, my name is Moxie Herrera. I use they, them pronouns and I'm a software engineer at Meta in the Menlo Park office. I work on donations products. So making sure that we are tracking who is donating to which fundraisers, to which charities. This is very important that we don't get this wrong. We wanna make sure that we're storing the right data and getting the right data to display to the right user. And what we mean by that is we wanna ensure the data validity we want to ensure that we are making sure that we are only getting the data that the specific user should see, that we are saving the right data. These are very important concepts when designing a database that you want it to be reliable. You want to make sure the relationships make sense. And we need to make sure that we're not accessing any data that a specific user shouldn't see. The integrity and quality of a database and its design is one of the first and primary steps to ensuring that our data is protected, our data is being stored in a safe way, and our users can trust that their data is not being mishandled. This requires us to have a well-designed database that is thoughtfully thinking about the different relationships that uh, data can have with each other, as well as having some plan for changes in the future. The process I generally follow when designing a database is to first come up with the core data model that I need for a product to work. I start with that because for me, it's the easiest to conceptualize how we're going to access the data we need from a product perspective. And then after that initial data model is built, 
uh, I start drilling down into specific privacy and validation uh, details that we need. So should certain data be encrypted? Should certain data be uh, only accessible via certain servers? These are all different questions that we are going to have to ask. And depending on the type of data you store, could be credit card information, could be user information, there's going to be even more checks that you're going to have to integrate into your database and database design in order to accommodate that. The core considerations for a well-designed database at Meta are to, first and foremost, respect user privacy and user safety. A user should know where their data is and have access to it, and that they should know that it's not being used in any products that they are not comfortable with. The other thing we need to ensure is scalability. Um, it does not matter if you have a really well thought out data model, if it cannot scale up with the billions of users that meta products see every day. I think one of the most common challenges when you're working with a database isn't the initial time you built the database, because you have this concept in your model of a relationship, and then something comes along and changes it. The first thing to do is really be thoughtful about how you can change your database in the future, how it, how it will scale not only with volume of users, but with types of products. The other thing that is very important to think about is how to modify an existing database. This is going to be a very challenging thing, and the majority of the work around databases is a lot of this stuff. We have this old data model. It doesn't suit our needs today. We're going to, need to overcome this. And that requires just a lot of thinking and planning on your part, how to migrate the data. These are big tasks that take time to kind of figure out, but that is some of the ways that you become better at managing database and building better data models in the first place. As a database engineer, you're going to have access to a lot of data. And you really need to keep in mind how integral that is to user trust or the trust of anyone trusting you with this data. Even if you think it's kind of trivial data, there's a lot of trust being put in you. Uh, to make sure that you're being responsible. I really want you to walk away knowing that database design, database engineering is critical to the overall product experience and integral to uh, user trust in the product that you're building. Many of the web applications that you use every day rely on a MySQL database to send and store data. And many of these same applications are developed in Python. Database engineers can send and store data from a Python-based application to a MySQL database using a MySQL Python connection. In this video, you'll explore the basics of this important connection and learn how it works. Over at Little Lemon, the restaurant needs to connect a Python application with its MySQL database. They need to form this connection so that they can perform basic MySQL tasks using Python. And they also need your help with these tasks. But first, you need to understand how the connection between MySQL and Python works. So let's take a few moments to explore the connection between Python and a MySQL database. A connection is established between Python and a MySQL database using an Application Programming Interface, or API. An API is also commonly known as a driver or client. The API is a written set of programs or software that acts as a bridge between the front-end Python application and back-end MySQL database. This connection can be created using different APIs like SQL Alchemy, MySQL Client, and MySQL Connector Python. MySQL Connector Python is the most common API and the one that you'll focus on in this course. A useful way of understanding the connection between MySQL database and Python is visually. Picture a diagram with a Python application on one side and a MySQL database on the other. In between these two elements is the MySQL Connector Python API. In a typical interaction between these elements, the front-end Python application sends a connection request to the Connector API. The connection request is the Python application asking for permission to access and retrieve information from the database using Python. The API forwards the request to the backend MySQL database. The database accepts the connection. It then sends a message to the Python application back through the API confirming that the connection has been established. 
In other words, MySQL gives the API permission for the Python application to access the database. Now the Python application sends a connection request to the database. Once the connection is established, you can then instantiate an instance of the cursor from the connector class. And when a cursor object is created, you can then execute SQL queries in the MySQL database using Python. Let's look at Little Lemon's database as an example. Little Lemon need to check what time a guest is arriving for dinner using their Python application. The date and time data for the guest's booking is stored in the backend database. So, the Python application uses the execute module from the cursor object to carry out the customer's demand. The records are returned through the cursor object in the form of tuples that show the booking slots of each guest. Once the request has been fulfilled, the cursor object and database connection can be closed. You should now understand and be able to explain how a connection works between a Python application and a MySQL database. I look forward to teaching you more about the MySQL Python connection in other videos. As a database engineer, you'll frequently work with Python to perform CRUD operations in a MySQL database. But before you can work with Python, you first need to install and configure Python software on your system so that you can create a connection between Python and MySQL. Let's look at the installation and configuration process for creating this connection. The first step is to download the most recent version of Python from the python.org website. Follow the site's installation instructions. Once you've installed Python, you then need to open the application. Select the search icon and access the command prompt. Type python version to identify which version of Python is running on your machine. If Python is correctly installed, then Python 3 should appear in your console. This means that you are running Python 3. There should also be several numbers after the 3 to indicate which version of Python 3 you are running. Make sure these numbers match the most recent version on the python.org website. If you see a message that states, Python not found, then review your Python installation or relevant document on the Python website. Now that you've installed Python, you need to choose an IDE or Integrated Development Environment to run your code on. This is software that you can use to display your code. This course uses the Jupyter IDE to demonstrate Python, so it's probably best if you also use the Jupyter environment. To install Jupyter, type python-m pip install Jupyter. Once Jupyter is installed, type python-m notebook. This opens a new instance of the notebook for you to use within your default browser. Now you can set up your working environment. Select the New button in Jupyter, then choose a new folder. This action generates an unnamed folder. Rename the new folder to MySQL Python Course Content and then access it. You can now save your projects and other files in this location. Now select New again and choose the Python 3 IPY kernel option. This opens a new tab in which you can enter your code. You now need to connect Python to your MySQL database. You can create the installation using a purpose-built Python library called MySQL Connector Python. This library is an API that provides lots of useful features for working with MySQL. The MySQL Connector Python needs to be installed separately using a package installer called pip. The pip package is included with the Python software you just installed. Rename the notebook instance to Configuring MySQL Connector. Now you need to use pip to install the MySQL connector Python. To install the connector, type an exclamation mark and then pip to call the package. Type the install command, then type the name of the library, which is mysql-connector-python. Finally, press shift and enter or select run to execute the code. The output of this code is that the installation steps have now been performed as required. And a list of libraries have been installed. Python can now access the functionalities of all these libraries. You can import libraries in Python by typing the import command, the name of the library, and an alias. For example, 
To import MySQL Connector Python in a cell in your Jupyter Notebook, just type import mysql.connector as connector. The import syntax tells Python that there is a library you want to import and make use of. The MySQL syntax refers to a subfolder that pip has installed, which hosts the connector. The dot before connector is known as an access operator. It tells Python that you want to access the connector subfolder using the dot operator. Finally, the use of as is a method of renaming the import using aliasing. This is like the aliasing that you encountered in previous database courses when working with joins. Aliasing is a common practice in Python development. You can use custom names, but best practice is to make use of common aliases that other developers are familiar with. Now that you've typed the code, it's time to run it. If there's no output in the console when you run the code, then this means that the connector has been successfully installed. You can now communicate with your database. You should now be familiar with the process of installing MySQL Connector Python to create a bridge between your Python and MySQL environments. And you also know how to install and configure a Python environment. Great work. A Python-based application needs to be able to communicate with MySQL databases to perform database operations. So, this means that you need to create a connection between Python and MySQL. For example, Little Lemon need to create a connection between their website, which relies on Python, and their MySQL database so that customers can view data like menus and booking slots. Let's take a few minutes to find out how a connection is established between Python and MySQL. At this stage, you may be familiar with the MySQL Python Connector API software package. This API facilitates the connection between Python and MySQL. But first, you need to import it into your Python program. To import the Connector API, type the import command followed by its name, mysql.connector, then select Run. However, typing the mysql.connector each time you need to work with the API can be tedious. So, let's create an alias instead. You can create an alias for the mysql.connector called connector. You can then make use of this shorthand to make your coding more efficient. To create an alias, you can type import mysql.connector again or use the existing code. But this time, include as connector within your statement. The as keyword instructs Python to recognize import mysql.connector using the connector alias in all future code. Now, each time you need to use the MySQL Python Connector API, you just type its alias, which is connector. But make sure that you have installed the connector API first. Otherwise, you'll encounter a module not found error. You've now successfully imported the connector API, also called the package or software. Now you can begin to make use of its modules and functionality using the access operator or the dot. For example, you can help Little Lemon to make use of a connector to establish a connection between their Python-based website and MySQL database. First, create a variable to access the connector from the connector module. Call it connection and assign it the value of connector.connect. Next, Pass the key arguments to the connect module within a pair of parentheses. These arguments are the database username and password. Only an authorized user can access the database. So, in this instance, the user is Mario and the password is Cuisine. By default, a connection is established between Python and the database installed locally on your machine. This database is called localhost. It can also be accessed through its IP of 127.0.0.1. You'll learn more about the local host and other arguments at a later stage in this course. For now, you should be able to create a connection between Python and MySQL. Nice work. You might be asking yourself, what actions can I take once I've established a connection between a Python client and a MySQL database? Well, some actions you can perform include creating databases and tables. In this video, you'll explore the process for creating databases and tables in a MySQL backend database using Python. Little Lemon uses the MySQL Connector Python client, or API, to communicate with their MySQL database. 
they need to communicate with the MySQL database to create a database and tables in which they can store data. Let's see if you can help them out. The connection between Little Lemon's existing MySQL databases and their Python application has already been established within a connection object. So, the first step is to create a cursor object that lets you communicate with the MySQL database. You'll learn more about cursors in a later lesson. For now, you just need to know that a cursor object can be created by invoking the cursor module from the connection object. A cursor object points the Python application to the location in the MySQL database where the required data is stored. Once you have a cursor object, you can run queries to the MySQL database. The cursor accesses an execute module that carries the SQL queries as Python strings to the MySQL database. You'll learn more about cursors at a later stage in this course. Now it's time to create a new database. Create a SQL statement as a Python string and pass it to a variable called create database query. The statement must create a database called little lemon. You can use triple quotes to change your statement to a Python string. You could also use single quotes to create a string. But the advantage of triple quotes is that you can use them to split a SQL query into multiple lines. And it's much easier to read and manage a SQL query over multiple lines. You now have a SQL query that you can run using the execute method from the cursor. Pass the variable createDatabaseQuery as an argument to the execute method on the cursor object. Execute this code to create the little lemon database. Next, you need to set the database for use. The first step is to create your SQL query as a Python string and pass it to a variable called useDatabaseQuery. The query lets you make use of the little lemon database through the use command and the name of the database. Then pass the variable as an argument to the execute method. You now have a new database ready to use. The next step is to create tables for the database. Create a variable called create menu item table for your SQL query. Then create your SQL query as a Python string so that you can pass it to the variable. Create the query using the create table command to create a table called menu items. The columns that Little Lemon need in this table include item ID, name, type, and price. The item ID column must hold the ID for each item on the menu. It's assigned an integer data type and rendered as auto increment. This means that a new ID is assigned to each item in numeric order. The name and type columns display the name of each item in the menu and the type of cuisine that it's associated with. Both the name and type columns are assigned a data type of varchar and character limits of 200 and 100 respectively. The price column must display the price of each item in the menu. It's assigned an integer data type. The item ID column is assigned the table's primary key. Then execute the create menu item table by invoking the execute module from the cursor object. You can use this same method to create further tables within the database. Just update your SQL query as needed. Little Lemon now have a new database and table in their MySQL database. And you should now be familiar with the process for creating a database and table in a MySQL backend database using Python while developing a Python based front end application. When accessing a MySQL backend database using a Python front end client, your Python application needs to know where the data required to complete your query is stored. A cursor indicates where this data is positioned on the database. Over the next few minutes, you'll explore the concept of cursors their key characteristics, and learn how they work. Let's look at an example of cursors from Little Lemon's database. Little Lemon need to retrieve a guest's booking details. They can carry out this task with a SQL select query using Python. However, the Python front-end client needs to know where the data is stored within the back-end MySQL database. The MySQL database can use a cursor object to point to the records that Little Lemon needs. This cursor helps the Python client locate the required data. This example offers a good understanding of what database engineers mean by the term cursors. A cursor is a pointer that directs the Python client to the results of your SQL query within the MySQL database. 
The cursor indicates the location of the queried data by identifying specific rows or records. You can use a cursor to read, retrieve and move through individual records within the results of your query. Cursors have several key characteristics or features that are particularly useful to database engineers. For example, cursors are read-only, so you can't update the data that they are associated with. The results can't be modified. They're preserved by the cursor. Cursors are also non-scrollable. They fetch records in order, which helps to keep track of your position when processing individual records. You can't skip or jump between records or fetch them in reverse order. And cursors are also asensitive. This means that they point to the original data within the MySQL database instead of a copy. This is faster than using insensitive cursors, which take longer to return results because they can only point to a copy of the data. So, how can you use a cursor in a MySQL database query? The first step is to declare the cursor. Use the declare statement and assign your cursor a custom name, followed by the cursor keyword. Then use the for keyword and a relevant SQL select statement to determine the purpose of the cursor. Next, you need to open the cursor. Type the open command and call your cursor's name to establish the result set. Now the cursor is pointing to the set of results from your select statement. The next step is to fetch or retrieve the results of your statement. Type the fetch command and the name of your cursor. Then type the into keyword followed by the name of the location the results need to be transferred to. For example, the results can be transferred to a local variable to be used in your Python application. The final step is to close the cursor. Type the close command followed by the cursor name. Closing a cursor is always good practice to release the memory associated with it. As you learned earlier, a cursor is non-scrollable. It works through the results set in order, so once it reaches the last result, it no longer needs to remain open. So, Close the cursor to free up the memory it uses. Now that you're familiar with how cursors work, let's return to Little Lemon's query. Little Lemon can use a cursor to retrieve the booking data for their guest. First, they declare a new cursor called Guest Booking Details. This is followed by a SQL select statement that targets the guest's data from the Little Lemon MySQL database. They then open the cursor. Next, they fetch the data and store it in a variable within their Python client called booking data. You should now be able to explain what cursors are in a MySQL database, describe their key characteristics, and explain how they work. You'll explore cursors in much more detail as you progress through this course, so this is a great start to your MySQL Python journey. At this stage of the course, you've explored how cursors can be used to point to the location of the data you require in a MySQL database. However, it's also important to understand how Python makes use of the cursor class. The cursor class converts MySQL records to more Python-friendly code. With Python, you can also change or alter the behavior of your cursors using cursor subclasses. In this video, you'll explore the cursor class and subclasses and develop an understanding of how they work. Little Lemon need to find out how much one of their guests spent on their meal. They can query this data from their MySQL database in a more efficient manner by using cursor subclasses to create their Python strings. Let's take a few moments to find out more, starting with building an understanding of what database engineers mean by the term cursor classes. Cursor classes are a method of translating communications between Python and a backend MySQL database. Python sends SQL statements to a MySQL database in the form of string objects. Cursor classes take these Python string objects and parse them into MySQL friendly commands and data types that can be understood by the database. Python then uses the cursor class when retrieving these results to parse them into Python friendly code. The cursor class contains several subclasses which can be used to parse string objects in different ways depending on your needs. At this stage of the course, you may have seen some examples of subclasses in action in the form of attributes and methods. For example, the column name's cursor attribute returns the column name of a result set from a SQL statement. 
Row count returns an integer that represents the number of rows affected by a select, insert, or update statement. Or there's the execute method. The execute method is the most common cursor function. It binds the parameters of a Python string argument to a MySQL query statement so that it can be executed on a MySQL database. Cursor subclasses inherit the properties of the parent cursor class. In turn, the subclasses vary the parent class to improve the efficiency of the code. Let's explore some examples of cursor subclasses. One example is the cursor raw subclass. This subclass returns the results of your variable without pre-processing them to more Python-friendly interpretations. So, it uses less processing power, leaving you free to create custom conversions of the results. However, the disadvantage is that it requires more coding to process the targeted variable. Little Lemon can use the cursor raw subclass to create their own custom data type conversion. This could save time if the initial conversion type is not the one required. Another example of a subclass is the MySQL cursor dictionary class. This returns each row as a dictionary which helps with accessing variables. You can access variables by using direct variable names. Little Lemon can make use of this subclass to return a result set in the form of a dictionary. This lets them use the actual column names of the database columns instead of working through a list of unnamed tuples. And finally, there's the buffered cursor class, which takes a subset of data and stores it in a buffered memory. The advantage to this subclass is that your code doesn't need to repeatedly request each row from the server. The disadvantage is that the data needs to be stored on local memory. So, you can only use this subclass to return small data sets. Little Lemon can use a buffered cursor class to retrieve data. This lets them make interleaving SQL requests. Interleaving of SQL requests is when you take part of a SQL query result and use it to make a subsequent request from a database. Let's take an example where Little Lemon need to find out how much a guest spent on a meal. They can interleave a SQL request to carry out this task. For their first query, they create a MySQL query as a Python string that retrieves the guest's booking ID. Once they have the result of the first query, they then create a second or subsequent query that uses part of the first result, which is the booking ID, to find the cost of the meal. In other words, Little Lemon can use part of their first query within their second query to make a subsequent request from the database. A database can return multiple results from the first query. If you use the first result within your subsequent query before all other results are returned, then MySQL encounters an error called unread result found. So, it's best practice to finish your loop and let all results print from the first query before you make any subsequent queries. However, you can avoid this if you first buffer the results using a buffered cursor. The buffered cursor returns all rows, while a standard cursor requires you to send an individual query to each affected row. Now that you're familiar with the different cursor subclasses, let's look at the syntax for instantiating them. The syntax is very similar across all subclasses. You just pass a keyword argument to the cursor that alters its behavior in a particular way. To create a standard cursor, you create the cursor as an object. So, to instantiate an instance of a cursor subclass, you add the subclass as a keyword argument that alters the behavior of the cursor. For example, you can pass buffered as the keyword to create a buffered cursor, or pass raw as the keyword to create a raw cursor, or dictionary to use a dictionary cursor. Little Lemon can use a cursor subclass to request all data from the orders table in the MySQL database. They can create two cursor instances, one buffered and the other a standard implementation. They pass their SQL select statement as an argument to both cursors. Once executed, the cursors return all items from the orders table. You should now understand the concept of cursor subclasses and how they can be used to alter or change the behavior of a cursor. Great work. Congratulations. You've reached the end of the first module in this course. You should now be familiar with the basics of how to interact with a MySQL database using Python. Let's take a moment to recap some of the key skills you've gained in this module's lessons. 
In the first lesson, you received an introduction to the course in which you developed an understanding of how a connection is formed between Python and a MySQL database using an Application Programming Interface, or API, also known as a driver. You now know that a front-end Python application sends a connection request to the connector API. The API forwards this connection to the back-end MySQL database. A cursor connection can then be established. Once the connection is established, data can be sent between Python and MySQL. You also learned about the different APIs that can be used to create this connection. And that, as a database engineer, you'll rely on the MySQL Connector Python API. During this first lesson, you also learned how to install and configure Python software on your system so that you could create a connection between Python and MySQL. You learned how to download Python, make use of pip, and import the different packages that you require. And you also learned how to use aliasing to create custom names to facilitate easier communication with the database. You then explored a working example of how to connect to a MySQL database using a Python client. You saw how the API is imported into a Python program and can be used with an alias and you now know how to make use of its modules and functionality using the access or dot operator. And you also know how to pass arguments to a connector module like usernames and passwords. You then ended this lesson with an overview of the process for creating tables in a database using Python. You learned that you need to create a cursor object that you can use to communicate with the MySQL database. The cursor object accesses an execute module that carries queries as Python strings to a MySQL database. Once your connections are set up, you can then create data in a MySQL database using Python, like databases and tables. In the final lesson in this module, you learned about cursors. You learned that cursors are used to indicate where data is positioned in a MySQL database so that it can be accessed by a Python client. The cursor lets you read, retrieve, and move through individual records within the results of your query. You then explored the key characteristics or features of cursors that are particularly useful for database engineers. You learned that cursors are read-only, so they can't be modified and preserve results. You discovered that cursors are also non-scrollable. They fetch records in order, which helps you to keep track of your current position when processing individual records. And you also found out that cursors are A-sensitive. This means that they point to the original data within the MySQL database instead of a copy. You then explored the code required to use a cursor in a MySQL database. You can now use commands like declare to declare a cursor, the open command to call the cursor's name, the fetch command to fetch results, and the close command to close the cursor. You then explored an example of this process from Little Lemon's database. In the next part of this lesson, you explored different cursor subclasses, and you learned how they can be used to change or alter the behavior of your cursors. You discovered that cursor classes are a method of translating communications between Python and a MySQL database. Classes take Python string objects and parse them into MySQL-friendly commands and data types that can be understood by the database. You also explored some common examples of cursor subclasses. Subclasses inherit the properties of their parent cursor class, like the cursor raw subclass, the cursor dictionary subclass, and the buffered cursor class. You also learned about the interleaving SQL requests, which involve taking part of a SQL query to make a subsequent request. You then explored the syntax for creating and using subclasses. And you also explored an example of subclasses from the Little Lemon database. You should now be familiar with the basics of how to interact with a MySQL database using Python, including establishing a MySQL Python connection and working with cursors. Great work. I look forward to guiding you through the next module in which you'll learn how to perform queries in MySQL using Python. As you're aware, working with a database in MySQL involves CRUD operations. Working with databases through Python also involves CRUD operations. The key difference is that the SQL statements used to carry out your operations must be processed in Python as strings. In this video, you'll discover how to execute, create, and read operations in a MySQL database using Python. Little Lemon is populating the restaurant's database with the records of upcoming bookings. 
Little Lemon also need to retrieve or read this data from their database so they know which guests are attending for dinner. You need to help Little Lemon create and read data in their MySQL database using Python. But first, you need to understand how to create and read data in a MySQL database using Python. Let's get started with creating data. So far, you've learned how to create data in a database using an insert statement, like an insert into command. For example, Little Lemon must use an insert into statement to add the names of customers and the time slots they've booked to the customer name and time columns in a table called bookings in their database. However, there are a few more steps to this approach when working with Python. Create your SQL statement as normal. Then use quotation marks to convert it to a Python string argument. This string argument is passed to a MySQL database through a connector, which parses it into a format that MySQL can understand. So, the first step in the process is to write your SQL statement. Then add a pair of quotation marks to convert it to a Python string argument. Finally, create a variable in which you can store the query as a Python string. Next, Python sends the string to the database through the cursor. The statement is then executed on the database. Little Lemon can use Python to add booking data from guests to their MySQL database using the MySQL insert query variable. The SQL data just needs to be passed in a string format. As you should know by now, you can also retrieve or query data from a database using a SELECT statement. And a SQL SELECT query is also the first step to complete when reading data using Python. Python can read data from a MySQL database using a SELECT statement. And just like with your INSERT query, you create a variable in which the query can be stored as a Python string, and you write your SELECT query. Make sure that it's written within quotation marks to convert it to a Python string. Little Lemon can use a read data query string object to retrieve all data from their bookings table. They just need to write the SELECT query as a Python string, then use the execute module from the cursor object. Now that you know how to create and read data using Python, let's see if you can help Little Lemon. For the purpose of this demonstration, a connection has already been established between Python, the API, and the MySQL database through the MySQL connector Python API. So, your first task is to instantiate the cursor object from the connection using the cursor method. The next step is to execute the MySQL insert query by passing it as an argument to the execute method. Once the query is executed, commit the change to the database using the commit method of the connection object. Now, each new instance of customer data is added to the bookings table in the database through the MySQL insert query. For the next stage of development, Little Lemon needs to read or retrieve the data in their database. Some sample customer data has been added to the database to test the read functionality. You need to develop the functionality and retrieve this data. As you learned earlier, the first step is to create a SQL statement as a Python string that you can pass to a variable. In this case, you need to create a SQL SELECT statement that retrieves all data from the bookings table in the database and pass this statement as a string to the Python variable called read data query. Now you need to pass your query to the execute module on the cursor, just like you did when creating data. Once the query is executed, you need to retrieve the results using the fetch all method on the cursor. Create a new variable called results, then pass the results of your query to this variable through the cursor object. The results variable is a list data type, and it shows each record in the form of a tuple. So, the results variable is essentially a list of tuples, and each tuple is a single extracted row from the bookings table. In this instance, the items in each tuple in the results variable are ordered in the same way as the columns in the bookings table. They are ordered this way because you're reading all records from the table. You can retrieve the column names by creating a new variable named columns and calling the column names from the cursor object. These values are then stored in the columns variable for later use. 
Don't forget that it's also good practice to close the cursor object and connection when you no longer need them. You now know how to execute create and read operations in a back-end MySQL database using a front-end Python application. That's a great start. I look forward to guiding you through more CRUD operations in Python. Updating and deleting records in a MySQL database involves routine CRUD operations. They're also common operations for a Python-based application that interacts with the MySQL database. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn how to execute update and delete operations in a back-end MySQL database using Python. Little Lemon needs to update and delete the records of the restaurant guests in the bookings table in their database using Python. You need to help Little Lemon with this task. But first, let's take a quick look at the bookings table. This table holds the booking data of each guest. This includes their booking ID, table number, first and last name, booking slot, and the ID of their waiter. Little Lemon must update and delete data within this table using Python. Let's begin with updating records. As you know from previous courses, data is updated in a database using update statements. Little Lemon needs to update the booking data of a guest. Let's see if you can help them out. You can start by writing a SQL update query that uses a WHERE clause to let Little Lemon update a guest's table number. The update query is created as a string. It's then passed to a string object called update bookings. Little Lemon just needs to update the specific values of each query. Let's test this query by updating the booking information for guest 6, Diana Pinto, who has been moved to table 10. Use the execute method to run the query and update the records in the bookings table in the database. To commit these changes to the table in the database, use the commit method. To check that the data was updated correctly, you can run the print cells of the Jupyter Notebook. The guest with the booking ID of 6 is now assigned to table 10. The update query has worked. There are also times when guests cancel their bookings. When this happens, Little Lemon needs to delete their records from the database. To carry out this task, write a SQL delete statement that deletes the record of a specific guest from the bookings table. Your statement can use a WHERE clause of booking ID. The delete statement is created as a Python string. It's then assigned to a string object called delete booking ID. You can test this query by deleting the booking information for Marcos Romero, who was assigned the booking ID of 4. Use the execute method to run the query. Then commit the changes to the database. Now it's time to check that the query worked with another printout. You can rerun the cells with the initial select query from the Jupyter Notebook. The printout changes if the database has been altered. There's no data in the table for Marcos Romero. This means that your delete statement was successful. You can also amend the WHERE clause in your delete statement to check for null values next to table and employee IDs. If the value is null, then you can set the bookings to be deleted. You now know how to perform update and delete operations in a MySQL database using Python. Great work! When you query records in a database, your query can often return hundreds, thousands, or even millions of results, depending on how much data there is. But you might only require a fraction of these results. As you saw in earlier courses, you can use filtering and sorting techniques to target only the data you need from these results. When querying a MySQL database using Python, you can apply these same techniques to ensure that your query targets specific data. Over the next few minutes, you'll recap some basic filtering and sorting techniques and learn how to filter and sort MySQL data using Python. Over at Little Lemon, the restaurant is currently querying the bill records of each customer in its database. They need the records of all bookings with a final bill greater than or equal to $40. They also need the bookings to appear in ascending order with respect to the total bill amount. Filtering and sorting techniques are a great way to carry out this task. Let's find out how these techniques work with Python and then help Little Lemon. One filtering technique that you should be familiar with is the use of the WHERE clause. Let's begin with a quick recap of the WHERE clause. 
As you should know by now, you can use this clause to filter and extract records that satisfy a specific condition. For example, Little Lemon can use the WHERE clause to create a SQL SELECT statement that targets the booking ID and bill amount columns in their orders table. The statement returns all values in the bill amount column equal to a value of 40. The WHERE clause helps to filter the records from the database, but not to the extent that Little Lemon require. As you saw earlier, Little Lemon need the records of all bookings with a final bill greater than or equal to $40. You can use comparison operators to specify the exact data you require from a database. For example, Little Lemon can replace the equals operator in their statement with the greater than or equals to comparison operator. This operator targets all records from a database where the bill amount is greater than or equal to a value of 40. This narrows down the records even further, returning much more specific results. Another technique is the order by clause. As you should know, the order by clause is an optional clause that can be added to a SQL SELECT statement. It helps to sort data in ascending or descending order. So, to filter their records even more efficiently, Little Lemon can add the order by clause to the end of their statement. They target the bill amount column and then type the ascending keyword. Once executed, the query returns all bill amounts greater than or equal to $40 in ascending order. Now that you've recapped some examples of filtering and sorting techniques, your next question might be, how can I use these techniques in Python to query a MySQL database? Well, as you saw earlier, Little Lemon need to query the records in their MySQL database using Python. Let's help them create this query using the filtering and sorting techniques that you just explored. To recap, Little Lemon need the records of all bookings with a final bill greater than or equal to $40. They also need the bookings to appear in ascending order with respect to the total bill amount. First, write a SQL SELECT query as a Python string stored in a variable called MySQL Query. The query must target the booking ID and bill amount columns from the orders table. Use the WHERE clause and a greater than or equal to comparison operator to target all records that are greater than or equal to the value of 40. Then use the order by clause and the ascending keyword to order all records from the bill amount column in ascending order. The next step is to establish a connection through the MySQL Connector Python API between the front-end Python application and the back-end MySQL database. Then get the cursor object from the connection using the cursor method. Run the query using the execute method from the cursor object. Once the query is successfully executed, you can fetch all the results in a new variable called results that satisfies the conditions given in your query. Just use the fetchAll method on the cursor object to grab the query results. All the retrieved data is in results as a Python list of tuples. You can display the list on your dashboard for Little Lemon. Little Lemon now have the data they need. And you should now be able to explain how to make use of filtering and sorting techniques to target records in a MySQL database using Python. Great work. At this stage of your database engineering journey, you should have experience of using join operations to extract data from multiple tables. There are also instances in which you'll need to perform a join operation on a MySQL database using Python. In this video, you'll explore the process for executing join operations using Python. Little Lemon are adding a new menu feature to their website. This feature lets customers view menu items, their prices, and the type of cuisine each meal is related to. The data that the feature requires is in two different tables in their MySQL database menu and menu items. Little Lemon need to use a join to combine the data from these tables to create their menu feature. Let's quickly recap the concept of a join. A join is created using the SQL join clause. It targets a common column between the two target tables. These common columns are used to join the tables together and extract the required records. Some examples of joins used in MySQL include left join, right join, inner join, and outer join. All these joins can be used with Python. 
Let's explore an example of the syntax and process for creating an inner join. First, a SQL query is created using join as a Python string that can be passed to a variable. The query is then run using the execute method from the cursor object. Once the query is executed, you can retrieve its results into another variable. Use the fetchAll method on the cursor object that holds the results of the join. The data is retrieved as a list of tuples. For example, Little Lemon can create a join query as a string object in Python that combines the menu items and menu tables. This join is performed using an inner join on the item ID column, which is common to both tables. When executed using Python on a MySQL database, this statement returns all required results. Now that you're familiar with the process for joining data from different tables using Python, let's see if you can help Little Lemon to create this query. As you learned earlier, Little Lemon need to use a join query to extract the data for the new menu feature on their website. They begin by creating the join statement as a string object in Python. Store it in a variable called myJoinQuery. The join query must target the name, type and price columns from the menu items table. And it must also target the cuisine column from the menu table. An inner join is created on the item ID column, which is common to both tables. Let's assume that the MySQL Connector Python API is running a connection between the front and back end, and that the cursor object is also available. This means that you can now execute your query using the join statement. Run the query using the execute method from the cursor object. When the query is executed, you can fetch all the results from the cursor object in a new variable called results using the fetchAll method. The results are retrieved as a list of tuples, one for each row. Little Lemon can view the order of each individual entry. They just call the column names attribute on the cursor to return the names of the column in order. At this stage of your database engineering journey, you should have experience of using joins to extract data from multiple tables. And you should now be familiar with extracting data from a MySQL database using joins in Python. Well done. Congratulations. You've reached the end of the second module in this course. You should now be familiar with how to perform queries in a MySQL database using Python. Let's take a few moments to recap some of the key skills that you've gained in this module's lessons. In the first lesson, you learned how to perform create, read, update, and delete, or CRUD, operations in a MySQL database using Python. You started this lesson with a recap of how to create data in a MySQL database using an insert statement. You then learned how data is inserted into a MySQL database using Python. First, it's created as a Python string argument. This argument is then passed to a MySQL database using a connector. The connector parses it into a format that MySQL can understand. You then explored an example of the syntax used to render a MySQL database query as a Python string argument. And you explored an example of creating and reading data using Python from the Little Lemon database. Next, you recapped how to delete and update records in a MySQL database using update and delete operations. You learned how to create these queries as Python string arguments and explored some examples from the Little Lemon database. You then undertook a series of lab exercises in which you received the opportunity to perform CRUD operations in your own MySQL database using Python. And you tested your knowledge of these topics by completing several quizzes. In the second lesson of this module, you learned how to perform advanced queries in a MySQL database using Python. You began the lesson by learning how to filter and sort records in MySQL using Python. You recapped the basic filtering and sorting techniques that you learned in other courses. These include the use of the WHERE clause to satisfy one or more specific conditions, utilizing the ORDER BY clause to sort data in ascending or descending order, and the inclusion of comparison operators to specify the exact data required. You then discovered how these techniques are used in Python by exploring several examples from the Little Lemon database. 
The next part of this lesson focused on joining data from different tables in a MySQL database using Python. You recapped the basics of the join clause and how it can be used to target a common column between two target tables. You then learned how join can be used with Python to extract data from a MySQL database. A SQL query is created using join as a Python string. The string is executed using the execute module on the cursor object. The results are then retrieved from the MySQL database using another variable that satisfies the query's conditions and the fetch all method. You also explored an example of this process from the Little Lemon database. And just like the first lesson, you also completed a lab exercise. In this lab exercise, you performed a join operation using Python to extract data from a MySQL database. You then tested your knowledge of the process in a quiz. You should now be equipped with the skills and knowledge required to perform queries in a MySQL database using Python. Well done. I look forward to guiding you through the next module in which you'll explore the topic of advanced database clients. There are many different types of tasks that you need to perform when working with a MySQL database. Functions are a great way to store the syntax that you need for these tasks as reusable blocks of code. These code blocks mean that you don't have to retype your code each time you need to use it. Over the next few minutes, you'll recap the basics of functions and learn how they're used with Python. Little Lemon's MySQL database holds a lot of data on different aspects of the company like customer behavior and sales revenue. Little Lemon can use functions to perform specific operations on their database and return results. They can then use the data from these results to improve the restaurant's performance. So, let's quickly recap the basics of MySQL functions. As you probably already know, a MySQL function is a piece of code that performs a specific operation and returns a result. In other words, it's a task that combines a set of instructions and produces results in the form of an output. MySQL functions provide a lot of advantages for database engineers. Some MySQL functions accept parameters or arguments, while others don't. They're great for manipulating data in a database. You can also create custom functions that combine several tasks in a block of code. You can then store these functions within your database and invoke them when needed. And, as you've just discovered, MySQL functions are reusable, so they can be used to complete repeat tasks. At this stage of your database engineering journey, you've probably made use of many different types of functions. The most common built-in functions available in MySQL include string functions, numeric functions, and date and time functions. There's also comparison and control flow functions. Let's take a moment to recap the basics of these different types of functions and look at how Little Lemon can make use of them. Let's begin with string functions. These functions are used to manipulate string values, like adding strings together or extracting a segment of a string. An example of a string function is concat. Concat combines data from two separate tables into one string. Little Lemon can use a concat string query function on their database records to extract information on each customer, like how much money they spent. You can also use numeric functions in MySQL. Numeric functions include aggregate and math functions. These functions are used to carry out common tasks on numeric data sets. For example, Little Lemon can use the average numeric function to determine the average dollar amount that each customer spends with the business. Another example of MySQL functions includes date and time functions. Date and time functions can be used to query a MySQL database to extract date and time values in a range of different formats, depending on the query. Over at Little Lemon, they often extract date and time data to analyze the behavior of their customers. They can use this data to find out how long guests spend at the restaurant and which days are the busiest. Next up is comparison functions. You can use these functions to compare values within a database, and they can be used with many different types of values, like numerical, strings, and characters. Little Lemon make use of comparison functions to identify the best and lowest selling items on their menu 
by using greatest and least comparison functions on their sales data. And finally, there's control flow functions. Control flow functions are used to evaluate conditions and to determine the execution path or flow of a query. For example, as you learned previously, the case function runs through a set of conditions within a case block. It then returns a value once a condition is met, or a null value if no conditions are met. Little Lemon often rely on control flow functions to determine which items on their menu are loss making and which items have turned a profit. Now that you've recapped the different functions available in MySQL, let's find out how they work with Python. Let's take the example of numeric functions and see how Little Lemon calculate the mean or average bill for each customer. They can create a select query that uses the average function to determine the average bill amount. This query is passed to the database to be executed. Once the query is executed, Little Lemon can access the results and see the average dollar amount each client spent with the business. This is just a basic recap of MySQL functions and a short demonstration of how they work in Python. The rest of this lesson will explore methods for accessing MySQL functions using Python in more detail. I'm looking forward to exploring this topic in more detail with you. As a database engineer, you can use date and time functions to extract time and date values from a database. And you can perform similar tasks using the functions available in Python's native DateTime library. In this video, you'll learn about the different date time functions available in Python and how you can make use of them. Little Lemon has received several bookings from guests for tonight. However, the restaurant has encountered a scheduling conflict. So they need to push each booking slot forward by one hour. Python's date time functions are a great way to solve this problem. Find out how date time functions work, then help Little Lemon to update their booking slots. Let's begin with an overview of DateTime. DateTime is a Python class with several built-in functions that can be used to format and change time and date variables. It's native to Python, so you can import it without requiring pip. Let's review the functions that Python's DateTime library offers. The DateTimeNow function is used to retrieve today's date. You can also use DateTimeDate to retrieve just the date, or DateTimeTime, to call the current time. And the time delta function calculates the difference between two values. Now let's look at the syntax for implementing date time. To import the date time Python class, use the import code followed by the library name. Then use the as keyword to create an alias of dt. You can now use this alias to call the library instead of typing date time every time you need to use a function. You now have a datetime object created within your Python environment. So, let's find out how to make use of its functionality using the datetimeNow function. Begin by creating a variable called currentTime. Next, type the dt alias as the module name. Then use it to call the datetimeNow function. Finally, instruct Python to print the current date and time values. Execute the code to print the time and date of your location. Python returns the date and then the time. The date is displayed in year, month, day format. The time is displayed in hours, minutes, seconds format. But what if you just need to know the current time? Or maybe you just want today's date? You can use the same code again, but this time give Python two separate print instructions. The first instruction tells Python to print the current date, and the second instruction tells Python to print the current time. When the code is executed, Python displays each value separately. Let's look at a slightly more complex function, time delta. When making plans, it can be useful to project into the future. For example, what date is this same day next week? You can answer questions like this using the time delta function to calculate the difference between two values and return the result in a Python-friendly format. So, to find the date in seven days' time, you can create a new variable called week. Type the dt module and access the time delta function as an object instance. 
then pass through seven days as an argument. Finally, instruct Python to print the results of the variable. When executed, Python returns the value of the date one week from now. Now that you know how date time works, let's see if you can help Little Lemon. As you learned earlier, Little Lemon have encountered a scheduling conflict. To resolve it, they need to push each booking slot forward by one hour. You can carry out this task by instructing Python to retrieve the data from the bookings table and then adding one hour to each booking. Let's assume that Little Lemon have already passed through their login details, created a new cursor instance and pointed the cursor at their database. Your first task is now to import the datetime library so that you can work with datetime. Use the import keyword and import the library using the alias dt. This alias is used for greater efficiency. Next, write a SQL select statement to return all data from the bookings table. Pass the statement to the execute module from the cursor as a string argument. Before entering the loop, instruct Python to print the column names from the bookings table so that you can view each item in the row. You can assign these values to variables and create a new variable called new booking slot that holds the values for the updated time slots. To add an hour to each time slot, pass an argument of one hour to the time delta function and then add the function to the booking slot variable. Finally, instruct Python to print the values for the new booking slots in the form of a text string. This text string details the values of each booking ID along with its respective old and new booking slots. Loop through the results from the query and extract the rows from the booking ID and booking slot columns. As the results show, booking ID is the first value and booking slot is the fourth value. You should now be familiar with the different datetime functions available in Python and how you can make use of them. Working with datetime functions can be difficult, but you've made a great start towards mastering this topic. As a database engineer, you can use date and time functions to extract time and date values from a database. And you can perform similar tasks using the functions available in Python's native datetime library. In this video, you'll learn about the different date time functions available in Python and how you can make use of them. Little Lemon has received several bookings from guests for tonight. However, the restaurant has encountered a scheduling conflict. So they need to push each booking slot forward by one hour. Python's date time functions are a great way to solve this problem. Find out how date time functions work, then help Little Lemon to update their booking slots. Let's begin with an overview of datetime. Datetime is a Python class with several built-in functions that can be used to format and change time and date variables. It's native to Python, so you can import it without requiring pip. Let's review the functions that Python's datetime library offers. The datetime now function is used to retrieve today's date. You can also use datetime date to retrieve just the date, or datetime time, to call the current time. And the time delta function calculates the difference between two values. Now let's look at the syntax for implementing datetime. To import the datetime Python class, use the import code followed by the library name. Then use the as keyword to create an alias of dt. You can now use this alias to call the library instead of typing datetime every time you need to use a function. You now have a datetime object created within your Python environment. So, let's find out how to make use of its functionality using the datetime now function. Begin by creating a variable called current time. Next, type the dt alias as the module name. Then use it to call the datetime now function. Finally, instruct Python to print the current date and time values. Execute the code to print the time and date of your location. Python returns the date and then the time. The date is displayed in year, month, day format. The time is displayed in hours, minutes, seconds format. But what if you just need to know the current time? Or maybe you just want today's date? You can use the same code again, but this time give Python two separate print instructions. 
The first instruction tells Python to print the current date, and the second instruction tells Python to print the current time. When the code is executed, Python displays each value separately. Let's look at a slightly more complex function, time delta. When making plans, it can be useful to project into the future. For example, what date is this same day next week? You can answer questions like this using the time delta function to calculate the difference between two values and return the result in a Python-friendly format. So, to find the date in seven days' time, you can create a new variable called week. Type the dt module and access the time delta function as an object instance. Then pass through seven days as an argument. Finally, instruct Python to print the results of the variable. When executed, Python returns the value of the date one week from now. Now that you know how date time works, let's see if you can help Little Lemon. As you learned earlier, Little Lemon have encountered a scheduling conflict. To resolve it, they need to push each booking slot forward by one hour. You can carry out this task by instructing Python to retrieve the data from the bookings table and then adding one hour to each booking. Begin by creating a connection between the front-end Python client and the back-end database. Then pass through your login details. This creates a new cursor instance and points the cursor at the Little Lemon database. Before you can begin working with DateTime, you first need to import the DateTime library. Use the import keyword and import the library using the alias dt. This alias is used for greater efficiency. Next, write a SQL select statement to return all data from the bookings table. Pass the statement to the execute module from the cursor as a string argument. Before entering the loop, instruct Python to print the column names from the bookings table so that you can view each item in the row. You can assign these values to variables and create a new variable called new booking slot that holds the values for the updated time slots. To add an hour to each time slot, pass an argument of one hour to the time delta function, and then add the function to the booking slot variable. Finally, instruct Python to print the values for the new booking slots in the form of a text string. This text string details the values of each booking ID along with its respective old and new booking slots. Loop through the results from the query and extract the rows from the booking ID and booking slot columns. As the results show, booking ID is the first value and booking slot is the fourth value. You should now be familiar with the different date time functions available in Python and how you can make use of them. Working with date time functions can be difficult, but you've made a great start towards mastering this topic. Stored procedures provide database engineers with a useful way of storing and recalling code when needed. Over the next few minutes, you'll receive a quick recap of MySQL stored procedures and how they work. Let's begin with a look at how stored procedures can help Little Lemon. Little Lemon checks the online bookings in its database every morning for a list of customers attending the restaurant that day. They rewrite the same code each morning to extract this data. But they could instead invoke a stored procedure that extracts the required data without the need to rewrite large blocks of code every morning. Before you find out how they can do this, let's recap the basics of stored procedures. A stored procedure is a block of code, or one or more pre-prepared queries, that can be stored in your database. You can then invoke or call the stored procedure as required. As you might already know, this is similar to how a function works. But don't forget the key difference between the two concepts. Functions can only have input parameters but a stored procedure can have both input and output parameters. There are three main steps to complete when using stored procedures. You should already be familiar with these. First, you create a stored procedure, then you call a stored procedure, and finally, you can drop or delete a stored procedure. Let's begin with a recap of the benefits of stored procedures. Your code is more consistent. The same code block is used each time it's invoked. You know exactly what to expect from it. Your code is reusable. You can use it as many times as you need across all your database tasks. And your code is easier to use and maintain. 
it's stored as one block that can be invoked, edited or dropped as required. Next, let's quickly recap the syntax for creating a stored procedure. To create a stored procedure, begin with the create procedure command. Then write the procedure name and a pair of parentheses to hold the parameters. Make sure that you include all required parameters within the parentheses. Finally, write the rest of the procedure logic. Then, when you need to invoke the procedure, you just type the call command followed by the procedure name. Don't forget to include the parentheses. And if you need to remove or drop a stored procedure from your database, then just type the drop procedure command followed by the procedure name. In this instance, you don't need to include any parentheses. Little Lemon can use this code to create a stored procedure that extracts the details of the customers due to visit the restaurant. They begin with the create procedure command. Then they name the procedure daily underscore customer underscore details and add the parameters. Finally, they write the logic of the procedure. Now, each morning, they just need to type the call command followed by daily underscore customer underscore details. The stored procedure then extracts the required customer data from the database. So, now that you've recapped the concept of stored procedures, you might be asking yourself, how do stored procedures relate to Python? Stored procedures increase the performance of Python applications and reduce traffic between the application and the MySQL database. The application only needs to send the name of the stored procedure and parameter to the database, instead of a large block of SQL statements. You're now familiar with the benefits of stored procedures and how to create, invoke and drop them in a database. You're now ready to learn how to perform these actions using Python. Great work! You should be familiar with creating stored procedures in a MySQL database, but how can you make use of stored procedures using Python? In this video, you'll learn how to access stored procedures using Python. Little Lemon Restaurant have a new promotional campaign where they give vouchers to all guests who spend $50 or more on a meal. To find out which guests qualify for vouchers, the team need to retrieve the guest names, booking IDs and bill amount data from the bookings and orders tables in the database. You can complete this task using a join operation but performing a separate join operation for each guest is time consuming. A better solution for Little Lemon is to create a stored procedure they can call using Python. Let's see if you can help Little Lemon to build a stored procedure using Python. The first step is to create the stored procedure as a Python string stored in a variable called stored procedure query. Next, type the create procedure command and then the name of your procedure, which is get customers and bills. Then create a begin end block. Type the logic of your stored procedure within this block using a SQL select statement. The statement concatenates the required data from both tables with the use of an inner join for all customers who've spent $50 or more. Don't worry about setting the delimiter before and after the procedure. The cursor executes the entire Python string as one MySQL statement. So, unlike with a traditional MySQL query, there's no need for a delimiter. In Python, the stored procedure is passed as a single Python string. It can also include multiple SQL statements. When executing MySQL statements through an API, the required closing semicolon is automatically appended to the end of the string. When executing a stored procedure, you need to store a block of code on the MySQL database that you can invoke when required. You can trigger this block with the cursor call procedure or call proc method. The cursor carries the stored procedure as a string in its execute module and stores it in the MySQL database. You are now ready to execute the stored procedure statement and store it on the MySQL database using Python. Call the execute method from the cursor object and pass the procedure to it as an argument. If executed successfully, the procedure is stored in the MySQL database. Now you can call this procedure. First, you need to call or invoke the procedure. You can do this using the cursor object's call proc method. Pass the name of the procedure to the module on the cursor object as an argument. Next, you need to retrieve the procedure's results. You can make use of Python's built-in next function to complete this task. 
invoke the stored results module as an argument to the next function and store them as a Python variable called results. The next function is used to return the next item from the stored results iterator. The entire result set from the MySQL server is then buffered in the results variable. Now you can invoke the fetchAll method on the results variable and save it as dataset. Once the code has been run successfully, the dataset returns a Python list of tuples. Each tuple is an individual record or row from the stored procedure. You can index the dataset or run the for loop to print all records. The results of the procedure show that there is one guest who has spent $50 or more with Little Lemon and qualifies for vouchers. You now know how to access stored procedures using Python. Great work! A MySQL database needs to provide access to many users at once, and each connection must be secure and stable so that only authenticated users can gain access and there's no risk of their connections failing. But managing secure and stable connections requires many resource-heavy actions. So how can you perform these actions efficiently? The answer lies in database connection pooling. In this video, you'll explore the concept of database connection pooling, investigate how it works, and learn about its advantages. Little Lemon's website has a Python-based application that lets guests book time slots with the restaurant. The application sends the guest's bookings as SQL statements to the Little Lemon database. However, the website needs to provide each guest with a secure and stable connection to the Little Lemon database. This is so that they can input their booking data without any risk of connection failure. Little Lemon can manage these connections with the use of database connection pooling. Let's find out more. Database connection pooling involves creating and managing a pool of connections to run faster, more efficient and optimized connections between clients and a MySQL database. To gain a better understanding of how connection pooling works, let's explore a visual example. Visualize a pool of four open connections to a MySQL database. Two of the connections are currently being used by clients to access the database. The other two connections are free and ready to use by any new user. A new user can arrive and request access to the database. The connection pool then assigns this new user one of the open connections. Shortly after the new user is assigned their connection, the first two users complete their tasks, end their sessions and leave the pool. Even though the users have left the pool, the connections remain open. Technically speaking, the connections aren't closed. They're just placed back in the connection pool where they remain available for new users. There are now three free and ready-to-use connections that can be assigned to new users. But what if all four connections are in use and a fifth user wants to join? There are only four connections available. So how can you serve the fifth user's access request? To avoid this situation, the best approach is to create multiple pools with a specific number of connections assigned to each pool. This means that different users can be assigned to different pools. So, there's always an available connection in at least one pool for new users. You can also program the system to create a new connection within a pool if an appropriate connection isn't available in other pools. Little Lemon can use this approach to manage connections to their MySQL database. They can create a series of connection pools that their guests can use to record their bookings in the database. There are a few key advantages to connection pooling. Connection pooling makes efficient use of available resources. It reduces the time and effort required to establish connections. Connection pools simplify programming models, and they increase the performance of the Python application when connecting to the MySQL database. You should now be familiar with the concept of database connection pooling, be able to explain how it works, and describe its advantages. There's lots more to learn about connection pooling in this lesson, but you're off to a great start. Database connection pools are a great way of providing secure, authenticated connections to a database for multiple users. And the MySQL Connector Python API provides a useful method for developing connection pools in the form of the MySQL Connection Pool module. In this video, you'll learn how to create a connection pool for a database using the MySQL Connection Pool module. Little Lemon need to provide secure, authenticated connections to their database for their team of web developers. 
they've decided that the most efficient way of providing these connections is through connection pooling. Let's take a few minutes to find out how to build a connection pool. Then use your new skills to help Little Lemon build a secure connection pool. A database connection pool is managed and maintained using a module called MySQL Connection Pool. The module is held in a directory called mysql.connector.pooling. You can import the module into your working environment and access its functionality using the import syntax. And the from keyword is used to identify the module's location. In other words, the code is instructing Python to access the subdirectory and return the MySQL Connection Pool library. The MySQL Connection Pool module has many useful functions and attributes that you can make use of. Let's look at a few of these. The pool name class attribute is used to identify the name of the pool to be used in the connection. If you don't specify a pool, then one is automatically generated instead. You can create as many pools as you need. The pool size attribute states the number of connections that have been created for a pool. The default number of connections is 5, but you can create up to 32 connections for a single pool. And finally, there's the connection ID attribute. This is a unique ID assigned to each connection in the pool. There are also many class methods available in the MySQL connection pool module. You can use the getConnection method to request a connection. The pool then assigns a free connection if one is available. If no connection is available, then you'll receive a pool exhausted error instead. The isConnected method is a Boolean function that returns either a true or false value depending on whether a connection has been made. This is a useful way of avoiding errors. Finally, the close method informs the connection pool that a user has completed their session. The user no longer needs the connection, so the connection can be placed back into the pool as an available connection for any new users who need it. Now that you're familiar with the module connection pool, let's see if you can help Little Lemon. As you learned earlier, Little Lemon want to create a connection pool to provide users with efficient access to their database. Before you can create a connection pool, you first need to import the MySQL connection pool library using the MySQL connector Python API. Once you've imported the connector, the next step is to make a connection to the database. Call the pool Little Lemon Pool, then use the pool size attribute to specify four connections. Use the local host as your host and place the pool on the Little Lemon database. Then type the username and password. All this code is passed as arguments or parameters to the MySQL connection pool module and assigned to the pool. Next, you need to create a Python list of users for the connection pool. You can call this list users. Populate the list with members of Little Lemon's guest list. You then need to create a SQL SELECT statement. This statement must accept an integer. The integer must correspond with different ID requests accessing different data points as database users. Now you need to use the FOR loop. You can use it with the RANGE function. The RANGE function is used with the pool size attribute. This means that no matter how big the pool is, the loop always runs to the end. The next step is to set up the application's connection. Write a statement that checks if a connection was successfully made within the pool. This statement also avoids any errors appearing in your code. Then write a statement that instantiates a new cursor from the existing active pool connections. This action must occur for each new live connection that's successfully made with the pool. Next, create a print statement that displays the following information on screen. The user requesting information from the database, the unique connection assigned to this user, and the unique booking ID that they're requesting. The print statement is formatted using curly braces. These symbols take the specified variables in the order that they are specified from the format function. So, this means that the information is printed in the order you specify. The next line of your code is a parameterized SELECT statement. This statement uses the initial SQL SELECT statement from earlier and combines it with the incremented i to assign a different booking ID to each user. Then you can use the fetch all method to return all information that corresponds with this SQL SELECT statement and print the information on screen. 
You can also create an else statement that generates an error message on screen if a live connection cannot be found. Finally, use the close method to return a user's connection back to the pool when they have ended their session. You should now know how to create a connection pool for a database using the functions and attributes available with the MySQL Connection Pool module. Congratulations! You've reached the end of the third module in this course. You should now be familiar with how to make use of functions and stored procedures in a MySQL database using Python, along with creating and managing database connection pools. Let's take a few moments to recap some of the key skills that you've gained in this module's lessons. In the first lesson of this module, you learned how to make use of MySQL functions using Python. You began with a quick review of MySQL functions by reminding yourself of the advantages that functions offer. Their main advantage is that they eliminate the need to carry out repetitive tasks. You also familiarized yourself with many of the common MySQL functions that you explored in earlier courses. These included string, numeric, and date and time functions, as well as comparison and control flow functions. You recapped how string functions are used to manipulate string values. You learned how to make use of numeric functions to perform tasks on numeric datasets. You saw how you can extract date and time values from a database using date and time functions. You received a reminder of how to compare values within a database using comparison functions. And you reviewed the process steps for using control flow functions to evaluate conditions and determine the execution path or flow of a query. You then learned how to access MySQL functions using Python by exploring examples from the Little Lemon database. And you also demonstrated your new skills and knowledge in the lab and quiz activities. In the second lesson of this module, you recapped the basics of stored procedures. You learned once again that a stored procedure is a block of code that can be stored in your database and invoked as required. Stored procedures offer several advantages, like consistent code, reusable code, and the ability to maintain code as one single block. You then recapped the syntax used to create stored procedures, including the create procedure, call and drop procedure commands, and the begin end block. And you examined the advantages of using stored procedures with Python. You saw that they increase the performance of Python and reduce traffic between Python and MySQL. In the next item in this lesson, you learned how to access stored procedures using Python. You explored some examples of stored procedures from Little Lemon, like the inner join operation. You saw how they made use of these stored procedures in Python to query a MySQL database. You also learned how to call or invoke a procedure in Python using the call proc method. Retrieving results using Python's next function. And you saw an example of the use of fetch all method. Once a stored procedure has been successfully run using Python, the data is returned as a list of tuples. You can index the data set or run the for loop to print all records. You then demonstrated your ability to use stored procedures in Python in a lab environment. And you tested your knowledge of Python and stored procedures in a quiz. In the third and final lesson of this module, you learned about connection pools. During this review, you learned that connection pools are resource efficient, provide faster connectivity, simplify programming models, and increase the performance of Python applications. You then learned about Python MySQL connection pools. You learned that a database connection pool is managed and maintained using a MySQL connection pool module. This module is imported into your working environment so that you can access its functionality. The module also offers many useful functions and attributes that you can make use of. This includes pool name, pool size, and connection ID. And there are also several class methods available like getConnection, isConnected, and close. These methods are useful for managing and maintaining the module. You then explored an example of how to create a MySQL connection pool using the MySQL Connector Python API. You also explored the concept of database connection pooling. You learned that database connection pooling involves creating and managing a pool of connections to run faster, more efficient, and optimized connections between clients and a MySQL database. 
Connections are managed between clients and users can drop in and out of sessions by using active connections. And you can create multiple pools with specific numbers of connections so that there's always an available connection for every user. You then completed a lab in which you worked with connection pools and you tested your knowledge of connection pools in a quiz. You should now be equipped with the skills and knowledge required to work with MySQL functions and stored procedures using Python. And you should also now be able to create and manage database connection pools. Well done. I look forward to guiding you through the next module in which you'll work with a database client. In this course, you learned about database clients. Let's take a few moments to recap the key lessons that you encountered in this course. You started the module by learning about the MySQL Connector Python API and how to make use of the pip package. You then learned how to install a front-end Python client and connect it to a back-end MySQL database. You then explored how to establish communication between Python and MySQL to perform CRUD operations. Once you established a connection, you then accessed a cursor object. Once you had access to the cursor object, you created a MySQL database and table using Python. You then committed changes in a MySQL database using Python. In the third and final lesson of Module 1, you explored the concept of cursors in a MySQL database. You learned how cursors work in Python and MySQL. You also reviewed the key characteristics of cursors and learned that they're read-only, non-scrollable and A-sensitive. You then learned that the cursor class is used to translate communication between Python and a MySQL database. And you also learned how to identify different cursor classes. And you also reviewed the basics of interleaving requests. The second module focused on performing create, read, update and delete or CRUD operations in a MySQL database using Python. You began the module by learning how to create and read records in a database. You reviewed the steps for this process and discovered how Python communicates with the database to carry out these actions. You then learned how to perform MySQL update and delete operations using Python. And you learned how to commit the changes to the database. You completed this first lesson by performing a series of lab exercises in which you demonstrated your ability to carry out CRUD operations in a MySQL database using Python. In the second lesson of Module 2, you learned how to perform advanced queries in a MySQL database using Python. The first of these queries involved filtering and sorting data in a MySQL database using Python. You recapped the basics of MySQL filtering and sorting techniques from earlier courses and learned how these same techniques are applied to Python. Next, you learned how to perform a range of different join operations to join data from different tables in a MySQL database using Python. You then received an opportunity to test your ability to perform advanced queries in MySQL database using Python through a series of labs. Module 3 focused on advanced database clients. The first lesson in this module began with an overview of how to use MySQL functions with Python. You began by learning how to identify the importance of MySQL functions, and you reviewed the different types of functions available in MySQL. You also learned how MySQL makes use of functions using Python. Once you finished recapping the basics of MySQL functions, you then learned how to implement or access MySQL functions using Python. You also explored date-time functions in Python and learned how to make use of these functions to update a MySQL database using Python. You then demonstrated your ability to make use of these functions in lab exercises. In the second lesson in this third module, you explored how to use MySQL stored procedures with Python. You recapped the basics of stored procedures and learned how they differ from functions and why they're used with Python. You then learned how to access stored procedures through Python with the use of the call proc method. And you also reviewed the use of delimiters. The third and final lesson in this module focused on connection pools. You began by developing an understanding of the concept of database connection pooling. You learned how to explain database connection pooling. And you learned how to identify the advantages of database connection pooling. You then reviewed the steps for creating a connection pool for a database, including the process for implementing the connection pool SQL module. 
you've reached the end of this course recap. It's now time to try out what you've learned in the graded assessment. Good luck. You've reached the end of this course. You've worked hard to get here and developed a lot of new skills along the way. You're making great progress on your MySQL journey and you should now understand database clients. You were able to demonstrate some of this learning along with your practical MySQL skill set in the lab project. Following your completion of this lab project, you should now be able to interact with the MySQL database using Python, perform queries in MySQL using Python, and make use of MySQL functions, procedures, and connection pools. The graded assessment then further tested your knowledge of these skills. However, there's still more for you to learn. So, if you found this course helpful and want to discover more, then why not register for the next one? You'll continue to develop your skill set during each of the database engineer courses. In the final lab, you'll apply everything you've learned to create your own fully functional database system. Whether you're just starting out as a technical professional, a student, or a business user, the course end projects prove your knowledge of the value and capabilities of database systems. The lab consolidates your abilities with the practical application of your skills. But the lab also has another important benefit. It means that you'll have a fully operational database that you can reference within your portfolio. This serves to demonstrate your skills to potential employers. And not only does it show employers that you are self-driven and innovative, but it also speaks volumes about you as an individual, as well as your newly obtained knowledge. And once you've completed all the courses in this specialization, you'll receive a certificate in database engineering. The certificate can also be used as a progression to other role-based certificates. Depending on your goals, you may choose to go deep with advanced role-based certificates or take other fundamental courses once you earn the certificate. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to embark on this journey of discovery with you. Best of luck in the future. Welcome to the next course in Database Engineering. The focus of this course is on advanced data modeling. Let's take a few moments to review some of the new skills that you'll develop in these modules. You'll begin the course with an introduction to the topic of advanced database modeling. You'll learn that a data model provides a visual representation of different data elements and shows how they relate to one another. You'll also discover how data modeling is used at Meta. You'll then explore database modeling in more detail by learning about different kinds of data models. You'll discover that there are three levels of database models. There's the conceptual data model, the logical data model, and the physical data model. You'll also review different kinds of models that you can use to design your database. Next, you'll learn how to structure your tables to remove anomalies using database normalization. These include the insertion anomaly, the update anomaly, and the deletion anomaly. You'll also explore an example of a data model and design a database model in an exercise. In the next lesson of this module, you'll receive an introduction to MySQL Workbench. You'll learn that MySQL Workbench is a unified visual tool for database modeling and management. It offers a range of useful features for creating, editing, and managing databases. You'll then discover how MySQL Workbench is used to build a data model diagram. And you'll then learn how MySQL's Workbench Forward Engineer feature is used to turn this model into a database schema in MySQL. You'll also learn how you can use MySQL to reverse engineer a model. This means you can create a data model, or ER diagram, from an existing database. This is essentially the opposite to the Forward Engineer feature. And you can print the model, share it, or apply changes and push it to the database using the forward engineering method. You'll also complete this lesson with a quiz item and an exercise in which you'll design your own database model in MySQL Workbench. In the next module, you'll explore the topic of data warehousing. In this module, you'll learn about the architecture of a data warehouse and build a dimensional data model. You'll begin with an overview of the concept of data warehousing. You'll learn that a data warehouse is a centralized data repository that loads, integrates, stores, and processes large amounts of data from multiple sources. Users can then query this data to perform data analysis. You'll then discover that a data warehouse is defined by four key characteristics. It's subject-oriented, it's integrated, 
A data warehouse is also non-volatile. And finally, data warehouses are time variant. You'll also review the different forms of data that a data warehouse handles, including structured data, semi-structured data, and unstructured data. You'll then explore the architecture of a data warehouse and learn that it includes the following components, data sources, the data staging area, which includes the ETL process, the data warehouse itself, and data marts. Once the data has been loaded from the data sources, it is then integrated and stored in the data warehouse. It's then organized in data marts, where users can perform data analysis and present their findings. These components control the flow of data from different sources. They also process and integrate this data so that the user can perform data analysis. You'll also explore a case study of a real-world data project. In the second lesson of this module, you'll explore dimensional data modeling. The lesson begins with an overview of the fundamentals of dimensional data modeling. You'll learn that it's based on dimensions and facts, and it's designed using star and snowflake schemas. You'll then explore some examples of dimensional data modeling in practice and learn that there are four key steps to follow when creating a model. Choose the business process to explore, choose the grain or level of granularity, choose the dimensions, and choose the facts. Once you've made all these choices, you can then create the schema. Finally, you'll undertake an exercise in which you'll create your own dimensional model. In the third module of this course, you'll explore data analytics in the context of dimensions and measures, and you'll learn how to perform visualized data analysis using an advanced analytics tool. You'll start with an overview of data analytics. You'll recap the basics of data analytics and the key types of data analytics that you've made use of at other points in your database engineering journey. You'll also learn that there are two generic types of data you'll deal with, quantitative data, which refers to numerical data, and qualitative data, which refers to non-numerical data. When you've determined what kind of data you need, you can process and analyze it using four measurement scales, the nominal scale, the ordinal scale, the interval scale, and the ratio scale. Next, you'll learn about the topics of data mining and machine learning. You'll learn that data mining is the process of detecting patterns in data, while machine learning is the process of teaching a computer how to learn. Machine learning makes use of data mining models to process data like classification analysis, the associate rule, clustering analysis, and regression analysis. You'll then learn about data visualization. You'll learn that when visualizing your data, you must consider your audience and the information they're looking for. You'll then need to choose an appropriate chart that best communicates this information. Finally, You'll conclude this lesson with a discussion around what kind of data analytics reports you make use of. In the final lesson of this module, you'll review the topic of data analytics and learn how to make use of data analytics tools like Tableau. As part of your introduction to Tableau, you'll learn what its key features are and how they help you perform data analytics. You'll then learn how to use Tableau to analyze data. You'll learn how to download, launch, and navigate Tableau, load and prepare data for analysis, filter and visualize data, and create an interactive dashboard. Finally, you'll complete an exercise in which you'll perform data analysis in Tableau. Now that you've reached the end of this course introduction, it's time to get started on your advanced data modeling journey. Good luck. The way the industry has developed with the internet, Web3, the metaverse, you are going to be working on systems that connect to a database. There are very few jobs that won't require this. So this is one of the most important fundamental skills that you can learn for a successful career. Hi, my name is Moxie. I use they, them pronouns. I am a software engineer at Meta in the Menlo Park office. There's not a one-size-fits-all process for data modeling. The process for developing a new data model for a new product is very different than retrofitting an old product uh, to add a new feature or to comply with a new regulation. And so you will have to adjust your process accordingly to the needs that you're encountering. And that's why these skills are so important to learn. 
data modeling is conducted by different people depending on the context we are changing or creating a data model for. If we are building a new product and we already have the business case, this will be led by a lead engineer, uh, generally discussing what the high level needs of the product are. If we are changing data model for user privacy or for a specific feature, uh, the person leading that discussion may be the individual engineer or it could be someone involved in the regulatory processes. One thing that's very important about Meta is that every engineer is empowered to add to the discussion and change things. And so even though it may be a lead engineer that's designing the first data model and bringing it forward, every engineer is expected to be able to talk about it and bring forward their ideas to improve our data models for our user needs and our product. One of the challenges at Meta around data modeling is making sure that we are using our user data properly and that when we are accessing new data, that we are being responsible with that data. This is a big challenge because there's a lot of data that we have access to and we wanna make sure we're only using the specific needs that we have and getting uh, actually approvals for all these things. And this can be a very arduous process because we do have to justify where we're getting our data from, how we're using it, how we're storing it, how long we're storing it for. There's a lot of details and you have to be very prepared for those meetings and very prepared to justify why or why not you're including some data. Managing changes to a database uh, is a very complicated process, and there's a lot of teams at Meta dedicated to ensuring that the data is stored securely, that it's reliable, uh, that there's fallbacks. There's a lot of considerations you have to take into from an engineering perspective, but from an overall infrastructure, there is a lot of teams managing and deploying uh, the code and the database changes in order to make this uh, work. So something like Meta or Facebook uh, with its billions of users uh, is not going to be maintained by a single individual. And so I think it's important to understand that uh, because a database is a common point for all the products, that we have to take great care when making changes and we have to coordinate with a lot of different other teams. If you really want to get good at data modeling, you have to really think about why you're getting your data, how you're storing it, and how you're protecting it. So you really have to think about the trust that is being put into you when doing that, especially if you have user information. There are a lot of considerations that you're going to need to build a good data model. And the questions you need to ask are sometimes tough questions, and you need to think about trade-offs. I hope you walk away from this video learning that Databases are very complex systems that require a lot of coordination. And even though one singular data model may be designed by one person, you are still going to need to be able to coordinate with lots of other technical and cross-functional partners in order to build a successful database. When developing a database system, you need to make sure that it operates efficiently and that you can extract information from it quickly. The best way to create such a system is to first design a data model. With a data model, you can plan how data is stored and accessed within your database before you create the database system. In this video, you'll explore the concept of data modeling and review different levels of data models. The jewelry store at Mangata and Gallo, or M&G, are in the process of designing and building a database system to store data on customers, products, and orders but their current design is very inefficient. However, if M&G first focuses on creating a suitable database model, then they can design a more simplified and logical database system. Explore the basics of database modeling, then see if you can assist M&G. Let's begin with the term data modeling. A data model provides a visual representation of data elements and shows how they relate to one another. In other words, it demonstrates how your database system is structured. This structure helps you to understand how data is stored, accessed, updated, and queried within the database. And it also ensures a consistent structure and high quality data. 
Data modeling is used to develop all kinds of databases, particularly entity relational databases. These databases are planned with the use of an entity relationship diagram. There are three different levels of data modeling, conceptual data models, logical data models, and physical data models. Let's take a few moments to explore these different types. You might already be familiar with conceptual data models from previous courses. A conceptual data model consists of high abstract level of data elements called entities. The relationship between the data elements, or entities, links related records of data within your database system. The purpose of a conceptual model is to present a high-level overview of the database system through a visual representation of the entities it contains and their relationship to one another. M&G can make use of a conceptual data model to create their database system. They can present their customers, products, and orders as entities, then document how these entities are related. The conceptual model provides the basis for the logical data model. Again, you should have a basic familiarity with examples of a logical data model from previous courses. The logical data model builds on the conceptual model by providing a more detailed overview of the entities and their respective relationships. It identifies the attributes of each entity, defines the primary keys, and specifies the foreign keys. M&G can build on their conceptual data model by using it to create a logical data model. Their logical data model must include all attributes required for each entity, like a list of the attributes each entity contains. It then needs to define which of these columns serve as the primary key for each table. For example, the client ID column is the primary key for the clients table. An M&G's logical data model also specifies the foreign keys they're using to create relationships between the tables. In the current model, the client table is connected to the orders table through the client ID foreign key. A physical data model is used to create the internal SQL schema of the database, which is implemented in the database management system. The physical data model must outline features like the data types, constraints, and attributes. For example, M&G need to define a specific data type for each attribute, like varchar for the full name attribute in the client's table, or integer for the contact number attribute. They also need to apply relevant constraints. They can impose a constraint of not null for each column in the client's table to make sure that each one contains data. There are also a range of tools available to generate and execute the internal schema of a physical data model. You'll cover these tools in later lessons. You should now be familiar with the basics of data modeling and the importance of the role that it plays in the development of a database system. You should also be able to differentiate between different levels of data models and explain how each one contributes to the creation of a database system. Great work. When creating a database system, you first need to design a data model, but there are many kinds of data models that you can choose from. So how can you determine which one is best for your database system? In this video, you'll learn how to choose between different types of database models and find out how they can be used to create databases. Mangata and Gallo, or M&G, need to build their database system so that it meets the needs of their business. So they need to choose a data model that fulfills their data requirements. Explore the different types of data models, including their advantages and disadvantages, and see if you can help M&G figure out which model is best for their business. There are many kinds of models that can be used to build a database system. In this video, you'll explore the following data models, the relational data model, the entity relationship model, and the hierarchical data model. You'll also review the object-oriented model and the dimensional data model. Let's begin with a look at the relational data model. You might already be familiar with the relational data model from previous courses. It's a popular and widely used database model. It represents the database as a collection of relations. Each relation is presented as a table that stores information in the form of rows and columns. A key advantage of this model is that it's much simpler to use than other models. You can quickly identify and access data. 
But the relationships between the data in this model can become more difficult to navigate with complex relational database systems. And you might also need to structure and organize the data differently when performing data analytics. Next is the entity relationship model. This model is similar to the relational data model. The key difference is that you can present each table as a separate entity by assigning each one its own set of attributes. The model also covers many different types of relationships between entities, such as one-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many -many relationships. For example, M&G can use an entity relationship model to visualize the relationship between their clients and orders tables. The two entities are connected through the client ID column using a one-to-many relationship. In other words, one or more orders belong to a specific client. There's also the hierarchical data model. The hierarchical data model organizes data in a tree-like or parent-child structure. Each record of data has a parent node, and it can also have its own child node. The main disadvantage is that it can only be used to record one-to-many relationships between nodes. Each child node can only have one parent node. M&G can use this model to depict the relationship between their orders and clients' entities. Clients are connected to their root node, and each order is connected to the related client, while each client can be connected to many orders. M&G can continue to add nodes as required. Another option for database developers is the object-oriented model. This model is based on the object-oriented concept. This is where each object is translated to a class that defines the object's characteristics and behavior. A key advantage of this model is that you can define different types of associations between objects, like aggregations, compositions, and inheritance. This makes object-oriented databases suitable for complicated projects that require an object-oriented approach. This model also relies heavily on the inheritance feature. This is where one class inherits its attributes from another. You can create a parent or superclass, also called a base, to hold the common attributes. Each child class that follows inherits the attributes of the parent class. However, if you do make use of this model, then you need a good understanding of object-oriented principles and related programming skills. MNG can make use of an object-oriented model to retain attributes between classes. They can create a base or parent class called person entity that contains attributes and operations. The staff and client classes then inherit these attributes and operations from the person entity class. So each staff member and client are a person. Finally, there's the dimensional data model. This model is based on two key concepts, dimensions and facts. Facts are measurements obtained from a process. For example, sales facts obtained from M&G's business data. Dimensions define the context of these measurements, like a specific sales period. So, sales facts measure how many quantities of a particular product M&G sold in each week. The key advantage of this model is that it optimizes the database for faster data retrieval and restructures data for more efficient data analytics. You'll explore the dimensional data model in more detail later in this course. You should now be familiar with the different types of data models that can be used to build a database system and some of their key advantages and disadvantages. You're making great progress on your database modeling journey. At this stage of your database engineering journey, you should be familiar with the concept of database normalization. When working with database tables, you can often encounter anomalies that can lead to inconsistent data. You can solve these anomalies by applying the normalization process. Over the next few minutes, you'll recap the importance of database normalization and the methods for applying it within your databases. Mangata and Gallo, or M&G, are building a database that holds data related to product orders. They've built some tables that contain order, product, and client data. But these tables also contain several challenges around anomalies. Review the database normalization process, then help M&G to resolve these anomalies within their database tables. Let's begin with a quick recap of database normalization. Normalization is an important process used in database systems. It involves structuring tables in order to reduce data duplication, avoid data modification implications, 
and simplify data queries from the database. As you learned earlier, database tables that don't follow the normalization process often give rise to anomalies. The most common of these anomalies include an insertion anomaly. This is when new data is inserted into a table which then requires the insertion of additional data. An update anomaly. This occurs when you attempt to update a record in a table column only to discover that this results in further updates across the table. And a deletion anomaly. This is when the deletion of a record of data causes the deletion of more than one set of data required in the database. So, let's quickly recap how the three levels of data normalization can be used to help resolve or avoid these anomalies. First, normal form, sometimes referred to as 1NF, enforces data atomicity and eliminates unnecessary repeating groups of data in database tables. In other words, there must only be one instance of a value per field. Repeated groups of data cause data redundancy and inconsistency. For example, MNG's products table stores the engagement and diamond ring products in the same cell of the item column. This violates the atomicity rule. There should only be one instance of a value per column. You can resolve this issue by creating two new tables. First, create a products table that holds all data related to the product entity. Assign the table a product's ID column to identify each unique record. Then, create a client's table that holds all data related to the client's entity. And once again, create an ID column to identify each unique record. This solution removes all unnecessary repeated data from your tables. Next, let's look at second normal form. For a table to meet second normal form, or 2NF, it must already be in first normal form. It also cannot contain any relationships built on functional or partial dependency. The table must be defined with a composite primary key. For example, the delivery status table from MNG has a composite primary key that consists of the order ID and the product ID. To comply with the second normal form, you must identify if there's any non-key attributes that depend on one part of the composite key. The order data in the delivery status table is a non-key attribute. It can be determined by using the order ID column only. This is called partial dependency. This isn't permitted in second normal form because all non-key attributes must be determined by using both parts of the composite key. This can be fixed by removing the order date attribute from the delivery status table. In other words, keep the order date column in the orders table. Your table now meets second normal form. All non-primary key attributes depend only on the primary key value. Finally, there's third normal form. Third normal form, or 3NF, removes unnecessary data duplication. This ensures data consistency and integrity. Again, a table must adhere to first and second normal form before you can apply third normal form. Third normal form resolves issues of transitive dependency. This is when non-key attributes are dependent on one another. For example, the city and zip code in the MNG orders table are non-key attributes. However, it's possible to determine the city value based on the zip code value. And if you change the zip code value, you need to change the city name value. This means a non-key attribute depends on another non-key attribute, which violates the third normal form. To solve this, you can split the table into two tables, an orders table with all related data, and a city table with two columns, the zip code and city name. All non-key attributes are now determined only by the primary key in each table, so the tables now meet the requirements of 3NF. Applying the three fundamental forms of normalization is a good way to resolve any anomalies that could arise within your database. You can resolve any issues of data redundancy and inconsistency by modeling your database so that it's easy to use, access, and query. You should now be familiar with the process of normalization and how to apply it to your database. Great work! As a database engineer, you need to create, implement, and manage a database system that meets the specific requirements of your business or organization. These can be complicated tasks to carry out, but there are a range of tools and technologies you can use to support your work. One example of the tools that you will make use of is the MySQL Workbench tool. 
In this video, you'll explore the basics of the MySQL Workbench tool. You'll also learn how the tool can be used to help model and manage your databases. Over at MNG, the company is developing a new MySQL database management system. The database system must follow some key requirements, particularly in relation to operating systems, data migration, and editing tools. MNG can build a database that meets these requirements using MySQL Workbench. Take a few minutes to review the basics of MySQL Workbench, then see if you can help them out. Let's start with an overview of MySQL Workbench. MySQL Workbench is a unified visual tool developed by Oracle for database modeling and management. It contains several key features that are useful for creating, editing, and managing databases. Let's review some of MySQL Workbench's key features. MySQL Workbench is open source and cross-platform. It can be used with multiple operating systems. It simplifies database design and maintenance, and it offers a visual SQL editor and other tools that support developers. It provides auto-complete and highlighting features for writing SQL statements, and it facilitates data migration between different versions of MySQL and between MySQL and other relational database systems. You'll make use of MySQL Workbench in this course to model and manage data in your MySQL database. But first, you need to download, install, and set up MySQL Workbench on your operating system. Download a copy of MySQL Workbench from dev.mysql.com downloads. Make sure that you download the correct copy for your specific operating system. Once you've downloaded a copy, you then need to double-click the file to install it on your machine. Next, follow the installation wizard with the custom setup. When you run the wizard, make sure that you install the following software. MySQL Server, MySQL Workbench, and MySQL Shell. If you encounter any difficulties, read the MySQL Workbench installation file for guidance. Next, let's open the MySQL Workbench and find out more about how you can use it to establish connections. Once you've downloaded a copy of MySQL Workbench, you need to set it up. Launch the program and view the MySQL Workbench home screen. The home screen contains a welcome message, links to documentation, blogs, and discussion forums, and provides access to various tools and features. You can use the home screen side panel to access MySQL connections, models, and MySQL Workbench migration wizard. Select the connections option to view a list of connections to local and remote instances of MySQL. You can use connections to load, configure, group, and view information about each of your MySQL connections. Models displays the most recently used models. Each entry lists the date and time the model was last opened, along with its associated database. You can also select the plus sign to add a new model, select the folder button to browse and open saved models, and select the more button to access additional commands. You can also open the Migration tab to display an overview of prerequisites for using the wizard, start a migration process, open the ODBC administrator, or view documentation. Let's look at the process steps for creating a new user. Creating a new user is the most secure way to connect to your MySQL database because you can manage user roles and privileges. Make sure MySQL Connections is selected. First, Log in to the MySQL server using the root user. Enter the root user password you set when installing MySQL. Save the password for future reference if required. Next, select Users and Privileges under the Management menu to view a list of current database users. Select Add Account to add a new user. This opens a new window in which you can enter the new user details. Name the new user, Admin1. Enter a password, confirm the password. You can also use this window to control user privileges. Let's review these privileges. Account limits is used to limit a user's maximum number of queries, updates, and connections. The Administrative Roles tab lets you assign a role to a new user or assign them associate privileges. In this case, select DBA that grants the right to perform all tasks. Schema Privileges lets you control new user access privileges. Select the Apply button to create the new user. The next task is to create a new MySQL connection. From the MySQL Workbench home screen, select the plus icon to open the Setup New Connection form. 
fill in the form to create a new server instance. You can now use the following values. Use test server as the server instance name. In the username text field, type admin1. You can use the default settings for all other parts of the form. Finally, make sure your hostname is 127.0.0.1 and the port number is 3306. Click the Test Connection button to check that the settings work as required. Enter the password you set for admin1 user. If you set it up correctly, then MySQL Workbench should confirm that the connection was successful. If not, return to the form and check that you've entered the information correctly. Select OK to save the connection. Your new MySQL connection is added to the home screen. You can now use this connection to begin working with database schemas and SQL queries. You should now be familiar with the basic features of the MySQL Workbench tool and know how to use it to help model and manage your databases. You're well on your way to understanding advanced data modeling. As a database engineer, you'll frequently need to create complex and robust database systems. This can be a difficult task, but luckily you can use tools like MySQL Workbench to create database systems quickly and efficiently. In this video, you'll learn how to use MySQL Workbench to create databases and tables and view, insert, and select data. Over at M&G, they need to create a database system to manage staff records. They've decided to create this new database using MySQL Workbench because of its SQL Editor, GUI, and other useful features. Let's help M&G to create their new database using MySQL Workbench. The first task is to create a new database schema. Choose a MySQL Server instance and select the Schema menu. To create a new schema, select the Create Schema option from the menu pane in the Schema toolbar. This action opens a new window. Within this new window, enter mg underscore schema in the database name text field. Select Apply. This generates a SQL script called Create Schema MG Schema. You are then asked to review the SQL script to be applied to your new database. Click on the Apply button within the Review window if you're satisfied with the script. A new window screen appears asking if you'd like to execute the Create Schema statement. Select the Finish button to create the MG Schema. The schema has now been successfully created and is listed in the Schema menu. You might need to select the Refresh icon from the menu to view new schemas. To view information on the MG Schema, select it and click the Information icon. This action brings up a new window that contains several options like tables, columns, triggers, and more. You can also double-click the schema name to view a submenu of all created tables, views, procedures, and functions. If you want to delete the schema, right-click the name and select the Drop Schema option. The next task is to create a new table inside the MG schema to hold the staff information. Right-click the Tables option in the submenu, select Create Table from the list of options that appear. This brings up a new table form. Enter Staff in the Table Name text field. Use the default settings for all other fields. Fill the column details in the middle window as required. Change the name of the first column to Staff ID. Define the column as Integer and set it as the primary key using the checkboxes. Add the following remaining columns using the same method. Full name, contact number, role, and email. Set each column's data type. Then declare each column as either null or not null as required. Finally, click the Apply button to generate the relevant SQL statement. You should now be able to review the SQL statement that creates the staff table. Click the Apply button to generate the relevant SQL statement. Review the SQL statement and click Apply to execute the statement. Then select Finish to save your changes. You can now view the staff table in the MG Schema database. Select the information icon to view the table's structure. The information window appears and shows options for columns, indexes, and other table elements. Click the Columns tab to show the column structure. Another method is to type Describe Staff in the SQL Editor. Then click the Run button to execute the statement. This displays the details of the staff table structure. Your next task is to create a virtual table in the schema called Staff View. First, 
Right-click the View submenu of the MG schema. Select the Create View option to open the SQL editor. Type a Create View SQL statement to create the virtual table. Create a basic view to show the staff full names and contact numbers. Click the Apply button to bring up the review window. You'll see some SQL code with suggestions that you can either accept or amend as required. For now, amend the table by creating aliases for the columns so that they're easier to view when querying the table. Finally, click the Apply button. Then click Finish to create the table. You can now view the virtual table in the MG Schema submenu. Next, MG needs you to populate the staff table with data. To insert data in the staff table, you'd usually use the Insert SQL statement in the SQL editor. However, with MySQL Workbench, you can populate the table grid directly. First, right-click the staff table, then select Rows from the list of options that appear. Enter the MG staff records into the table. Click the Apply button to generate an automatic Insert Into statement. Then click the Apply button again once you've reviewed the statement in the Review window to execute the statement. Finally, select Finish. The staff records are now stored in the staff table. Your final task is to query data from the MNG database. You can query the database using MySQL Workbench's SQL Editor. Write a select query that extracts all data from the staff view table. This query outputs all data that exists within the staff view table into a table grid. MNG have now created their staff table and populated it with required data. MNG have now created their staff table and populated it with the required data. And you should now be familiar with how to use MySQL Workbench to create databases and tables, as well as view, insert, and select data. Great work. At this stage of the course, you understand the importance of database models. But how do you create these models? You can create database models using professional data modeling tools such as MySQL Workbench. In this video, you'll learn how to use MySQL Workbench and make use of the forward and the reverse engineer features. MNG need to develop a basic database to maintain information about their customers and orders. They can use MySQL Workbench to create the model. Then they can use MySQL Workbench's forward engineer feature to transform the data model into a SQL schema and implement it automatically into MySQL. Let's help MNG create their database using MySQL Workbench. In the MySQL Workbench home screen, click the Models view from the left sidebar. Then click the plus icon next to the models to display a new window. This action creates a new schema called MyDB. Double click the schema name and change it to Mangata underscore Gallo. The next step is to create the data model diagram. This diagram is essential for using the forward engineer feature. You can create the data model in MySQL Workbench and then transform it into a SQL schema that can be implemented automatically in MySQL. First, double-click Add Diagram to create the ER Diagram. This action opens the ER Diagram Designer page. Now you need to create the tables. Click the Add Table icon and then click a square within the view. This action creates a table entity. Double-click the entity to load the table editor. Change the default Table 1 name to Customers. Now you need to add columns to the Customers table. Double-click a cell. This creates a default ID Customers column. Change its name to Customer ID. Keep the data type as integer. Check the primary key NOT NULL and AUTO INCREMENT boxes. Then add three more columns, full name, contact number, and email. Set the data types as required and mark all three columns as NOT NULL. Follow the same steps to create the orders table and set the data types as required. You also need to create the orders table foreign key. Define the table's customer ID column as the foreign key using the foreign keys tab at the bottom of the window. Type customer ID FK in the foreign key text field. Double click the corresponding field in the reference table. Then select the customers table. Check the customer ID referenced column. Then mark it as on update cascade. 
and on delete cascade. You now have a visual representation of the MNG schema ER diagram with the customers and orders tables. Save your work by clicking File Save As and name it Mangata underscore Gallo underscore model. Now that you've created the data model, you can synchronize it to the MySQL server using the Forward Engineer feature. Select the Database tab, then the Forward Engineer option from the menu. This opens the Forward Engineer to Database wizard. Select the connection that you created earlier to connect to the MySQL server. Leave the default setting as is. Click Next. The wizard lists some advanced options. You can ignore these for now. Just click Next. A new window appears called Select Objects to Forward Engineer with a series of options. Check the Export MySQL Table Objects box, then click Next. The next step displays the SQL script to be executed on the MySQL server to create the internal schema. Review the script to ensure that it creates the schema as required. Click Next to forward engineer the SQL script. A message appears stating Forward Engineer finished successfully. Click Close to close the wizard. The MNG database has now been created in MySQL. You can confirm this by examining the schema list in the Navigator section, or executing a Show Databases statement inside the Workbench SQL Editor. MNG also need to use MySQL Workbench to reverse engineer a data model. This means building a data model ER diagram from an existing database. The first step is to go to the Database tab, then select the Reverse Engineer option. Once you're happy with the connection details, click Next. Each connection must be configured appropriately to connect with MySQL Server. If you're not happy with the existing connection, you can choose another one and click Next. A message appears stating, Execution completed successfully. Click Next. A list of available schemas on the server is displayed. Select the database schema you want to reverse engineer, then click Next. A message appears on screen stating, Retrieval completed successfully. Click Next. A new screen appears in which you are presented with the option to select all objects. The screen confirms that all objects have been retrieved. Click Execute. Once the retrieval process has been successfully executed, a message is displayed which states, Operation completed successfully. The selected objects have now been reverse engineered successfully. Click Next again. A final screen is displayed which shows a summary of the import. Click Finish to complete the process. MySQL Workbench creates the new ER diagram from the internal MySQL schema. You can print the data model as a PNG image, share it with others, or apply changes and push it to the database using the Forward Engineer feature. MNG have now developed a basic schema in their database using MySQL Workbench, and you should now know how to make use of the reverse engineer feature in MySQL Workbench to develop a data model diagram. Well done! Congratulations on reaching the end of the first module in this advanced data modeling course. In this module, you learned how to design a suitable database model, resolve any anomalies, and then implement the model in your database using MySQL Workbench. Let's take a few minutes to recap some of the key skills you gained in this module's lessons. In the first lesson, you reviewed the concept of data modeling and learned that a data model demonstrates how your database system is structured. You also discovered that there are three different levels of data modeling. The conceptual data model presents an abstract overview of the database system through a visual representation of the entities and their relationship to one another. Then, there's the logical data model. This model identifies the attributes of each entity and defines the primary and foreign keys of each table. And the third and final level is the physical data model. This model provides the detailed level required to implement the internal schema in the database management system. You then explore different types of data models available to database engineers. You reviewed their advantages and disadvantages to determine which is best for your needs. Some of the models that you reviewed included the relational data model, the entity relationship model, and the hierarchical data model. There's also the object-oriented model and the dimensional data model. You also recap the topic of database normalization. 
you discovered that normalization is the process of structuring tables to resolve anomalies such as the insertion anomaly, the update anomaly, and the deletion anomaly. You also recap the three levels of data normalization that are used to resolve these anomalies. First normal form, or 1NF, which focuses on the issue of data atomicity. There's second normal form, also called 2NF. This involves fixing any relationships built on functional dependencies. And finally, there's third normal form, or 3NF. This is a method of resolving transitive dependencies. In this lesson, you also explored an example of a data model. You then demonstrated your new skills by designing your own database model in an exercise. The second lesson in this module introduced you to MySQL Workbench. MySQL Workbench is a unified visual tool for database modeling and management. It offers a range of useful features for creating, editing, and managing databases. As part of your introduction to this tool, you learned how to download and install it on your operating system. You also saw how to use the tool to create a new user and establish a connection to a MySQL database. You then discovered how MySQL Workbench can be used to manage databases. You saw how to use the tool to create and navigate a database schema. And you learned how it can be used to create and view tables, including virtual ones, and query their data. The next topic in this lesson provided an overview of database modeling in MySQL Workbench. With MySQL Workbench, you can create new database schemas. You can also build a data model diagram using MySQL Workbench's forward engineer feature. This process involves creating a data model in MySQL Workbench and then transforming it into a SQL schema that can be implemented in a MySQL database system. MySQL Workbench can also be used to reverse engineer a data model by building a data model ER diagram from an existing database. You can print the model, share it, or apply changes and push it to the database using the forward engineer feature. You then put your new skills to the test in an exercise in which you were challenged to design your very own database model in MySQL Workbench. You should now be familiar with the basics of data modeling and management. I look forward to guiding you further through advanced data modeling in the next module. A regular database collects, stores, and processes data from transactions in real time. But what if you need to aggregate and analyze data from multiple sources? In these instances, a data warehouse is the perfect solution. It can aggregate data from a range of sources and analyze it using different tools. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn what a data warehouse is, explore its main characteristics, and review the different types of data that can be used in data analytics. The online e-commerce platform Global Superstore has seen a significant drop in sales recently. They want to perform data analytics to identify the reasons behind this downturn. The company has large amounts of data from multiple different sources, like online transactions, social media interactions, and website data. Analyzing all this data requires powerful tools. A data warehouse is the perfect solution. Let's explore the concept of data warehousing in more detail and find out how Global Superstore can make use of it. A data warehouse is a centralized data repository that aggregates, stores, and processes large amounts of data from multiple sources. It separates the data analysis workload from the standard transaction workload of a regular database management system. Users can then query this data to perform data analysis. This type of database is called Online Analytical Processing, or OLAP. A regular database focuses on collecting, storing, and processing data in real time. It's also known as Online Transactional Processing, or OLTP. There are four key characteristics of a data warehouse. They're subject-oriented, integrated, non-volatile, and time-variant. Let's explore these characteristics, starting with subject-oriented. When building a data warehouse, you need to choose one or more subject areas to explore. For example, Global Superstore can build a data warehouse that focuses on sales. They can then use the warehouse to find all relevant information on their sales processes, like best and worst selling products. Integrated means that a data warehouse integrates data from a range of different sources. This data must be integrated in a consistent format. Integrated data must also resolve issues such as naming conflicts and data types. 
Global Superstore's data warehouse integrates data from online purchases, website interactions, and social media. The next characteristic is non-volatile. Non-volatile means data should not be deleted once it's loaded to the data warehouse. The purpose of a data warehouse is to analyze data as it exists. The more data you have, the better the results of your analysis. So, the data that Global Superstore integrates must not be deleted. The final characteristic is time variant. A data warehouse aggregates data over a long period so that it can measure changes in data over time. This helps users to discover trends, patterns, and relationships between data elements. For example, Global Superstore can use data from the last few years of sales to find out why their profits have declined. Now that you're familiar with the characteristics of a data warehouse, let's look at the different forms of data that it encounters. There's structured data, semi-structured data, and unstructured data. Let's start with a look at structured data. This is data that's presented in a structured format within a well-defined data model. The relational database model is commonly used for structured data. The organized tables help users to access, manage, and search for data using SQL. A data warehouse typically uses structured data. This data type is organized for a specific purpose, so it's easier to gain insights from and uncover answers to specific questions. Semi-structured data is data that's only partially structured. It requires more effort to perform data analysis. An example of semi-structured data is an email message. It can contain structured data like a sender and subject. But the body is unstructured and can contain several different kinds of data like text, images, and videos. The final type of data is unstructured data. This data type doesn't adhere to any specific predefined data model. It can include any kind of data like text, video, or audio. This data can be collected and stored without applying any form of data model. But analyzing unstructured data requires advanced data analytics mechanisms like machine learning and data mining. You'll explore these techniques later in this course. Semi-structured and unstructured data are more suited to a data lake. This is like a data warehouse, but it can handle unstructured data. Data lake is used more widely by data scientists. Businesses prefer working with structured data in data warehouses because of its accuracy. You should now be able to explain what a data warehouse is, outline its main characteristics, and the different types of data that can be used in data analytics. That's great progress. I look forward to guiding you further through these topics. At this stage of the course, you should be familiar with the concept of a data warehouse. But you might still have questions like, what does a data warehouse look like? And how does it work? In this video, you'll explore the architecture of a data warehouse and understand how its components work together to facilitate data collection, integration, and analysis. Over at Global Superstore, they've begun building a data warehouse that can aggregate, integrate, and analyze data to help inform their business activities. As a database engineer, it's important that you understand the architecture of a data warehouse. So let's explore the architecture of Global Superstore's data warehouse and discover how it works. Let's begin with a quick overview of the purpose and basic composition of a typical data warehouse's architecture. A data warehouse's architecture must be constructed so that it can control the flow of data from different sources. It needs to be able to process the data it encounters and integrate it in a consistent format. This is so that the users of the data warehouse can perform data analysis and extract useful insights. To facilitate this process, the architecture of a data warehouse is comprised of several different components. Each of these components plays a key role within the data warehouse to support data analytics. These components include data sources, data staging area, the data warehouse itself, and data marts. Once the data has been collected and integrated within these components, the data warehouse users can then perform data analysis and present their findings. Let's explore these components and find out more about how they contribute to the data analysis process. The first component of a data warehouse's architecture is the sources of data that it relies on for its insights. These include external sources like Global Superstore's online surveys or social media data. Internal sources, like information collected within the company database on customers and products. 
operational data produced by day-to-day -day business activities like customer orders, and data sources can also include flat files. These are files without an internal structure, like customers' online behavior or data log entries. Make sure that the data sources are accurate so that you can avoid irrelevant or poor data analytics. The next component is data staging. The data staging area includes a set of processes known as the ETL, or Extract, Transform, and Load Pipeline. You'll explore these terms in more detail later in this lesson. Now that you've sourced and staged the data, the next stage is to store it. Data is stored in the data storage component. This is a central database repository that serves as the foundation of the data warehouse. It organizes data in relational databases. It also includes a metadata repository that holds different kinds of information about the data, like where it was sourced from, the features of the data, and the tables the data is stored in, along with their attributes. What does metadata mean in the context of a data warehouse? Metadata is essentially a table of contents for the data in the data warehouse. It helps database engineers manage and keep track of the changes within their source systems, methods, and processes. For example, Global Superstore's metadata contains information like where the data was sourced from. It also shows when each file was created, who created it, and other important information. The next component in the data warehouse is data marts. These are subject-oriented databases that meet the demands of a specific group of users. Each mart contains a subset of data that focuses on particular parts of the business or organization. For example, Global Superstore's data marts relate to specific departments and business functions. They can use these marts to perform focused analytical processes on specific parts of the business. Finally, once the data is ready, you can perform data analytics. Data analytics is performed using different analytics techniques like data mining. Once you've analyzed the data, you can then present it. The data can be presented in the form of reports like interactive reports, analytics reports, or static reports. Global Superstore's data analysts can analyze the data within their repository using different techniques. They can then produce reports that provide information on sales, profits, and other important aspects of the business. Now that you're familiar with the components of a data warehouse, let's take a quick look at some best practices to follow when creating and working with the architecture. First, always separate the analytical and transactional operations. Make use of scalable solutions so the data warehouse can process increasingly larger amounts of data and build a flexible architecture that can incorporate and implement new functionality. There are also several other best practices you should follow. For example, make sure your architecture contains data security features. Develop a simple and flexible architecture that can work with different forms of data. Create a data warehouse that's easy to understand, implement, use, and manage. And document the development of the data warehouse. This makes it easier to incorporate new functions. You should now be familiar with the architecture of a data warehouse. And you should also be able to explain how its components work together to facilitate data collection, integration, and analysis. Great work. Very, very large databases are very hard to get data from. And so ETL pipelines are some of the critical ways in order to ensure that different products get quicker access to the data they need. Hi, my name is Moxie Herrera. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a software engineer at Meta in the Menlo Park office. ETL stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. Uh, this is one of the common ways that data will be transferred to particular areas. So you will have some sort of data source, and then perhaps a staging area for the data, and then a consumer of the data. So splitting it up into different data consumers allows you to do two things. One, have the raw data stored in a backup, in a warehouse, and then it's extracted then transform to the data that you need so that it can be loaded by the consumers that need that data at the time of use. The purpose of an ETL pipeline can vary depending on your uses. 
Uh, but fundamentally, the point is either to bring together a whole bunch of different data sources or have very large data sources uh, abstracted away from the consumers of the data. The extract is bringing together all those data sources. The transform is doing the data validation, the scrubbing, the cleaning, maybe encryption. And then finally, the loading is where the end consumers are actually taking the data. The exact usage depends on the case. But what this means is that an ETL pipeline is a very common process that's used to solve many different data problems. Part of the point of an ETL pipeline is to take all these different sources that may be built under different systems and bring them into one system that specific consumers can use. This allows for parallelization. And so the decisions are often made around what do the end consumers need? Where am I getting the data from? How am I organizing this? And what would lead to the most performant uh, approach to this? One of the most common problems when dealing with data pipelines is sometimes handling the volume of data and the varied sources of data. This can make it very difficult to ensure that your pipeline is up to date and has the data that is needed at the time of use. Understanding the delay and how these pipelines work are very critical to ensure that you are not expecting data consumers to be able to grab data that they're not actually, that's not actually available to them. A change to the database may then trigger a need for a change in the data pipelines that you have built, depending on the needs of the consumer and what the database change is. So what this requires is a strong understanding of the need of that pipeline, what its goals are, and a strong sense of ownership by the stakeholders of that pipeline. These kind of updates happen all the time, and this could trigger all sorts of different changes in the product team. And so this requires a lot of ownership and responsibility and understanding of ETL pipelines for when those changes occur and what changes you need to make to accommodate that. There's a lot of data in the world. Uh, in fact, too much data to store in a single database. So ETL pipelines are an absolutely fundamental point in this world of big data, cloud computing, and uh, the metaverse. So far in your database engineering journey, you've studied and worked with different data models like entity relationship and object oriented. But these models are built for real time transactions. When working with a data warehouse or data analytics, you need a model that can optimize data access and queries for specific analysis. In this video, you'll explore the fundamentals of dimensional data modeling. This is a model used to build databases in a data warehouse for data analytics. Global Superstore are in the process of creating their data warehouse. Their next step is to design a data model for their database system that can handle data analytics. The dimensional data model is a good fit. Let's find out more about this model and see how Global Superstore can build it into their data warehouse. A dimensional data model is a data model based on the two key concepts of dimensions and facts. Let's take a closer look at these two concepts. The dimensions represent the different elements of your data. The dimensions define a context or perspective for your measures. Good examples of dimension data elements in Global Superstore's database is time and location. They can measure sales and other aspects of their business in the context of time and location. The term facts represents quantifiable data held within a database. Good examples of Global Superstore's facts include the number of sold products and the profits that they have made. There are two kinds of measures in the fact table, stored measures and calculated measures. Stored measures are aggregated measures stored in the data warehouse, like sales data and product price. This data is loaded from the data source and stored in the database warehouse repository. Calculated measures are calculated from other measures. For example, Global Superstore can calculate their profit by deducting the sold product's cost from the sold price. These measures are performed through queries that rely on calculation rules programmed in the data warehouse database. Next, let's look at the structure of a dimensional data model. A dimensional data model consists of facts and dimensions tables. The dimension table includes the dimensions data elements and can be structured as a hierarchy of data. 
This facilitates different levels of data analysis. You can navigate through the hierarchy to find the data you need. For example, you can drill down or roll up through the data elements. And the fact table includes the measure's data. For example, Global Superstore can use this structure to find their average sales at specific points in time. They can explore data in different dimensional contexts and drill down through different levels. They can use the time and location dimensions to explore the data for average sales per year or by city. Then they can drill down through this data to find average sales per month and even average sales per week or day. There are several best practices that you should follow when designing a data model. Before designing a dimensional data model, you need to be clear about which business activities you want to examine. And you need to know which dimensions provide you with the most meaningful and useful context. Also, make sure you organize data in a way that's easy to understand, access, and query. A common method for designing a dimensional data model is with the use of schemas. One of the most widely used schemas in a data warehouse is the STAR schema. The STAR schema is a common model for designing databases in a data warehouse. It's a simple dimensional data model that consists of facts and dimension tables organized as a star. One or more fact tables sit in the middle of the schema, connected to one or more dimension tables. Global Superstore can use a basic star schema to organize their dimensional data model. The sales fact table is in the center of the diagram. It's connected to several dimension tables, suppliers, customer, product, time, and location. Another schema that you can use to design your dimensional data model is the snowflake schema. It's called a snowflake schema because the schema diagram resembles a snowflake. When working with a snowflake schema, you should normalize your dimensions tables to eliminate data redundancy. The best approach to normalization is to group dimensions data into multiple simple subdimensions tables. The disadvantage of this schema is that it increases the number of dimensions tables and requires more foreign keys to connect the tables. So more complex queries are required to join records when performing data analytics. For example, Global Superstore can use the schema to normalize their product dimension table into three tables, a products table, a subcategory table, and a category table. You should now understand the concept of dimensional data modeling and you should be able to explain how the star and snowflake schemas work. Well done. At this stage of the course, you should be familiar with the dimensional data model and many of the key concepts related to it. But how do you build a dimensional data model? The process for building a dimensional data model revolves around four key steps known as Kimball's dimensional data modeling. In this video, you'll explore the approach and review each of these four steps in detail. Let's begin with a look at Global Superstore and their use of the dimensional data model. Global Superstore wants to perform data analytics to understand their recent sales figures. This requires building a dimensional data model that will help them understand their business and the factors that impact on their sales and profits. Before you explore Global Superstore's process, let's quickly recap the purpose of a dimensional data model and take a high-level look at the four key steps. A dimensional data model must focus on particular aspects of a business or organization in order to address specific problems. The model is created using a systematic approach that revolves around four key steps. These steps include the business processes, the grain, the dimensions, and the facts. Each of these steps is a choice. You need to choose a business process that your dimensional model must investigate. You then need to choose the facts and dimensions that can provide the answers you need. Let's work through each of these four steps or choices and understand how they contribute to the process of building a dimensional data model. When building a dimensional data model, the first step is to identify or choose the specific business process to be addressed. Once you've identified the process, you can then determine the grain of data in the data model. Global Superstore have decided that the business process to be addressed is their sales activity. Once you've decided on the process, you then need to choose the level of detail required. This is referred to as the grain. What granularity or level of detail is required for the data warehouse to address your process problem? And what's the lowest level of detail required to address the issue? For example, 
Global superstore need to analyze their sales data at both a yearly and daily level. They also need to investigate this data at the global and local level. The next step in the process is to choose the dimensions. In this step, you need to choose the relevant dimensions. In other words, in what context do you need to explore your business activity? As you already know, global superstore need to analyze their sales data. And they need to analyze this data in the context of products, customers, time, and locations. So now that you've identified the business process, the grain, and the dimensions, it's time to establish the facts. This is basically answering the question of, what do you want to measure? You need to select the measures that contain numeric data and populate your fact table with these attributes. For example, global superstore need to explore their facts using the dimensions tables location, product, and time. They can demonstrate how each of these dimensions impacts the sales. And they can also include relevant attributes that provide useful information about each dimension. Once you've decided what aspect of your business process you need to investigate and chosen the grain, related facts and dimensions, you can then create your schema. Arrange your dimensions and dimensions tables. Global Superstore can arrange their dimensions and measures in a star schema. Their schema examines the performance of their sales activity in the context of four different dimensions, customers, products, locations, and time. And within each dimension is a set of relevant attributes that target the required data. Once you've decided what aspect of your business process you need to investigate and chosen the related data and dimensions, you can create your schema. Global Superstore have identified their dimensions and measures step-by-step -step based on their business requirements. They can now perform different forms of data analysis to achieve their goals. You should now be familiar with using a systematic approach to build a dimensional data model. And you should also be able to identify and explain each of the four steps in which you must make your decisions around data. You've made great progress on your advanced data modeling journey. Congratulations on reaching the end of the second module in this advanced data modeling course. In this module, you explored the architecture of a data warehouse and learned how to build a dimensional data model. Let's take a few minutes to recap some of the key skills you've gained in this module's lessons. You learn that a data warehouse is a centralized data repository that aggregates, stores, and processes large amounts of data from multiple sources. Users can then query this data to perform data analysis. You then discover that a data warehouse is defined by four key characteristics. First, it's subject-oriented, which means that it provides information on chosen subjects or topics. Data warehouses are also integrated in that they integrate data from a range of different sources. The next key characteristic is non-volatile. Data is maintained in the state in which it was loaded into the data warehouse. And finally, data warehouses are time variant. They aggregate data over a long period of time to measure change. You also reviewed the different forms of data that a data warehouse encounters. There's structured data, which is data presented in a well-defined structured format that's easy to access, manage, and search through. Semi-structured data is data that's only partially structured. It's more flexible, but also requires more effort to analyze. And finally, there's unstructured data. This can include any kind of data without any predefined model, but it's much more difficult to analyze unstructured data than structured and semi-structured data. Once you reviewed the basics of data warehousing, you then moved on to explore the architecture of a data warehouse. A data warehouse's architecture focuses on the design of the components that aggregate, integrate, and analyze data in the data warehouse. It illustrates the flow of data from different sources. It then processes and integrates this data so that users can perform data analysis. The architecture of a data warehouse consists of the following components. The first is data sources, which consist of the data that the organization relies on for its insights. Next is the data staging area. This is where data is prepared for analytics through the ETL or extract, transform, and load process. Then there's the data warehouse itself where data is stored. And finally, there's data marts. These are subject-oriented databases that meet the demands of specific users. Once the data has been collected and integrated within these components, the data warehouse users can then perform data analysis and present their findings. 
It's also important that you follow best practice when creating and working with the architecture of a data warehouse. And make sure that you document the development of the data warehouse so that you can incorporate new functions into the architecture as needed. You then explored a case study of a real-world data project and tested your new knowledge in a quiz item. In the next lesson, you learned about dimensional data modeling. This lesson began with an overview of the fundamentals of dimensional data modeling. You learned that a dimensional data model is a model based on dimensions and facts. Facts represent the measures. These are quantifiable data. Dimensions define the context in which you can explore the measures. There are stored measures, which include aggregated measures that can be stored in the data warehouse. And there's calculated measures, which focus on data that's calculated using data from other measures. You also review the structure of a dimensional data model. A dimension table can be structured using a hierarchy of data. This structure allows for different levels of data analytics. You can drill down or roll up through the data elements to find the data you need. Dimensional data models are also designed using schemas, like a star schema. You can also use a snowflake schema. You then explored some examples of dimensional data modeling in practice. You learned that there are four key steps that must be followed when creating a model. First, you need to identify the business process to be addressed. Once you've decided on the process, you must choose the grain, then choose the relevant dimensions, and decide the measures in the facts table. You then undertook an exercise in which you created your own dimensional model using the skills and knowledge that you gained throughout this module. You should now be familiar with the basics of a data warehouse and its architecture and the fundamentals of dimensional data modeling. Great work. I look forward to guiding you through the next module in this course in which you'll learn about advanced data analytics in the context of data modeling. Your databases collect and store an endless stream of data from a variety of different sources. And as you should know by now, the true value of this data is what you do with it. Data is most valuable when it generates insights that help improve services, make plans, and minimize risk. All these insights are generated through data analysis and advanced data analytics. Over the next few minutes, you'll recap the basics of data analytics and explore different types of data measurements. Over at Global Superstore, they've been collecting large amounts of data and storing it in their databases. This data represents an important asset which the store can use to understand and improve their business activities and performance. To take advantage of this data, they need to perform different types of data analysis and measure their data appropriately. Let's find out how Global Superstore can make the most of their data and start with a recap of data analytics and the types of data analytics they can use. As you should know from previous courses, data analytics involves analyzing data to derive useful information and valuable insights. You can make the most use of data analytics using data analytics tools and data analysis. There are several key types of data analysis that you've encountered so far and made use of in other courses. Let's briefly recap these. Descriptive data analysis presents data in a descriptive format. Exploratory data analysis is used to establish a relationship between different variables, and inferential data analysis focuses on a small sample of data to make inferences. Predictive data analysis identifies patterns in data to make predictions about future performance. And causal data analysis explores cause and effect between variables. Before you can engage in these types of data analysis, you first need to understand the type of data that you're dealing with and ask what kind of measurements should you apply to it. Another key question to ask of your data is if it's quantitative or qualitative. Quantitative data refers to numerical data. This is data that can be counted or quantified. In the case of Global Superstore, this includes the average number of customers who make purchases each day or the average cost of each purchase made. Qualitative data refers to non-numerical data. This is textual and descriptive data, like information about the quality attributes of a product. For example, Global Superstore's qualitative data includes category names or descriptions of products like furniture or office supplies. Once you've determined what kind of data you're dealing with, you then need to organize, identify, and analyze your data. You can perform these actions using four different measurement scales. The first of these measurement scales is the nominal scale. This scale describes the identity property of non-numerical data. It's purely descriptive, 
which means it just identifies the data. In the case of Global Superstore, they can use this scale to identify products in their stock, like a chair or a desk. Each product is one nominal unit of data. The next form of measurement is the ordinal scale. This is a qualitative data type scale, which places data in a specific ranked order. However, it doesn't include decisive criteria to determine the difference between the data elements. For example, Global Superstore can rank chairs using ratings values. So they can use a value of one for top quality products, two for very good products, and three for good products, and so on. However, there's no precise criteria that determines the measurement between each value. There's also the interval scale. This scale includes properties of the nominal and ordered data scales. Its key feature is that the difference between data points can be clearly identified using specific criteria. The scale can also contain both positive and negative numbers, and zero does not represent an absolute true value. Global Superstore can use the interval scale to provide feedback on products from 10 to minus 10. Finally, there's the ratio scale. This scale is a quantitative data type that includes properties from nominal, ordinal, and interval scales of measurement. It defines the identity of the data, classifies the data in order, and marks clear intervals. However, it holds an absolute value of zero. Over at Global Superstore, they can use the ratio scale to mark the weight of products. For example, a small table is 20 kilograms, a medium-sized table is 40 kilograms, while a larger table weighs a total of 60 kilograms. In this instance, there's a clear order between variables and an equal distance of 20 kilograms between each measurement. So, all data points can be measured accurately. You should now be familiar with the basics of data analytics, be able to identify different types of data, and explain different types of data measurements. Great work. The more data you collect and store, the more difficult it becomes to analyze and make sense of. So database engineers who run large databases rely on advanced data analytics methods like data mining and machine learning to discover patterns, paradigms, and trends in data. Over the next few minutes, you'll explore these methods and learn how they help businesses and organizations to understand performance through data and make predictions and actionable plans. Global Superstore has been in operation for 15 years. During that time, they've collected huge amounts of data on all aspects of the business, like sales, customers, and marketing. However, the more data they collect, the more difficult it is for them to analyze and understand it. Several years ago, they began using advanced data analytics methods like data mining and machine learning to help make sense of their data. The terms data mining and machine learning are often used interchangeably. While they're both useful methods for analyzing data, they operate very differently. Data mining is the process of detecting patterns in data. You can then gain insights, make judgments, and deliver predictions based on these patterns. Global Superstore used data mining to identify associated patterns between the sales of certain products. For example, many customers who buy tables also buy chairs. So this data suggests that the store might benefit from advertising or selling these products together. Machine learning is the process of teaching a computer how to learn. Specifically, it involves teaching a machine to determine probabilities and make predictions. There are two main methods of machine learning supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Supervised machine learning involves classifying data based on given labels. For example, Global Superstore can label the available chair and table images as CH and desks as DK. The computer can then learn to recognize, classify, and group these product images based on their labels. Unsupervised machine learning is when data is classified based on shared characteristics, but without the use of labels. So, the machine learns to recognize and categorize images of objects like chairs, tables, and desks based on the shapes in the images. Machine learning makes use of many kinds of data mining models when processing data. Let's take a few minutes to explore some examples of these models. The first model is classification analysis. This model assigns data items into categories or classes of data. You can then use this data to predict your target class for the items. For example, many global superstore customers purchase low-priced office products, so they can be classified as low-budget customers and targeted with advertisements for low-budget products.
There is also the association rule. The association rule is a model that identifies the relationship between different data elements. It determines if there is a correlation between these elements based on certain criteria. Many global superstore customers who purchase cell phones also buy items like phone chargers and battery packs. This data suggests that these products should be advertised and sold together. The next model is outlier detection. Outlier detection is a model that reveals unusual data within a particular data set. In other words, it detects data outliers or anomalies that don't conform to the expected pattern. For example, a group of global superstore customers with a shared history of purchasing low-priced products suddenly begin purchasing expensive products. In this instance, the company needs to reclassify these customers and target them with advertisements for more expensive items. Another model you need to be aware of is clustering analysis. The clustering analysis model searches for similarities within a data set. It then separates the data into clusters of subsets based on the similarities it finds, or the common characteristics within the subsets. The model works in a similar manner to the classification analysis model. However, that model is initially assigned to predefined groups, not newly discovered ones. Global Superstore can use the model to classify low and high budget customers based on similar types of navigation behavior in the company's online store. The final model you need to know about is regression analysis. The regression analysis model considers the different factors that impact data. It then determines the relationship between these factors. This model can help Global Superstore to develop a better understanding of their sales patterns. The data shows that each time the store discounts certain products, it leads to an increase in sales. So the store can conclude that discounts impact sales data. You should now be familiar with different methods of data mining and machine learning. You should also be able to explain the different data mining models that machine learning can make use of. Great work. Database analysis isn't just about extracting and analyzing the information you need from the database. How you present your data is also just as important. Good data visualization helps decision makers to interpret the data and make the right choices around it. In this video, you'll review the different factors that inform data visualization, and you'll also explore the different methods that you can use to present your data. Over at Global Superstore, the company's data analysts are performing advanced data analytics to help improve the store's performance. They now need to present their findings to the company. The best way for the data analysts to make sense of the information and present their findings is by visualizing the data. Let's explore some different methods of data visualization that Global Superstore's data analysts can use to present their findings. Let's start with a quick overview of what database analysts and engineers mean by data visualization. The term data visualization refers to presenting or visualizing data in a way that lets decision makers interpret the information quickly and easily. Your role is to remove the noise from the data and present the important elements, like trends, paradigms, and outliers in a user-friendly way. In other words, how can you tell an informative and engaging story through your data? There are four factors to consider when deciding what type of visual data to represent. The first of these is your target audience. Who are you presenting this data to? What's their background? What's their level of understanding of the issues or topics to be investigated? Factor these questions into your presentation. You also need to carefully consider what information your visualization includes, what information answers your audience's questions, and what information is redundant. Another issue to consider is time. How much time do you want your audience to spend examining each chart? Should they be able to understand a chart after just a few minutes of observation, or should it take them longer? And finally, think about the level of accuracy your audience is looking for. Does your audience just need to understand the data in a general sense, or do they need to drill down into finer levels of detail? Once you've answered the key questions, identified your audience, and determined what kind of data you need to show, it's time to decide on your data visualization charts. Each type of chart has a different purpose, and each chart can be used to solve a different type of problem or communicate a different kind of message. What's most important is to select a chart that tells your audience the story of your data in the most appropriate way. 
Let's explore a few examples of commonly used data visualization charts and find out what kind of message each one communicates. One of the most frequently used charts is a bar chart. This is a comparison chart type. It helps audiences to recognize differences or similarities between data values. You can present data horizontally or vertically to show numerical comparisons across categories. Global Superstore uses a bar chart to depict the sale of products against profit ratio. This shows how much profit is made in each product category. The line graph is another common chart. A line graph shows quantitative data over a continuous interval or time period. Line graphs work by showing connections between the data points on a Cartesian coordinate system. Over at Global Superstore, they use line graphs to show the trend in profits over the last number of years. There's also the bubble chart. A bubble chart shows the relationship between numeric variables. Each variable is assigned its own bubble. Audiences can understand what a bubble chart is saying by comparing the sizes, positions, and colors of the bubbles. For example, the larger bubbles in Global Superstore's bubble chart indicate that the departments each bubble depicts are more profitable than the departments assigned to the smaller bubbles. Next is the map chart. A map chart presents data in geographical areas. Each data variable can be reflected in the map using a variety of different methods, like colors and labels. Global Superstore use map charts to visualize sales across different global regions. And finally, there's the scatter plot graph. This graph plots variables as points on a Cartesian coordinate grid. You can then use these data points to search for correlations between variables. You can also add trending lines for each data group within category labels to show the performance of select categories. Global Superstore used this approach to depict sales and profits across different categories or departments. You should now be able to explain the different factors that inform data visualization and take these factors into account next time you visualize your data. And you should also know how to select the charts or graphs that best communicate the story that you want to tell through your data. Excellent work. Data analytics is a complex process and the task is beyond the capabilities of traditional database management systems. That's why data analysis is performed using data analytics tools. These tools make it possible for users to view and understand large amounts of data using artificial intelligence. In this video, you'll review some examples of well-known analytics tools and learn about their key features. You'll also explore the Tableau tool, which you'll make use of later in this course for your own projects. Global Superstore's data analysts are performing advanced data analytics to generate data insights that will help inform their business decisions. This approach requires the use of powerful data analytics tools. Using these tools, Global Superstore can use their data to identify new business opportunities, grow their sales, and improve their services alongside other benefits. Let's find out more about how these tools work and discover how Global Superstore makes use of them. Data analytics tools help database users to perform data analysis. The results of the data analysis generate insights that inform the development of businesses and other organizations. These tools make use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data mining. And they provide tools for visualizing data to help you understand and communicate your findings. There are many kinds of analytics tools that you can make use of. The most common tools that database analysts rely on include Tableau, SAS Business Intelligence, and Microsoft Power BI. There are several key features these tools offer which make them useful for dealing with large databases. They can deal with massive amounts of data, they can work with data in many different formats, and they can interact with many different data sources and database systems. In addition, each tool uses advanced data analysis techniques to generate insights, and they provide advanced data visualization tools. These features make it much easier for users to view and understand their data. Tableau is a widely used data visualization tool. There's a free 14-day trial, and it offers a one-year license for tutors and students in accredited academic institutions. There are several key features that Tableau users can take advantage of when visualizing their data. It stores data in the form of different data types, like string, date, and time. It can connect to a wide range of data sources like MySQL, Microsoft SQL, MongoDB, BI, and Oracle DB. And it can interact with many different data sheets and file systems like Excel, JSON, and PDF. 
In addition to these features, Tableau can also generate interactive dashboards that present data in real time, support scripting in Python and R programming languages, and complete tasks using interactive UI tools like drag and drop. Tableau comes in both desktop and cloud versions. In this course, you'll make use of Tableau Desktop. You can download the software directly from Tableau.com. Now that you're familiar with the Tableau tool, let's explore it in more detail and find out how organizations like Global Superstore make use of it. First, launch Tableau by clicking on the Tableau desktop icon. This opens the Tableau launch page. The launch page offers several different options. Open existing workbooks using Open a Workbook. Work from sample workbooks in the Accelerator section. And access useful learning resources in the Discover section. You can also connect to your data sources using the Connect pane. For example, Global Superstore can choose a Microsoft Excel document as their data source and load the file's data into their Tableau workspace. Select the Tableau icon to switch from the Start page to the Authoring workspace. Once you're connected to a data source, the source connection and related fields appear in the data pane. You can then use the Authoring workspace's user interface elements to create a visualization of your data. Add data to your view using the Marks card or the row and column shelves. For example, Global Superstore can drag measures and dimensions around the workspace as required. This is useful for comparing data and categories. Access commands and navigation tools quickly and easily in the toolbar. Global Superstore often makes use of the sorting icons to arrange bars in ascending or descending order or use the dashboard to view and work with multiple sources of data at once. You can even create an interactive dashboard that combines different sheets to present relative information to the audience. You can also use Story, a tool that's similar to the dashboard. Story presents sequences of worksheets and dashboards to tell your data story. You should now be able to identify well-known analytics tools and describe many of the key features that they share. You should also be able to access and make use of the Tableau work environment to visualize your data. You're making good progress in developing your understanding of advanced data analytics. At this stage of the lesson, your next question might be, how do I use Tableau? In this video, you'll learn how to connect Tableau to your data sources, then clean and prepare your data for analysis. Global Superstore needs to use Tableau to analyze the records of a large Excel file but they first need to clean and prepare the existing data. Let's help Global Superstore to connect their Excel data source to Tableau, then clean and prepare the data for analysis. To perform data analysis in Tableau, you first need to establish a live connection to a data source. To establish a live connection, first open Tableau on the Connection page. Under the Connect tab on the left-hand side, click Microsoft Excel. This opens a dialog box that you can use to navigate to the Excel file on your machine. Select and open the file. The Excel file name appears on the left-hand side of the screen. The data from the Excel file is displayed in the data pane. With a live connection, you can make sure that any updates to the original source are automatically reflected in your database. However, it's faster to process a data extract, particularly when dealing with large amounts of data. On the left side of the data pane is the metadata grid. This shows relevant information about the different data fields. You can keep or hide the metadata grid by clicking the Related button. Now that you've connected to the data that you need, you can begin to clean it and prepare it for analysis. This process involves fixing errors in the data and shaping it so that it's easier to understand and analyze. You can do this by performing different types of operations like filtering, sorting, and renaming the data. You'll cover these operations in more detail in a later video. The top of each column specifies the column's data type along with a suitable symbol. You can change these data types as required. Let's take the order date column as an example. Select the small arrow next to the symbol above the column. Click Describe on the list of options that appear. This action shows key information about this field of data. Click the ABC data type and select the date data type. The data type has now been changed. You can also hide irrelevant table details so that you can focus only on the necessary data. You can also change the number of rows displayed within the data pane. Let's hide the order date column. Select the small arrow again, then select hide. The column is now hidden. 
To show the data again, click the Tableau Settings icon. Then select the Show Hidden Fields option. This action displays faded versions of the fields to indicate what has been hidden. To restore these fields, click the small arrow and select Unhide. Your next task is to split the Customer Name column into two separate columns, one for each customer's full name and another for their last name. Click the small arrow and then select the Split option. This automatically creates two new fields. You can rename them as required. Click the corresponding small arrow, select Rename, and call the columns First Name and Last Name. Global Superstore also need you to create a new data field for their returns. The field must include the final date by which each product can be returned under the company's returns policy. This is 15 days from the date of purchase. Select the small arrow in the Orders Date column and click Create a Calculated Field. Name this new field Return Date. In the Calculation Editor, enter the following basic formula, Order Date plus 15. This formula adds 15 days to each order's order date value. This creates a new returns column populated with the relevant data. When finished, click OK. The new calculated field is added to the data pane. Global Superstore's data has now been cleaned and prepared for analysis. And you should now be familiar with how to connect to data sources in Tableau and clean and prepare your own data for data analysis. Great work. Once you've imported your data into Tableau, you then need to prepare it for analysis. However, the process is more efficient if you focus only on the data you need to analyze. With Tableau, you can focus on relevant data using the software's filtering and visualization features. In this video, you'll learn how to filter data and create a data analysis chart in Tableau. Over at Global Superstore, they're preparing to launch a new marketing campaign in Canada. But first, they need to analyze their sales data to optimize their campaign. They can use data filtering techniques to arrange and exclude data so that their records are focused only on Canada. This provides a more relevant, reliable, and accurate level of information. You can help Global Superstore to complete this task by using Tableau. In Tableau, you can filter data in either the data source page or the worksheet. However, filtering data directly in the data source page limits your data analysis in all worksheets to the filtered criteria only. For example, if Global Superstore filter their categories to include only office furniture, then they can't perform data analytics in other categories in the worksheet. Let's begin by applying data filtering in the data source page. Click the Add option under Filters. This opens a dialog box that lists all filtered fields in the data source. Click Add again to add a new filter field. Next, select Region and click OK. Click the Select from List option in the General tab area. Check Canada, then click OK. The data pane now shows filtered records from Canada only. You can repeat this process to add more data source filters if required. To remove a filter, click Edit Filter, select Canada, then Remove, and OK. You can also filter data in the worksheet. Open the Sheet tab at the bottom of the page. In the worksheet, the columns from your data source are displayed as fields on the left side of the data pane. The data pane contains a variety of fields. The fields above the gray line are dimension fields. The fields below the gray line are measure fields. Dimension fields hold categorical data. In the case of Global Superstore, this includes product categories, types, and dates. Measure fields hold numeric data like sales, profit, and quantity. Global Superstore want to compare sales of all category products sold in Canada. To help them with this task, drag the category field from the dimension section of the data pane to the rows in the shelf area. Then drag the sales field from the measure section in the data pane into the columns in the shelf area. The horizontal bar chart that appears shows information about different product categories. You need to filter this data to show only products sold within Canada. Drag the region dimension from the data pane to the filter card. This opens a pop-up window. In the General tab, select Canada, then click Apply and OK. Your data is now filtered to show sales in Canada only. You can also take further steps to make your chart easier to read and understand. Click the Swap icon to change the horizontal bar to a vertical chart. Click the Descending Order icon to filter data from maximum sales to minimum sales. 
Drag sales to the color part in the mark section of the screen to change the bar colors based on sales. Drag profits from the data panes measure section to the label mark. This shows the profit of each category in the chart. You can also provide a title for the sheet. In this instance, you can call the sheet sales in Canada. A lot of the information in the chart is generic. It might be better to add the subcategory to the view to provide more detail around the sales and profits. Drag the subcategory field from the dimension section of the data pane to the columns in the shelf area. Then click on the descending order icon to filter data from the maximum to the minimum values. You can now view all categories and subcategories. You can even focus on one category like furniture. Drag the category dimension from the left data pane to the filter card. Then use the filter categorical data option to retain the furniture category while unchecking the technology and office supply categories. Click apply, then okay. You can also filter categories according to best selling items. Drag the subcategory to the filter card. Then select the top tab, tick by field and enter a numerical value of two to view the top two categories. Then click apply. The wildcard can also be used to filter data based on specific patterns. For example, you can type chair in the text field to include subcategories that contain this text value. In this instance, the data returns the chair subcategory. Another filtering technique is condition filtering. You can use condition filtering to select a field of data and define specific rules to be applied. For example, you can select the sales field, then specify a sum value greater than 500,000. Click apply and then okay. This returns all values within your data greater than 500,000. To remove all subcategory filters, just right click the subcategory and click remove. You can also remove the category and keep the region to focus on Canada. You can now view all sales data related to the furniture category and subcategories in Canada. Global Superstore has now filtered the required data for data analysis using Tableau. And you should now also be able to apply different filtering techniques to your data using Tableau. You're making great progress on your data analytics journey. Once you've analyzed your data in Tableau, you then need to determine the most informative way to present it to your audience. With Tableau, you can present data visually in the form of an interactive dashboard. Over the next few minutes, you'll learn how to create a basic dashboard with multiple views and interactivity. At Global Superstore, they want to create an interactive dashboard that shows profits and sales by country and indicates how profits are trending over time. They can then use this dashboard to compare sales and profits in each country. Help Global Superstore to complete this task by creating worksheets in Tableau as follows. One worksheet to show sales and profits in each country and another worksheet that shows trending profits. You then need to combine these worksheets in one dashboard where they can interact with one another based on the needs of the user. This tutorial assumes that you already connected to the data source and that all necessary data has been cleaned and prepared for analysis. Let's begin with the map chart. Click the sheet tab and change the default title to profit and sales map by country. Double click country in the data pane the map view is automatically created because the country field is a geographic field. Drag the profits field from the data pane to the color on the marks card. Change the color so that it's easier to identify this data. Next, drag the sales field from the data pane to the tool tip on the marks card. Select maps, then background maps. In the background pane, click the normal option. Roll over each country using your mouse to display the name, profits, and sales data. Your next task is to create another view that shows the global superstore profit trends over time. Create a new worksheet and change the title and sheet name to Profits Trends. Drag the order date field from the data pane to the column shelf. Make sure that the order date has been assigned a data type. Drag the profit fields from the data pane to the rows in the shelf section. Tableau automatically generates a trending chart for profit. You can change the trend line's color set by dragging the profit to the color mark. Select a new color set to differentiate it from other data. Then drag the profits field from the data pane to the label mark. This shows the profits made each year. You've created two worksheets that communicate important information. 
You now need to combine the two sheets within one dashboard to show how profits are trending within each country. The first step is to set up your dashboard. Click the Dashboard tab, then the New Dashboard option. You can also use the dashboard icon at the bottom of the page. Call your new dashboard Profits Dashboard. To the side of the dashboard pane, you can access the sheets you've already created. Drag the map chart to the empty view within the dashboard and drag the profits chart below the map chart. The dashboard now has two related charts. Global Superstore can use it to compare profit and sales by country. However, it would also be useful to add some interactivity to this chart. For example, you can add interactivity to view profit trends by clicking on each country. Select the map from the dashboard, then click the Use as Filter icon. Select a country within the map, like Argentina. This shows the sales and profits in the map chart, and it also shows the trend in profits within the selected country. You can repeat these actions for each country. Thanks to your worksheets, Global Superstore can now compare their sales by country, and you should now be able to create a basic interactive dashboard with multiple views and interactivity. You're making great progress. Congratulations on reaching the end of the third module in this advanced data modeling course. In this module, you explored data analytics in the context of data modeling and learned how to perform data analysis using a visual analytics tool. Let's take a few minutes to recap some of the key skills you gained in this module's lessons. You began the first lesson in this module with an overview of data analytics. You learned that data analytics involves converting and processing aggregated data into useful and meaningful information. You also explored the topic of data analysis. There are several key types of data analysis that you've encountered throughout your database engineering journey. Descriptive data analysis presents data in a descriptive format. Exploratory data analysis is used to establish a relationship between different variables. And inferential data analysis focuses on a small sample of data to make inferences. Predictive data analysis identifies patterns in data to make predictions about future performance and causal data analysis explores cause and effect between variables. And you also learned that there are two types of data you'll deal with, quantitative data, which refers to numerical data, and qualitative data, which refers to non-numerical data. Once you've determined what kind of data you're dealing with, you then need to organize, identify, and analyze it. You can perform these actions using four measurement scales. The nominal scale is used to label data without assigning any quantitative value or order. And the ordinal scale places data in a specific ranked order. The interval scale identifies clear differences between data points using specific criteria. It also can represent negative values. And finally, the ratio scale defines the identity of the data, classifies the data in order, and marks clear intervals. It cannot represent negative values. You then explore the topics of data mining and machine learning. You learn that data mining is the process of detecting patterns in data, while machine learning is the process of teaching a computer how to learn. This can be done through either supervised or unsupervised machine learning. Machine learning makes use of several different kinds of data mining models when processing data. Classification analysis assigns data items into categories. The associate rule identifies relationships or associations between different data elements. Outlier detection is a model that detects data outliers or anomalies that don't conform to the expected pattern. Clustering analysis searches for similarities in data sets, then separates them into clusters. And finally, regression analysis considers the different factors that impact data, then determines the relationship between these factors. In the next part of this lesson, you learned about the importance of data visualization. This means that you must present or visualize your data in a way that lets decision makers interpret the information quickly and easily. When visualizing your data, you must consider the following questions. Who's your audience? What information do they need to know? How much time should they spend examining this information? And what level of accuracy do they require? Once you've answered these questions, you can then choose an appropriate data visualization chart. There are many different types of charts to choose from, including a bar chart, a line graph, and a bubble chart. You can also use a map chart or a scatter plot graph. Each chart serves a different purpose. What's most important is to select the chart that best informs your audience. 
You then concluded this lesson with a discussion in which you considered what kind of data analytics reports you engage with and how they help you in your tasks. In the next lesson of this module, you reviewed the topic of advanced data analytics. You learned that data analytics tools help database users to perform data analysis. The results of this data analysis inform the development of their businesses or organization. The data analysis tool you worked with in this course is Tableau. Its key features are as follows. It stores data in the form of different data types, it can connect to a wide range of data sources, and it can interact with many different data sheets and file systems. In addition to these features, Tableau can also generate interactive dashboards, support scripting in multiple languages, and it also offers interactive UI tools like drag and drop. You first learned how to download, launch, and navigate Tableau, then you learned how to import and prepare data in Tableau. This involves setting up a live connection to your data source or importing data into the tool and cleaning and preparing your data for analysis. This second step often involves actions like filtering irrelevant data, splitting data for greater accessibility, creating new data fields as required, and fixing data types. Once you've connected to the data source or imported your data, you can then filter, analyze, and visualize the data in Tableau. You can filter data using either the data source page or the worksheet. Tableau also lets you filter data using conditions or by adding subcategories. You then learned how to create an interactive dashboard using Tableau worksheets. And finally, you undertook an exercise in which you performed data analysis in Tableau. You should now be familiar with data analytics and data analysis software. That's great progress. I look forward to guiding you through the next module in which you'll undertake a data modeling project. In this course, you explored the topic of advanced data modeling. Let's take a few moments to recap the key lessons that you encountered in this course. You began the course with an introduction to the topic of advanced database modeling. You learned that a data model provides a visual representation of different data elements and shows how they relate to one another. You then explored database modeling in more detail by learning about different levels and types of data models. You discovered that there are three levels of database models. There's the conceptual data model, the logical data model, and the physical data model. You also reviewed different types of data models that you can use to design your database, like entity relationship and object oriented. Next, you learned how to structure your tables to deal with the data anomalies using the three main forms of database normalization. These include the insertion anomaly, the update anomaly, and the deletion anomaly. You also explored an example of a data model and designed a database model in an exercise. In the next lesson of this module, you were introduced to MySQL Workbench. You learned that MySQL Workbench is a unified visual tool for database modeling and management. It offers a range of useful features for creating, editing, and managing databases. You then discovered how MySQL Workbench is used to build a data model diagram using the software's forward engineer feature. You also learned how you can use MySQL to reverse engineer a model. This means you can create a data model from an existing MySQL database schema. This is essentially the opposite of the forward engineer feature. And you can print the model, share it, or apply changes and push it to the database using forward engineering. You also completed this lesson with a quiz item and an exercise in which you designed your own database model in MySQL Workbench. In the next module, you explored the topic of data warehousing. In this module, you learned about the architecture of a data warehouse and built a dimensional data model. You began with an overview of the concept of data warehousing. You learned that a data warehouse is a centralized data repository that aggregates, integrates, stores, and processes large amounts of data from multiple sources. Users can then query this data to perform data analysis. You then discovered that a data warehouse is defined by four key characteristics. It's subject-oriented, it's integrated, a data warehouse is also non-volatile, and finally, data warehouses are time-variant. You also reviewed the different forms of data that a data warehouse encounters, including structured data, semi-structured data, and unstructured data. You then explored the architecture of a data warehouse and learned that it includes the following components. Data sources, the data staging area, which includes the ETL process, the data warehouse itself, and data marts. Once the data has been aggregated from the data sources, it is then integrated and stored in the data warehouse. 
It's then organized in data marts where users can perform data analysis and present their findings. These components control the flow of data from different sources for data analysis and reporting. They also process and integrate this data so that users can perform data analysis. You also explored a case study of a real-world data project. In the second lesson of this module, you explored dimensional data modeling. The lesson began with an overview of the fundamentals of dimensional data modeling. You learned that a dimensional data model is based on dimensions and facts, and it's designed using star and snowflake schemas. You then explored some examples of dimensional data modeling in practice and learned that there are four key steps when creating a model. Choose the business process, then the grain, followed by the dimensions, and finally, choose the facts. Finally, you undertook an exercise in which you created your own dimensional model. In the third module of this course, you explored data analytics in the context of dimensions and measures, and you learn how to perform visualized data analysis using an advanced analytics tool. You started with an overview of data analytics. You recap the basics of data analytics and the key types that you've made use of at other points in your database engineering journey. You also learn that there are two generic types of data you'll deal with. Quantitative data, which refers to numerical data, and qualitative data, which refers to non-numerical data. When you've determined what kind of data you need, you can process and analyze it using four measurement scales. The nominal scale, the ordinal scale, the interval scale, and the ratio scale. Next, you learned about the topics of data mining and machine learning. You learned that data mining is the process of detecting patterns in data, while machine learning is the process of teaching a computer how to learn. Machine learning makes use of data mining models to process data like classification analysis, the associate rule, clustering analysis, and regression analysis. You then learned about data visualization. You learned that when visualizing your data, you must consider your audience and the information they're looking for. You then need to choose an appropriate chart that best communicates this information. Finally, you concluded this lesson with a discussion prompt that revolved around what kind of data analytics reports you make use of. In the final lesson of this module, you reviewed the topic of data analytics and learned how to make use of data analytics tools like Tableau. As part of your introduction to Tableau, you learned what its key features are and how they help you perform data analytics. You then learn how to use Tableau to analyze data. This included the following steps. Download, launch, and navigate Tableau. Load and prepare data for analysis. Filter and visualize data. And create an interactive dashboard. Finally, you undertook a lab exercise in which you performed data analysis in Tableau. You've reached the end of this course recap. It's now time to try out what you've learned in the graded assessment. Good luck. Congratulations, you've reached the end of this course. You've worked hard to get here and developed a lot of new skills along the way. You're making great progress on your advanced data modeling journey, and you should now possess an advanced understanding of database modeling. You are able to demonstrate some of this learning in an exercise. Following your completion of this exercise, you should now be able to Design a database model in MySQL Workbench. Understand the role of the data warehouse in the data analytics process. Create a dimensional data model using a data warehouse and perform data analysis using Tableau and present your results using data visualization techniques. The graded assessment then further tested your knowledge of these skills. However, there's still more for you to learn. So if you found this course helpful and want to discover more, then why not register for the next one? You'll continue to develop your skill set during each of the database engineer courses. In the final project, you'll apply everything you've learned to create your own fully functional database system. Whether you're just starting out as a technical professional, a student, or a business user, the course and projects prove your knowledge of the value and capabilities of database systems. The project consolidates your abilities with the practical application of your skills. But the project also has another important benefit. It means that you'll have a fully operational database that you can reference within your portfolio. This serves to demonstrate your skills to potential employers. And not only does it show employers that you are self-driven and innovative, but it also speaks volumes about you as an individual, as well as your newly obtained knowledge. And once you've completed all the courses in this specialization, you'll receive a certificate in database engineering. The certificate can also be used as a progression to other role-based certificates.
Depending on your goals, you may choose to go deep with advanced role-based certificates or take other fundamental courses once you earn the certificate. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to embark on this journey of discovery with you. Best of luck in the future. Welcome to the Capstone course. You're now within reaching distance of the end of your database engineering journey. In this final course, you need to prove your new skills by helping Little Lemon complete a series of database-related tasks. These tasks include setting up a database in MySQL Workbench using a MySQL instance server, creating an entity relationship or ER diagram and implementing it in MySQL Workbench, and you need to commit the project using Git. You also need to help them create sales reports from the data in their database, build a table booking system, generate data insights using data analytics, and create a database client. Let's take a few minutes to review the processes and tools that you'll use to complete these exercises. In the first set of tasks, you'll help Little Lemon to build a relational database system by designing a well-structured entity model, or ER diagram, that conforms to the three fundamental normal forms. You'll design the ER diagram using MySQL Workbench, a unified visual tool used for database modeling and management. A key feature of MySQL Workbench that you'll make use of is the ability to transform your data model in a physical database schema in a MySQL server. Once you've created the Little Lemon database, you'll then commit your project using Git, the version control system. You'll also make use of GitHub to store your Git repositories. Your next task is then to create sales reports from the data in the Little Lemon database. You'll create these sales reports using database queries, procedures, and prepared statements. Let's look at these in more detail. You'll use virtual tables to make use of data that exists in other tables and simplify data access and queries. You'll also make use of different kinds of join clauses to link records of data between one or more tables based on a common column. You'll help Little Lemon to use stored procedures to create reusable code that can be invoked and executed as required. And you'll also rely on prepared statements that can be used repeatedly without the need for compiling or using valuable MySQL resources. Another task you'll assist Little Lemon with is building a table booking system in their database that they can use to keep track of guests visiting the restaurant. This task mainly consists of using SQL queries and transactions. Let's review some examples of the SQL queries and transactions that you'll use. You'll create data using standard insert into statements. You'll change data in the database using update statements. You'll also delete or drop data using delete statements. And finally, you'll read your data using read queries like select statements. You'll also make use of triggers to store a set of actions in the form of a stored program that you can then invoke automatically when certain events occur. Once you're confident that your code is correct, you'll commit your progress to Git. In the next task, you'll help Little Lemon use their data to generate business insights. You'll carry out this task using Tableau, the data visualization tool. Let's review the process steps that you'll follow to complete this task. You'll first connect your data sources to Tableau. You'll then prepare your data for analysis and focus on the most relevant data. The next step is to create a visualization of your data using its UI elements. Finally, you'll use Tableau to produce interactive, real-time data visualizations in the form of dashboards. These process steps will help to provide clear and relevant answers to Little Lemon's important business questions. Your final task is to help Little Lemon create a database client so that they can interact with their database using a Python-based application. To begin, you'll first need to identify which version of Python is running on your machine. Once you've confirmed that you're running the most recent iteration of Python, you'll need to install the Jupyter IDE to run your code on. You can then open a new instance of the Jupyter Notebook and use it to connect Python to the Little Lemon MySQL database. You can establish this connection using the Python library, MySQL Connector, and the PIP software package. Once you've set up your Python environment, you can begin working with your database client. So now that you're familiar with the tasks you need to complete, it's time to get started. Don't worry, I'll be here to provide you with guidance along the way. You can also refer to the relevant learning material from previous courses if you need more help. Best of luck. In this lesson, you need to help Little Lemon set up their database project. 
There are three key steps required to set up the project. Set up the database in MySQL Workbench using a MySQL instance server. Create an entity relationship diagram and implement it in MySQL Workbench. And then commit the project. Over the next few minutes, you'll recap these topics and learn how you can make use of them in the lesson. To help Little Lemon build their relational database system, you'll first need to design a well-structured entity relationship data model, or ER diagram. You'll need to make sure that the diagram conforms to the three fundamental normal forms. By conforming to these forms, you'll ensure the integrity of your database and avoid the insertion, update, and delete anomalies. As you've discovered in previous courses, there are many professional tools that you can use to design an ER diagram. In this project, you'll work with MySQL Workbench. You should be familiar with MySQL Workbench from other courses, so for now, let's just quickly recap the basics. MySQL Workbench is a unified visual tool that's used for database modeling and data management. Its key advantages are that it's open source, cross-platform, and provides support for a visual SQL editor. It also lets you transform your data model in a physical database schema in a MySQL server. If you haven't already installed MySQL Workbench on your operating system, then you can download and install a copy from dev.mysql.com downloads. Once you've downloaded a copy of MySQL Workbench, run the installer file and make sure to install the following. MySQL Server, MySQL Workbench, and MySQL Shell. The installation process is relatively straightforward. However, if you do face any challenges, you can refer to the installation material in the previous courses, or visit the Oracle website for a detailed set of instructions. Once you've created the Little Lemon database, you then need to commit your project. You can commit a project using Git. Git is a free, open source, distributed version control system. You can use it to manage all source code history. You can keep a history of your commits, revert to previous versions, and share code to collaborate with other developers. You can download and install Git from the URL git-scm.com slash downloads. Your Git repositories are typically stored on GitHub. GitHub includes the source control management features of Git, along with other useful features. These features include project management, support ticket management, and bug tracking. You can also use it to share, access, and store repositories, including backups. To sign up to GitHub and get started, visit the official site at github.com. Now that you're familiar with the required technology, you can begin helping Little Lemon to develop their database system. You can set up the database in MySQL Workbench, create an ER diagram, and commit your model. If you need more information on any of these topics, then you can review the learning material from previous courses. Good luck. In this lesson, you helped Little Lemon set up their database project. There are three key steps that you carried out to set up the project. You set up the database in MySQL Workbench using a MySQL Server instance. You created an Entity Relationship, or ER, diagram and implemented it in MySQL Workbench. And then you committed the project. Let's take a few minutes to recap how you completed these tasks in the module. To help Little Lemon build their relational database system, you designed a well-structured Entity Relationship Data Model, or ER, diagram that conformed to the three fundamental normal forms. By conforming to these forms, you ensured the integrity of your database and avoided the insertion, update, and deletion anomalies. There are many professional tools that can be used to design an ER diagram. In this module, you worked with MySQL Workbench. MySQL Workbench is a unified visual tool that's used for database modeling and data management. There are several key advantages of the tool that you made use of in your project. Its key advantages are that it's open source, cross-platform, and provides support for a visual SQL editor. It also lets you transform your data model in a physical database schema in a MySQL server. You are able to download and install a copy from dev.mysql.com slash downloads. Once you downloaded a copy of MySQL Workbench, you ran the installer file and made sure to install the following. MySQL Server, MySQL Workbench, and MySQL Shell. Once you created the Little Lemon database, you then committed your project using Git. Git is a free, open-source, distributed version control system. 
You used it to manage all your source code history, keep a history of your commits, revert to previous versions, and share code to collaborate with other developers. You downloaded and installed Git from the URL git-scm.com slash downloads. You are able to store your Git repositories on GitHub. GitHub includes the source control management features of Git, along with other useful features. These features include project management, support ticket management, and bug tracking. You are also able to use it to share, access, and store repositories, including backups. Now that you've reached the end of this module summary, the next stage of this module is to complete the module quiz and then review the additional resources. When you've completed these tasks, you can then progress to the next module. Little Lemon need to create sales reports from the data in their database. You can help them to produce their sales report by querying their data. You can query their data using virtual tables, joins, stored procedures, and prepared statements. Recap the basics of these tasks and then see if you can help Little Lemon. Little Lemon can query their database using a virtual table. As you should know from previous courses, a virtual table makes use of data that exists in other tables. It doesn't physically store any data. It's more like an interface that provides access to data in the database. There are several benefits to these tables. They simplify data access and queries. They can be used to create a join from virtual and base tables. You can use them to efficiently manipulate and filter data, and they support database security. When creating virtual tables, you'll make use of joins to build a view from multiple tables. Joins are used to link records of data between one or more tables based on a common column. You might use a join to find information about a specific activity or object within the database. Or you might need to find where the relevant information exists in more than one table. There are several types of joins that you've explored within these courses. These include inner join, left join, and right join. There's also the self join and the full outer join. You can make use of these joins to query Little Lemon's database and retrieve the information they need. You'll also need to help Little Lemon using stored procedures. The main purpose of stored procedures is to create reusable code that can be invoked and executed efficiently. This makes your code more consistent, reusable, and easier to use and maintain. So instead of typing the same code repeatedly, you can save your blocks of code as stored procedures that you can then invoke when required. You can create as many procedures as you need, and they can include multiple parameters. Your code can also include various types of SQL code. Just make sure each one has a unique name. Remember that how you create a stored procedure depends on the task that you need to achieve. You'll also assist at Lemon with the use of prepared statements. Each time you create SQL statements, they need to be compiled and parsed by MySQL before they can be executed. A more efficient method is to create a prepared statement that only needs to be compiled once and can then be used repeatedly. In other words, you can create a prepared statement that MySQL compiles and parses just once before it's executed. So each time the statement is invoked, MySQL knows that it's ready to use and safe to execute. Prepared statements are a much more efficient and optimal way of executing statements without using valuable MySQL resources. You should now be familiar with the techniques and methods that you can use to create a sales report for Little Lemon. If you need more information on these topics, then remember that you can review the learning material from previous courses. Well done. Little Lemon need to build a table booking system within their database. They can then use this system to keep track of guests visiting the restaurant. You can use your knowledge of SQL transactions to help them create this system. You can help them to create the system using SQL queries, transactions, and CRUD operations. Developing a table booking system requires the use of SQL transactions or queries. As you know by now, transactions are statements that are executed within a database. The main types of statements that you need to use include create, read, update, and delete queries. These are also known as CRUD operations. Let's run through the basics of how you can use these queries to complete the tasks in this lesson. You can help Little Lemon to develop and populate their table booking system by creating data in the form of new bookings. You can create data using a standard insert into statement. Just be sure to identify the following within your syntax the table you want to create the data within, the columns that must be populated, and the values that they need to contain. 
execute this statement to create the data within your database. There might also be instances in which the data that you originally created needs to change. Perhaps someone wants to update their booking, or maybe they've cancelled their booking, so their data needs to be deleted from the table. You can carry out these actions using update and delete statements. Use an update query to alter information within the table. Identify the following information within your query. The name of the table to be updated, the columns to be updated, and the new values to be added to these columns. If you're deleting or dropping information from the table, then you'll need to use a delete query. Your delete query must contain the following information the name of the table that contains the data to be deleted, and any conditions related to that data. You can enact these conditions using a WHERE clause. Once you've created, updated, or deleted data within the booking table, you'll need to run tests to make sure that your queries have been executed successfully. You can carry out these tests by reading the data. A READ query returns all information that matches the criteria within your statement. An example of a basic READ query is a SELECT statement. In this case, you must make sure that the SELECT statement contains the following. The name of the table and columns that hold the data, the values you require, and any conditions required to help you target the data. You can also enhance your transactions with the use of triggers. A MySQL trigger is a set of actions available in the form of a stored program. The set of actions is then invoked automatically when certain events occur. You can use triggers for different types of events, like CRUD operations. To use a trigger, you first need to create it using the CREATE trigger statement. Then define the trigger type. Is it an insert, update, or delete trigger? And should it be executed before or after the event? You also need to define the trigger's logic, specify which table it's assigned to, and how it should be applied to the table. You've explored many different examples of read queries within this course. The important thing to remember is to make sure that you include conditions within your statement that target the exact data you need. This is good advice to follow for all types of operations. Once you're confident that your code is correct, you can commit your progress to Git. It's also a good idea to enact version control. This way, you can keep track of snapshots that show the project in different stages of development. You can then roll back to previous versions if required. You should now be ready to make use of SQL queries and transactions to help Little Lemon develop a booking table system within their database. If you need more information on these topics, remember that you can review the learning material from previous courses. Good luck! In this module, you helped Little Lemon to create sales reports from the data in their database. You also helped them to build a table booking system. Let's take a few minutes to recap the tasks, processes, and tools you completed or made use of in this module. In the first task, you created a sales report for Little Lemon by querying the data in their database using virtual tables, joins, stored procedures, and prepared statements. You helped Little Lemon to query their database using a virtual table to make use of data that exists in other tables. The benefits of the virtual table are that you are able to use it to simplify data access and queries, create a join from virtual and base tables, efficiently manipulate and filter data, and support database security. You also made use of the join clause to link records of data between one or more tables based on a common column. There are several types of joins that you were able to make use of in this module, including inner join, left join, and right join. You also had the opportunity to use the self join and the full outer join. You also helped Little Lemon to use stored procedures. Stored procedures are used to create reusable code that can be invoked and executed efficiently. By using these procedures, you made your code more consistent, reusable, and easier to use and maintain. So instead of typing the same code repeatedly, you are able to save your blocks of code as stored procedures that you could then invoke when required. You are able to create many stored procedures, and you could include multiple parameters in each one. You are also able to include a range of syntax, like SQL statements, variables, and control structures, while making sure that each one had a unique name. And how you created your stored procedures depended on the tasks that you needed to achieve. You also assisted Little Lemon with the use of prepared statements. 
Each time Little Lemon creates SQL statements, they need to be compiled and parsed by MySQL before they can be executed. You showed them that a more efficient method is to create a prepared statement that can be used repeatedly without the need for compiling. Prepared statements are a much more efficient and optimal way of executing statements without using valuable MySQL resources. MySQL compiles and parses a prepared statement just once before it's executed. In the second lesson of this module, you helped Little Lemon to build a table booking system in their database that they could use to keep track of guests visiting the restaurant. You were able to help Little Lemon develop and populate their table booking system by creating data in the form of new bookings. You created data using standard insert into statements while identifying the following within your syntax. The tables you wanted to create the data within, the columns to be populated, and the values that they needed to contain. You then executed your insert into statements to create the data within your database. There were also instances in which the data that you originally created needed to change. You were able to carry out these actions using update and delete statements. You used an update query to alter information within the table while identifying key information in each of your queries. When you were deleting or dropping information from the table, you used a delete query, again making sure to identify key information in your query. Once you created, updated, or deleted data within the booking table, you ran tests to make sure that your queries were executed successfully. You carried out these tests using read queries like select statements. In this case, you made sure that your select statements contained the following the name of the table and columns that held the data, the values you required, and any conditions required to help you target the data. You also made use of triggers to store a set of actions in the form of a stored program that you could then invoke automatically when certain events occur. To use triggers, you first created them using the create trigger statement. Then you defined the trigger type. For example, you specified if they were insert, update, or delete triggers, and if they should be executed before or after the event. You also defined the logic of your triggers, specified which tables they were assigned to, and how they should be applied to the table. Once you were confident that your code was correct, you then committed your progress to Git and enacted version control. You have helped Little Lemon to create sales reports and a table booking system using database queries, procedures, and prepared statements. Well done. I look forward to providing you with more guidance in the next module. Little Lemon need to perform advanced data analytics to generate data insights that can help to inform their business decisions. They can then use these data insights to inform their business decisions, like identifying new opportunities for growth or improving services. This task requires the use of powerful data analytics tools like Tableau. With Tableau, Little Lemon generate insights using its data analysis features. They also need to connect their data source to the software, prepare the data for analysis, and present their insights using worksheets and interactive dashboards. In this video, you'll recap the key process steps and features of the tool and find out how you can make use of Tableau to help Little Lemon generate their business insights. Tableau is a widely used data visualization tool. There are several key features it offers that users can take advantage of when analyzing data. For example, with Tableau, you can connect to a wide range of data sources, process large amounts of different data types, and create visualized data charts. You can also generate interactive real-time dashboards, script in Python and R, and complete tasks using interactive UI tools. The dashboard interface offers many useful features for analyzing data. You can connect your data sources to Tableau using the Connect pane in the launch page. Once you've connected to a data source, the related fields appear in the data pane. You can then use the authoring workspace's UI elements to create a visualization of your data using worksheets, dashboards, and story. You can also use the worksheets to add data to your view using the Marks card or you can analyze and visualize data using the row and column shelves. You can make use of Tableau's other useful features to access commands and tools in the toolbar menu, work with multiple sources of data in the dashboard view, arrange data in ascending or descending order using sorting icons, and you can use Story to present worksheets and dashboards. 
Once you've loaded data into Tableau, you then need to prepare it for analysis. There are several steps involved in this process, including splitting data for greater accessibility, creating calculated data fields, fixing data types, and filtering data. With Tableau, you can focus on relevant data using the software's filtering and visualization features. By filtering data, you can focus only on the data you need. You can also drill down, roll up, and filter data to show it from different perspectives or in different levels of detail. Tableau can also be used to filter data using either the worksheet or the source data page. However, filtering data directly in the data source page limits your data analysis in all worksheets to the filtered criteria only. One of Tableau's key features is its ability to produce interactive, real-time data visualizations in the form of dashboards. A well-organized dashboard can help to provide clear views and relevant answers to Little Lemon's important business questions. Once you've analyzed data in Tableau's worksheets, you can then combine data from multiple sources. You can add filters or drill down or roll up into specific information. You've now recapped the key features of the Tableau tool. You should now know how to make use of this tool to create worksheets and interactive dashboards that can help Little Lemon to generate business insights from their data. If you need more information on any of these topics, then remember that you can review the learning material from previous courses. Good luck. Little Lemon need to create a database client so that they can interact with their database using a Python-based application. You can help them by completing the following tasks. Review the version of Python installed on your machine. Install a suitable Integrated Development Environment, or IDE, for Python. And connect Python to the Little Lemon MySQL database. Let's take a few minutes to review these tasks. As you just saw, the first task is to identify which version of Python is running on your machine. Open the command prompt and type python dash dash version to check which version of Python is running on your operating machine. If Python is correctly installed, then Python 3 should appear on your console screen. This means that you're running Python version 3. There should also be several numbers after 3 to indicate which iteration of Python 3 you're running. Make sure that these numbers match the most recent version on the python.org website. If you search for Python and see a message that says Python is not recognized as an internal or external command, then review your Python installation or the relevant documentation on the Python website. Once you've installed Python or confirmed that you're running the correct version, you then need to choose an IDE to run your code on. An IDE is software that you can use to display your code. In this course, you'll use the Jupyter IDE to demonstrate Python. To install Jupyter, type python -m pip install Jupyter within your Python environment. Then follow the Jupyter installation process. Once you've installed Jupyter, type Jupyter Notebook to open a new instance of the Jupyter Notebook to use within your default browser. The next task is to connect Python to your MySQL database. You can create the installation using a purpose-built Python library called MySQL Connector. This library is an API that provides useful features for working with MySQL. The MySQL Connector must be installed separately using a package installer called pip. The pip package is included with the Python software that you installed. Create a new notebook instance and name it Configuring MySQL Connector. Then install the connector using pip. To install the connector, type an exclamation mark and pip to call the package. Then type the install command. Next, type the name of the library, which is mysql-connector-python. Make sure you type python with a lowercase p. Then press shift and enter or select run to execute the code. The final step is to check that your environment has been correctly configured. Type import mysql.connector as connector and click run. If there's no output in the cell, then the library has been imported successfully. You should now know how to install and configure your environment to help create and connect a database client to Little Lemon's database. If there's any parts of this lesson that you need more guidance on, then you can review the specific learning material in previous courses. Great work! 
In this module, you help Little Lemon to perform advanced data analytics to generate data insights to inform their business decisions. You also help them to create a database client that they could use to interact with their database using a Python-based application. Let's take a few minutes to recap the tasks, processes, and tools that you used in this module. In the first lesson, you used Tableau to help Little Lemon generate insights using the tool's data analysis features. Tableau is a widely used data visualization tool. There are several key features it offers that you were able to take advantage of when analyzing data. For example, with Tableau, you are able to connect to a wide range of data sources, process large amounts of different data types, and create visualized data charts. You were also able to generate real-time interactive dashboards, script in Python and R, and complete tasks using interactive UI tools. You were also able to make use of the dashboard interface's features to analyze data. You connected your data sources to Tableau using the Connect pane in the launch page. Once you connected to your data source, you then used the authoring workspace's UI elements to create a visualization of your data using worksheets, dashboards, and story. You also used the worksheets to add data to your view using the marks card, and analyze and visualize data using the row and column shelves. You then prepared your data for analysis using process steps like splitting data for greater accessibility, creating calculated data fields, fixing data types, and filtering data. With Tableau, you also focused on relevant data using the software's filtering and visualization features, so you could focus only on the data you need. You also used the drill down, roll up, and other filtering features to show the data from different perspectives or in different levels of detail. You also use Tableau to produce interactive real-time data visualizations in the form of dashboards. Your well-organized dashboards help to provide clear views and relevant answers to Little Lemon's important business questions. In the next lesson, you helped Little Lemon to create a database client so that they could interact with their database using a Python-based application. You first identified which version of Python was running on your machine using the command prompt. Once you confirmed that the correct version of Python was correctly installed, you checked which iteration of Python 3 you were running. And you checked that it matched the most recent iteration on the official Python website. Once you confirmed that you were running Python, you then chose an IDE, or Integrated Development Environment, to run your code on. In this course, you used the Jupyter IDE to demonstrate Python. You followed the Jupyter installation process and then typed Jupyter Notebook to open a new instance of the Jupyter Notebook to use within your default browser. You then connected Python to the Little Lemon MySQL database. You created the installation using a purpose-built Python library called MySQL Connector. You were able to do this using the pip software package. Then you checked that your environment was correctly configured to ensure that the library was imported successfully. Once you set up your Python environment, you are able to begin working with your database client. You completed an exercise in which you added or implemented query functions using Python to query the Little Lemon database. Finally, you committed your progress to Git. You have helped Little Lemon to perform advanced data analytics to generate data insights to inform their business decisions. And you have also helped them to create a database client that they can use to interact with their database using a Python-based application. Well done. I look forward to providing you with more guidance in the next module. Congratulations, you've almost reached the end of this capstone course and your database engineering journey. In this final module, you'll need to demonstrate your knowledge in a peer review exercise and graded assessment. But before you begin, let's recap the tasks that you helped Little Lemon to complete in this course. These tasks include setting up their database in MySQL Workbench using a MySQL Server instance, creating an entity relationship or ER diagram and implementing it in MySQL Workbench, and committing the project using Git. You also help Little Lemon to create sales reports from the data in their database, build a table booking system, generate data insights using data analytics, and create a database client. Let's take a few minutes to review the processes and tools that you used to complete these tasks. In the first set of tasks, you helped Little Lemon to build a relational database system by designing a well-structured entity model, or ER diagram, that conformed to the three fundamental normal forms. 
You design the ER diagram using MySQL Workbench, a unified visual tool used for database modeling and management. The key feature of MySQL Workbench that you made use of is its ability to transform your data model in a physical database schema in a MySQL server. Once you created the little lemon database, you then committed your project using Git, the version control system. You also made use of GitHub to store your Git repositories. Your next task involved creating sales reports from the data in the little lemon database. You created these sales reports using database queries, procedures, and prepared statements. Let's take a quick look at some of the different types of queries that you used. You use virtual tables to make use of data that exists in other tables and to simplify data access and queries. You also made use of different kinds of join clauses to link records of data between one or more tables based on a common column. You helped Little Lemon to use stored procedures to create reusable code that they could invoke and execute as required. And you also relied on prepared statements that could be compiled just once and then used repeatedly. Another task you assisted Little Lemon with involved building a table booking system in their database that they could use to keep track of guests visiting the restaurant. This task mainly consisted of using SQL queries and transactions. Let's review some examples of the SQL queries and transactions that you used. You created data using insert into statements. You changed data in the database using update statements. You also deleted or dropped data using delete statements. And finally, you read your data using read queries like select statements. You also made use of triggers to store a set of actions in the form of a stored program that you could then invoke automatically when certain events occurred. Once you were confident that your code was correct, you committed your progress to Git and enacted version control. In the next task, you help Little Lemon use their data to generate business insights. You carried out this task using Tableau, the data visualization tool. Let's review the process steps that you followed to complete this task. You first connected your data sources to Tableau. You then prepared your data for analysis and focused on the most relevant data. The next step was to create a visualization of your data using its UI elements. Finally, you used Tableau to produce interactive real-time data visualizations in the form of dashboards. These process steps help to provide clear and relevant answers to Little Lemon's important business questions. Your final task was to help Little Lemon create a database client so that they could interact with their database using a Python-based application. To begin, you first identified which version of Python was running on your machine. Once you confirmed that you were running the most recent iteration of Python, you installed the Jupyter IDE to run your code on. You then opened a new instance of the Jupyter Notebook and used it to connect Python to the Little Lemon MySQL database. You established this connection using the Python library, MySQL Connector, and the PIP software package. Once you set up your Python environment, you then began working with your database client. So, now that you've recapped the tasks you completed, it's time to begin the peer review project. Don't worry, you've worked hard to make it this far, so I'm sure you'll do your very best in the project. Best of luck. Congratulations, you've reached the end of this capstone project course. You've worked hard to get here and developed a lot of new skills along the way. You made great progress on your MySQL journey. This course and all you have achieved is really a culmination of all the previous courses you've completed in this database engineering program. You understand the basics of database engineering and MySQL syntax. You have a solid foundation in database structures and management, and you're familiar with advanced MySQL. You're also familiar with the basics of Python. You understand and can implement advanced data modeling techniques, and you demonstrated your skill set in this final course by designing a database project. With this course, you are able to reinforce and demonstrate the learning and practical development skill set you have gained throughout this program. This was achieved through hands on guided practice around the creation of a fully functioning database system for Little Lemon. The graded assessment further tested your knowledge of database engineering. Now that you've completed the final project, it's a great time to pause and reflect on your journey. You can reflect on the completed course from several vantage points. You could consider the links between this course and the previous ones you've completed, or you could reflect on the process of completing the project. 
For example, what were the hardest parts of the project? What were the easiest? What experience did you gain from working on the project? And would you benefit from revisiting previous courses? Whether you're just starting out as a technical professional, a student or a business user, this course end project proves your knowledge of the value and capabilities of database systems. The project consolidates your abilities with the practical application of your skills. But the project also has another important benefit. It means that you have a fully operational database that you can reference within your portfolio. This serves to demonstrate your skills to potential employers. And not only does it show employers that you are self-driven and innovative, but it also speaks volumes about you as an individual, as well as your newly obtained knowledge. You've completed all the courses in this specialization and earned your certificate in database engineering. The certificate can also be used as a progression to other role-based certificates. Depending on your goals, you may choose to go deep with advanced role-based certificates or take other fundamental courses. Certifications provide globally recognized and industry-endorsed evidence of mastering technical skills. You've done a great job and you should be proud of your progress. The experience you've gained shows potential employers that you are motivated, capable and not afraid to learn new things. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to embark on this journey of discovery with you. Best of luck in the future. Hello and welcome to this coding interview preparation course. This course will help prepare you for the unique and challenging aspects of a potential coding interview including some of the approaches to problem solving and computer science foundations that you may need to be aware of or apply. Let's take a moment to preview some of the key concepts and skills that you'll learn. In the first module, you'll start by discovering what a coding interview is, what it can consist of, and the types of coding interviews that you might encounter. You'll also explore how you can prepare yourself for a coding interview, including a focus on communication such as explaining your thought process, handling mistakes, and the STAR method. You'll also learn about how to work with pseudocode to demonstrate how you might reach a solution, some important tips that might help with any practical solution design, and how to test your solutions. Next, you'll get an introduction to computer science, starting with the fundamental concepts of binary, and how binary relates to real-life hardware and computing. You will explore memory and the key components of computer memory, read access memory, RAM, and read only memory, ROM, and how your computer uses memory to perform its tasks, processes information, and store data. Next, you will take a dive into time complexity and the key concept that underpins this, big O notation. And you'll discover some of the types of big O notation and how this applies to algorithmic processing. You will explore space complexity, which is essentially the space required to compute a result. In the second module, you will learn about data structures and how each one comes with certain benefits and limitations. So understanding each of these can be really important when designing a solution. You will start with basic data structures by addressing the implementation and capabilities of data structures between various programming languages and the similar patterns of the overarching architecture. You will explore the main basic data structures, strings, integers, booleans, arrays, and objects. You will go on to examine some collection data structures, starting with lists and sets. Then you will learn about stacks, queues, and trees, before moving on to some advanced data structures, namely hash tables, heaps, and graphs. In the third module, you will get an introduction to algorithms, including the types of algorithms available to you and how best to work with them to sort and search your data. You will start by exploring sorting algorithms and how working with sorted data or having the ability to sort your own data can result in significant time savings and you will explore the three main types of sorting, selection sort, insertion sort, and quick sort. And you will learn that each approach has its trade-offs and is more effective in some environments than others. Next, you will discover searching algorithms and how each type provides its own framework for problem solving. 
You will also gain insight into time and space complexity in both searching and sorting algorithms. You will take a deep dive into the processes and underlying mechanisms involved with divide and conquer, recursion, dynamic programming, and greedy algorithms. Finally, in the last module, you will get the chance to recap on everything you've learned throughout the course before taking the graded course quiz, which will test you on all of the key concepts and skills you have learned throughout the course. In this video, you have had a broad overview of the course. Specifically, you have discovered how this course will help you prepare for the unique and challenging aspects of a potential coding interview, including some of the approaches to problem solving and computer science foundations that you may need to be aware of or apply. Now, let's get started. It takes approximately 39 months to find software engineers and developers um, in tech hub cities in the US. The interviews that you will go through sometimes have skills that you don't normally use in your day-to-day -day job. It's not just about how well you can program, it's also about how well you're displaying a lot of interpersonal skills, how well you're able to drive projects, how well you're able to collaborate with others. You don't need to worry about showing up in a suit. You really can just kind of wear whatever, be yourself, and focus on the technical aspects of the interview. Hi, my name is Julie, and I am a software engineer on the IG Shopping team at Meta New York. Hi, my name is Moxie Herrera. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a software engineer in the Social Impact Org at Meta, and I work at the Menlo Park office. My name is Chanel Johnson. I work remotely in Maryland for Meta, and I'm a software engineer for the Facebook App Core Architecture team, where we work on infrastructure for the Facebook mobile app. My name is Mari Batalando. I am a software engineer uh, for the Web3 monetization team within Meta. And I work on um, different ways creators and influencers can make a living off of the Facebook platform using Web3 technologies like NFTs and cryptocurrency. I think it can be broken up into three general areas. One is the application process, one is actual interviewing, and one is the calibration process when they discuss your packet and give you an offer. In terms of the actual interview process, it's broken up into technical, architecture, and behavioral. For the application phase, um, it's a lot of, it's recruiters kind of screening the your resume, um, your uh, work experience. The recruiter then will meet with you and talk with you, want to get a better idea about your skills, your experiences, what you're looking for to make sure that you're a good fit for the role. Phase two is the technical aspect of it. There can be a range of one to four or five or even more interviews there. So this could be things like a coder pad interview where you're on the phone or over a voice chat with a recruiter or a engineer to kind of go through some uh, technical challenges. Uh, you'll have some behavioral interviews where people are just kind of engaging of what it's like to work with you, how do you solve problems. And then oftentimes there are architecture interviews as well, where you build kind of an end-to-end -end product, discuss the full architecture for that. Phase three, the final phase, is when everyone involved in the process kind of gets together and discusses how you did throughout the phases and um, if they should uh, extend an offer to you. If you decide to take on the offer, you go through what is called boot camp uh, process where you get to learn the ropes of how it is working at Meta and also sit with the teams that you're interested in so that you know uh, what choice you end up making and you get to choose ultimately what team uh, you go in. If you are interviewing for a specific pipeline like iOS, Android, or ML or AI, you should expect some questions that deal with that specific domain. So for example, in my case, I was interviewing for the iOS pipeline. So in addition to those algorithms and data structure questions that I got asked, I also got asked some iOS questions or some questions that I deal with in my day-to-day -day work as an iOS engineer. So you can imagine similar things as if you were a, an Android engineer or if you were an AI or ML engineer. I think in the application phase is when a lot of candidates get screened out. 
What can really help there is crafting your resume and focusing on real experience that will really help when it comes to software engineering roles. So if you don't have job experience, totally fine, work on side projects. And that will show both you know, concrete experience and a drive to, that you're actually interested in working on the role that you're applying for. I will say the coding interview portion is where a lot of people get disqualified. There can be many reasons for it, but the biggest reason I see is that sometimes uh, when you're writing out your code, the person being interviewed is not explaining their thought process, what's going on. They're not asking clarifying questions. Um, sometimes if the interviewer gives them a hint, they're not listening. So communication skills is where I also see a lot of people getting um, disqualified in the coding interview portion. Some candidates I see do not have a structured process for answering problems they may not have heard or seen before. And they kind of just uh, go cowboy coding and just start coding without even knowing what they're supposed to solve. So I think having a robust problem solving process for questions you may or may not have seen before is very important in doing well in, in these coding interviews. One common problem is people get stuck and they get so wrapped up in it that they're unable to kind of take feedback. What interviewers are looking for are a holistic approach to the problem. So it's not just about solving the problem, it's about how you go about it. It's about collaboration with the interviewer. So that's a really important piece to remember. The biggest thing that I've learned is to really be myself. I found it much more successful and way less stressful to just be who I am unapologetically. But it also means whenever I come, come forward as a candidate, like I am presenting myself as I am and not trying to hide anything given that this is who I want to be at work. This is who I want to be in my life. And I think having that mentality has made it so much easier. Uh, regardless of the outcome of the process. Think really hard about what you want and choose companies that resonate with uh, what you value. There are other things other than compensation and just the uh, prestige of a company that will uh, that matters in how happy you are uh, with the company. So make sure you make a list of those and consider that whenever you are choosing companies. My biggest piece of advice is just going through as much practice as possible. So two main ways to do that, I think, is one, while you go through lead code problems or mock interviewing, doing the whole thing end to end. Even if you're unable to solve the problem, you get stuck, you don't know what to do, finishing it out as if it's a real interview, it'll give you really good practice for when you actually get to the interview. And then the second thing is apply to as many places as possible. It gives you the best chance of getting interviews. And then once you're in a real life interview situation, it's a lot easier if you've already had experience doing that before. It really helps calm the nerves and it it helps you get more practice in. There's not all just only like one particular person that we're looking for when it comes to tech. We want different backgrounds and different perspectives and experiences because that's the only way we're gonna make our products better. We need that. It's such a rewarding process to uh, make an impact and actually for the better um, and just meet with people and keep learning. You will never get bored at this job, never. As you start to interview, you will face many ups and downs. And these are all experiences you can learn from. If you keep pushing, keep learning, you will eventually get to a role where you can start an amazing career in technology. The amount of preparation you're gonna do is gonna lead you to having a really big impact in the world because software is just everywhere and it's used by millions and billions of people. So I think it's well worth the preparation, the amount of effort it takes to land a job at a very um, influential and impactful uh, tech company. A technical interview is where you demonstrate your competency to code. Normally, you would have completed a screening call and demonstrated that your soft skills are suitable for the company. Soft skills relate to your ability to conduct yourself socially. This includes communicating clearly having a good work ethic, and that your presentation aligns with the company values. The technical interview is to determine that you are technically capable of the responsibilities of the role. In this video, 
you will learn how to approach the technical interview. When going for a coding interview, it will help you to keep the following steps in mind. Prepare to succeed. Solve the problem conceptually first. Employ appropriate tools. And lastly, optimize the solution. Doing a deep dive into these concepts will help you understand how to apply the method. Firstly, prepare to succeed. Many candidates might feel some trepidation at doing a technical interview. What happens if a question is asked and my mind blanks? Fortunately, there are steps that you can take to prepare for success. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Solve the problem conceptually first. Before employing a solution, it is a good idea to first have a clear picture of the question and what the answer will look like. Take some time to ensure that you are clear on what is being asked. An interviewer will have no issue with you seeking clarification from the onset. If there is a whiteboard, then use it. Jot down the major points of the problem before outlining a potential solution. Here is an excellent opportunity to show your ability to reason a problem using pseudocode before writing a single line of code. Demonstrating your ability to reason out a problem is halfway to it. Remember, one can always be taught to code. An ability for problem solving is a much sought after ability. Be vocal as you assess the problem and show the interviewers how you engage with problem solving and why you elected one approach over another. It can be a big help if you can equate the problem with one you already know. Later in the course, there is a video on the practice of divide and conquer. This is a good opportunity to employ that. Breaking the problem into smaller ones can help to solve a seemingly complex problem. If there is an additional time constraint and you exceed the allowed time, you will still be able to show functional chunks of code. Employ appropriate tools. The types of problems presented in a coding interview will have to be completed during the interview time. Thus, the solutions will not be excessively complicated in nature. They are designed to test your problem-solving ability on a microcosmic level and your awareness of the available tools. Consider the classical count the socks problem. You are given an array that represents sock colors. Yellow socks are represented by one, blue socks by two, red socks by three, green socks by four, and lastly, orange socks by five. Sock colors equal the numbers as explained, namely one, two, two, one, one, three, five, one, four, and four. Determine how many pairs of the same color socks exist. So, there are four ones, which equates to two pairs of yellow socks. Three and five represent odd socks. Although it is a red and an orange sock, they don't have matching socks to form pairs. There are two twos and two fours, which each represent a pair of blue and green socks. To solve this problem succinctly, you can utilize an appropriate data structure. Later in this course, you will review data structures. One video outlines how a dictionary stores key value pairs. A solution would be to use the sock colors as keys and the count as values. Then iterate over the dictionary and retrieve all odd numbers, which indicates the presence of any odd socks. While there are many programmatic ways of solving this, the use of existing structures minimizes the code required and demonstrates familiarity with fundamental building blocks. When possible, always utilize existing approaches rather than attempting to implement manual solutions. In addition to familiarizing yourself with staple structures, review common sorting and searching algorithms before engaging in any technical interviews. It is good practice to optimize your code. That means writing or rewriting code so a program uses the least possible memory or disk space and minimizes CPU time or network bandwidth. Coding the solution is a good step towards a respectable solution. Ensure you make time to optimize your code. Another concept you'll meet in this course is time and space complexity. Can you demonstrate to the interviewer that you understand these crucial concepts? Put simply, it is a way of measuring how fast and how much space your solution will take. When presenting your answer, 
outline your solution's time and space complexity, and then see if you can improve. Identify any repeat or overlapping code. Demonstrate that you can modularize this code into a function that is callable repeatedly and reuse code when possible. An often repeated principle for good programming is dry. Don't repeat yourself. It is the idea to only say a thing once in code and reuse as often as needed. Additionally, if there are portions of your code that are no longer required as a result of modularizing or as a result of an avenue of thought that was not completed, remove it. Avoid excessive compiler calls. If you are searching for a value in an array, terminate the loop when the item is found. A very achievable optimization on your code is to include a return statement when a value is found, or to use a loop that is dependent on a Boolean. As soon as a result is found, the loop can be terminated. This increases overall efficiency and reduces time complexity. Space complexity is all about being clever with memory usage. Whenever you can, avoid creating more variables than needed. In this video, you learned about some approaches that can be used regardless of the challenge presented. Even if you're not familiar with the problem or don't achieve a result in the time allotted, always strive to demonstrate your reasoning and best practice approaches. Prepare for technical interviews by doing practice solutions to online problems and when possible, employ a similar methodology to each challenge so that regardless of the challenge faced, you are working from a comfortable framework. A coding interview can appear like a daunting task. There will always be elements of the unknown involved and your desire to succeed may add some pre-interview nerves. Just stay calm and think logically. Good luck. The success of an interview is almost fully dependent on how you communicate with the interviewers. You wish to convey your suitability and the company would like to find a candidate that is appropriate for the role. In this video, you will learn about verbal and physical or nonverbal communication. Never underestimate the power of first impressions. It is important that every interaction with you as a potential employee reflects the capabilities that you will bring to the organization. The first nonverbal sign that you can show is punctuality. It is good practice to arrive at least 10 minutes before the scheduled meeting is supposed to start, particularly if you are unsure of the specific venue where the interview will be conducted. It takes time to navigate a building and you wish to appear composed and ready for the interview, not out of breath and flustered. Over the course of the interview, ensure that you maintain eye contact and actively listen to the questions that are being asked. Dress appropriately for the meeting. Generally, a job interview calls for you to wear professional or business attire. Make sure your clothes are clean and neat. That shows respect and reflects positively on yourself. Finally, maintain a good posture and refrain from squirming and needlessly touching the face or wringing the hands. While being nervous about and during a meeting is understandable, these gestures may unintentionally convey a sense that you don't feel up for the task. A great way to settle the nerves is to have done your due diligence prior to the meeting. Make sure you understand what the job entails and what the company does and stands for. Although it is important to understand the importance of nonverbal communication, verbal communication is equally important. You need to be able to speak to your interviewers. A good indicator of how to conduct yourself in an interview is to observe the interviewers. Listen carefully. They will lead with questions to see if you fit the required skills and personality profile. Typically, an interviewer will aim for the 80-20 rule, speaking for 20% of the time and allowing you to present yourself for the other 80%. So, allow the interviewer to direct the question to you completely before answering. Use clear and concise language in your answers. The temptation particularly if you have done diligent preparation, is to try and respond to a question with everything you know on the topic. This may lead to some rambling. A better answer is one that stays on topic and allows for the opportunity for further questions. A good interviewer 
will follow up with related questions, so this allows for the conversation to flow. Refrain from exaggerating your abilities or being negative towards yourself. Be careful not to use emotive terms that can convey negative attitudes about yourself. For example, rather than saying, I failed at that task, you could say, that task was challenging, but provided me with some ideas for future areas of research to explore. Additionally, avoid excessive slang, cursing, or inappropriate humor. A good methodology to follow when conducting an interview is the STAR method. Initially, the interviewer will attempt to make you feel welcome by giving you an opportunity to talk about yourself. What is on your CV? What do you know about the company or the role? As the interview progresses, the discussion will focus more on your abilities and suitability for the role. It is important that you can convey why you are a good fit. Typically, questions will focus on the business needs, either technologies that are being used or problems that have had to be overcome. The interviewer wants to know how you would respond to issues that arise when engaged with the job. Therefore, try to answer questions using the STAR method. Include the following four points when answering a question. The situation, the task, the action, and lastly, the result. Here are some examples to demonstrate the method more clearly. What is the context of the situation? What is the project? And what are the challenges faced? Looking at the task, what would your responsibilities and assignments be? What actions will you take to rectify or address the challenges? What are the results or outcomes of your actions? How did taking this approach impact the result? Using this approach as a template for an answer will give depth to your responses. It provides a workable framework for an answer. It also gives the interviewer a chance to respond with more related questions on areas you feel comfortable discussing. Let's recap what you have learned in this video. An interviewer will be on the lookout for candidates that can clearly convey a concept. Your first task is to communicate why you are suitable for the role. This is done verbally and non-verbally. Finally, the STAR method is a very efficient framework for engaging with technical questions that will arise over the course of an interview. In this video, you have learned that verbal and non-verbal communication is key during an interview. In any given role in a company, you may have to deal with the stakeholders, whether it be complications with the role or why a given solution is the optimal path to take. So, take what you have learned about communication and apply the principles with confidence. Almost half of software developers, according to data from a popular employment website, find the coding interview portion the most stressful portion out of all of the um, technical interview. You are going to be asked a lot of technical problems, a lot of architectural problems, organizational problems. They really want to know who you are as a person and what you value. When I was interviewing, one way that I practiced was I had an actual stuffed animal that I would talk to. And this just really forced me to practice the interview end to end as if I was actually talking out loud. I think the interviewers at Meta have been trained very well to make the interviewee feel um, welcome and uh, comfortable in solving problems together. My name is Mari Batalando. I am a software engineer at Meta, and I work in the FB Web3 monetization team where I help creators and influencers make a living by using the Facebook product. My name is Moxi Herrera. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a software engineer in the social impact org at Meta, and I work at the Menlo Park office. Hi, I'm Julie. I'm a software engineer on the IG shopping team at Meta New York. My name is Chanel Johnson. I work remotely in Maryland for Meta, and I'm a software engineer for the Facebook App Core architecture team, where we work on infrastructure for the Facebook mobile app. There are generally three different types of interviews. Technical, which is your regular elite code interviews, architecture interviews, and then behavioral. 
The technical interviews, the leak code esque questions, you'll typically have two to four of these in the interview process. One or two will be as a screen, and then there'll be a couple more after you pass the initial screen. And these are just going to be 20 or 30 minutes per question, just your classic leak code questions. The architecture interview is going to be about a 45 minute to hour long interview where um, you'll get a question of how to build kind of an end to end feature. So this can either be more product oriented, like build Tetris, or it can be more back end oriented, kind of focused on how data flows and how to scale this to many users. And then finally, for the behavioral interviews, um, you can expect questions like about your experience working with other people, collaborating, challenges you faced, exciting projects that you've worked on. Questions I usually ask is what is an experience that you've had when working on a team that things did not go well? And the main reason I asked for this is because at Meta, you're going to have to be working with a lot of people. It's not just a solitary um, job. So you need to learn how to communicate and how um, to really learn and grow with people. When I was interviewing, I was asked a lot of general questions that I would expect as an iOS engineer. So for example, how would I build um, the newsfeed um, surface in the Facebook app? You know, what objects will I make? How will those objects talk to each other? What networking APIs uh, do I expect? And being able to, at a high level, describe how, how I would tackle uh, these challenges and um, how I would structure the app as an iOS engineer. So that's a very classic question. One advice I would give in order to um, practice for interview questions is to talk out your solution when you're whiteboarding it. So one thing I would do is like with friends or colleagues, when you write out your solution, explain your thought process on what's going on. Are you considering time complexity? Are you considering um, how to make this faster? How to make, how to reduce space? These are things that we also wanna see as interviewers because when you're coding on the job, these are things you need to think about. So this is a good practice for you to explain when you go through your code of like, hey, this is why I'm doing this because of X, Y, and Z, and I'm also considering this. As an interviewer, I am actually rooting for you to do well, because what I want as an interviewer is to not sit there and stare at the screen for 45 minutes watching you struggle. I would much rather see you succeed and for us to work together on a problem so that I can gather as much signal um, from you uh, as I can so that I can make a good decision whether or not uh, you would be a fit for Meta. In terms of dress for the interview, the key is to really just be yourself. Wear something that you're comfortable with. No one expects you to show up in a suit. I get a lot of interviewees that have that are wearing just a t-shirt and jeans. I am really looking for a candidate that is willing to explain their thinking, willing to engage very deeply, and show a high level of confidence and knowledge. So the most common mistake I see people making is they might be a really talented iOS engineer, but their software general skills might be lacking. So make sure you're preparing for those general algorithms and data structure types of questions, because they will come up when you are interviewing, regardless of um, the pipeline uh, that you're interviewing for. Sometimes in the technical challenge, you'll get stuck. And the worst thing you can do is say nothing because I can't read your mind and I don't know what you're doing. So you really want to explain what you're thinking for, how you're stuck, why you're stuck, because even if you don't get the answer right, if you can show that you have a good understanding of the problem, that can be enough to get you to the next round. What really impresses me about candidates is when they come prepared for the interview. and. It, you should obviously come prepared to the interview, but when they've done their research on the company, they know the values and they know how they apply to their values and what they can bring to Meta. What really impresses me about a candidate during an interview is when they can take feedback from me. So even if they are on the right track already, sometimes if I can see that and push them a little bit more, that's a really good sign that they can hear my feedback and work with me to solve the pro whatever problem is at hand. Um, it gives a good indication that it's someone that I would want to work with in real life. Interviewing is really about showing who you are. It's really about 
you know, showing what you know, how you grow, how you learn. And there's not a single trick to it. You really have to kind of figure out a little bit about yourself and how you display these things and make it work for you. A candidate that's very enthusiastic, excited to be there and has a really positive demeanor. That just really shows that that's someone I want to work with, someone that's going to be passionate about the work they do. And that was that is what I think leads to success, is that passion. On the other side of the interviews, even though it can be a really long process, it is really rewarding to start to actually work on the products that people use every day at a place like Meta where things scale so large. It's really cool to see one of the features you build being used by millions of users. And you get to work with the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And that will help you grow as an engineer. And you would be shocked at how much you will learn and grow within a short time here. Thanks for watching. Hope that you were able to learn some good tips at interviewing at Meta. And good luck on the rest of your journey. In this video, you will learn about binary numbers, what they are, and how computers use them to represent human language. You will learn how positional encoding can turn a limited set of numbers into an infinity-sized representation of values. Lastly, you will learn how computing the power of a number can be applied to determine how many states this simple representation can hold. Traditionally, you count using 10 different digits, 0 to 9. This stems from the early development of maths. It was a natural progression resulting from humans having 10 fingers and 10 toes. Counting with the use of 10 digits is referred to as base 10. Base 10 means you have 10 different numbers to use before you have to add another digit and reuse numbers. Each time you exhaust the range, you reset the number on the left and add a zero to the right. This new digit has to be 10 times greater than the digit to its right. The number on the right is the reset and the count begins again. The use of the position of the number to denote a progressive increase in value is called positional notation. When you consider it, it is an early implementation of an algorithm to allow for the recording of an infinite number of values. Simple in implementation, but very powerful in effect. Binary works using the same positional notation approach. It is another common counting approach that employs base two. This means that all of the values are represented with either a one or a zero. Computers store information as bytes. Each byte is made up of eight bits that can either be one or zero. As you have now learned, in decimal, the count would come to nine and you would add another digit and reset. In binary, the same thing happens, but in this case, only two digits are used. To progress the count, you move the number left. Move the one to the left until all configurations of ones and zeros have been used, at which point you add another zero to the end. At this stage, all the numbers are reset to zero apart from a single one at the beginning. Let's explore it step by step. Start to count with a zero, then add one. To get to three, start back at zero again, but add a one on the left. As soon as all the ones are full, start back at zero again and add one to the number on the left, but that number is already at one. So it also goes back to zero and one is added to the next position on the left. Binary has many uses in computing. It is a very convenient way of translating electricity into computer code. If a signal is present, a one is displayed Otherwise, a zero is used. The binary counting system allows these base two signals to amount to a significant amount of information, transportation, and storage. This is the same way as Boolean numbers are stored. A Boolean value is either one for true and zero for false. Some powerful applications can be built using this simple information representation. The ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange is a map of binary to character encoding or a mapping from binary to text. There is a binary number reserved for each digit and character as well as for a number of special characters like a question mark, brackets, full stop 
and even the spacebar. It was already mentioned that a byte is made up of eight bits. Each bit can take the value of zero or one. So that raises the question, how many different values can be represented in each byte? Here, we would use exponentiation or counting the power of a number. An example would be two to the power of three. That is two multiplied by two multiplied by two, which equals eight. Now consider that you have a lock with four different digits. Each digit can be a zero or a one. How many potential pass numbers can you have for the lock? The answer is two to the power of four, or two times two times two times two equals 16. You are working with a binary lock. Therefore, each digit can only be either zero or one. So you can take four digits and multiply them by two every time, and the total is 16. Each time you add a potential digit, you increase the possible permutations. So the same lock with five digits would have two to the power of five or 32 different combinations. Now, coming back to our original question, how many different representations can there be in a byte? It was already mentioned that a byte is made up of eight bits which can be either a zero or a one. Eight bits would have two to the power of eight or 256 different combinations. In this video, you learned about binary numbers, the language of computers. While at first glance, it seemed quite limited to on or off, you learned that through the use of positional encoding, it could be used to represent a much larger number set. You learned how computers can use electricity to store and read numbers and how exponentiation or counting the power of a number relates to counting unique states and how to use it to count the number of possible combinations a number lock could have. Binary is the language of computers. Understanding how it is used to store information will give you a greater understanding when discussing data and the structures that hold it. In a previous video, bytes were introduced. Each byte consists of eight bits. A bit is the simplest form of computing memory. In this video, you will learn about the central processing unit, or the CPU, and the roles and functions of the different types of memory. Typically, a computer will be made up of a series of memory blocks, which contain both information and instructions on how this information needs to be processed. Memory capacity then refers to the number of bytes that a computer can hold. There are different types of memory that need to be considered, namely cache memory, main memory, and secondary memory. Firstly, to better understand the various layers of memory, it is important to pause and consider how a computer works. A computer functions around the central processing unit, or CPU. This takes both information and some instructions on how this information is to be processed. All this information exists as bytes or a series of ones and zeros that are determined by a small electrical current. The CPU can work faster than information can be transferred to it. Often, a CPU will be working on a number of different tasks near simultaneously. The switching between tasks can allow information to be transferred into the cache for processing and the results to be stored in the appropriate location. The proximity of a memory cell to the CPU can reduce the time it takes to load the information. Therefore, quicker and more expensive memory is always found near the CPU. So, an important concept to consider when discussing memory is the transfer rate. This relates to the speed at which a computer can transfer memory into the cache for processing. Now that you better understand the processing part, let's explore the different types of memory and start with cache memory. Cache memory is the most expensive form of memory and lives close to your CPU chip. When the CPU receives an instruction to process some information, it first checks the cache to see if the information is here. If the information is available in the cache, it is processed. If it fails to find the required information here, the information is not processed. The CPU then queries the larger, slower main memory 
then loads this information into the cache for processing. Storing recently accessed information in the cache can improve the effectiveness of your system by reducing the search and transfer time of regularly used data. Much like a metro in a large metropolis, cache memory is organized in zones of importance. The most readily required information is in zone one. Each subsequent zone is of lesser importance and is numbered zone two, three, four, and so on. Next, you will learn about main memory. A computer's main memory consists of read access memory, RAM, and read only memory, ROM. Main memory holds only the information that a computer is currently working on. It can be volatile or non-volatile. Volatile memory stores information actively, so if the computer loses power, it is lost. Non-volatile memory retains its information when the power is cut. ROM, as the name suggests, is read-only, meaning the information cannot be overwritten. This memory is programmed once at the factory and cannot be altered. Typically, one will find instructions and data that are critical for a computer's function here. ROM is busiest when the computer starts and information on the required application is loaded. RAM is programmable. It can retain new information and instructions. RAM holds the current data and instructions that are in current use. The amount of RAM your computer has is directly correlated to how fast it can go. This is because of the transfer rate. Large amounts of RAM mean that the system does not need to transfer information constantly. Instead, it can hold and run a number of applications at once using RAM. All the memory needed to operate these applications needs to be available from your RAM. Having too many programs open will affect the performance of your system by exhausting your RAM memory. There are a number of algorithms for reading and storing these memory addresses that fall outside the perimeters of this course. Now, let's explore secondary memory in more depth. Secondary memory relates to external memory that can be plugged in externally and used to increase the storage capacity of your system. Accessing secondary memory is slower and requires transferring all required information and instructions into RAM. Examples of secondary memory would include cloud storage, external hard drives, and memory sticks. In this video, the various components of memory have been discussed. You have learned how all memory allocation revolves around the CPU, which oversees the reading, processing, and storing of information on the computer. You have also learned how there are different types of memory that vary in speed and importance. This informs their proximity to the CPU, with quicker, more expensive memory cells found near the source. This information should assist you in understanding how your computer works much better. When developing applications or evaluating efficiency, it is always useful to have a metric or a lens through which you can evaluate fitness for function. Evaluation in computer science will often consider two aspects, namely time and space. In this video, you will learn how to evaluate time efficiency or gauge performance by the time taken to complete a task. You can refer to this as the time complexity of a task. An application must return information within an acceptable time frame. These days, people expect an instantaneous response when clicking on a website. There might, however, be some extra scope afforded to more complex queries, depending on the user's needs and expectations. Big O notation is a metric for determining an algorithm's efficiency. Put simply, it gives an estimate of how long it takes your code to run on different sets of inputs. In this video, the amount of time an algorithm will take is considered. Some of the big O notation you will encounter include the following. O of one, O of log log n, O of log n, O of n, and so on. So how do you measure the quickest possible time that something can be computed? You make use of a constant time algorithm where it takes O of one time to compute. Put simply, it means that no matter what is entered into a system, it will only take one computation. A simple example to illustrate this is to consider printing the first item in an array. In this instance, 
no matter how many values exist in the array, the approach has a big O of 1. Things can get more complex if you need to do a search. Consider that you have an array of 10 items and you wish to know if a certain value is in this array. You might apply a loop and check each item to see if the value exists. In this example, the complexity is said to be O of n. This is called linear time. The search is going to be equal to the length of the array passed. The larger the array, the more time is required to search it. So, if in place of 10 items you have 100 items, then the search will take 10 times as long. Let's explore an example. Each operation comes at a time price for time complexity. So, O of 1 means it costs one single computation, and O of n means it costs n computations. For example, you wouldn't say it takes 45 seconds, you would say the complexity is n. So for every n action, that is plus 1 on our final result of complexity. If n equals 100, it is 100 checks. The complexity is still O to n, only n means it is 10 times longer. This means that your application speed depends on the size of the data being processed. Print array at position n is an example of an O to 1 operation. That means print the doc at whatever n is. It doesn't matter how big n is, the cost is always 1. Let's continue to O of log n. This search is less intensive than O to n, but worse than O to 1. O of log n is a logarithmic search, so it will increase as new inputs are added. But these inputs only offer marginal increases. A good example of this in action is a binary search. Imagine you are playing a guessing game with the following prompts, too high, too low, correct, given a range of 100 to 1. You may decide to approach the problem systematically. First you guess 50 and it is too high. Then you guess 25 and it is still too high. You then decide to go 12 or 13. It is still too high. What is happening here is that you are halving the search space with each guess. So while the input to this function was 100, using a binary search approach, you should come upon the answer in under six or seven guesses. This solution would be said to have a time complexity of O log n, even if n, the range of numbers entered, is made 10 times bigger. It will not take 10 times as many guesses. Let's move on to O n squared. O n squared is heavy on computation. This is a quadratic complexity, meaning that the work is doubled for every element in the array. A good way to visualize this is to consider that you have an array of arrays. The first loop will equal the number of elements inputted namely n. The second loop would also look at the number of input elements n. So, the overall complexity of running this approach can be said to be n times n, which is n squared. So, how will you visually represent the problem? This graph displays the algorithm for time complexity. The x-axis relates to the number of inputs and the y-axis relates to the time taken. Notice that as the number of inputs increases, it has a different impact on the gradient of the line for all cases but O of 1. In this graphical representation of how n relates to the number of computations taken, the best time to aim for is O to 1. O of log n is still very good. O to n is acceptable and O n square is not great. Of course, it is not always possible to tell how long an approach is going to take. Let's return to the example of looking for something in a loop. While you could say that to search a loop takes O to n time, this might not always be the case. Consider that the item being searched for is the first in array, then the return will be in O1 time. Pretty good. Equally, the element might be missing, so every item must be searched. O n time. The middle case would be that it is found around the middle of the loop O of n over 2. When evaluating an approach, there are three definitions used. Best case, worst case, and average case. To conclude, in this video, the notion of time in relation to complexity was introduced. You have been given something to consider when implementing a solution to a problem. 
A good question to ask yourself before you start is how many computations does my solution employ and is there a better way? Now that you use a metric to evaluate your solution to a given problem, you can start thinking of its efficiency in relation to time complexity. This is not the only way to consider a solution, and in the next video, the focus will be placed on space complexity. In the previous video, you learned that the time spent on an algorithm depends on the problem's complexity and data structure. Another consideration when evaluating suitability is space. How much memory will a given solution take? This is often a trade-off with time. The selection of this data structure will pivot on what your priority is, speed or compactness. Some algorithms, like the hash tables you learn about later in this course, provide very fast lookups in O of one time. However, to work efficiently, they must have a lookup for every element stored. This results in a space complexity of O of n. The big O notation for space complexity is the same as for time. O of 1, O of log log n, O of log n, and so on. In all these notations, n refers to the size of the input. This is often measured in bytes. Different languages have different memory costs associated with them. In Java, for instance, an integer requires 4 bytes of memory. A blank array will consume 12 bytes for the header object and an additional 4 bytes for padding. Thus, if n refers to an array of integers size 4, then the total memory requirement is 32 bytes of memory. When discussing space complexity, you have to consider what the increase in input size has on the overall usage. The space complexity of a problem can be broken into two sections, namely auxiliary and input space. Auxiliary space is the space required to hold all data required for the solution. It refers to the temporary space needed to compute a given solution. Input space refers to the space required to add data to the function, algorithm, application or system that you are evaluating. Consider when you are learning long division. You may have been taught using a methodical approach that involved breaking each computation into simpler steps. To achieve this, you would create a table to hold the temporary calculations. Some complex problems require the same additional allocation of space to hold their workings temporarily while the solution is being calculated. Big O space complexity allows for the auxiliary space required for coming upon a given solution. So it can be said that space complexity equals input space plus auxiliary space, that is the space required to compute a result. Remember that you calculated the space complexity where an integer requires 4 bytes of memory. You added the 12 bytes of the header object and the 4 bytes for the padding. The total was 32 bytes. However, consider that the size of the array is doubled to 8 integers. Space complexity is now computed the same way, and the total will be 48. The space complexity is higher. Adding additional input did not increase the size of the auxiliary space, so when computing the big O, you can discount the auxiliary size if it is not impacted by increasing the input size. Knowing that each decision made in computing a solution requires memory, it is worth noting the aspects that can increase memory usage. Some common memory actions could be assigning variables. These can be temporary variables when computing a solution as with the long division analogy before. Creating a new data structure. Some solutions require that a new array be created to contain the values or a duplicate array that retains index locations. Creating a new data structure instance has an O to N auxiliary memory cost. Function calling and allocation also have additional memory overheads. It is worth bearing in mind how space is being used when designing an application. Creating a new variable to contain a value in place of overwriting an existing one will impact your space efficiency. This impact is greatly increased if you needlessly copy arrays or complex data structures with high data overhead. Additionally, writing functions that use complex structures when simpler, less intensive structures will suffice, can incur a penalty, particularly 
if these structures need to be duplicated in computing a solution. In conclusion, in this video, the concept of Big O was expanded from one focused on time consideration to one that includes space complexity. It was highlighted how there is often a trade-off between speed and memory efficiency. Additionally, there were some observations on the efficient use of space when designing a solution that is worth bearing in mind. Well done, you've reached the end of the introduction to the coding interview module. Let's take a few moments to review what you learned during this module. You began the module with a course introduction where you were informed of the content of the coding interview prep course. You then moved on to the coding interview lesson. Your first lesson focused on the technical coding interview, primarily to determine that you are technically capable of the role's responsibilities. You learned about the steps that you must keep in mind when this interview is conducted. You were taught that using the appropriate tools is always important and that you have to keep time constraints in mind. You then learned about code optimization and should be able to write or rewrite code so a program uses the least possible memory or disk space and minimizes CPU time or network bandwidth. To summarize, you learned about some approaches that can be used regardless of the challenge presented. Even if you are not familiar with the problem or don't achieve a result in the time allotted, always strive to demonstrate your reasoning and best practice approaches. Prepare for technical interviews by practicing solutions to online problems and, when possible, employ a similar methodology to each challenge. This will assist you in the future, so that regardless of the challenge faced, you are working from a comfortable framework. You then focused on communication and the importance of first impressions. You were introduced to verbal and nonverbal communication and the importance of both. You learned about the STAR method and how to use it to your benefit when communicating with interviewers. You should now be able to look at the context of a situation and the challenges faced, the responsibilities around the tasks involved, the actions required to address the challenges, and lastly, the outcomes that need to be achieved. To summarize, you should now be able to clearly convey a concept during an interview. Communicate why you are suitable for the role in a verbal and nonverbal manner. Finally, use the STAR method for engaging with technical questions that will arise over the course of an interview. You then moved on to the next lesson where you were introduced to computer science. You started with binary, where you learned about the difference between base 10 and base 2. You then discovered positional notation. This is the use of the position of the number to denote a progressive increase in value. You were then introduced to how a computer stores data as bytes and that each byte is made up of 8 bits that can either be 1 or 0. You were also given some examples. You examined the concept of exponentiation or counting the power of a number. This was followed with examples where a lock with a different number of digits was used to explain the concept. You should now be able to apply this knowledge and understand that binary is the language of computers. Next, you explored memory. The first concept you learned about was memory capacity, which refers to the number of bytes that a computer can hold. You also learned about the different types of memory that need to be considered, namely cache memory, main memory, and secondary memory. You should know by now that to better understand the various layers of memory, it is important to pause and consider how a computer works. You learned about the transfer rate, or the speed at which a computer can transfer memory into the cache for processing. You then explored cache and secondary memory and should be able to describe the differences. You were then introduced to the concept that a computer's main memory consists of read access memory, RAM, and read only memory, ROM. You should be able to describe the role of the main memory and distinguish between RAM and ROM. You should now be better positioned to work with memory. You then moved on to explore time complexity, where you learned how to evaluate time efficiency or gauge performance by the time taken to complete a task. You discovered Big O notation, which is a metric for determining an algorithm's efficiency. Thus, it gives an estimate of how long it takes your code to run on different sets of inputs, or it considers the amounts of time an algorithm will take. 
You were given some examples and should have a solid idea of how to measure time complexity. You then learned about space complexity. It is not just the speed of an algorithm that is important, but also how much memory will a given solution take. To understand space complexity, you were introduced to the concept of auxiliary space, which is the space required to hold all data required for the solution. Also referred to the temporary space needed to compute a given solution. The other concept was input space, which referred to the space required to add data to the function, algorithm, application, or system that you are evaluating. To summarize, space complexity equals input space plus auxiliary space. That is the space required to compute a result. You have done some quizzes on all the topics mentioned. That's a great start to your learning journey in this course. And all this content should empower you to have excellent coding interviews in the future. Having a knowledge of data structures is useful for any coding interview you may encounter. From basic data structures like strings, booleans, or arrays, to more advanced data structures like collections, graphs, and heaps. Understanding the data you're working with and the most appropriate structure to use can be very beneficial. In this video, you will be introduced to data structures and the two main types, mutable and immutable. You will also learn what to look for when considering a given data structure in your own applications. A data structure models an object so that it can be stored and organized easily in computer memory. It can be a simple immutable structure that does not change after creation, or it can be a mutable structure that facilitates operations to be performed on the contents. Operations might include updates and queries to be performed on the contents of the structure. On the surface, it may seem that a mutable structure should always be used. However, mutable structures require time and effort to model, and some objects are very complex and not easily modeled. Other concerns, such as space, may be a factor. Understanding the underlying mechanics of data structures can be a great advantage because decisions to use a particular data structure can have far-reaching implications on a project's progress. While the implementation and capabilities of a data structure can range between various programming languages, the overarching architecture generally follows similar patterns. Here is a universal classification of data structures that categorizes the different types of structure into two main branches, linear and nonlinear. This relates to how the elements are stored within the data structure. A linear structure relates to how the information is stored. The elements of the structure are arranged one after another or sequentially, reflecting the order that they were inputted. Examples of linear structures are arrays, queues, stacks, and lists, and it infers that each element is attached to the element that precedes it. Some languages will demand that only similar types of data are stored on the same structure. Therefore, you will have integer lists or string arrays. Other languages will allow for mixed arrays. This would mean that storing an integer and string in the same array is not prohibited. This easy approach can come at the cost of error handling down the line. For example, imagine you have created an array and want to find the sum of your values, only to discover that the total is three pineapples and one apple. Once a simple structure has been created, such as a list or array, it will contain an index. An index is a way of accessing elements that may not necessarily be the first or last instances. Generally, use of an index is done through appending square brackets and the location of the item as an integer. So array four would indicate that the required element is the fourth item of the array. However, programming languages are predominantly zero based, which means that the count will start at zero. Therefore, array four would actually be the fifth item in the array. Accessing an array through the use of an index can throw an error if index location eight is requested, but there are only seven elements in the array. A common feature of these structures 
is that most languages have a built-in length method that will inform as to how big an array is. An example of this would be calling array.length in Java or placing it inside a len function in Python. While the mechanism of how to retrieve the length varies, it is possible in most programming languages. Arrays and lists are typically first-class objects. This means that all functionality that is available to other variables is available to them. This definition generally indicates that a data structure can be passed as a parameter to a function, returned as a result, or assigned to a variable. When passing a list or array to a function, care should be taken that the structure is actually passed and not just a reference to the structure. This can be a memory-saving device used to prevent copying the information. However, such instances can cause an error if a change in the structure inadvertently affects the array in the calling environment. In this example, a string has been added to a list of integers. And because the new list points to the initial list, the initial list is also changed. Therefore, it is better to make a copy of the array and pass the copy to the function. Another memory-related issue to be mindful of is memory leak. Memory, as previously mentioned, can be arbitrarily allocated. If this memory is not used, then it is good practice to deallocate the memory location. As a result of careless programming or other issues, it is possible that a program makes repeated calls that result in excessive memory being allocated and not then deallocated. Over a prolonged time or through repeated calls, this can cause the application to run out of memory and crash. Most compilers have sophisticated algorithms for detecting and deallocating memory to avoid this issue. In contrast to linear structures, there are nonlinear instances such as trees or graphs. These structures do not allow you to traverse the data in one smooth motion. Instead, you can investigate certain paths. The makeup of these structures means that they can include natural sorting, which makes querying for specific data very quick. You will learn about different types of sorting later in the course. In this video, you had a general overview of data structures, including their two main types, linear and nonlinear. You have also learned about some of the considerations that should be made when deciding the type of data structure you should use. As you progress through this module, you will explore these structures further and learn about some of the individual strengths and weaknesses. Have you ever needed to store some data but were unsure about what sort of data structure to use? It's a common coding problem. In this video, you will discover two important data structures that could be used, lists and sets. Both are very useful data structures with their own strengths and weaknesses. Lists and sets are common in many programming languages. Let's get started by exploring lists. In most programming languages, lists are represented as objects. This means that in addition to storing data, they also have their own inbuilt methods. Here, an inbuilt sort method is used to arrange the numbers in a list. As with arrays, it is common to find lists that are declared as either a string, an integer, or float. In some programming languages, you can have lists with mixed element types. A list is an abstract concept that refers to a container of elements. A stable implementation of a list is done using either an array or a linked list. An array-based list is an ordered collection built using arrays as the underlying data structure. As such, they are subject to the same strengths and limitations associated with arrays. Array-based implementations relate to the initial sizing rather than simply pointing to another node as with a linked list. Some languages require that you initially determine how big a structure will be, while others allow for dynamically growing structures. It should be noted that this freedom is somewhat surface level. For many dynamic structures, there is an initial size automatically configured at instantiation. When this limit is reached, the array will copy itself into a new structure with a larger size allocation. Therefore, the decision not to arbitrarily allocate space at the onset may come at a cost at runtime, 
when such data structures may have to expand multiple times during the execution of other operations. Consider the computation costs of a list dynamically growing while performing operations in a loop. In this case, it would help to set the initial list size to be larger rather than dynamically growing, which can be costly due to having to create and copy over values into increasingly bigger lists. A linked list works differently. A linked list contains two pieces of information, the data and a pointer to the next list item. A linked list begins with an empty list and can grow dynamically by introducing new cells to the list. To grow a linked list, you simply have to add a new node and point the list at its location. This makes them very fast for storing large amounts of data. The flexibility of linked lists is achieved by including some additional storage requirements. Notably, in each node, there must be some reference to the nodes around it. There is also a head and a tail. The head is a unique node that indicates that it is the start of the list, and the tail indicates where the list ends. This approach to growing the size of the data structure is very powerful and can lead to very large but manageable data sets. So, what do sets entail? Set is very similar to a list. However, a set will store its elements in an unordered way. Though there are some possible implementations of ordered sets, sets have some unusual tendencies. A set will only hold unique elements. So, adding an element that already exists to a set will make no difference to the data stored there. The unordered process in which sets store their information means that printing out a set will not necessarily reflect the order in which the element was added to the set. Once a value has been added to a set, it cannot change. Instead, you would have to delete it and add a new value instead. Sets are exceptionally fast to search. This is because of its internal mechanisms. A set uses hash tables to determine where to store the elements of a set. Therefore, each number that is passed to a set will have a hashing function applied to it. A hashing function can be defined as an algorithm that takes in some data and maps it to a fixed size value. The value is theoretically unique, and every time the function is applied to the data, the same value is returned. This means that searching a set can be done in O1 time. This is due to the mechanism that is used to save values in a set. You will learn about hashing functions in more detail later in the course. A ON approach would be to iterate over the entire data structure to check for the presence or absence of a value. Sets instead apply the mapping function to the input data and check the resulting output to see if a value exists there. If it does, then the value is returned. If it doesn't exist in the set, then the data was not stored in the set and hence will return a false. While sets can perform an exceptionally quick search, performance degrades when dealing with very large data sets. This is due to the nature of the hashing function. The more values retained, the more risk there is of clashing. Clashing is when the hashing functions return the same unique mapping for two different values. The larger the data set used, the more likely clashing is prone to happen. So, there we are. In this video, you have explored two very important and useful data structures, lists and sets, and learned about the strengths and weaknesses inherent in both. You should now have a greater sense of when to use each, depending on the storage needs of the solution. So, what is the difference between a stack and a queue? And what does it mean to use one of these data structures over another? Well, in this video, you will learn about stacks and queues, the difference between the two, and why you might choose to use one over another depending on the requirements of the solution. Stacks and queues are abstract data structures that have many different implementations depending on the programming language. The unique principles that are common to both are how elements are added and removed. While lists and arrays allow for random access, stacks and queues employ sequential access. This limited approach to holding data can be very useful when you want to control how the data is accessed. 
Let's start by exploring stacks in a little more detail. Stacks are linear data structures with strict ways of adding and removing items. As the name suggests, a stack is a collection of elements that are stacked on top of one another. What this means is that it is impossible to pull items from the middle. Instead, a stack works with a strict first in, last out or philo basis. This can also be phrased as last in, first out or lifo. It's a simple yet powerful concept that informs you that items can only be retrieved from the top of the stack, which determines the order in which you can retrieve them. An example of this principle in action is hitting Control Z in a URL, Word document, or any coding environment. Control Z undoes the very last action. Hitting it again will undo the previous action, and so forth. To extend the analogy, Control Y will redo the action or push it by adding it back to the stack. Stacks tend to have very few methods. Push, pop, is empty, is full, and peak. The functions of these methods correlate with their names. Push will add an item to the stack and pop will remove it. Is empty checks that the stack contains nothing and is full is a Boolean that will return true if there is no more room in the stack. You might have heard of the popular computer question and answer platform named after this very issue, namely Stack Overflow. So, popping an item takes it from the top of the stack and calling pop again will return the next item in the stack. Pop can be called until there is nothing left in the stack. Push then will place an item on the top of the stack. It is worth noting that by calling pop or push, you are changing the stack. You have now learned about all the methods except peak. So what does that entail? To have a look at the contents, one would call peak, which allows you to view the top item without removing it from the stack. So calling it will not change the state of the structure, unlike pop or push, which permanently alters the stack. Some implementations will include a search feature for looking through the stack, though this won't always be the case. Now, let's explore an example. Imagine that an application generated a deck of cards. You could create a stack of 52 playing cards, and each time a card is dealt, it is removed from the top of the stack, just as in a real deck. Using a stack in this way would simplify the code required for maintaining the state of the deck. Now, let's explore queues. A queue is very similar to a stack in that it tends to have the same methods. It can create, insert, remove, and check the state of the queue. Unlike a stack, a queue works on a first in, first out, or FIFO basis. Again, the name is a good indicator of how the structure works. As an example, Imagine you have a line of people waiting to get a burger at a fast food restaurant. The first person to enter the queue gets served, and each subsequent customer stands behind the one in front and is processed in turn. As with the stack, a queue will pop the selected item from the structure, though different languages have different implementations for this. The element that is removed from the queue is the one at the bottom. In other words, the least recently added item or the first to join the queue. Using a real-world IT example, a server balancing system usually uses a queue to retrieve tasks. The structure would hold each task in order of insertion, and when a server becomes available to process the task, the first task entered into the queue would be removed and passed to that server. In this video, you have learned about stacks and queues and the differences between them. These are very useful tools to have in your programming toolkit, and knowing them will be an advantage when dealing with problems requiring a structured way of accessing and inserting data. In previous videos, you have learned about data structures like lists, stacks, and queues. Another data structure you have not yet learned about is trees. So what exactly is a tree in the data structure context? Trees are a powerful data structure that gives you great flexibility in adding and searching values. 
the inherent structure of the tree can allow you to understand a lot about the relations between the data stored, which can save a lot of time and code when extracting information from the data. In this video, you will explore the general structure and inherent features that trees provide. You will also learn about some of the different types of trees and the advantages of using a tree data structure. So, let's get started. A tree is a very complex data structure that resembles a tree in design. It consists of nodes that are linked with one another. A node can be a parent or child node. A parent node may have a connected set of children nodes. Nodes with no children are referred to as leaf nodes. As with a tree, nodes can branch off in different directions, allowing for powerful search and storage features. Generally, we can look at a tree as a graph-like structure that has nodes that contain data and edges that model how each node relates to one another. When discussing trees, it is important to know some of the terminologies. The top level node is referred to as the root. Each subsequent node down that is connected to this node is referred to as a child node. Nodes that have the same parent are referred to as siblings and are considered to be on the same level. One might picture a chapter of a book where the subsections correlate to connected nodes. The theme of these nodes will be of a very similar nature. Other branches would be other chapters that still fall under the general theme, but on different topics. A path refers to a series of connected nodes. You might assume a connection between two nodes by determining the shortest path. This is to say the quickest way that you can move from one node to another. Intuitively, nodes with shorter paths will have more in common. The depth of a node refers to how many edges there are from the parent to the root or the longest path. The height of the tree refers to the number of edges between the topmost node to the deepest node within the structure. And finally, the size of a tree refers to the total number of nodes within the tree. There are many variants and implementations of trees, such as binary trees, B trees, and B plus trees. There are also quad trees and AVL trees to name a few. While all of them will contain the general theme outlined, their use and implementation differ slightly, depending on the type of tree being applied. There are many advantages to storing your data in a tree-like structure. The connections between the nodes indicate a relationship that is inherent in your data. They can store information in a hierarchical fashion where the topmost content is stored in the upper nodes and more in-depth information can be retrieved by traversing a given branch to a tree. They are also very efficient for inserting and deleting data due to the flexible way in which they are implemented. The non-linear nature of a tree means that there are many ways of traversing the data. In binary trees, this feature can be very useful when storing data. A left node has a lesser value, while the right node indicates that there is a greater value. Let's demonstrate that with some data values. The first data contains the value of 23. Then a 4 is added. Because it is less than 23, it goes to the left. Following is a 1, also less than 23, but also less than 4. That also goes to the left. The next number to follow is 30. Because it is now larger than 23, it goes to the right. A 24 is added. And because it is less than the 30, it goes to the left. But the 56 that was added goes to the right of the 30 again. One can traverse a tree in depth first or breadth first method. A depth first method involves visiting every node from top to bottom sequentially. A breadth first method involves searching each node on the same level before ascending to the next level and repeating until the root node has been reached. More benefits of trees are that they can be used to model file systems on your laptop, class hierarchies like those found in Java, or modeling hierarchies in organizations. In this video, you explored the general structure and inherent features that trees provide. You also learned about some of the different types of trees and the advantages of implementing a tree data structure. At this point of the course, you have been introduced to several different data structures and you've discovered that there's not a perfect way of storing information. 
Instead, there is a wide variety of approaches, each of which is an appropriate solution depending on the problem. In this video, you'll learn about what a hash table is, its structure and inherent features, and how it works. You will also explore some of the advantages of using hash tables and discover what is meant by collisions in hashing. A hash table contains several slots or buckets to hold key value pairs. It requires a hashing function to determine the correct bucket to place the data into. A hashing function is any algorithm or formula that is applied to a key to generate a unique number. Each data item to be stored must have a key and a value. The key is taken and the hashing function is applied to it such that it is reduced to a fixed size value. There are a variety of hashing functions one could apply. You may be familiar with them in relation to compression. When you want to send information over the internet, you might first compress the size of it to a manageable number of bytes, send it over the internet, and then decompress it on the other side. This is an example of how hashing works. It reduces the key to a small manageable size which then acts as the index indicator. What information is used to generate the index is dependent on the application. It might be the data itself, if it is small enough, or it might be the last four digits of an employee ID number, or it might be a key in a dictionary. Most programming languages have built-in hashing functions like MD5, SHA, or CRC32. So, implementing a hashing function is a straightforward job. When discussing big O notation, the idea that speed and space are often at odds with one another was introduced. This means that you can reduce the time taken to retrieve an item, but in doing so, you add overhead to your application. Hash tables prioritize speed over space and can retrieve an item in O of one time. Recall the discussion on arrays. When you want to check if a value exists, a search must be executed that checks each element of the list and makes a comparison with a target value. Worst case scenario, this will take O of n time, or in other words, if the element was at the end of the array, it must make n checks. Hash tables offer an alternative approach to storing and searching data. This is done through use of an index. To achieve this, you must implement an algorithm that takes in a key and maps it to a value which is stored in an index. Then, when a new key is presented, the algorithm need only run the same function and determine where in the index the value lies. Much like an index in a book, this will drastically speed up the time it takes to identify the location of some data. You are likely to find hash tables used in caches, dictionaries, database indexes, and sets. Consider a scenario where you have an array of 10 keys, which are numbers zero to nine. You elect to employ a hashing function to decide where in memory to store these numbers you opt for a simplistic approach of applying the modulus of 20 to the numbers. So, for each key from 0 to 9, you apply your hashing function. Start with 0 mod 20 equals 0, 1 mod 20 equals 1, 2 mod 20 equals 2, 3 mod 20 equals 3, and so forth. In this way, you would generate nine unique values which are used to represent in memory where the data associated with those keys is placed. This example is simplistic but illustrates the mechanism behind creating hash maps. The issue arises when the number of keys to be stored grows beyond 20. Remember 1 mod 20 equals 1, but 20 mod 21 also equals 1. Let's move on to collisions in hash tables. What are collisions in hash tables? A hashing function will apply a clever algorithm that will reduce the size of the key to a manageable size. Some approaches are more intricate than others. So, what happens if the result of two hashings is the same? To expand on this idea, it is worth pondering on von Mises' birthday paradox. Due to probability, 
sometimes an event is more likely to occur than we believe it to. In this case, if you survey a random group of just 23 people, there is actually about a 50-50 chance that two of them will have the same birthday. This is known as the birthday paradox. Say there are 24 employees in a company and a clever hashing function has been applied that takes the date and month of their birthday and uses this as an index. With only 24 employees and a hash table of 365 index slots to hold a reference to them, you may think that the probability of any two employees sharing a birthday is unlikely. In fact, it has been shown that it is over 50% likely to occur. Next time you're at a party, be sure to check if any two attendees have the same birthday to check for yourself. What this illustrates is that there will be duplicate hashes generated when the hashing function is applied to the key and that allowances must be made for it. There are a few solutions to the issue. One solution is to grow the table every time a collision occurs, then increase the complexity of the hashing approach, redistributing the values to new addresses. In this way, a table will grow organically to match the size of the data required. Another is to create a linked list at the point of collision and simply store the additional values. So, in the event of a collision, instead of storing a value, you would instead store a linked list of values. In this video, you discovered what hash tables are, their structure and features and how they work. You have also learned that hashing is a very clever approach to generate O of one time searches using a hashing function and an index. You explored collisions and how they can be used to inform the size of the table. And you even learned that if you are at a party with more than 24 guests, it is more likely than not that at least two will share the same birthday. A heap may not sound like a particularly promising name for a data structure. However, it is a very important organizational tool and combines some features and benefits of other data structures. In this video, you will learn about the structure and features of heaps. You will also discover how heaps can be used to organize elements from least to most important, and how, by limiting the functionality of heaps, productivity can be increased. So, let's get started with heaps. A heap is a specialized data structure that is modeled like a tree, but behaves in a similar way to a queue, though with a notable difference of assigning priority to some elements. Each element in a heap has a key value, and the priority can either be the smallest or the largest key value. Heaps that place priority on the lowest valued key are called min heaps, and ones that place the priority on the maximum value are called max heaps. Heaps were first introduced as a means of storing and searching data efficiently, but since then, it has been recognized that there are a number of very useful operations that a heap can be applied to. A heap has a few select core operations that it can perform. Insert, find underscore min, and delete underscore min for a min heap, and insert find underscore max and delete underscore max for a max heap. For the rest of this video, the discussion will revolve around min heaps, but you can reverse everything said and it will apply to a max heap. The only difference between the two is where the priority is placed. As with many of the data structures discussed on this course, these methods are the fundamental elements that constitutes a heap. Different implementations in different languages could have additional methods added. An instance of which may be decrease key, this is where the value of a key is changed. The motivation for which would lie with the priority of the key in real world instance changes. When discussing trees, it was mentioned that binary trees sort values in order of size. If the value is less than the node go down the left path, if the value is greater than the node, go down the right path. Because of this underlying architecture, heaps are often built using binary trees. Though another approach would be to make an array act in a way that mimics the behavior of a binary tree. The minimum value is placed on the root node and each subsequent value is placed on the hierarchy where their value dictates. 
This means that to retrieve the minimum value from a heap is O of 1, because it will be stored always at the root. Unlike a stack, retrieving a value does not cause it to be moved from the tree. Instead, a delete min method exists that can be called if the intent is to remove items as they are processed. Typically, a heap would not support operations such as deleting items other than the priority element. The reason being that a heap is built for specialized purpose that involves identifying the most important item and returning this in the shortest time possible, then queuing up the next item of importance. Deleting items in the tree would require restructuring the tree and this would lead to a degradation in performance. If you are looking for a data structure that can act in this way, then you might consider structures other than a heap. Insertion into a min heap is done through propagation. Each item is inserted at the root. A comparison is then made with the left value. If this is less than the newly inserted item, they are swapped. This continues until the newly inserted item has no greater value above it, and the value below is lower. Insertion in a heap can be achieved in O of log n time. Having examined the underlying mechanisms that power a heap, you may now have some idea of how this data structure can be applied. Considering that its inherent structure prioritizes a particular value from a group of elements, the natural application would be for scheduling. This could apply to CPUs, routers, or packet handling. Additionally, one could imagine that such a structure would be useful in prioritizing certain tasks like interview scheduling, where the key used to store the candidate may relate to what stage of the interview process they lie at, or what priority the role has within the organization. Having a process that automatically applies schedules based on importance can be a huge time-saving device. In this video, you have gained a greater understanding of heaps and how they can be used to organize elements from least to most important. You have been shown that by limiting functionality, productivity can be increased. As with the selection of any data structure, it is important to find the right tool for the right job. When considering a given problem in computer science, it is always important to consider what executions might be required to solve your problem and through this reflection, choose an appropriate data structure to hold your data. Consider that you might work for a large internet company that wants to store a directory of locations and their connectedness to one another. In this illustration, our cities plotted in relation to one another. Notice how every possible detail need not be recorded. Say, for instance, you want to know how far Chicago is from Boston, you can easily deduce this from the way in which the data is organized. The same approach could be used to model internet destinations, relationships between words, or people on a social network. This approach to saving information is a graph-based approach. In the coming video, some terminology and advantages to this approach will be outlined. This structure illustration is a graph that is made up of nodes to denote destinations, and edges that show how each node relates to another. The presence of values between the nodes means that this is a weighted graph. There are no arrows present, which means that this is an undirected graph. In contrast to a directed graph, an undirected graph has no order of precedence. One way to think about directed and undirected graphs is like two-way and one-way streets. Sometimes it helps when ordering data to highlight some progression when in other instances, the edges are there just to show association. A path then is a sequence of two or more nodes that are connected by an edge. A connection in a directed graph is considered weakly connected if the edge is only one way. However, if there are two connections going either way between two nodes, then it is said to be strongly connected. At this point, you may be considering that a graph resembles a tree. In some ways, you can say a tree is a simple graph. Notably, a tree has a starting point and models a hierarchy with parents and children. A graph is a far more complex structure 
that has no beginning or end. Two nodes bordering one another are called neighbors and nodes that are connected through a neighbor are said to be adjacent. Graphs like trees can be traversed breadth first and depth first. Recall a breadth first search involves visiting every node on the same level, then going lower. And a depth first search involves drilling into the end of every branch before moving on to the next one. A breadth first approach involves choosing a given starting location and iterating over all the neighboring nodes. Each neighbor will have a connection of connected nodes, which can be added to another data structure already mentioned, the queue. In this way, you can systematically visit every node. To achieve a depth first search, you can employ a stack. We call a stack processes elements differently than a queue. While the queue prioritizes first in, first out, a stack focuses on last in, last out. So by placing all of the neighbor nodes systematically on a stack, you would ensure a depth first traversal. Graphs are a much studied data structure and are the basis of many algorithms that have been developed to establish importance between nodes. Regardless of the element stored in the node, one notable one is shortest path. What is the quickest way to get from node A to node E? The edge weights would inform as to the cost of choosing each path. This approach is used when routing internet packages on the internet or when calculating a journey on Google Maps. Another common graph-based challenge is the traveling salesman. A salesman has a select few nodes to visit. What is the best route to plot that hits all the nodes in the shortest time? This would be used in package routing. Given X destinations and Y vehicles, plot out the most efficient route so that all packages get delivered with the least spending of resources. In this video, you learned how graphs give you the opportunity to model data in a flexible way that facilitates inferring information on the data by how it is stored. This versatile approach only retains the minimum of information. The distance from Chicago to Boston is not stored anywhere, but can be deduced. It's easy to query different questions without changing the makeup of the data. Calculating the best time when walking can easily be substituted in place of driving with minimal fuss. There has been a whole field of statistics devoted to inferring information from node placements, which can be levered to make inference on any data stored there. Well done, you've reached the end of the Introduction to Data Structures module. Let's take a few moments to review what you learned during this module. You started the module with a lesson on basic data structures. This ranged from basic data structures like strings, booleans, or arrays, to more advanced data structures like collections, graphs, and heaps. Understanding the data you are working with and the most appropriate structure to use can be very beneficial. You learned about a simple, immutable structure that does not change after creation and mutable structure that facilitates operations to be performed on the contents. You then took a deep dive into all the types of data structures. To refresh your memory, here is a universal classification of data structures that categorizes the different types of structure into two main branches, linear and nonlinear. Examples of linear structures are arrays, queues, stacks, and lists, and it infers that each element is attached to the element that precedes it. You learned about the structures in detail and should now be able to describe each of them. You then moved on to focus on nonlinear data structures. In contrast to linear structures, there are nonlinear instances such as trees or graphs. These structures do not allow you to traverse the data in one smooth motion. Instead, you can investigate certain paths. You then moved on to the next lesson where you were introduced to lists and sets. You learned that as with arrays, it is common to find lists that are declared as either a string, an integer, or float. In some programming languages, you can have lists with mixed element types. You also learned that some languages require that you initially determine how big a structure will be, while others allow for dynamically growing structures. 
That was followed by a section on linked lists and how they work. Remember that a linked list contains two pieces of information, namely the data and a pointer to the next list item. You then learned about sets and how they work. A set is very similar to a list. However, a set will store its elements in an unordered way. Following sets, you were introduced to the hash functions and their role in searching in sets. Sets are exceptionally fast to search. You then moved on to the next video on stacks and queues in the same lesson. To refresh your memory, Stacks and queues are abstract data structures that have many different implementations depending on the programming language. The unique principles that are common to both are how elements are added and removed. You learned that stacks and queues employ sequential access and use the empty stack, push and pop methods to move and or add and remove items. You also learned about the philo first in, last out and FIFO, first in, first out principles. When you visited queues, you learned that a queue is very similar to a stack in that it tends to have the same methods. It can create, insert, remove, and check the state of the queue. Unlike a stack, a queue works on a first in, first out, or FIFO basis. Again, the name is a good indicator of how the structure works. The last video in this lesson focused on trees. Trees are a powerful data structure that gives you great flexibility in adding and searching values. The inherent structure of a tree can allow you to understand a lot about the relations between the data stored, which can save a lot of time and code when extracting information from the data. You learned about tree structures and how data moves in a tree. In the next lesson, you were introduced to advanced data structures. First, you learned about what a hash table is, its structure and inherent features and how it works. You also explored some of the advantages of using hash tables and discovered what is meant by collisions in hashing. Let's quickly revisit what this entailed. You were introduced to the hash function and learned that the key is taken and the hashing function is applied to it in such a nature that is reduced to a fixed size value. You learned about compression with an example from our field of experience. When you want to send information over the internet, you might first compress the size of it to a manageable number of bytes, send it over the internet, and then decompress it on the other side. This was followed by an explanation of how hash tables offer an alternative approach to storing and searching data through use of an index. To achieve this, you must implement an algorithm that takes in a key and maps it to a value which is stored in an index. The next video in this lesson focused on the structure and features of heaps. You also discovered how heaps can be used to organize elements from least to most important, and how, by limiting the functionality of heaps, productivity can be increased. You learned that heaps could place priority on the lowest valued key and are then called min heaps and ones that place the priority on the maximum values are called max heaps. A heap has a few select core operations that it can perform, namely the insert, find and delete of items. Following this, you learned that deleting items in the tree would require restructuring the tree and this would lead to a degradation in performance. To summarize, in the video about heaps, you have gained a greater understanding of heaps and how they can be used to organize elements from least to most important. You have been shown that by limiting functionality, productivity can be increased. As with selecting any data structure, it is important to find the right tool for the right job. Finally, you focused on graphs and set the scene as follows. When considering a given problem in computer science, it is always important to consider what executions might be required to solve your problem. And through this reflection, choose an appropriate data structure to hold your data. Consider that you might work for a large internet company that wants to store a directory of locations and their connectedness to one another. An illustration of cities plotted in relation to one another was used to explain all the concepts. 
such as a weighted graph, an undirected graph, and that in contrast to a directed graph, an undirected graph has no order of precedence. Following that, you learned that a connection in a directed graph is considered weakly connected if the edge is only one way. However, if there are two connections going either way between two nodes, it is said to be strongly connected. In this video, you learned about the key concepts and topics covered throughout this module. You have done some quizzes on all the topics mentioned. You are getting more equipped for your future. Good luck with the next module. Sorting a set of data might sound like a straightforward task, given what you have already learned throughout this course. However, it can be surprisingly challenging when you get into the details. In this lesson, you'll explore sorting algorithms and the different sorting methods that are available to you. You'll be introduced to some of the various approaches to searching, such as linear and binary. You'll also discover the steps involved in implementing both of these approaches and explore the advantages they offer. You'll also learn about the steps required for implementing selection, insertion, and quick sort, and discover the strengths and weaknesses of each sorting approach. There are several algorithms that have been developed for this challenge, and some data structures that had previously been discussed, like binary trees and heaps. Both of these data structures have been designed with the aim of retaining the data in a sorted manner. Working with sorted data or having the ability to sort your own data can result in significant time savings. Therefore, a data set of elements that can be ordered is fundamentally necessary. This order could be alphabetically, sequentially, chronologically, by size of shape or by hue of color. The actual metric that is used is less important than the fact that they can be arranged in an ascending or descending order. A second consideration that's factored in is whether the ordering is permuted, meaning reordered or has been accomplished by creating a copy whilst keeping the original list. Selection sort is an early approach to sorting. It mimics how a human might approach the problem. The underlying principle is very straightforward. You start by searching through a list to identify the smallest element. Then, switch this with the first element so that the smallest element is placed at the top. Now the previous occupant of the top spot has been switched into the vacated spot in the list. This is repeated for every element in the list until the list has been ordered from the smallest through to the largest. Let's explore this in an example. You'll see in this diagram element 35 at index location 0. In a selection sort, a comparison is made between the element at index 0 and each element in the array until the lowest is found. Equally, element 46 in the next location is compared to each element and in this case switched with 6. Next is element 36 found at index 2. You'll notice that element 9 at index 3 is deemed the smallest. However, the entire array must be searched. This process is continued until every element is ordered by size, smallest to the left, largest to the right. Another straightforward approach to sorting is insertion sort, rather than searching through all the elements. This approach begins by examining the first two elements in a list. The smaller of the two is then moved to the front. This is repeated for every element, each one being compared to the element on its left. A subsequent switch to the left is made if it's found to be smaller. So, element 2 is compared with element 4. It's found to be smaller, so a swap happens. Next, element 2 is compared with element 1. It's found to be larger, so no more comparisons are made. Then, element 3 is first compared with element 4. It's found to be smaller so a swap occurs. Next, element 3 is compared to element 2. It's larger, so no further comparisons are made. Let's explore an example of this. On screen, you'll notice an array of numbers. The first element, 35, has nothing larger to the left, so it remains where it is. Then, element 46 is compared and is also left where it is. Next, you see element 36. This is compared with location 1. It's smaller than 46, so they are swapped. 
checks against location zero shows that no further swaps need occur for this element. At step three, you'll notice element nine. This is compared with 46 and is therefore swapped to location two. It is further compared with location zero and one and swapped again. Next, the element found at location four is compared with location three and swapped. It's further swapped with location two and location one. It's also compared with location zero, but as it's greater, no further movement is made. The process is continued, moving from right to left until the entire array is sorted. Both the insertion and selection sort are straightforward approaches working on a simple paradigm. Quick sort is a more sophisticated approach that is more complex to implement. However, it shows far greater efficiency. Quick sort operates on the principle of pivots. The algorithm selects an element in the array as the pivot. Then, all items in the array larger than this value are moved to the right of the pivot, and all elements less than the value are moved to the left. This process is repeated for both sides of the pivot until all the items are sorted. Let's explore this in an example. Here, element nine is selected as the pivot point. Using quick sort, all items that are less than nine are swapped left, and all items larger than nine are swapped right. Therefore, the smaller elements have now been moved left after this first split. In this example, these smaller elements are six and three. Applying the same procedure again to the resulting array terminates when three is found to be the only element not split. Now, taking the values that are greater than the original selected pivot, you select a new pivot. In this case, 36 is selected and a further swapping of elements is performed. Finally, the remaining unsorted index locations are swapped in relation to a new pivot. Once all elements have been sorted, the algorithm terminates. There are many additional sorting approaches that can be used with some approaches even forming hybrids of these existing ones. In practice, you probably would not write your own implementations as there are excellent implementations in every language. The goal here is to show how they operate under the hood so that you can choose the best one when faced with a given problem. As with data structures, there is not one sorting algorithm that provides the best result in every given scenario. Each approach has its trade-offs and is more effective in some environments than others. You will learn more about the efficiency of these approaches when compared to big O notation soon. In this video, you've explored sorting algorithms and the different sorting methods that are available to you. You have also learned about the steps required for implementing selection, insertion, and quick sort, and discovered the strengths and weaknesses of each sorting approach. In the previous video, you explored sorting and were introduced to several sorting approaches that can be used for a data set. However, what if you need to search this data for a specific element? In this video, you'll be introduced to some of the various approaches to searching, such as linear and binary. You'll also discover the steps involved in implementing both of these approaches and explore the advantages they offer. In computer science, searching is a fundamental operation. When provided with a collection of data, there may be a need to identify specific elements within this data. However, the exact description of the element does leave room for some interpretation. From the onset, you might consider the question, Given a hash table, is there a key value pair that matches this key? This is a simple like-for-like -like comparison that will produce either the absence of a unique key or the return of a unique key. Some considerations when making a search might include finding the largest number in this array or the smallest, or to return the median number from this collection of numbers. However, what if the value does not exist? What should be returned? Returning a null value can interfere with an application's ability to run afterwards. When doing a search, you need to consider what safeguards should be put in place when there is no value returned. You should also consider if the search is supposed to return the first instance of the value or the last. In the additional reading at the end of this lesson, there is a link to a talk from Tony Hoare, the inventor of null, 
who refers to it as his billion dollar mistake. The simplest search that you can implement is a linear search. If you have an array of elements, a linear search begins at the start of the index and searches through the array until an appropriate element is found or there are no more elements to check. In this approach, the best case scenario would be O of 1 and worst case, O of n, as each element would have to be checked before it's possible to say that the target element is absent. In relation to data structures, it has been shown that some have inherent sorting tendencies, such as a heap or a binary tree. You can also take any data structure and apply a sorting algorithm to it before applying a searching approach. Using a binary search will half the search space at each iteration. On screen is a data list. A binary search will firstly check the halfway point and determines if the element is greater or smaller than the target element. If the middle element is less, then the left half of the list is discarded and the right half becomes the focus. So, now only the right half of the list is queried for the middle value. Again, if it's less than the target element, it is once again discarded, and the right half of that filtered list will be examined. In this way, the algorithm halves the search space at each iteration. This approach is quicker than a linear search, but does require the data to be sorted before beginning the search. It may not seem like a reasonable requirement to have this, but if your data is read more often than it is updated, then such a solution might be an appropriate implementation. Again, as with the linear search you covered earlier, the best possible outcome from this approach is that the element is found in the first go O of 1. However, the worst case scenario is less optimistic. After the first search, the list is halved. If this iteration is not successful, it is halved again. Then after the third division, it is halved again, and so on. Therefore, it can be said that after j iterations, it is n over 2 to the power of k, or in other words, O log n. This is considerably more efficient than a linear approach. However, it is worth bearing in mind that any perceived gain in time needs to be offset by the time taken to sort the list. If the list is updated regularly, this can become a costly process. In this video, you explored binary and linear search functions the steps taken to complete these searches and how they work. You also learned how the application of Big O can be used to estimate the efficiency of both. You've even learned how through some clever adaptations to a standard approach, it's possible to seriously improve performance. Keep up the great work. In the next lesson, you'll start learning how to work with algorithms. The divide and conquer paradigm offers a useful framework for thinking about how to solve a given problem. It encompasses two principles discussed in this module, namely recursion and breaking problems down into smaller problems. In this video, you will learn about the divide and conquer paradigm and how it offers a framework for problem solving. You will also learn about the mandatory and optional steps involved in the divide and conquer paradigm and what advantages this paradigm brings to computers. So how does the divide and conquer algorithm work? The algorithm comprises two steps with an optional third, namely divide and conquer, which are the mandatory steps, and combine, which is an optional step. In the divide step, the input is split into smaller segments and processed individually. In the conquer step, every task associated with a given segment is solved. The optional last step combine is combining all the solved segments. This will not happen in every instance, but will for the example provided. The following is an example of the divide and conquer paradigm. When discussing sorting approaches, it was shown that there are many ways to solve a problem. Using sorting as our example, let's discuss another sorting approach that can be solved using a divide and conquer approach. Merge sort is a sophisticated approach for sorting an array. It starts by halving the array. These two halves are then halved and halved again. 
This process is repeated until there is only one element remaining. Then the process reverses and each smaller list is sorted before rejoining the part it was halved from. This solution to a problem is based on the idea that by breaking a problem into smaller problems, it is easier to complete the overall task. To gain greater intuition on how divide and conquer can be applied to merge sort, let us explore a real world example. Consider you and three housemates have decided to do the shopping together. After having compiled an extensive list, you all go to the supermarket. One solution might be that you all walk around the supermarket and pick up each item from the list. A better approach might be to break the list into four parts and each take a section. This would reduce the overall time spent in the shop. Though this might cause an amount of overlap between parties, a further optimization of the task then might be to first sort the list so that all similar items are together. For example, all the beverages, the fruits, the meats, and so on. Then assign each member a given area of the supermarket. This would be an even more efficient approach to completing the task. They say a problem shared is a problem halved. So how does this work on computers? There are two immediate advantages, namely parallelization and memory management. Parallelism is when you have different threads or computers working on the same problem at the same time to complete it in a quicker time. A benefit to employing divide and conquer solutions is that you can then employ parallelism when coding. Now, let's explore memory management. With the merge sort example, consider that each array can be sent to a different core or server depending on the architecture of your organization and the results are then returned. It might be that the data being processed is too large to hold in memory and must be processed in chunks. Additionally, the boss may have provisioned access to cloud computing, so the solution can involve accessing an online server and exporting some of the problems from the company servers. All this contributes to managing your available memory. In this video, you were introduced to the paradigm of divide and conquer through an example of merge sort and how it offers a framework for problem solving. Some various terminology associated with it as well as how this approach lends itself to real-world computer optimization approaches were demonstrated. You also learned about the mandatory and optional steps involved in the divide and conquer paradigm and what advantages this paradigm brings to computers. In a previous video, you learned about the divide and conquer paradigm. In this video, you are going to learn about recursions and how to implement the requirements for a recursive solution. One of the basic tenets of any given language is its ability to perform loops. Loops enable us to perform actions repeatedly until the desired output is achieved. Unlike humans, computers never tire of performing the same mundane task repeatedly. An alternative approach to solving a problem than a loop is recursion. The practice of having functions call themselves is referred to as recursion and the focus of this video. Recursion is when a function calls itself with a smaller instance of a problem repeatedly until some exit condition is met. So what is required for recursion? There are three requirements for implementing a recursive solution, namely the base case, the diminishing structure, and the recursive call. Let's look at an example relating to binary to better illustrate these three requirements. Consider a challenge where you are tasked with finding the exponent of a number. Recall that calculating an exponent of a number is to determine how many potential permutations can be derived from it. This was discussed when demonstrating how binary can be used to represent a range of characters. The base case ensures that the function will not continue to call itself and eventually ends. Line 1 outlines a function that will take two arguments, x and n. The base case is if n equals 0. In this instance, the program will terminate. Line 4 is the second part of the conditional statement. If a termination point has not been reached, 
call the function again with a reduced structure. In this instance, the goal is to multiply x by n to find the total number of potential states that could exist for the binary number. Reducing the input value is as important as establishing a base case. This way, the function will eventually reach the base case and cease to call itself. The third component of a recursive function is to include a call to itself. This happens on line 5, where the exponent is accepting the diminished structure. The structure can be said to be diminished because the size has been reduced from one call to another. Each time the function is called, a new instance is created on the call stack. Calling the above function with x equals 2 and n equals 3 will result in three instances being created and placed on the call stack. This increases computational cost as resources are required to make a function call. However, the computation from each result will be retained on the call stack. This can be useful when computing hierarchical problems or problems where one can benefit from knowing which steps resulted in a given outcome, like traversing a graph. Let's explore an example of the use of recursion. Consider the video on binary search. A binary search function will accept an argument of a list and a target value. First, the middle point of the list is checked against the elements to determine which half of the list to check. This process is repeated until the target element is found or deemed to be not there. You might consider solving this problem through a loop or recursively. The input to the recursion would be a list and a search element, and the recursive function would call itself until the target endpoint is reached. So why then use recursion when a simple loop will do? Some problems lend themselves well to recursive calls. Consider calculating the Fibonacci of a given number. Fibonacci is a sequence of numbers where the first two numbers are 0 and 1, and every other number is the sum of the previous two numbers in the set. Calculating the result involves passing a number, calculating the output, changing the number, then calling the function again with a new integer input. Writing the code this way means that you can simply call the function with a different integer, and it will return a breakdown of the required steps. Readability is a strong plus for recursion. Sometimes when a problem requires many checks, a loop can quickly become unwieldy. Recursive solutions reduce the amount of code required to solve a problem and can be easier to read and understand. Finally, one would employ a recursive approach as part of a divide and conquer solution. Here, the problem is broken into smaller steps and repeated to come upon the optimum solution. In this video, recursion has been introduced. You have learned that while recursion can add some computation overheads to a problem, it can also result in eloquent, easily read code. Additionally, that recursion epitomizes a divide and conquer solution, breaking the problem into its smallest components and solving those. In the build up to dynamic programming, you have learned about the divide and conquer paradigm and recursions. In this video, you will learn about the concepts of memoization and dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is a programming paradigm that promotes solving problems by breaking them into smaller problems and solving these. The solutions are then stored in an appropriate data structure for later use. The advantage to this is that if these subproblems require being computed again, one only searches for the answer instead of computing the problem again. The technique of solving subproblems and storing them to save time on a potential future lookup is known as memoization. Dynamic programming relates to two concepts already encountered in the previous videos. Let's have a quick refresher on these concepts. The first is divide and conquer. That is, taking one large problem and breaking it into a smaller set of subproblems and then solving these. The second is a subset of this known as recursion. Recursion is the practice of coding a solution that avoids running loops, but instead uses multiple self-calls in coming upon a solution. 
Dynamic programming is an extension of these approaches, which in addition involves keeping a record of results generated from running the subproblems each time they are newly run. In subsequent runs, instead of recomputing results, a lookup is queried for the last time the question was asked. As said, this approach is called memoization. And to reinforce the concept, this is when the results of previous calculations are stored and used in place of rerunning the calculations when the compiler identifies that the computation has been run for a previous task. To exemplify this, consider the question posed in the video about binary numbers. How many combinations were possible with a binary lock of six digits? In a previous video, it was shown that you can discover this through exponentiation or finding the power of a number. So the same lock with six digits would have two to the power of six or 64 combinations. So two to the power of six equals two times two times two times two times two. Alternatively, you can divide these into two groups where you have calculated two times two times two and again, two times two times two. That will result in eight times eight and again, give the same result. Applying a divide and conquer approach to computing this efficiently using memoization would reduce the computations by first calculating to the power of three and again two to the power of three. By applying memoization, the first two to the power of three would be computed, then reused for the second bracket, reducing the overall computation required. So, what sorts of problems are good fits for a dynamic solution? The dynamic programming approach is commonly applied to combination or optimization problems. One example of a combination problem already mentioned is the Fibonacci sequence. Another instance you may encounter in an interview is the knapsack problem. This is both a combination and an optimization problem. Say for a planned camping trip, you can fill a knapsack with required items. Each item has a weight cost to it. A torch equals one kilogram, water equals two kilograms, and the tent equals three kilograms. Additionally, each item has a value. The torch equals one, water equals two, and the tent equals three. In short, the knapsack problem outlines a list of items that weigh different amounts and have different values. You can only carry so many items in your knapsack. The problem requires calculating the optimum combination of items you can carry if your backpack can carry a certain weight. The goal is to find the best return for the weight capacity of the knapsack. To compute a solution for this problem, you must select all items that add up to a given weight and contain a given value. The weight carryable will change. This problem can be applied to resource allocation where you have so much CPU power and X tasks to run, just like the capacity of a CPU dedicated to completing tasks. Sometimes the weight will be 7 kg and other times it might be 10 kg. Dynamic programming involves saving the computations used to come upon a given solution. So, if you have computed an optimum selection for 7 kg and it is raised to 10 kg, you will not have to rerun the initial computations again. This can be a time-saving metric. When computing dynamic programming solutions, you must firstly determine the objective function. That is the description of what the optimum outcome is to be. Next, you must break the problem into smaller steps. One approach already discussed for achieving this can be the use of recursive functions. That is, functions that will call themselves repeatedly until a solution is come upon. They should be written in such a way that you can change the outcome without altering the code for the methods already written. To conclude, in this video, it has been shown that dynamic programming is an approach that looks to optimize solutions to a given problem. It uses principles of memoization and overlapping subproblems to identify when an objective function can be achieved quickly, optimizing the computation steps required. In this video, 
you will learn how you can implement this paradigm to solve complex problems by using greedy algorithms. There is a philosophical principle called Occam's razor. It states that the simplest solution is almost always the best one. This problem-solving principle argues that simplicity is better than complexity. In our case, the greedy algorithm is the simple solution. This is an alternative approach to dynamic programming, as this approach seeks to present an immediate solution for a task and favors local optimization over a more holistic global approach. When engaging with a problem subdivided into segments, utilizing a dynamic programming approach would find a globally optimal solution so that each subproblem is solved and the best subset is selected and implemented. A greedy approach would instead look at the list of solutions and implement a local optimization. Usually, the current most rewarding option is chosen. To make this more clear, let's take an instance of a CPU that has a list of tasks to be completed. Applying the dynamic programming approach would entail selecting a subset of activities that could be completed within a given time and executing these tasks. With the knapsack analogy, this would involve determining what subset of items to pack that would maximize the value in the process of filling the bag. A greedy algorithm approach to this would be always to select the most valuable item and place this in the bag, giving no thought to what other items this would exclude from the process. Thus, in our CPU example, a greedy approach would involve selecting first the shortest running program and then the next shortest program and so on. While this might not lead to a globally optimized solution, it will reduce any overhead in calculating the most efficient subset of items. To better understand how these two approaches would differ, let us consider the problem of the shortest path. The image shows a map with nine different nodes. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and S. Each node is connected to another node by a weighted path. This weight reflects the cost that would be incurred by selecting this path. Thus, in our CPU example, a greedy approach would involve selecting first the shortest running program and then the next shortest program, and so on. While this might not lead to a globally optimized solution, it will reduce any overhead in calculating the most efficient subset of items. You are now faced with making a journey from E to F and want to plot the most effective route. A dynamic programming approach would involve creating a table and calculating each potential node from E. From there, it would introduce the next set of nodes and calculate the accumulated cost. This approach would undoubtedly arrive at the most efficient solution. Using memoization, after the initial calculations were made, they would be saved and subsequent journeys would benefit from a quicker computed time. This is a bottom-up global approach to the problem. A greedy approach would differ in its methodology. Instead of trying to find an optimal subset of connected routes, it would instead begin at node E and look at each available connection. Thus, it would have a selection of weights, namely 5, 3, 2, 4, and 12, which correspond to nodes C, B, D, G, and H. The lowest value in that array is 2, which corresponds to node D. Following the greedy principle, it would make this selection and progress to the next node. Assuming that the data structure was a directed graph, it would be presented with a further three nodes, a, F, and G that have the values of 7, 5, and 6, respectively. Since F is the final location, it would select F and arrive at its destination happily, having amassed a total penalty of 7 for travel time from E to D and then to F. That carries a weight of 2 plus 5. Visually, you can see that this is the most efficient approach and it was come upon without creating an exhaustive table of combinations and computing all routes. However, 
had the node between G and F had a penalty of 2, then it would have selected a less optimal solution. This is the trade-off when choosing a greedy approach over a dynamic one. While the overhead for a greedy algorithm is low and coding a solution is quite straightforward, it will not always guarantee that the best option is returned. You now have a greater understanding of the greedy algorithm approach. In addition, you have seen how it compares with a dynamic solution and thus deepened your grasp of the strengths and weaknesses of this alternative approach. Next time you are plotting a route in Google Maps, consider the selection of routes that are offered and think about how these routes might have been calculated. Well done, you've reached the end of the Working with Algorithms module. Let's take a few moments to review what you learned during this module. You began the module with a lesson on sorting and searching. First, you learned about why sorting is important and explored the three main methods for sorting, selection, insertion, and quicksort, and examined the steps involved for each method that these algorithms use to sort data and explored the strengths and weaknesses of the three sorting approaches when choosing an algorithm to use for a given solution. Importantly, that there is not one sorting algorithm that provides the best results in every given scenario. Next, you learned about searching algorithms, which are a fundamental concept in computer science and some of the various methods that are used by algorithms for searching. You explored two core approaches to searching, linear and binary, Linear searches progress through every item in a given data structure until a specific item is found, whereas binary searches half the search space at each iteration. You also learned the steps involved in implementing both approaches and some of the advantages they offer. You also took a deep dive into time and space complexity for both searching and sorting algorithms. You then moved on to the next lesson, where you were introduced to working with algorithms. Here you learned about different approaches to working with algorithms. First, you explored the divide and conquer paradigm. In the divide step, the input is split into smaller segments and processed individually. In the conquer step, every task associated with a given segment is solved. And the optional last step, combine, is combining all the solved segments. And you discovered how the divide and conquer technique offers an effective framework for problem solving and the various benefits that it provides. Next, you explored another important algorithmic approach, recursion. Recursion is when a function calls itself with a smaller instance of a problem repeatedly until some exit condition is met. And you learned that there are three requirements for implementing a recursive solution, namely the base case, the diminishing structure and the recursive call. You were then introduced to dynamic programming, which is a programming paradigm that promotes solving problems by breaking them into smaller problems. You explored the concept of memoization, the technique of solving subproblems and storing them to save time on a potential future search. And you examined the process involved to compute a dynamic programming solution, essentially, this can be outlined as first, determining the objective function. That is the description of what the optimum outcome is to be. Next, breaking the problem into smaller steps and then deciding which dynamic programming approach you would like to apply to achieve your desired outcome. Finally, you learned about greedy algorithms. In comparison to the dynamic programming approach, a greedy approach would look at the list of solutions and implement a local optimization. Usually, the current most rewarding option is chosen. You explored how a greedy algorithm approach could be implemented to reach a solution. And that there is a trade-off when choosing a greedy approach over a dynamic one. While the overhead for a greedy algorithm is low and coding a solution is quite straightforward, it will not always guarantee that the best option is returned. With all the knowledge you have acquired, all that is left is to complete the final quiz for this module before moving on to the final module, where you will complete the graded assessment. And then you've really made it. You're so close. Good luck 
and enjoy the rest of your journey. In this course, you have learned a range of concepts and skills as you prepare for a coding interview. Let's take a few moments to recap the key topics that you learned about. In the first module, you started by discovering what a coding interview is, what it can consist of, and the types of coding interview that you might encounter. Your first lesson focused on the technical coding interview, primarily to determine that you are technically capable of the role's responsibilities. You learned about the steps that you must keep in mind when this interview is conducted. You were taught that using the appropriate tools is always important and that you have to keep time constraints in mind. You also explored how you can prepare yourself for a coding interview and the importance of first impressions, including a focus on communication, such as explaining your thought processes and handling mistakes. You learned about the STAR method and how to use it to your benefit when communicating with interviewers. You also learned about how to work with pseudocode to demonstrate how you might reach a solution, some important tips for practical solution design and how to test your solutions. In the next lesson, you got an introduction to computer science, starting with an overview of binary, where you learned about the difference between base 10 and base 2. You then discovered positional notation, the use of the position of the number to denote a progressive increase in value. You then moved on to explore key components of computer memory and how it works. You should know by now that to better understand the various layers of memory and should be able to describe the differences. You learned about the transfer rate or the speed at which a computer can transfer memory into the cache for processing. You then moved on to time complexity, where you learned how to evaluate time efficiency or gauge performance by the time taken to complete a task. You discovered Big O notation, which is a metric for determining an algorithm's efficiency. You explored space complexity, which is essentially the space required to compute a result, and that any decisions around space complexity are not just based on the speed of an algorithm, but also on how much memory capacity a given solution will use. There will always be a choice to prioritize speed or compactness. In the second module, you learned about data structures. This ranged from basic data structures like strings, booleans, or arrays, to more advanced data structures like collections, graphs, and heaps, and how each one comes with certain benefits and limitations. You explored all the types of data structures and how they are classified into two main branches, linear and nonlinear. Next, you were introduced to stacks and queues, abstract data structures that both have specific characteristics around how elements are added and removed. When you visited queues, you learned that a queue is very similar to a stack in that it tends to have the same methods. It can create, insert, remove, and check the state of the queue. Unlike a stack, a queue works on a first-in, first-out, or FIFO basis. Finally, you found out that trees are a powerful data structure that give you great flexibility in adding and searching values. Following this, you went on to examine some advanced data structures, namely hash tables, heaps, and graphs. Next, you explored heaps. You discovered how heaps can be used to organize elements from least to most important, and how, by limiting the functionality of heaps, productivity can be increased. Finally, you examined graphs. This structure illustration is a graph that is made up of nodes to denote destinations and edges that show how each node relates to another. The presence of values between the nodes mean that this is a weighted graph. There are no arrows present, which means that it is an undirected graph. In contrast to a directed graph, an undirected graph has no order of precedence. And you learned that a connection in a directed graph is considered weakly connected if the edge is only one way. However, if there are two connections going either way between two nodes, then it is said to be strongly connected. In the third module, 
you had an introduction to algorithms, including the types of algorithms available to you and how best to work with them to sort and search your data. You started by exploring sorting algorithms and how working with sorted data or having the ability to sort your own data can result in significant time savings. You discovered why sorting is important and explored the three main methods for sorting, selection, insertion, and quick sort. Next, you went on to discover searching algorithms and how each type provides its own framework for problem solving. You explored two core approaches to searching, linear and binary. Linear searches progress through every item in a given data structure until a specific item is found, whereas binary searches half the search space at each iteration. You also gained insight into time and space complexity in both searching and sorting algorithms. You then moved on to the final lesson where you were introduced to working with algorithms. Here you learned about different approaches to working with algorithms. First, you explored the divide and conquer paradigm. You learned that in the divide step, the input is split into smaller segments and processed individually. In the conquer step, Every task associated with a given segment is solved, and the optional last step, combine, is combining all the solved segments. Next, you explored another important algorithmic approach, recursion. Recursion is when a function calls itself with a smaller instance of a problem repeatedly until some exit condition is met. And you learned that there are three requirements for implementing a recursive solution, namely the base case, the diminishing structure and the recursive call. You were then introduced to dynamic programming, which is a programming paradigm that promotes solving problems by breaking them into smaller problems. And you examined the process involved to compute a dynamic programming solution. Essentially, this can be outlined as first, determining the objective function. That is the description of what the optimum outcome is to be. Next, breaking the problem into smaller steps and then deciding which approach you would like to apply to achieve your desired outcome. Finally, you learned about greedy algorithms. In comparison to the dynamic programming approach, a greedy approach would look at the list of solutions and implement a local optimization. Usually, the current most rewarding option is chosen. And you looked at an example of how a greedy algorithm approach could be implemented to reach a solution. While the overhead for a greedy algorithm is low and coding a solution is quite straightforward, it will not always guarantee that the best option is returned. So, there is a trade-off when choosing a greedy approach over a dynamic one. Well done. You have covered so many important concepts and approaches throughout this course. It is a real achievement, but it should also serve to prepare you for any potential coding interviews that you may go on to attend. All you have left to do is to take the final course quiz before wrapping up the course. Good luck. You've reached the end of this coding interview preparation course. You've worked hard to get here and accumulated a lot of knowledge along the way. You've made great progress on your developer journey. You should now understand the unique and challenging aspects of the coding interview. Specifically, you should be well prepared with some interview soft skills that will help you to be ready when you go for your coding interview, the foundations of computer science and some problem solving methods to apply to any challenge you may face in an interview scenario. Following your completion of this course in coding interview prep, you should now be able to prepare for the interview process, offer strategy and tips for successful interviewing and openly discuss the emotional components of the process. The key skills measured in the graded assessment revealed your knowledge and understanding of data structures in the context of coding interviews, the concepts and usage of algorithms, how to visualize an algorithm, and combining new and previously learned coding patterns to solve problems. Congratulations, you've successfully completed all of the courses in this program. At this stage, you may want to consider registering for another course, specialization or certificate pathway. Certifications provide globally recognized and industry endorsed evidence of mastering technical skills, whether you're just starting out as a technical professional, a student or a business user, 
the courses you have completed and the range of practical projects you have in your portfolio will prove your knowledge and ability as a developer. These can serve to demonstrate your skills to potential employers. And not only does it show employers that you are self-driven and innovative, but it also speaks volumes about you as an individual, as well as your newly obtained knowledge. You've done a great job so far, and you should be proud of your progress. The experience you gained so far will show potential employers that you are motivated, capable, and not afraid to learn new things. Again, congratulations on finishing this course and good luck with the rest of your educational journey.